This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability of solving crime is unequal in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Against the ones you got back. And I also found this. It's partly burnt sack. 
Hey, looks like some kind of army issue, don't it? Probably well, really is. Had a name and a serial number on it, but I can't make out the name. However, the number is still clear, though. Yeah? We can check it and see where it leads us. Oh, Watchman? Yeah? Yeah? Were you on duty here last night? Sure. I'm the night Watchman here. Stayed on this morning until Mr. Evans and the owner gets here. Did you see the fire start? Yes, yes. I, I was just coming back from the lunch wagon. They got me a cup of gel. Oh, Alex. And just, uh... Alex, how did this happen here? Well, uh, Mr. Emerson, like I was telling these fellas, I was coming back from getting a cup of coffee, and suddenly I seen a big flare of greenish blue light in, in the room just outside the office. And before I could turn around, the whole place was ablaze. The office was in this corner, wasn't it? Uh, that's right. Now, who are these men, Alex? I'm Sergeant Matheson, City Police. This is Nick Carter, investigator for the insurance company. Well, I'm Walter Emerson, owner of the warehouse. You say you saw an explosion, Alex? Kind of like that, but there wasn't so much noise uh, like an explosion. Well, I don't understand. There was nothing in there to explode. Whatever exploded was planted there for that purpose, Mr. Emerson. This fire was no accident. It was set. But why? There was nothing here but furniture. Who would want to destroy that? A pile many. I doesn't care what burns as long as something does. I understand that you were fully insured. Oh, yes. Completely. Was the warehouse full, Mr. Lentz? Very full indeed, Sergeant. The housing shortage has prevented many families from taking their furniture out, even though they want to. Yes. Oh, by the way, Alex, has, uh, have you seen Mr. Taylor? Uh, no, no, sir. I haven't. Well, yeah, he called me about an hour ago and said he'd meet me here. I wonder what's keeping him. Uh, Mr. Emerson. I suppose you kept your safe here in the office. Well, we had no safe, Miss Carter. All business is transacted in the downtown office. No safe here. Yeah. Oh, that's fair, Mr. Yeah, what's peculiar about there being no safe here, Miss Carter? Maddie, let's get out of headquarters. Nothing more to do here. Right. Come along, Walter. We've got work to do. want you to find out who had the serial number I just gave you. His name and present address and where he works, if you can get it. Okay, Nick, I'll get at it right away. Oh, when would you be back to the office? As soon as I get through here at headquarters. Bye. Hey, Nick, why were you so surprised that there was no space in the warehouse office, huh? Maddie, have you forgotten? What? One thing about the Jersey firebug was that before he set fire to a building, he always robbed the safe that was in it. Uh-huh. I see what you mean. You think it might not have been the Jersey firebug that set this one, huh? Well, I'm just putting that fact away in the back of my head. Now, how about checking the prints of this clock against the others? I got the other prints right here, Nick. The CL is stuck up. Oh, where do I put those? Uh, oh, here they are. Now, then, where's the clock you found? Uh, here it is. Uh, no. Huh? They're not the same. Well, that don't prove the Jersey firebug didn't do it, Nick. No, 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 of course not. Now, do you got one of the clocks you found at the other fires? Well, there's one at the 48th Street Station. They took it up there to make some tests on it. Want me to have it sent down, Nick? Yeah. I'd like to have this clock checked against the other to see if the system of wiring is the same. But isn't we may find that this fire was set by someone trying to make us think the Jersey firebug did it. Yeah, but look, Nick. None of the newspapers have ever carried anything about how that fellow set his fire. That part of it was always kept secret. So he wouldn't know that we had the information about it. Now, you better take the clock just the same. All of you stay here and wait for the other one to be sent down. Right. And you and Maddie check carefully to see if the way the clock is wired up is the same or different. Right. Sure. Come to the office. I'll be waiting for you. This information may be very valuable. Mm -hmm. Hi, Betty. Hi, Nick. How's business? Well, business must be dull with you, no matter how it is with me. Never saw you reading a mystery magazine before. Oh, that. I picked it up in the drugstore this morning when I stepped in for my coffee. And I seem a little bit dull around here this morning. I was just looking through it. <laughs> as long as you don't bleed anything, you're eating it, it won't hurt you, I <laughs> Oh, uh, did you find anything interesting with the fire in it? Oh, I don't know. Might be the work of the Jersey Firebug, since an alarm clock was used to set it off. The Jersey Firebug? Yes. Why the surprise? Well, there's an article in this magazine I'm reading on him and all the fires he set. Huh? Oh, one of the series on pyromaniacs, apparently. Yes, so. Will you explain that system you use? Well, sure. You see? Diagrams and descriptions tells all about the clock. Well, does it show how the clock was hooked up? Oh, well, not in detail, no. It just says it was used to set off the fire. Huh. Well, does it mention the fact that he always robbed the safe first? No. Uh, did he? Hmm. Well, someone should have read that article and tried to indicate the Jersey Link anyway, without knowing about that thing. 
Oh, oh, uh, did you find out to whom the army serial number belongs? Oh, after considerable telephoning around and getting stunted from one person to another, I finally got what she wanted. She saw Jay Huston, let out a couple of months ago on a medical discharge. Anxiety and neurosis, they told me. I checked the U.S. yes, but they have no record of his having any job. Find any address for him? Well, the only address they had was the Sunset Trailer Camp out on Long Island. Really? If he was discharged because of anxiety and neurosis, he must be the kind of man who would set fires and things. Oh, Patsy, you ought to know better than that. But you could... Patsy, when they discharge a man from the army because of a neurosis, it doesn't mean he's cracked up or crazy. An anxiety and neurosis is like overwork, run down. Boy, it's undoubtedly perfectly strange. Too many people, just as you did now, think a man with a medical discharge is nuts and refuse to have anything to do with him. All he really needs is a room as a chance to pull himself together again. Be just the same as you or I. Oh, but Nick, this clue you found at the fire seems to lead directly to him. Well, even if it did, it's that clue. There's nothing to do with us having a medical discharge. No war angle to this whatsoever. Uh, and who's never been in the army become fire for us. Oh, I'm sorry, Nick. I, I guess I just didn't think. Yeah, just like a lot of other people. Well, I'm not trying to be tough with you about this, Patsy, but it's just that... I, uh, Nick, well, how are you, Patsy? Well, uh, hi, Waldo. From the look on your face, you must have some news. Uh, well, what'd you find, Waldo? You were right, Nick. The clock we found at the warehouse is picked up altogether different from the one Matty had. Not the same at all. Oh. If it were, no space to crack, and an article in a magazine telling how to keep down. Uh, uh, I'd say it all adds up to let the Jersey firebug out completely. In which case, we better be in our way to the Sunset Trailer Camp and have a talk with Charles J. Hatcom. This is quite a camp, isn't it, Nick? Yeah. Must be more or less permanent, too. The only thing look. Oh, yeah. Poor Waldo. What caused that remark? thinking how sore Waldo was that she wouldn't bring him along. Waldo is one of those things called a procrastinator. He <laughs> give him a job to do, but because it's just routine running around, he tries to put it off as long as he possibly can. <laughs> oh, uh, this is the Hatton trailer, this green one with the white trim. It matches the description of the man the gate to it. It's the right location. Yeah. But if the door being open means it has to be around somewhere. Well, we can look in, can't we? That won't hurt anything. Yeah, that should be all right. But I hope it shows up soon. Oh, well, there you are, Nick. Oh, man. Well, oh, well, well, the right arm of the law. What happened to you? You're right behind us. The next time I looked around, you disappeared. Oh, I got stopped at that last red light, then I got boxed up behind a truck and couldn't get out. <laughs> Everything happens to me. <laughs> um, is this the uh, hospital's place? Yes, we were just going to have a look inside while we were waiting. Just look here. Hmm? Look at that. Yeah. Made sort of a crime in this war for many years. Hey, two furry pistols, canteen, cartridge belt. And two sets like the one Nick found after the fire, with the same identification on them. Yeah. And there should be a third one. Empty spaces. I guess, one. Eh? What's in them? Magnesium flares. Oh, oh, what a beautiful blaze they'd make. It certainly looks like Haskam had something to do with it. And the greenish blue sort of explosion the watchman saw could easily be a magnesium for you. Yeah. It don't look so good for Mr. Houston. He's got some pretty fast explaining to do. Must be around somewhere. He wouldn't have let the door open this way. What the devil are you doing in my trailer? Are you Charles Houston? Yes, so what? Stand up here to see you. We're out, so we just looked in. How'd you get in? Uh, the door was open, so we walked in. Yeah, that's a likely story. I left the door locked. You must have broken it. That's what you did. What do you want? Are you sure you locked the door when you left? Sure, I'm sure. You calling me a liar? Not at all. But it was open when we got here. Yeah? Well, look here. You forced it open. See? Here's the march of the Jimmy. Huh? I thought you're right. Why is Jimmy open? If we didn't do it, Haskell. Believe me. Why should I believe you? I can see what I see. The lock's busted and you're inside. Now, look here, Haskell. Cops don't go around breaking in doors that way. Cops? They're the worst of the whole bunch. A lot of... Wait, no, all right, all right, Haskell. Wait a minute. When did you leave here? Yesterday morning. What's it to you? What have you been doing since then? Why should I answer a lot of silly questions? I don't have to. You better take it easy. Now, we want some information. If you won't tell us here, I'll have to take you down to headquarters and make you answer. What did I do? Kill somebody? What have you been doing since yesterday morning? 
Isn't it bad enough to have no home but this lousy trailer, no place to bring my wife where we can live together, no job, no nothing? But you have to come here and accuse me of heaven knows why. We're not accusing you of anything yet. Uh, tell me, Hudson, uh, what happened to that stack of magnesium flares that's missing from your collection? What do you mean, missing? It was here when I left. Well, it's not there now. Any idea what happened to it? No, I haven't. You probably took it. Hey, my alarm clock has gone, too. Well, that's good. You bust in my door, steal my stuff, then ask me a lot of silly questions. I'm not accountable to anybody anymore. I got my discharge. I'm a free man. Free as anybody can be with the world the way it is. Look, Haskell, you're not making things any easier for yourself by doing this. Hey, hi, Charlie. What? What's What's the... job for? What job? It's trucking job you have. What do you mean, trucking job? You're crazy. Oh, like that, huh? Okay, buddy. I'm just the wrong way. I didn't know that. I thought you didn't have any job. You must know it was just a temporary job I took yesterday. Trucking some furniture. Yep. Yeah. Furniture, did you say? Yes, furniture for the Emerson Warehouse. It was a rush job. They had a lot of stuff to get out in a hurry and needed drivers. Paid over scale, so I took it. I needed the money. And I still have no job. Next, you hear that? Hear what? Look, Haskell, you go to work for Emerson. You're gone all night. The warehouse burns down by a fire. Set with magnesium flares like you've got there. And you I had nothing to do with any fire. No? Your army number was on the bag we found the building when the fire was out. A bag just like them two you got in there now. Son, you and I are going down to headquarters. I want to know a lot more about this. Hey, you can't take me. No? Oh, yes, I can. I'm going to. Tell me this. Uh, no, not just yet, honey. I want to look around a bit. Uh, okay, I'll be seeing you. Come on, Haskell. We're going for a ride, you and me. Not me. You can't. Come on. Oh, we're going to ride. Suddenly, so mixed up, he got into a jam without realizing what he was doing. I'm not satisfied as did. Don't forget, the lock on the door was broken open. Well, couldn't he have done that as a blind? Oh, that's just good. I'm not going to look around for prints, though, from the door first. Uh-huh. We can compare them with Haskell's stuff. There should be plenty of those inside. And if they match? That would prove Haskell was a liar. And if they don't? Well, that's something else. Wouldn't prove much one way or the other. Not until we get some more facts to go with him. And that's our job right now, Tessie. Getting all the facts we can. So the prince didn't know. Well, couldn't that mean that somebody was working with Haskam on this? It could. Or just mean Haskam was innocent. Good afternoon. You the owner of this camp? Yeah, sure I am. But we're full up right now. See? I'm glad to hear it. And I just want some information. Oh, sure. Glad to tell you what I can. See? You know Charlie Haskell, don't you? Oh, sure. Yeah. Nice young fella. He didn't have a chip on his shoulder all the time. Not a very sociable fellow, I should imagine. Sure ain't. Does he have any friends in the camp here? Sure don't. I've seen him talk to the young couple leaving beside him, but that's all. See? I suppose you know most of the people in this camp. Oh, sure, he there ain't no chances just now, town of the housing building. Uh-huh. All nice people? Oh, sure, yeah. All except the guy got the tail of the other side of Haskell. Don't like him. He don't live there, just use it as a kind of office. Office? What kind? I don't know. But there's always a lot of queer-looking men running in out there every night. I wish I could get rid of them, but they ain't found no good reason. See? Well, what's the name of the man who lives there? Terry Jones. We can go. That's not a funny name. I'll look at my house. Sounds funny, all right. Jones home now? No, no, never there during the day, only at night. Okay, thanks for your trouble. So long? Hey, so long, mister. Glad to help you. We, um, call him with the Jones, Carolyn? We are, back to immediately. Before Mr. Jones gets back, I hope. <laughs> Hmm? Oh, yeah, it is. Say, may I speak to you a moment? Mm-hmm. Sure. What's on your mind? How well do you know Charlie Haskell? Well, is he in trouble? Maybe, maybe not. That's what I'm trying to find out. How well do you know him? Oh, just a feature. We don't make friends easy, that's I do. So I know him. What was that about a job? Oh, why, yes. Uh, well, this fellow offered me a job running a truck yesterday. He was rushless, you know. Well, I was busy, and I knew Charlie needed money, so I told him about it. Who offered you the job? Oh, a fellow named Jones. Uh, lives in that trailer right ahead of you there. I see. Okay, thanks very much. Oh, no, mention it. 
Say, I hope Johnny makes out all right. Hmm, that certainly ties up, doesn't it, Miss? The mysterious Mr. Jones seems to be indicated as our next point of contact, Jay Lee. Oh. Looks as if Jones was out, Miss. Sandra. Mr. Jones! Not so easy this time. His door is locked. Yes, yeah, I think he'll go in anyway. Enjoy daylight like this. The owner said Jones was never around in the daytime. Yeah, we can't wait. There. Oh, that was easy. I'll bet you did it, did you? Stay outside the door. If anybody looks as if they were coming in, start swinging. Mm-hmm. And I can get out fast. Right. Hey, listen. From here, you can look right into Haskins' cell and see his work with the same. Maybe Mr. Jones... Maybe. Now, don't forget. If anyone comes, you will sing. <laughs> Fellow like that, Charles, I never I'm going to try to pull him out of it. I asked Manny to let him. Now, 
They told me you wanted to see me. Come in, Aspen. You don't think I'm a crook? No, I don't think you're a crook. And I never did. But if you've been a little more cooperative, it can help. Why should I be? Nobody ever cooperates with me. You don't give them a chance. Chance to what? That's to be friendly. They're all against me. I can't get a break anywhere. Now, now, look. Nobody's against you. That little tough luck, same as a lot of other men just out of the service have had. And you've made a personal issue out of it. Just your own personal reaction to an unpleasant situation. How do you figure that? I can't get a job. I can't get a place where my wife and I can live together. I can't no, no, get... hold on, hold on, hold on. Not so fast. See if we can't do something about this. You know any other men who don't have jobs? Sure, plenty of them. You know any other men who haven't found a place to live? Yeah. But what's that got to do with... Everything. Are all these other men you know convinced that the world is out to do them dirt? Well, no. Not all of them, but I know a couple of them. Well, well, you're... Aspen, you're one of a small minority of guys that take it out and break it. It doesn't help the situation at all. Well, maybe, but I haven't what do you had do? a... I'm an auto mechanic, and a darn good one, too. I'm sure you are. Suppose I find you a job. Can you take it? Sure, I'll take it. And if you and your wife will be satisfied with a furnished room until something better offers, I can fix you up with that, too. Interested? Sure. Wait, if I can have Mary here with me, I, I, I feel a whole lot better. About everything, I guess. Oh, good. Here's $50. That'll help you to pay your wife's transportation and buy whatever things you need. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Get it. Oh, look, Mr. Carter, I, I don't need your money. We'll make that. Somehow. Now, look, if you can share it, it's a loan. I expect you to pay me back when you can. Thanks, Mr. Carter. You're swell. That's Miss Carter, I know. Only trying to help somebody when he can. Why are you doing all this for me? A stranger. Captain, we all owe you, boys. We're in the service. More than we can ever be paid. And if anything I can do will help to pay that debt and get you started on the right road, I want to do it. I'm going to see if you get what's coming to you. Oh, no. That's what you usually say to the crooks you catch. You're going to get what's coming to you. Oh, yes, that's the idea. But this time, I'm talking to a friend. Right, Hudson? Right, Mr. Carter. Oh, gotcha. Friend is a wonderful thing to have, isn't it? How about letting us in on your story for next week? Glad to do it, Phil. My story includes the list of the diamonds stolen from Mrs. Larkin's safe, the print of a pointed shoe in the garden, the telephone number that refused to answer, and the place where diamonds are worth more than anywhere else in the world. And there was excitement, too. When our plane dropped down through the fog trying to locate that ship at sea, oh, I was sure my last hour had come. Clues and excitement, eh? Sounds like a good combination. What's the name of the story next? I call it The Case of the Unwilling Criminal. Next Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jack McGregor, is copyrighted by Speed and Smith Publications Incorporated. Fictive stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics. In the broadcast of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Ron Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy, Matty is played by Ed Latimer, Waldo by Humphrey Davis. Original music is played by George Wright. Script is by Peggy Mayer and Jock McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons living or dead or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations every week at the same time. This is Bill Tarkin saying so long until next week. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. What's the matter? What is it? It's a case for 
Anthony Carter, master detective. Yes, it's the case of the Red Goose Murder. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Listen, Patsy, why do you have to come back to the office at this time of night? I just want to be sure that I finished everything before I left Scubby. With Nick away, it sort of leaves the responsibility on my shoulders. Okay, but shake it up, will you? Uh, the last show starts at 8.40 and it's 8.20 now. Well, this won't take but a minute, Scubby. I simply want to have everything in order for the morning. <sighs> that was a good feed we had, wasn't it? Mmm, that sound was out of this world. Oh, doggone it. I knew we should have stayed away from this place. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Mr. Carter there? Uh, not at the moment. Who's calling, please? Mark Bradley, manager of the Red Goose. When do you expect Mr. Carter? Uh, I can't say exactly. Uh, can I do something for you? I'm his assistant. Well, maybe you could help me out. Well, I'd be glad to if I can. Suppose you tell me why you called. It's like this. My girl singer has just died very suddenly. Oh. She was all right a half hour ago, but when I stopped in her room just now, she was slumped on the floor dead. Looks very hard to me. Well, why don't you call the police? Well, I was going to, but the police visiting my nightclub would hurt business. And she may not have been killed, so I wondered if Mr. Carter... You see, I met him the other evening at one of his lectures. Oh, I see. And I wondered if he wouldn't come over and see what actually happened before I do anything further. If you have any suspicion that her death wasn't natural, Mr. Bradley, you'd better call the police. Yes, I suppose I had that. Uh, who should I call? Can you tell me? Uh... Oh, look, Mr. Bradley, leave it to me. I'll take care of it for you. Oh, well, that'll be fine. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Now what? More trouble? Oh, not for us, Gubby. I have to call Sergeant Madison. Then it's up for the movie. Oh, swell. <laughs> I thought for a minute we were going to miss that western. Oh, no, sir. Homicide. Sergeant Madison. Oh, hello, Sergeant. This is Patsy. Oh, hiya, Patsy. What's up? Uh, Art Bradley, manager of the Red Goose on West 7th Street, says his girl singer is dead, and he thinks maybe she didn't die naturally. You better take a look and see what's what. Nick going over? Oh, uh, no. Nick's out of town for a few days. You'll uh, have to solve this alone, if you can. What do you mean, if I can? <laughs> I solved murder cases before you was born. Just because Nick has helped me out once or twice. I, I apologize, I... Sergeant. Happy hunting to you. Yeah. Bye. Come on, Patsy. We just got time to make it. Right with you, Scubby. Let's see how the movies do it. Just for a change. <laughs> So this is just the way you found her, Bradley, huh? Nothing been touched? Nothing, Sergeant. You see, I opened the door to the dressing room to speak to her, and there she lay on the floor. I shut the door again and called Mr. Carter. Go on. Yeah. Yeah, it's murder, all right. You see this? That mark around her neck, you mean? Yeah. Strangled with a fine cord or a wire, maybe. It's murder, sure. Only dead a few minutes, too. Not more than 15 or 20, I'd say. Uh, how did you happen to come to her dressing room, Bradley? Well, it's payday today, and I brought up the payroll sheet for her to sign. See, I'd given her an envelope downstairs sometime before, but she hadn't signed for it. How much did she make? 150 a week. Hmm, good racket she was in. Made more than I do. Uh, that her handbag on the dressing table? Uh, yes, I think so. Ah, uh, notice it's open. Let's see if she's still got all that dough. Empty, by golly. Not a cent left in it. Hey, that must have been the motive for the killing. Yeah. Robbery. Uh-huh. Beautiful kid like that killed for a measly hundred and fifty bucks. Wait till I get my hands on the guy that did... Yes, you do, Sergeant. Well, Patsy, what are you doing here? And the demon reporter, Scuppy Wilson. Hiya, Maddie. We were almost to the movies when Patsy's feminine curiosity got the better of her. She just couldn't stand the idea of a murder investigation going on without her being here to poke her nose in it. Uh-huh. Well, Patsy, now that you've poked your nose in, you can just poke it right out again. I don't need no help from you. What? Sergeant, I wasn't trying to help. I was just interested. Mm. Uh, is that... Was she killed, Sergeant? Yeah, strangled with a cord or a piece of wire. Oh. 150 bucks stolen out of her handbag. And no more questions, see? Yes, Sergeant. But please, may I just watch? Okay, okay. Just don't bother me. I won't. Uh, Bradley, how many rooms on this floor? Well, there are three rooms on the second floor, Sergeant. My office, this dressing room, and the dark room. All on this side of the building. Dark room? What's that for? Well, that's where the girl who takes the flashlights of customers in the club develops the pictures she takes. Oh. As soon as she gets three or four snaps, she comes up and makes prints for the customers to buy. Then she could have been in and out of this room any time. Well, yes. 
Yes, you could. I want to talk to her. Sure, sure. Hey, if all three rooms are on this side, they must all look out onto that roof next door. Yes, they do. The adjoining building is a one-story flat roof to pair, same length as this one is. Uh-huh. Windows always kept open, are they? Oh, on hot nights like this, yes. You ever see anyone on that roof uh, from this club, I mean? No, I don't ever remember any of our people ever going out there. There's no reason why they... Oh, oh, uh, Marie, just a minute. Yes, Mr. Bradley? Uh, Sergeant, this is Marie, the girl who takes the pictures. You oh. said you wanted to talk to her. Yeah, I do. Uh, Marie, uh, when did you see this girl? This... Uh... Paula! What happened to her? Is she... Yes, Marie. She's dead. She's been killed. Oh, poor Paula. When did you see her last? Her... It was just after her first show, maybe half an hour ago. Was she all right when you saw her? Oh, yes. She, she was as happy as anything. She came upstairs just as I finished printing my last batch of photos. I asked her for an autographed picture of herself. And she said that if I'd take one, she'd autograph it for me. You took one, did you? Yes, I snapped it right then. You developed it yet? No, I was just going to now. Uh-huh. Well, let me see it as soon as you get it done. Might get some ideas from it. I'll have it for you in ten minutes, Arthur. And may I watch you, Marie? I used to take pictures when I was a kid. Uh, I'm Patsy Bowen, Sergeant Matheson's assistant. Yeah, my assistant, my pain in the neck. Oh, Paul, Miss Bowen. I'm glad to have you. Did you ever develop your pictures when you took Oh, them? no, I didn't. <clears throat> eh, women, they give me a pain. Uh, Mr. Bradley, how many employees do you have here in the Red Goose? Why, there are 12 in the kitchen crew, 7 in the orchestra, 5 front men in the lobby and inside, the check girl, flower girl, and Marie. I want to talk to them, all of them. Get them up here. And look, Sergeant, couldn't we sort of take it easy, just talk to them one at a time, kind of private-like? And don't want to upset the whole club. Give a club a bad name, you know. Oh, don't give it another thought, Mr. Bradley. Sergeant Matheson is the soul of discretion and the epitome of integrity. Hey, are you calling me names again? Oh, not at all, Maddie. They were compliments, if you only knew it. Well, pipe down, will you? Okay, Bradley, I'll take it easy. But I want to talk to every one of them. Alone or together, I don't care. Now, come on, let's get started. Hey, Sergeant. Yeah? I've got some news for you. Yeah? What is it, Stubby? Your homicide squad is all through. Just left. Oh, some news. That helps a lot. <laughs> oh, you finished your checkup? Yeah. Yeah, we've accounted for all but two waiters and one of the front men. And all three of them have been with me for years. They can't be mixed up in this. Who says they can't? Anybody could be mixed up in it. But we'll let them go for now. I want to ask that Marie a few questions. She's the one nobody can check up on. Let's go back up and see what she's got to say for herself. If you don't mind, Sergeant, I'll stay down here. You two go right ahead. Ask her anything. All right. Come on, Scully. Right with you, Maddie, old boy. Bradley says she only makes 35 bucks a week. What she can get out of the customers. She could have needed that money. Oh, she seems like a nice kid, Maddie. I don't think she'd be You two? When will you guys learn that appearances don't mean a thing? Oh, there you are. Oh, going to look for you. Marie's been waiting to show you the picture she took of Paula. Here it is, officer. Yeah. You just think she'll never autograph it for me now. Uh, looks happy enough. And look at this one, Sergeant. What? That's the picture Marie took while Paula was singing her last number. See her in the background? Yeah. And see whose picture it is. Hey, that's all worth Van Keppel, the millionaire playboy. Uh-huh. Does he come here often? Oh, about once a month and always with a different girl. Blonde this time. He always gets his picture taken, too, and he's always good for a swell tip. Marie, suppose you and me have a little talk. Now? Yeah. Oh, I have to go down and deliver these pictures before the customers leave. Okay, but make it snappy. Mm. Uh, I'll go with you, just in case. In case of what? Just in case. Wasn't Marie nice, Cubby? She made me extra copies of her last batch of pictures for my scrapbook. Patsy, uh, let me see that picture of Ann Keppel again. Well, sure, Cubby. Ah. Uh... It's a good one, isn't it? Mm. Patsy, how many men do you see in the orchestra of this picture? Huh? Oh, gee, Scubby, they're so far in the background, it's hard to tell. Well, look closely. Mm-hmm. Five, six. Six? Why? Well, Bradley told us there were seven men in the band. The picture shows only six. Huh? I wonder where the other one was. Uh, how are you folks oh. making out? Find anything yet? Oh, uh, Mr. Bradley, you said there were seven men in the band. Yes. Well, this picture taken during the first show tonight shows only six. That's so. Well, let's see. 
Yes, the guitar player, Steve Dawson, isn't there. See, that's funny. Any idea why he wasn't there when this picture was snapped? No, no, I know he was there when the show started, and he's there now. I saw him as I came up. I don't understand it. Scubby. Huh? Do you suppose he could have... Oh, Bradley, uh... Marie tells me this was Paula's last night here. She was going to work for another club beginning tomorrow night. Mm, yes, yes, that's true. Well, how come you didn't tell me about that before? I guess it just slipped my mind, Sergeant. Why was she leaving? Well, she got a better job. More money than I could pay her. That's all. Sergeant, while Paula was singing her last number, the guitar player was missing from the band. Do you suppose he could have come up here and, and done this? A guitar player, huh? Hey, Bradley. Do these musicians have a dressing room here anywhere? Yes, yes, they do, on the third floor. They keep their stuff in lockers up there. How much longer are they going to be playing? Let me see, it's 9.10 now. They break at 9.30. Uh-huh, so we got 20 minutes. Let's have a look at this guitar player's locker. Maybe he knows something about this. Which one is this uh, Steve's locker? It's the third one from the left. Got his name on it. Good. Oh, not locked. That helps. No, nothing in this old jacket. Just the racing form. Hey, what's that written on it? Huh? Oh, Central 8740, Mike. That's probably his bookmaker. Yeah, probably. These boys play the horses pretty heavily, I understand. Oh, Yeah. Then the Steve could need money, maybe, if the nags weren't running for it. Anything else there, Sergeant? No, Patsy, only this old guitar case. Hmm, and that's empty. Gosh, they use nice velvet for the lining, don't they? Well, maybe it was nice once, but it's pretty well shot now, Patsy. Oh, yes. Look at this big tear in it. It... Oh, Sergeant, look at this. What? Money. Hidden in the lining. Right. Seven twenties and a ten. Say, that's what I paid Paula tonight. What? So Steve took it, but... But why did he have to kill her to get it? He could have got it without that. Well, we don't know that he did kill her, Mr. Bradley. The guy that got the money is the guy that did the killing, according to my book. Hey, Bradley, get Steve Dawson up here. We'll see if he can get out of this. Certainly, Sergeant. I'll have him meet you in Paula's room right after the band breaks for intermission. And you can bet I'll keep my eye on him until then. Uh, Mr. Bradley, do you have a phone we could use? Yes, of course. There's one in my office. In the room right next to Paula. Thanks. Come with me, Scubby. I've got a job for you. Anywhere with you, beautiful. Just lead the way. You say you want me to call this number we found on Steve's racing form? Right, Scotty. And ask for Mike. Oh, do you want me to ask him anything special? Oh, no, just say it's Steve Dawson calling. Mm-hmm. Then stroll around and see if maybe he won't let something slip about Steve's finances. Okay, what can we lose? Here goes. Right. Eight, seven. Oh, I wish I knew what this Steve's voice sounds like. Well, just talk a little husky, as if it were a bad connection. Michael never know the difference, I hope. The Purple Pig. Good evening. Oh, hello. Is Mike there? This is Mike. Who's talking? Steve Dawson. Oh, yeah, Dawson. You got the money ready for me? Well, I've got part of it. Part of it? Hey, listen, you know what I told you. You have it all when I call for it tonight or else. The whole 300 bucks you borrowed, and the $100 interest for the two weeks you had it. Well, isn't there some way I can let you have part of it now and the rest Cut of it? Cut the little... stall, Dawson. 400 smackers in a bunch by 1 o'clock tonight for trouble. And I mean trouble. Okay, Mike. Goodbye. So Steve did need money. He sure did. $400 by 1 o'clock tonight and no fooling around either. So Steve might have needed that money so bad he'd be willing to kill Paul to get it. Well, it sure looks that way from where I sit. I wonder if... Gubby, what's that on the floor over under the window? Huh? Oh. Looks like tar. Tar? Yeah. Tar off somebody's heel. Maybe somebody was out on the roof and got some on a shoe. Mr. Bradley said nobody ever went out there. But look here. Here's a smudge on the windowsill, too, Scubby. Do you suppose... Have you got a flashlight, Patsy? Yeah, my my. Well, one's here in my bag. I Quiet. think I'll have a look at the roof outside this window. There might be footprints or something. If you're going out there, I am, too. Give me a hand. Okay, beautiful. Here. Easy now. Huh? There, there you are. Hey. The tar on this roof is soft, isn't it? Yeah, tar roofs generally get that way on warm days. Well, I don't see any prints here anyway. Mm-mm. Well, that doesn't prove anything, of course. 
Soft tar wouldn't hold prints very well. Uh, Scubby, this fireplace must fire escape. Oh, I'm getting all mixed up. Must be the one that goes up to the musician's locker room. Well, it probably is. I remember seeing one when we were up there before. Uh, is Paula's body still in the room? No, they took it away after the homicide boys finished their investigation. Oh, I'm glad of that. I don't... Oh. What's the matter? Oh, I tripped over something. Caught my toe in it. Well, there's nothing here, Patsy. Oh, wait. Huh? Ah, here's an old guitar string. Maybe a trip on that. An old guitar string? And Steve plays the guitar. Funny, isn't it? How do you mean funny? The sergeant says Paula was choked with a cord or a piece of wire. Of course. And finding this guitar string here is no coincidence at all at all. I wonder. What do you mean, I wonder? Huh? Oh, I don't know, Scubby, but that's what Nick always says when he's not sure of something. Oh, his master's voice, huh? Or uh, something like that. Uh-huh. I'm just trying to think the way Nick would do it if he were here. Oh, I wish he were here, too. Oh, I don't know. It looks pretty open and shut to me. I know it does. But that's always a time Nick says to... Scubby, there's one of the musicians just coming into Paula's room. That must be Steve Dawson. Yeah, come on. I want to hear what he has to say. You want me, Sergeant? Yeah, come on in. Have a chair. Uh, mind if we join you, Sergeant? For the love of Pete, what are you two doing out there on the roof? All just looking at the stars, that's all. Do you mind if we come in? I don't mind what you do so long as you don't get my way. Thanks. Help me up, Scubby. Right. Here you are. Now, easy. Watch the sill. Uh, uh, yep. oh, thanks, Scubby. Uh, won't you come in, too, Mr. Wilson? Oh, delighted, Miss Bowen. So kind of you to offer me. Will you two ever stop clowning? This is a murder case. Murder? What have I got to do with the murder? Everything, if I ain't mistaken, Dawson. Where were you at about 8 o'clock tonight? 8 o'clock? Yeah. Playing with the band, same as always. That's so. Patsy, where's that picture you had? Here it is, Sergeant. Thanks. Now then, Steve, show me which one in this picture is you. Why, uh... I don't seem to be there. Uh, when was this taken? During Paula's last number in the first show tonight. Now, where were you? Oh, yeah, I, I remember now. I, I was late coming in. Mr. Bradley said you were there when the show opened. Huh? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I had to step out for a minute. You need money pretty bad, don't you? Money? Yeah. No, I just got paid tonight. I got plenty. You didn't get paid enough to repay the loan Mike made you. 300 bucks plus 100 interest. Hey, what's that? Where did you find that out? Mike told us. Mike? What do you know about Mike? And he's calling for you at 1 o'clock tonight, isn't he? I don't know what you're talking about. No? Then why did you kill Paula Windsor tonight and then swipe $150 from her purse? And don't try to lie out of it. We found the money in that old guitar case in your locker. I didn't kill her. I swear it. Sergeant, we found this on the roof just outside the window. What's that? A string for a fiddle or something. So what? Could be a guitar string, Maddie. What? That settles it, Dawson. You saw Bradley give Paula her salary earlier tonight, so you sneaked off the bandstand during her last number, came up to her room, and tried to sneak her purse. She caught you, and you killed her. No, I didn't kill her. I didn't. You strangled her with a guitar string you happened to have in your pocket and threw it out the window. I didn't kill her. She wasn't even in the room when I took the money. Oh, so you admit you stole the money. Yeah. Yes, I stole it, but I didn't kill her. She was just finishing her song when... When I got back downstairs. No good, Dawson. If you can make a jury believe that, you're a better man than I think you are. But I tell you, I didn't kill Look here, Scott. I took the money. Here's a slip of paper on her dressing table with that same number on it that we just called. C E 8740. Wonder what she was doing with that. Playing the horses, maybe. I doubt it. Sergeant, yes. may I ask Mr. Dawson a question? Oh, you again. All right, ask it. And let me get out of here. Uh, Mr. Dawson, what did you and Paula have in common about the purple pig? Nothing. Mike is the manager there, and he's my bookie. Paula was supposed to start singing there tomorrow night. Mike met her here when, when he came over once to see me and gave her a job. That's all. So that's where she was going. Yeah. Bradley was all burned up about it, but Mike offered her more than Bradley did, so she gave notice. Come on, Dawson. You and I, you and I have a date at headquarters. Look, Sergeant. I'm I... booking you for robbery and possible murder. Now hold out your hand. I got a bracelet for it. But I tell you, I, I just... you don't... tell me don't count. <laughs> Ah, so long, Miss Patsy Carter. If you pick up anything I missed, uh, give me a ring. I'm always happy to hear from you. Why, thank you, Sergeant. Well, Scubby, what do you think? I think if I killed a girl with a guitar string, I'd never throw it out the window where it would be found first thing. Well, that's the way I feel. 
And it seems to me that if Paula did catch Steve Dawson stealing her money, he wouldn't be likely to go fishing around in his pockets to see if he had an old guitar string he could kill her with. Gosh, you're right, Patsy. He'd more likely strangle her with his bare hands. You know, Scuffy, I think the murder had nothing to do with the robbery. I think whoever killed Paula did it deliberately and used the guitar string to throw suspicion on Steve Dawson. Which would account for his leaving it right outside where it would be sure to be found. Uh-huh. And I noticed another thing, too, Scubby, that makes me think Dawson didn't kill her. It's not proof, but it's something to think about. Yeah, what's that? Well, well, when I saw Paula's body, I noticed that she had unzipped her dress as if she were going to take it off. Uh-huh. And her shoes were off, and one of her stockings was unfastened. Which means she'd been in her room long enough to start changing her costume. Good girl. And if she'd been leaning over and fastening her stockings, the killer could have crept up behind her without being seen. Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking. Oh, the poor kid. Just look at this picture of her Marie took tonight. She's laughing and looks as if she didn't have... Scubby. Huh? Look at this picture. Look at the mirror. Hey, there's the figure of a man reflected in the mirror. Huh. From the angle at which the picture was taken... He must have been standing on the roof just outside her window. He probably thought he couldn't be seen, but the camera caught him in the mirror. Oh, it isn't plain enough to make out who it is. No, the picture doesn't show him very plainly. But it's definitely a man in a black coat, and the musicians wear white. So it's not the guitar player. Scubby, this man has a flower in his buttonhole. It's the right buttonhole instead of the left, the way most men wear them. Hey, let's ask Bradley. Maybe he'll be able to recognize who it is. Right, Scubby, come on. We'll show Sergeant Matheson, yes? Uh, Miss Bradley? Yes? Uh, Miss Bradley, we've got something to show you. Can we go somewhere where it won't be so noisy? Yes, yes. Suppose you go right in here. With the door closed, you can at least hear yourself think. <sighs> yes, this is bad. Now, what have you found that would interest me? And Mr. Bradley, this picture was taken this evening in Paula's room right after the first show. Oh, yes, I remember Marie saying that she took one. If you look in the mirror, you can see the reflection of a man standing outside her window on the roof. What? Yes. Yes, I see. It's a pretty pity it isn't a better picture of him so he could recognize who it is. Mr. Bradley, have you ever been out on the roof outside your office? What? No, I never go out there. Then how do you suppose the spot of root tar got on the rug in your office? I wouldn't have the least... It probably I... came off your shoe, Mr. Bradley. I see there's still some tar on the heel. But I did... Your right heel. Say, look here, are you implying that I killed Paula? I am. I didn't realize it until I saw you again just now. But you wear your flower in your right lapel. Practically no one does that. You're a pair of idiots. Why should I kill Paula? I had no motive to do a thing like that. I don't understand about the motive part either, Mr. Bradley, but I'm sure you killed her. Now, see here. Just because I happen to be standing outside Paula's window when Marie snapped that picture doesn't prove that I killed her. Just went out for some air and then went back to my office. She was alive the last time I saw her. You've forgotten one thing, Mr. Bradley. Your fingerprints are on the guitar string you strangled her with. All right, so I killed her. What are you two going to do about it? I'll have you two taken care of so fast. Sit you won't down, even... Mr. Bradley. You can't scare me with that little pop gun. Don't kid yourself, Mr. Bradley. Patsy knows how to use that gun, and she will if she has to. And a twenty-two makes just as good a hole in a man's heart as a forty-five does if it's aimed right the way Patsy aims. Thank you, Scubby. Now, will you sit down, Mr. Bradley? Thank you. Now, Scubby, if you'll call Sergeant Matheson, he can put both the robber and the killer in the same cell. You mean you're going to be at that typewriter for another hour yet? I'm sorry, Scubby, but I have to have a full report ready for Nick when he comes back. Uh, And I want to get it down in black and white while it's still fresh in my mind. Okay, okay, I quit. I'm going home. I'll see you again sometime, I hope. Why, I hope so, Scubby. Give me a ring sometime when you're free. Oh, darn you, Patsy Bowen. If I wasn't in love with you, I'd wring your neck. (laughs) Good night, Scubby, dear. Good night. Poor Scuffy. Let's see. Where was I? Oh, yes. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. This is Manny, Patsy. Oh. 
I just wanted to tell you, Bradley made a full confession. He did? Yeah. Oh, that's good. I'll put that in my report, too. Oh, uh, what'd he say? He said he planned to kill Paula tonight, so he waited on the roof outside her window for her to come back from the floor show. Uh-huh. It was while he was standing out there that he saw Steve Dawson swipe the money out of her purse. Oh. Well, that gave him the idea that he could have a perfect alibi by making Steve the goat for the killing as well as the robbery. Hmm. <laughs> So he went up the fire escape to the musician's room, found an old guitar string Steve had thrown out, and got back outside Paula's window just in time to see Marie snap her picture. I see. And then, while she was changing her clothes, he crept up behind her and strangled her and threw the guitar string out on the roof where it would be found by the police. Or by someone else. Uh, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Uh, Did he say what his motive was? Yeah. He loved Paula, but she turned him down cold. He discovered this. He gave her her first job. He felt she owed him something, but she told him to his face that he had done nothing for her and that she was leaving him for a better job with a better man. Well, that made him so mad, after the fact that he really loved her desperately, that he decided if he couldn't have her, nobody else was going to. Oh, the poor guy. Love is an awful thing sometimes. Yeah. (sighs) Especially if it's not returned. Yeah, but look, Patsy, there's yeah. one thing I don't understand. You said you told him his fingerprints were on the guitar string. Now, what was the idea of that? Well, Nick always has something to clinch the case with, so I happen to think of that. What you want to know a guitar string wouldn't take any fingerprints? Well, sure, Sergeant, I knew it. But Mr. Bradley didn't. <laughs> Well, Patsy, in the absence of Nick, I suppose I'll have to get my hints on next week's show from you. How about it? I sure can do, Carl. The case started when both Vince O'Neill and Otto Lerner found they were married to the same girl. Hmm. What did Nick do about that? Well, he started out to find the girl and straighten things out, if he could. And he found her, I suppose, knowing Nick? Oh, yes, he did. But when he located her finally, she could no longer give him any information. She'd been using a new jar of cold cream and taking a bath. Well... What did that have to do with it? Why, everything. That and the fight on the train. Yeah. All right, all right. What's (laughs) the name of the story? We call it The Case of the Extra Husband. Carter, Master Detective, which is produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Pictured stories of Nick Carter appear in every issue of the Shadow Comics. In the broadcasts of Nick Carter, Master Detective, Lon Clark is starred as Nick, Charlotte Mansim is featured as Patsy, Manny is played by Ed Latimer, Scubby by John Kane. Original music is played by George Wright, script is by Jock McGregor. Any resemblance in these programs to actual persons, living or dead, or to actual places is purely coincidental. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented over most of these mutual stations each week at the same time. This is Carl Caruso saying, so long until next week. Auctions are exciting, but we've never heard of a public auction where the bidding went up, 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 to murder. There's your promise of thrilling mystery entertainment again tomorrow night over these mutual stations on Bulldog Drummond's case called Upholstered for Murder. That's Bulldog Drummond, Mondays on Mutual. This program was heard in Canada through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. for today's thrilling Nick Carter adventure, The Case of the Blue Mink, presented by Old Dutch Clay. As our story opens, Nick and Patsy are entering a large department store very early in the morning. 
Just a minute, I didn't know you were retained by the Fur Protective Association, too. You've probably forgotten, Patsy. It's been years since they've had occasion to call on me. Oh. This new series of fur thefts is really serious, they tell me. And you think this department store is the best place to catch up with them? I do. They've suffered the biggest losses of any store in town so far. Oh. Come on, here's the elevator. Mm-hmm. Oh, four, please. And you think I'll be able to spot it if I see one? Oh, I hope so. As a rule, women who steal furs have a large receptacle of some kind, a bag or bundle in which they can hide the furs while they make the getaway. Also, they have a sort of shifty look about them. You watch closely. You've had a lot more experience with the crooks than most sales girls, I think. Gosh, I hope you're right. I'll try anyway. All right, come on. This is the party button. Miss Cheryl, the detective on this floor, uh, said she... Mr. Carter. That's right. You're Miss Cheryl? Yes. And this is Miss Bone, who's going to be our new sales girl. Oh, well, for a while, anyway. I only hope I can make good. Oh, I'm sure. I hope so, too. Now, if you'll come with me, Miss Bowen, I'll show you where you can leave your things. Oh, j- just a minute, Miss Cheryl. Me. Suppose I see a customer who looks suspicious. What do I do? Call Miss Cheryl if you can, and call me. Then keep your eyes open and don't leave the customer for a second if you can help it. All right, Nick. I hope this works. Wish me luck. Just use your common sense, Patsy. That's always better than luck. So long. <laughs> Carter speaking. Nick, this is Patsy. Oh, Patsy, how do you like being a clerk in a department store now that you've had a full day of it? Nick, I think maybe I have one of those fur thieves here now. She's got a big bundle, just the way you said, and she's acting queer. Well, where are you calling from? I'm using the phone right here in the fur department. She can see me, but she can't hear what I'm saying. Anyone else there? No. The other girl who's usually here at this time had to leave early. Went home at 4.30, and I can't find Miss Cheryl anywhere. There's just this one customer here, and she's... She's acting awful suspicious. All right, Patsy, here's what you do. Stall her along. Let her see everything in the place, but keep her there until uh, I get there. Uh-huh. What does she look like? Well, oh, she's a rather large woman, dressed in a brown suit and dark red hat with a yellowish sort of trimming on it. Has a big bundle done up in wrapping paper and small bundle and a handbag. Oh, she has a large lapel pin in the form of a horse's head. I ought to recognize her from that description. I'll be there in five minutes and have a look at her. Maybe I'll know her when I see her. Right, Nick. Goodbye. <laughs> Are you going to finish waiting on me, Miss? Oh, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. I was trying to get some other fur pieces brought over from my warehouse. They just got some new ones in, and they're beauties. Do you like anything you've seen so far? Well, this next piece isn't bad, but I want something more expensive. Well, suppose you look around and see if you find anything that suits you better. Oh, I think I will. You don't need to wait. I'll let you know if I find anything. Oh, that's quite all right. I have nothing else to do. How nice. I'll tell you what I really like. When I was coming in the store this afternoon, I saw just the next piece I wanted in the left-hand main window. Do you suppose you could get it for me? Oh, I'm sorry, madam, but I'm not supposed to leave the department. But that's exactly what I want. Oh, won't you please see if I can take a look at it? Well, as you can see, madam, there's no other girl here to watch the stock. I couldn't leave just now. But there are no other customers either. Couldn't you make an exception just this one? I'm sorry, madam. Isn't there something here that would suit you as well? You're a smart girl, aren't you? Smart for your own good this time. How do you mean, madam? Just this. Ah! Oh! I wonder if Patsy's mistaken about this woman. It could be, you know. I doubt if she'd call me, Waldo, unless she was sure of a fact. Ah, sure, Nick. But you know women always jump at it. Big bundle, brown suit, red hat, and horse head pin and a lapel. Yes. What are you stopping for? That's the woman Patsy called about. You sure? I am. The description mixes exactly. Come on. But, Nick, you you can't arrest her without some kind of evidence. I'm not going to arrest her, Waldo. We're going to follow her. I want to find out where she goes. Well, then what? Then I'll find some excuse to take a look into that bundle she's carrying. Unless I'm greatly mistaken, they're furs. Stolen furs. When you look at that line at the ticket window, I never knew so many people went to the opera. Just eight fifteen. 
half an hour before the performing starts. Well, why in the world? You had to get us down here so early, I can't see. Well, I had to be here to see if that woman walks through this lobby. Miss Bowen, suppose we're wrong about this. Oh, yes, and Miss Cheryl, how can we be wrong? It was right after that woman left that we found that wad of gum folded up in this envelope, didn't we? Right where she was standing when she knocked me out. And it wasn't there before. Yes, that's true. But we don't we know. We know it's she... a ticket broker's envelope. And calls for four seats for tonight's performance here at the opera, don't we? Yes, and but if the tickets that were in this envelope belong to her, she'll be here tonight. And I'll recognize her. Oh, I wish Mr. Carter were here. Oh, so do I. But I've been calling him for the past three hours and no answer. What? Even Waldo's gone. So we've got to find out for ourselves who's sitting in R2, 4, 6, and 8. I guess you're right, Miss Bowen, but... Oh, I... don't you worry. We'll work it out somehow. Oh, look at that gorgeous fur coat on that girl just going in. Hmm? It's blue. It's blue mink. That's all blue mink. That was stolen from our store. Are you sure? Certainly I am. It's the only one in this city. There are only three of them in the world, and the other two are privately owned at the West Coast. Oh, that mousy little girl wearing it couldn't be a third thing. Well, she's got our coat on. That's all I know. We've got to get inside and get back. You got your ticket? Uh, yes, but how about... I've got nothing. I'm going in. Take it, please. The label Thank and the coat you. will prove it's ours. Oh, no, it won't. The first thing a thief does is to change the lining and the label. You've got to be sure before you accuse her. But I am sure. That's the... Oh, wait a minute. Look where she's sitting. In R4. One of the seats marked on the envelope. Oh, she's a thief. But she's not the one who was in the store. We've got to wait here and see who sits in those other three seats. Then we can capture them all at once. We've been following this dame through all these little towns for a heck of a while now. Do you think she's going anywhere? Well, either she's taking a very roundabout way to where she's going, or she knows we're following her. Well, I'm going to see where she goes if it takes all night. The whole first act is over, and nobody is in those other three seats. And I'm not going to wait any longer. I want that coat. Wait. She's going into the lobby. And she's leaving the coat in the seat. Uh, let's go down and casually take it. Take it? What about her? We want her, too. Come on, follow me. I have an idea. But easy yes. now. No, 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 don't hurry. Oh. Now, let's just sit down here in these end seats. I don't like this. I don't like it either, but I think it's the best way. Well, now what? We'll get up, and the coat goes with us. Like this. Nobody watching. You've got more nerve than anybody I ever saw. Now walk up the aisle. Slowly. Well, don't hurry. Yeah, that's it. Do you see that girl who had the coat? Yes, she's over there at the drink stand. If she should she see... won't. Come over here behind this pillar. Now, here's my idea. She must be one of the thieves, but she's not the one I want. You take the coat back to the store, and I'll wait here and follow her after the show. Maybe she'll take me to the rest of the gang. But she'll make a whale of a fuss when she finds out that her coat's gone. It's a stolen coat, isn't it? Oh, let me look at the label. Oh, this is a parrot. Label. There never was a blooming coat made in Paris. That's what I told you. The thieves changed the label. So it must be the coat stolen from your store. Now, you go ahead. And I'll... Oh, oh, oh. If you want to stay healthy, just walk quietly out the door. That one on the left. Don't look around. Hey, you Start can't... walking and don't run. I'll be right behind you. Come on, Patsy. We better walk. Yes, I... Uh, I guess we better... That's it. Now, you see that dark blue sedan up the street a little way? The tall girl gets in the front seat, the short one gets in back. And no argument. Where... where are you taking us? You'll find out by and by. When you do, you won't like it. Now get moving. Let's pause right here. More from Nick Carter, Matt. 
In the case of the blue mink, Patsy, together with Aris Alicero, floor detective for a big department store, recovered a blue mink coat which had been stolen from the store while Nick and Waldo were on the trail of a suspected fur thief. But just as the girls got the coats back, they were forced into a strange car at the point of a gun, bound for an unknown destination. The time is now a few minutes after intermission. Sergeant Matheson of the Metropolitan Police has just arrived at the office of the Opera House in answer to a strange summons. Oh, oh no. The coat, the beautiful blue fur coat, it is good, it is good. Look, Mr. Helbine, I can't make heads or tails out of this. What's this blue fur coat she keeps talking about? Well, I don't know, Sarge. In a mission after the first act's about over, when this girl sets up a holly, you can hear three blocks away. Yeah? Here's we can make out, she had a blue fur coat that disappeared. She's been practically in hysterics ever since. I thought maybe you could get the story out of her. Yeah, there's some job you wish on me. All right, you, what's your name? Gussie. Gussie Bombwood. All right, Gussie, uh, what happened? I have a blue fur coat. I go outside to get a drink, and when I go back, it is gone. And she will kill me. I know she will. You mean the coat was stolen? No, no, no. I do not steal it. I, I borrowed it to go to the opera. No, 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 no. I don't mean that. Did somebody steal it from you? Yes, they steal it. And now I cannot go home anymore. Did you see who took it? No, it is. God, that is all. I tried to get up here before, but I couldn't get away from a fussy old dame out front. What is it? Is that anything wrong? I'll say there is. Just when intermission is about half over, I saw a man force two girls to walk out of the lobby and get into a blue sedan parked just down the block. And I could see he had a gun in his pocket. And I heard him say, when you find out where you're going, you won't like it. All right, wait a minute, wait a minute. You sure of this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm the doorman here, you know. I was standing just outside. I heard it as plain as I can hear you what now. What kind of a man was he? He was, uh, uh, well, well, he was an, an ordinary man, like a, a businessman. On a pretty hard boy he was. And one of the girls had a, a blue fur coat with her. A blue she... fur coat? Did you say blue fur coat? Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. Why? So two girls stole Gussie's coat and somebody stole them. Can you describe these girls? Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. One of them was a sort of a tallest... Yeah. I want that description of the two girls sent out to all precincts at once. Yes, sir. Let me know as soon as anyone gets a lead on them. Yes, sir. I want my call. I want my call. Now, look here, Gussie. I brought you down here to headquarters so I could talk to you quiet-like without nobody butting in. Now, where'd you get that coat you had? Oh, please, mister. I do not feel it. I, I Hi, just... Make... Oh, hello, Nick. Hey, what you got there? A bunch of fur. Probably all stolen. Patsy called me from the department store where I planted her and told me a customer she had was acting funny. Yeah. So Waldo and I started down to have a look at this woman and met her coming out of the store. I recognized her from Patsy's description and followed her. She led us right to the old factory building where they remodeled the stolen furs. Hmm. I found a workman there relining the coats and brought them both in. Oh, nice going, Nick. You say you're on a stolen fur case yourself? Right, Nick. One with a twist to it. What's the twist? Well, it seems that Gussie wore this blue fur to the opera and a couple of girls stole it from her. And some fellow, the doorman says, was hanging around before, pulls the gun on the two dames and forces them into his car. Looked as if he was waiting for them. Any descriptions of the man? Sure. Girls. Yeah, the doorman at the opera saw the whole thing. One of the girls was about 45, short, kind of blonde gray hair, blue eyes, wore a dark blue suit with Not a... Not a shell. But, you know her, Nick? But the description of the other girl fit, Patsy? But, by George, I believe it would. You think it was, Nick? Heavens. Patsy and Miss Cheryl, the floor detective at the store, doing a little detecting on their own. Maddie, they may be in trouble, real trouble. I remember now. Miss Cheryl told me a blue mink coat was stolen from the store a couple of weeks ago. Somehow they got on the trail of it. And someone got on their trail. Well, we've got to find out about this in a hurry. Gussie, whose coat was it? Do I got to tell you? She killed me, sure. You certainly do got to tell me, and quick. It was the lady I worked for. She always gets new fur coats all the time. So I just took this one to go to the opera with. Anybody home when you left? There was a little girl, Virginia. She, maybe, she could see me. Does she know where Father and Mother were tonight? Oh, yes. Her mother left her the telephone number. It was in Oakdale. Hey, Maddie, let me have that phone with you. Yeah, what are you going to do, Nick? 
to find out if this Virginia called her mother to tell her Gussie had taken a coat. From what Gussie says, it's very likely she did. I thought we saw Gussie go out with a coat. Yeah, but Nick, I... Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Operator, this is Nick Carter. I want to find out if a call was made tonight from the Dutton residence in Cedar Ridge to someplace in Oakdale. Yes, that's right. For the love of Pete, Nick, what's the connection between this kid and a guy kidnapping Patsy? Look, Matty. Gussie said Mrs. Dutton was always getting new fur coats, didn't she? Yeah. Well, that looks like part of the fur gang. So if this kid phoned her mother that Gussie was wearing her new fur coat, her father, who's probably the head of the gang, drove into town as fast as he could to get it back before it was spotted as a stolen coat. Why, sure. Well, got to the opera house after the show started, so he hung around. That was where the doorman saw him. Yeah. He probably missed Gussie in the crowd at intermission, but saw Patsy and Miss Cheryl. So he took them and the coat, which is what he really wanted. Well, for the hey, love of... Wait, wait, wait. What's that, operator? Well, there was. About 7.15, huh? Thank you. That's all. Let's see. Dutton got the call around 7.15. He could have driven down in about an hour and a half. We should get him to the opera house after the show started. Yeah, that checks. Yeah, but look, Nick, if Dutton has got the girls, he certainly wouldn't take them to his home. And where would he take them? And what would he do with them? Matty, that's what we've got to figure out, and fast. <laughs> What a dirty old place this is. If it was going to lock us up somewhere, he might have picked a pleasanter place than this. If we only knew where we were, maybe we could figure out some scheme to let somebody know. Huh? If we could only... Oh, there he comes back. Oh, I hope well, it's you not... You weren't alone in this, huh? How do you mean? You told somebody else about the coat, did you? Well, no one... Oh, could... yes. Yes, we did. Right after we found it. Then who'd you tell? Speak up. I, uh... I called Nick Carter and gave him all the details. Yeah, I thought so. Somebody's been here and taken all the furs and working the storage vault in the basement. Took my tailor away, too. Just called his home and they haven't seen him. Don't know what's happened to him. Why don't you tell this, Carter? And no funny business. Oh, well, uh, you, you, you see, we, we told them that... Listen, you, stop stalling. If you want a little while longer, give us the details and make it snappy. Well, the girl who had the coat at the opera gave us your names. And when I called him, I told him your names and where you live. <sighs> Where do I get my hands on that gussy? I'll wring her neck like I was a chicken, stealing my coat and blabbing everything she knows. Well, what do we do now, Eddie? Well, let me think. I... Yeah, I have it. Young lady, you're going to call your Nick Carter on the phone. There's an old abandoned hunting shack out in the woods about two miles off Route 47. You're going to tell him you've caught the fur thieves and that you're stuck on them without any chance. <laughs> While Nick is conferring with Matty at headquarters, Waldo sits in Nick's office, waiting for the next development in the case. You're in Nick Carter's office. Nick Carter's first assistant, Waldo McGlynn, speaking. Is Nick there, Waldo? This is Patsy. Oh, no, Patsy, he ain't. Uh, can I help you? Put him on, will you? I tell you, Nick ain't here. Do you want me to... Hello, Nick. Oh, I'm so glad you're there. This, this ain't Nick. This is... Yes, uh, Nick, it's all right. We've caught the fur thieves we were after. But this ain't Nick, Patsy. This now, is listen what... carefully. Very carefully. This is extremely important. You must be crazy, but I'm listening. We chased the thieves way out of town in Miss Cheryl's car. And just as we finally caught up with them, we ran out of gas. Nick, I want you to come out and bring us all back to town... I don't dare leave the thieves to look for any gas because they might get away. But we caught them thieves ourselves. We... Now, get these directions straight, Nick. Better write them down. Write them down. Now, we're near an old hunting shack on a small side road that turns off Route 47 about three miles north of Woodmere. Three miles north of Woodmere. You got that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the shack is about two miles in off the main road. Huh. We'll be waiting for you inside the shack. Hurry up, will you, Nick? It's awful lonely out here. You better hurry. He's awful worried about you, Pat. Yes, about two miles. But we caught them, Nick. Hallelujah. We caught the crooks. Bye. Well, if that ain't a crazy... I gotta get this to Nick immediate here. Hallelujah. We caught the crooks. Uh, that ain't the silliest thing I ever... Sergeant Matheson. Oh, this, this is Waldo. He's Nick there. Yeah, sure. Hold on. Here, Nick, it's Waldo. Yes, Waldo? 
Uh, Nick, I just got the doggondest message from Patsy. From Patsy? Where is she? Well, now, now, keep your shirt on while I tell you this. She kept calling me Nick. I told her it was Waldo, but Yes, she yes, said, yes, Waldo. What did she say? She said she got the thieves and ran out of gas at an old hunting shack. About two miles out on a small road that turned off Route 47 about three miles above Woodmere. And she's waiting there for you. Did you say anything else? No, that's all. Do you, do you know how she ended up? Well, naturally not. What was it? She says, Hallelujah, we caught the crooks. Hallelujah? You sure? Well, sure, I'm sure. I ain't if you know. Thanks, Waldo. Goodbye. Grab your hat and your gun, Mary. We're going places. <laughs> You're uh, sure the whole thing is a frame up, Nick? Of course I am, Mary. I told you when Patsy wants me to know she's in trouble, she uses the word hallelujah somewhere in the conversation. Uh, we set that up years ago. Probably the guy who kidnapped her made her send the message, huh? Exactly. He thinks he set a trap for us and that we'll walk into it. Well, we'll string the trap on him instead. <laughs> changed your plan? No. They'll let the car stop outside the shack. And when they start walking in, I'll pick them off. They won't have a chance. Not with this moon. Oh, won't you they please? They can see me and I can see them. Oh, crying God, God. God. Hey, hey, what's up? Hey, you? Yes, Patsy. Are you all right? Oh, yes, Nick. He was going to kill us after he shot you. Hey, you shut up. Shut up, will you? How about the guy, Nick? Looks pretty bad, Matty. How do you live to pay the penalty, I'm happy to say. And after I finished talking to you, or rather to Waldo, he took us to that shack to wait. Oh, Nick, I was scared. She certainly was, Mr. Carla, but not so much on her own account. She was afraid that you might get hurt. I was afraid somebody might get hurt, maybe killed, and I didn't want it to be... Uh, the wrong person. Well, that's highly commendable of you. Oh, just think. If Guffy hadn't borrowed the blue mink, Patsy and I might not be here. Oh, please. That's not exactly a cheerful thought. Patsy, there's one thing I still don't understand. When you two found that ticket broker's envelope with the seats marked on it, why didn't you go to the police instead of trying to handle it yourselves? Well, well, to tell the truth, Nick, I just didn't think of it. Hmm. I suppose it's because, well, as a rule... We don't go to the police for help. They usually come to us. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is a copyrighted feature by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick, with Charlotte Manson featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer, Waldo by Humphrey Davis. Script written by Jock McGregor, storyline by Peggy Mayer. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use Old Dutch Cleanser. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Sending that imitation diamond in the crook's pocket is certainly proof that he was in on the robbery. Certainly would be, Patsy, if I had found it there. But you must have. I saw you take it out of his pocket. You did. I was trying to start something. Well, oh, I don't understand you at all in this case, Nick. You're doing the craziest things and not getting anywhere. Ah, that's where you're wrong, Patsy. I expect to catch the robbers before I go to bed tonight. And that's a promise. Now, the case of the imitation robbery. Today's exciting adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. As our story opens, Nick and Patsy are in the jewelry shop of Nelson Stroud, talking to the proprietor. It is late fall, and there's a hint of snow in the afternoon air. The Jewelers Protective Association tells me you reported that you're being systematically robbed, Mr. Stroud. It must have been going on for weeks, Mr. Carter. So many of my best unset stones have been stolen. Then it wasn't from hold-ups, Mr. Stroud? Hold-ups? No. It's a lot slicker than that. Oh. You see, it's like this. 
Day before yesterday, Saturday, I happened to see an imitation diamond in the tray with a dozen or so real diamonds. So I became suspicious. Uh-huh. You say you just happened to spot the forty stone? Yes. So yesterday, Sunday, I came down to the store and checked through all the trays. And I found 29 paste stones mixed in with the real ones. Well, how much will the 29 diamonds that are missing be worth, Mr. Stroud? At a rough estimate in the neighborhood of $65,000. Golly. And you think somebody brought 29 imitation gems in here and walked out with 29 real ones? I know it. Well, how does it happen none of your clerks spotted the fakes? These fake stones are too good, Mr. Carter. That's the trouble. Here, look at this one. Why, Nick, that looks genuine to me. Yes. It is an excellent job, I must admit. A close inspection would, of course, reveal them at once. But about all the clerks do as a rule is to run their eye rapidly over the tray after serving a customer and check the number of stones before putting them away. Mm-hmm. Well, do you have any ideas how this substitution might have taken place? I don't think. I know. Some crook or gang of crooks has come in here time after time asking to see our unset stones and palm the real ones, leaving the fakes in the tray. Oh, but that would have taken weeks, Mr. Stroud. It couldn't be done too often. And even then, the criminal will be taking a long chance of not being recognized. But it must have been done that way. Oh, not necessarily. No, it looks to me as if the crook or crooks had inside help in this. Nonsense. All three of my clerks are fine men with good references. That remains to be seen. Show me what you have here in the store in the way of burglar alarms. Of course. You see, there are counters on each of the three sides of the store. Each counter has an alarm buzzer under it, operated by pressing a button with your foot. Then the vault where the unset stones are kept has a special alarm on it. Well, how is that operated, Mr. Stroud? Well, if the dial that works the combination is turned back to ten first, it automatically rings an alarm. They're all connected direct to police headquarters and the protective association. Uh-huh. And the unset diamonds are kept in that vault? Yes. Here, I'll show you. There. You see, this vault is filled with little trays, only about an inch high. Each tray is numbered to identify the different grades of stone. Oh, golly, Nick, look at that. There must be a hundred trays in there. Just about. Mr. Stroud, I think I have a plan that will test the reaction of your clerks. Tomorrow afternoon should be a good time. I'll let you know definitely the exact hour, because I'll need your cooperation. Of course, Mr. Carter. Uh, what are you planning to do? It's a little unconventional, but it's been done before. Now, here's the plan. About four o'clock, I'll send Miss Bowen here. And Nick says he's ready for the test. So will you please disconnect the burglar alarm system? Uh, you're sure this is necessary, Miss Bowen? Well, you're interested in having these thefts stopped as soon as you can, aren't you? Of course. Very well, I'll make the necessary arrangements. How long before Mr. Carter will be here? From what he said, he should be along any minute now. Something I can do for you, sir? Oh, oh a gun. Put your hands on the counter. All three of you. And keep them there. But I... This I... is a stick-up. No monkey business. Hands on the counter there, you with the black hair, and quick... That's better. Now, you two, get her on the other side of the store with Gola Locks. Now, look here, you can't... Shut up, Goldie. And keep your trap shut. All right, you other guys, get her with Goldie, I said. And walk slow. So nobody looking in will think there's anything wrong. Okay. Now, you, Baldy. Me? Yeah, you. Open up that vault. I... I can't. I don't know the combination. Open up vault, I said. But I said For the I... last time, will you open well, up that... All right. All right. Now, haul out all those trays so I can get at them. Wait a minute, Baldy. Don't be picking out just a tray with the cheap stones. I want them all. Yes. All right. Okay, that's enough. You can put them back now. What? All right, Mr. Stroud. Well, Mr. Carter, I hope you learned something. 
Yes, all three of your clerks passed with high marks, Mr. Stroud. Baldy here turned the vault dial the wrong way, which would set off the alarm. The other two stepped on their alarm buzzers. I watched their feet. Then if the alarms had been connected, there would have been three separate alarms rung in headquarters, Nick. Right, Patsy. Oh, by the way, Mr. Stroud, you better connect the alarm system again, just in case. Mr. Stroud, what's been going on here? I don't get it. Uh, this is Mr. Nick Carter of the Jewelers Protective Association. He just wanted to be sure you boys were on your toes in case of real trouble. Oh. Uh, you through now, Mr. Carter? All through, thanks. Then let's get back to my office. Uh, you can put the trays back, boys. That's all right. This all seems very silly to me, Mr. Carter. Did you really learn anything from that little stunt? I did. Who's the young fellow with the blonde hair? That's my nephew, Bill Devlin. And the middle-aged man with the bald head? Well, that's Arthur Ryan. Been here for six years. Darn good clerk. And who's the good-looking chap with the black hair slicked down so neatly? Chap by the name of Robert Hill. He's new here, but as far as I know, he's absolutely okay. I called the firm he's been with, and they gave him excellent references. Maybe so. But he instinctively reached for a gun and a shoulder holster when I first drew my guns. Nothing against him yet, of course, but I'd keep an eye on him. Well, maybe he's used to having a job where he needed protection, Nick. Entirely possible, Patsy. I wouldn't want to say until I knew more about him. You said yesterday you thought this was an inside job, Mr. Carter. Well, I think now that you're wrong. What do you mean, now? I'll show you. Here. I found this under the silverware counter this morning. That's so... Well. Well, what is it, Nick? What a chewing gum, Patsy. And there's a diamond inside it. Diamond in a hunk of chewing gum? Yes. It's an old game. Crook comes in, palms an unset stone, and when the clerk's not looking, sticks the stone to the underside of the counter in the chewing gum. Huh. Then, a few days later, he comes in, scrapes the gum off, and walks out. <laughs> that way, if the stone's missed when he steals it, he can submit to a search and there's nothing on him. And I bet that's how all 29 of my stones disappeared. It's possible, Mr. Stroud, but I doubt it. I still think it's an inside job. And I'll tell you what... Uncle Max. Uncle Max, you said to let you know if anybody I'd seen before came in to look at unset stone. That's right, I did. Why? Well, there's a man out there now who's been in at least twice before. Ryan's waiting on him. Any way I can get a look at him from in here, Mr. Stroud? Uh, yes, I have a secret panel here that lets me watch the store without being seen. All right here. Good. You mean that tall, thin man in the brown suit, Devlin? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Oh. I think, Mr. Stroud, I'll have a talk with that gentleman. Oh, now be careful, Mr. Carter. I, I, I don't want a lawsuit on my hands. Well, Morgan, interested in diamonds? Huh? Oh, Nick Carter. Mind stepping into the office a minute, Morgan? I'd like to have a word with you. Look, why don't you mind your own business, Carter? I'm minding mine. I'd like to help you mind yours. This won't take but a minute. And I think you better do as I suggest. Okay, copper. If there's any funny business, I'm telling you. David Morgan. Right in here. Look, I don't know what right you got to drag me in here like this. A lot of diamonds have been taken out of this store lately without being paid for. You've been in here several times to look at unset stones. So I just want to see if any of those stones have stuck to your fingers. Wouldn't be the first time. Boy, you cheap two friends. Now, look here, Carter. Carter. We simply can't go We can in customers. this case. Morgan's long record at headquarters makes me very suspicious. All right, stand still, Morgan. While I see what you have in your pocket. I'll sue you for this. I'll sue the store, too. See if well, I don't. Well, what's this? Huh? Here in your vest pocket. A diamond. So he is. I, I, I... I never saw that before. I swear. Now, will you confess, or must I? I never saw that before. Look, there's something wrong, I tell you. Yes, something is. Let me see that stone. Hmm. Certainly. Here you are. Uh, I thought so. It's a fake. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. And I still say I never saw that thing before. But it don't make no difference now, see? You can't arrest a man for having an imitation diamond in his pocket. No, Morgan, you're quite right. You Hmm. can't. You can go now. I'm going fast enough, but I ain't through with this. I'm going to sue this poor. You'll hear from my lawyer later. But you can't let him go like this. Genuine or imitation, he's at the bottom of this. Yes, I think you're right, Mr. Stroud. Then why did you let him go, Nick? Finding that imitation diamond in his pocket is proof, isn't it? Well, yes, it would be if I'd found it there. What? You mean you didn't? No, I put it there and then pretended to find it. What? The fake stone Mr. Stroud showed me yesterday. I hope you know what you're doing, Mr. Carter. This is all Greek to me. Yes, Nick. What in heaven's name are you doing? 
playing games? Why, Patsy, you know me better than that. Well, I thought I did. Oh, by the way, Mr. Stroud, didn't you tell me none of your clerks knew of these thefts? That's right. I left the fake stones in the trays where I found them. Well, if you were so sure this wasn't an inside job, why didn't you want the clerks to know about the loss? Well, you see... Well, it was really only when I found that wad of chewing gum under the counter that I finally decided it was an outside job. Hmm. I see. Well, in that case, I believe I'll search your clerks before they go home tonight. What? May turn up something. What time do you close? 5.30, but I... 5.30 now, so... Or 5 o'clock now, rather, so I guess I'll wait, if you don't mind. Oh, I don't like it, but I guess you'll do it anyway. Go ahead, wait if you want to. Better take your overcoat off and make it pretty warm in here. Thanks, Patsy, I'll do that. Might as well be comfortable as we can while we're waiting. <laughs> be through in the store by now. I told them to come in here when they were ready to go home. I can wait. I still say this is the craziest way to find out. You wanted to see us, Uncle Max? No, I did. Gentlemen, a number of unset diamonds have been stolen from the store recently. Mr. Shroud says you're all okay, but just as a matter of routine, I'd like to search each of you before you leave tonight. Any objections? No. All right, Devlin, I'll take you first. Yes, you're clean. Now you, Hill? Yes, sir. Nothing on you? Hmm. All right, Ryan, you're next. Well, I don't know. Well. Right? You can go now. Thank you. Uh, All right. Oh, Nick, that was the silliest exhibition I've ever seen you give. Why, those men could have a dozen stones concealed in their clothes. He'd never have found them. The girl's right. That was no search at all, and you didn't really think one of them would be fool enough to try to walk out of here tonight of all nights with a diamond hidden on him? Perhaps I was looking for something else. Huh? Something else? Did you find it? I won't know till later, Patsy. Oh, for goodness sake. Uh, I'll go and see that everything's locked up for the night. If you'll excuse me. I got the names and addresses of those clerks before I go. Oh, where did I put my pencil? Had it earlier this afternoon? Maybe it's in your overcoat pocket now. Uh, maybe. I'll have a look anyway. Well. Nick, you're looking in the wrong coat. That's Mr. Stroud's coat. Yes. So I've just discovered. And look here. Diamonds. Two beautiful diamonds. Yes. And these aren't ponies. They're the real thing. They were in Mr. Stroud's coat? Yes, Betsy. Two genuine unset diamonds in Mr. Stroud's overcoat pocket. Now back to the case of the imitation robbery. Today's exciting adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. It's a few minutes after Nick found the two real diamonds in the overcoat pocket of Mr. Stroud, the jeweler, and Stroud has just returned to his office and is locking up the store for the night. Anything else, Mr. Carter? If oh, I... uh, yes, just one more thing, Mr. Stroud. Will you give me the addresses of your three clerks? There they are on that phone list. Oh, yes. Copy them down for me, will you, Patsy? Of course, Nick. And will you let me look in your vault once more before we go, Mr. Stroud? I suppose so. But I'd like to get home sometime tonight. You'd like to stop the robberies, too, wouldn't you? Naturally. By the way you're going at it, I can't... There you are. Now what? I'm going to pull out certain of these drawers of unset stones. This, this, these two, this, and these two. Now, Mr. Stroud, will you tell me, please, whether or not there are any phony stones in any of the drawers I have not pulled out? Let me see. I know you've pulled out every tray that has a fake stone in it. How did you know? I have a good memory, Mr. Stroud. You can close the vault now. Ready to go, Nick? Yes, Patsy, all set. Good. How could you tell which trays had the phonies in them, Mr. Carter? Those seven trays are the ones Ryan pulled out first when I pretended to rob the place. Well, that shows he's a good man. Wanted to get rid of the bad stones and keep the good ones if he could. Well, that's really clever. Now, look, I don't want to hurry you, Mr. Carter, but I'd like to get my dinner. If you need me, you can reach me at Deal's Restaurant. I eat there every night. Well, that is, unless you'd care to join me. No, thanks, Mr. Stroud. I have something else to do right now. Come on, Patsy. All right with you, Nick. After you, Mademoiselle. Oh, 
Merci, monsieur. Expect any results in the near future, Mr. Carter? I do. In the very near future. I hope so. Well, good night. Good night. Get in touch with me when you have anything definite. Good night. <laughs> oh, it certainly doesn't sound very optimistic, Miss. And I can't say I blame him much. The way you've been acting today. It isn't like you, Nick. Well, this case isn't like any other either, Patsy. It's always a good idea to pitch your methods to what you're trying to do. Well, good night. I'll see you in the morning. But you're not going back to the office? No, indeed. I expect to finish up this case this evening. I have something else I want to do tomorrow. This apartment of mine is the darkest hole. Wish they'd put that dog on light switch. Dog right on the lights. Uh, that you, Morgan? Yeah. Oh, she gave me a scare. For a minute, I thought you were a cop. So you're getting scared at last, are you? It's about time. Been trying to tell you we can't keep this up forever, but no, you're new at all. Now look where we are. What are you doing here? Why'd you come here to my apartment? I came here for my share of eyes. I'm through. Washed up. After what happened in Stroud's office today, I ain't sticking what around. What did happen? Now that copper Nick Carter searched me. But so what? He didn't find anything, did he? That's the beauty of the way we got this racket fixed. They can search any time they like and find nothing. Yeah, you know so much, Ryan. Carter did find something. Why? He found a fake diamond in my vest pocket. You blundering fool. Why the devil did you have one? I the didn't have it. Carter planted it on me. I was framed. Framed? Why? I don't know. But I do know he wouldn't have framed me if he wasn't on me. Now on, I'll be washed like a hawk, so I'm leaving town on the first train out. Anybody follow you here? Nah, not a chance. A bloodhound couldn't have trailed me the way I came here. And I climbed up the fire escape in the back, and I got in through the kitchen window. And I ain't had a light in here either, in case somebody might be watching from the next door roof, maybe. I hope you're right, Morgan. Don't worry. You're in the clear. But I ain't, see? So I'm getting out of here as soon as I get my half of the stuff. Can you find it in the dark? Sure. I can find it all right with the lights off, but a dozen detectives couldn't find it with the lights on. In the base of this lamp right here. Very cleverly concealed in a hollow special wall. They're packed in cotton so you can shake the thing, not... Nah, here. come on. Never mind the lecture. Let's have the stones. I've got to get them first, don't I? There they are. Hey, count them. Let me see. There ought to be 28 of them. 29 we got away with when we left in the gum for a phony clue. Yeah, I may have to have some light to see how we're dividing him. I'll get a if blanket. If you want some light, no. I'll give it what? to you. <laughs> How's this? Nick Carter. How the juicy... Now let my gun scare you. You play pretty, I won't have to use it. But if you get rough, so do I. <laughs> okay, Carter. What do you want? So a dozen detectives couldn't find the diamonds, have all these? I thought you'd have them hidden away pretty well, so I've been waiting in the bedroom until you found them for me. You mean... You mean you was here when Morgan, I... Morgan, you passed within two feet of me when you came in. I wish I'd have known you was here. I don't doubt it. Well, boys, that was a very interesting conversation I heard you two having. You can put it in writing later when we go down and see Sergeant Matheson. You'll be very happy... Get him, Ryan! Yeah. Oh, you want to play? Yeah. All right. Come on, boys. What? No, didn't want to shoot you guys if I didn't have to. And it looks as if I didn't have to. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Hi, Matty. Nick, got a couple of crooks for you. You want them for a Christmas present? Sure, I want them. Tell me more, Santa Claus. Tell me more. All right, send a squad car up to 1753 North Garvin Street. <laughs> Now we return to Nick Carter. As we pick up our story, we find Nick and Patsy at headquarters in Matty's office. Mr. Stroud, the jeweler, has come down to identify the stolen gems. You're sure these are the diamonds stolen from your store, Mr. Stroud? 
As near as I can identify unset stones, I'm sure. Uh, uh, but there are only 28 here. 29 were stolen. Well, you forget the one you found in the wad of chewing gum. Oh, of course, Mr. Carter. I didn't think of that. Did those two men confess, Sergeant? Yep. We've got everything down in black and white now. Nick knocked all the fight out of them. <laughs> <laughs> I seem to have been all wrong in my opinion of your ability, Mr. Carter. I apologize. I thought you were just fooling around today. Well, I almost thought that myself. But <laughs> knowing Nick, I should have had more faith in him. Look, Nick, don't fool around without he's got some idea in mind. But you have to admit, Mr. Carter, you would have been stuck if this accomplice of Ryan's, this Morgan fellow, hadn't come into the store while you were there. Well, that was a help, certainly, but I could have got along without him. How do you suppose I happened to be in Ryan's flat in the first place? Well, I suppose you trailed him there. Oh, wrong, Mr. Stroud. I beat him there. I was waiting for him when he got there. But how could you do that? Nick, you ain't told me the whole story now. The fake holdup told me all about that clerk, Ryan. Well, go on, Nick. Give out. No secret. Yeah, come on. Well, I told you that Ryan started pulling out certain trays of diamonds from the vault before I made him pull them all out. Uh-huh. Later, when I pulled out those same seven trays, Mr. Stroud, you told me those were the trays that contained all the phony stones. Yes, that's right. I told you that he was trying to be sure that if any diamonds were stolen, it would be the fake ones. But you forget... At that time, none of the clerks were supposed to know there were any fake stones. So he could only know where they were if he himself had put them there. Why, of course, Nick. <laughs> it's so simple when you tell it. His real idea was to get rid of the phony stones before they were discovered, if possible. But it couldn't have been Ryan. You searched him and found nothing. <laughs> Mr. Stroud, you really wouldn't expect him to walk out of there with a diamond on him when he knew he might be searched any time, would you? No. No, no, he was too clever for that. Well, for the love of Pete, who did take them out of the store? It couldn't have been Morgan, could it? That would have been just as dangerous. Quite right, Mary, quite right. Neither of them carried them out. Huh? Mr. Stroud took the stones out for them. Now, look here, Carter, if you're insinuating that I... Easy, Mr. Stroud, I'm not saying you knew you were taking them out. Huh? Now, here's what happened. Morgan came in the store every few days, always being sure Ryan was free to wait on him. He gave Ryan the phony stones. Ryan substituted them for the genuine ones, then put the real stones in your overcoat pocket. What? what? Nick, you mean those stones you found there this afternoon were put there by Ryan? Exactly, Patsy. What? When Mr. Stroud had dinner in that restaurant he said he went to every night, he hung his overcoat on a hook. Yeah. And Morgan, an expert pickpocket, Pick the stones out of his overcoat pocket. Oh. In that way, neither Morgan or Ryan had the stones on them at a time when they might be searched. Huh. No wonder I never felt them in my pocket while I was on my way to the restaurant. You wear heavy gloves, don't you? Oh, yes. And you put them on as soon as you leave the store, don't you? I do. Well, see, practically no risk. <laughs> Diamonds aren't very big in an overcoat pocket, you know. Well, I'll be doggone. Oh, by the way, Mr. Stroud, here are two diamonds that I found in your overcoat pocket this afternoon well, while I was waiting in your office. Morgan must have been surprised when he searched your pocket for them tonight and didn't find them. Well, thanks, Mr. Carter. You seem to have taken care of everything. If Morgan hadn't waited to try to get those diamonds from you as you left tonight, I might not have been able to beat him to Ryan's room. But he did. And I did. Uh, there's one more thing, Nick. You said when you held up the store that Ryan turned the dial on the vault the wrong way so as to set off the alarm. Well, why should he do that if he really wanted the fake stone stolen? Patsy had nothing to lose. He knew the other two men had already pressed the foot buzzers and sounded the alarm that way. And it was safer for him to do it the way he ought to in case either of the other clerks was watching him. Uh, oh, I got to uh, admit it, Nick. You're a wonder. I suppose you planted the fake stone on Morgan like you did so as to put him on his guard and start him worrying, huh? That's the answer, Matty. Oh, oh. There's an old saying, you remember. When thieves fall out, honest men get that chance. Yeah. Well, these two thieves decided to fall out when they saw what was up. And Mr. Stroud, an honest man, gets his diamonds back. Which is as it should be. Quite a tale, Nick. Uh, what happened to Ryan and Morgan? They were brought to trial, Bob, and sentenced to spend many long years behind bars. And believe me, they'll be a lot older than they are now when they get out. <laughs> Glad to hear it. But what about the clerk who reached for his gun during the fake holdup? Did you ever find out about him? Oh, yes, yes. It seems that he used to be in the state police out west when he was younger. Really very simple when you know the answer, as Patsy says. Now, what can you tell us about the adventure that Old Dutch Clancy is going to bring us next week? 
A Bob, it's the story of what... For Chasing Dirt presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. But Nick, with the man you're chasing murdered and the stolen diamonds gone from their hiding place, how can you possibly hope to carry on? That's simple, Patsy. We just follow the clues. Clues? What clues do we have? The gold-headed cane, the angle from which the knife was thrown. And the ink spots on the bills. Of course. When we put them all together, they spell the end of our search. But there's no time to be lost. We dock in less than two days. Now, the case of the gold-headed cane. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. As our story starts, we find Sir Armand Coleman and his servant Gig being shown through the Filbert Diamond Mine, one of South Africa's biggest. I say, Mr. Hopkins, it's awfully decent of you to take your time to show us through the mine. Being general manager of a mine like this must be quite an undertaking. Yes, Sir Armand, it keeps me pretty busy. But you're, we're always happy, you know, to show visitors how diamonds are mined. Yeah, but how do you know one of these visitors won't walk off with some of the diamonds? You uh, don't seem to have any guards here. But we don't need them, Sir Armand. Before you leave the mine, you have to pass through a special exit gate where an X-ray machine shows the attendant whether or not you have any diamonds on your person, no matter how cleverly concealed. Oh, I see. Clever idea, then. <laughs> oh, I mean, look at all the diamonds spread out on the table, Sir Armand. Why, Jules, they are beauty. Yeah, those are some of the choice samples of diamonds found in this mine. May I look at them, Mr. Hopkins? Uh, uh, closely, I mean. Why, certainly. Now, Mr. Hopkins, could I ask you a question, please? Yes, of course. Uh, what is it, Gig? Uh, this picture here on the wall, is that the mine we've just been through? Yes, Gig, it is. You see, we came in here, went down through this way, then turned here, came back along here. We're now standing in this room here. Blimey, we've had some walk, ain't we? <laughs> uh, where's this exit gate you've been telling us about? Well, you see this passage? leads out of this room. Well, the gate is right here, just around the corner. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. That sure is some map. <laughs> well, Sir Armand, you ready to leave? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, through this way, please. This has been a most instructive... Oh, oh, oh. Found it, my ankle, and I dropped my cane again. Oh, I'll get it, sir. Oh, here it is. Your ankle hurt much, sir? No, it's all right, Gig. Let's get on. Uh, your bad leg troubling you, Sir Armand? A uh, little, yes. Must be this long walk we've had. Well, here we are. Here's the exit gate. Uh, you go first, Gig. Yes, sir. <laughs> Stop under the archway until the attendant says he's satisfied you're not carrying any diamonds out. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Glad I didn't try to get away with nothing here. <laughs> Okay, you can get out, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Couldn't find nothing on old gig, eh? <laughs> you next, Sir Armand, if you will, please. Mm, of course. There's a queer sensation. Oh, I'll hit my ankle again. Here, I've got the cane, Sir Armand. I'll keep it till you come out. Eh? Oh, very well, gig. You're all right, sir. You may go. Well, thank you. You have to go through this too, Miss Hopkins? Oh, yes, indeed. Everyone does from the owner down. Take no chances on anyone. Okay, Mr. Well, Sir Armand, uh, that's about all. It's been very interesting, I assure you. Thanks no end, Mr. Hopkins. Been just fine, Mr. Hopkins. We go out this door here. That's right. You'll find your car just outside. Goodbye. Goodbye, and thanks again. Did you get those diamonds, Sir Armand? I certainly did. The trick worked like a charm. And Mr. Hopkins will never know I got the idea from one of the stories he told us. <laughs> that's good, sir. <laughs> Come on, Gig. Let's get back to the hotel and pack. In 12 hours, we can be on the boat, headed for the States, and a life of luxury. Uh, take this message, Miss Gerald. Yes, sir. 50 carats of first quality diamonds stolen from Filbert Mine and daring robbery. Suspect believed to be on boat bound for United States. Lost discovered in checkup late this afternoon. Famous American detective Nick Carter called in on case. Have you got that, Miss Gerald? Yes, sir. See that it gets out at once. All news, sir. <sighs> this has been a wonderful trip, Nick. Except for this cold of mine. <laughs> oh. Poor girl. You know, it's the first time I've made a transatlantic crossing by plane. 
Yeah, I don't mind taking time for a trip like this. Particularly when it's at someone else's expense. <laughs> you know from what John Filbert said... Oh, well, Filbert is the owner of the diamond mine, Nick? Yes, I met him at a convention some years ago. Uh-huh. From what he said, he's more worried about how the diamonds got out than he is about the loss of these particular stones. You'll find out, Nick. I'll bet on that. Huh? Hope you're right. Come in, Hopkins. Yes, Mr. Gilbert. Uh, Nick, this is Charles Hopkins, our general manager. Uh, how Pleasure, you, Mr. Connor. Uh, he was the one who showed this man Coleman through the mine the day the thefts occurred. Oh, yes, yes. Mr. Hopkins, Mr. Filbert here tells me you're sure Coleman is the man who got away with the gems. He must be, Mr. Carter. Our display table is checked every night, you see. So when we missed the stones, we went back over every visitor for that day. Mm-hmm. The only one that presented anything out of the ordinary was Coleman, who dropped his cane as he went through the exit gate. So we figure the cane must have something to do with it. Very probably. Well, if Coleman secreted the stones in his cane, he must still have them with him. I think the best plan will be for Patsy and me to fly directly to the ship he's sailing on and see if we can find them. So if you'll radio the skipper that we're coming and give me a full description of the man and his servant, we'll be on our way. Oh, oh, before you go, Nick, I, uh, I want to give you a small retainer to cover your expenses at least. Uh, you have the money, Hopkins? Uh, yes, sir, right here. The two $500 bills. <laughs> I have to apologize, Mr. Carter, but I accidentally spilled some red ink on the corner of them while they were on my desk. No, oh, that doesn't matter, Mr. Hopkins. Thank you. Now let's get on with the details. We have to reach Coleman's ship before it docks, and we haven't too much time. Such a beautiful stroll around the deck, Monsieur Coleman. I say, Madame Duquesne, I think a cocktail won't go badly before we go down to dinner. Huh? That is such an excellent idea, Monsieur. Shall I mix the cocktail, sir? Uh, no, Gig, you may go. We won't need you until after dinner. Oh, yes, sir. You'll find everything you need right there. Madame Duquesne, we've gotten to know each other quite well these last few days. Yes. Why don't we stop being so formal? You call me Armand, and I'll call you Sarita. Ah, that is another of your lovely ideas, Monsieur. Almost? <laughs> Shall I mix the cocktail? I am very good at it. If you like. You'll find the things on that table. You would like a Manhattan, Armand? They are my favorite. Whatever you desire, Sarita. Huh? There's the vermouth. Oh, the stick. No, shall I? Oh, no, 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 I have it. <laughs> oh, Armand, I spilled it all over my hands. No, I shall have to wash them. The wash basin's in the other room, Sarita. I'll mix the cocktails while you're gone. Hurry now, I shall return at once. Mixing drinks is a man's job anyway. A woman's job is to look pretty and feed a man's vanity. <laughs> do I feed your vanity, Armand? You do indeed, my pretty. And I'm happy that you do. I shouldn't... Uh, uh, what is that uh, funny noise, Armand? Are you thinking uh, already? Uh, Please wait for me. Uh, now, Armand, I'm ready for... Who are you? What are you? Armand, who is that? Armand! You made good time, Mr. Carter, but even so, you're too late. Too late? For what? To talk to Coleman. He was killed a half hour ago. Uh-oh. Killed? How? A knife in his throat. The woman who was with him when it happened reported it to me. She said she was washing her hands in the dressing room when she heard a funny noise. When she came out, Coleman was lying dead on the floor. Hmm. Did she see anyone else? Yeah, there was a man in the room. But he dashed out when he saw her. She said she wouldn't know him again. She was so scared. This is something I hadn't counted on. Look here, Captain! I want something done about this man, Reddy. Uh, I'm busy just now. I'll drop in later, won't you? I want action now. Two days ago, this Redding moved my deck chair to one side and put his own chair where mine should be. He insulted uh, me. I'm too busy he... to do anything about that now, sir. Now, come uh, back this evening, will you? Yeah. Oh, all right, all right. But I'll poke this guy, Redding, right in the snoot if he doesn't... Sorry, Mr. Carter. Just one of the things in a captain's life. <laughs> yes. Well, shall we take a look at Coleman's cabin? I'd like to get started on my investigation. Perhaps what I'm looking for is still here. This is 
Coleman's stateroom, Mr. Carter. Dr. Samuels, this is Nick Carter and Miss Bowen. Mr. Carter, this is the ship's doctor. How do you do, sir? How do you do, Dr. How do you do, Doctor? Now, that's Gig, Coleman's servant. Is everything the way you found it, Doctor? Yes, Captain. You said Mr. Carter was coming, so I've made my inspection without moving anything. Oh, thank you, thank you. Hmm. Doctor, would you say that this knife was stabbed into the throat or thrown? Well, I, I did think that it was a peculiar angle for a stabbing, but the throwing hadn't occurred to me. You find anything on the knife, Nick? The handle seems to be clean. Well... Huh? No prints. Uh-uh. Gig, where were you when Coleman was killed? Uh, when Sir Armand and the lady came in after they'd been walking on deck, he told me he wouldn't need me till after dinner. So I went out and talked to a man I met yesterday. When I came back, the captain and the doctor were here. Uh, I verified that part of it, Mr. Carter. Hmm. Looks as if Coleman was mixing a drink when he was killed, doesn't it? That's what Madame de Cain uh, told me when she, she was the one who was with him at the time. Oh, I see. If he was standing there at the table where the drinks are, the knife must have been thrown through the window, judging by the angle at which it entered his throat. Yes, you're certainly right about that, Mr. Carter. Oh, Patsy, do you yeah. see that gold-headed cane Filbert told us Coleman carried? Yes, it's standing over there in the corner. Ah, good. You want it? Yes, please. Have you seen that cane before, Mr. Carter? No, but I've heard about it. Here, Nick. Thanks. Imagine this head comes off. <clears throat> well, there must be a catch here somewhere. Ah, well, that does it. Hmm. Why? Well, inside we find the motive for the killing. You mean the diamonds? I mean the diamonds are gone. You expected to find diamonds in the head of the cane? I did, Captain. When Coleman left South Africa, he had about 50 carats of flawless diamonds hidden there. It's empty now. So I should guess that the killer has taken the stones. Then all we have to do is search the ship, find the diamonds, and arrest whoever has them as the murderer. Yes, you could do it that way, Captain, but maybe I can save you some time. If I can do a little figuring. Uh, you know, Mr. Carter, there's one thing that puzzles me about this. Yes? What's that, Doctor? Well, the woman who reported the killing, Madame Duquesne, said she came to the captain's office immediately. Now, allowing for the time it took her to get there and the time it took me to get down here after that... The man should have been dead about 20 minutes. But I found that he'd been dead at least an hour. Is that so? Hey. I wonder why she waited over half an hour before reporting the murder. Yes, Patsy. I wonder, too. <laughs> back to the case of the gold-headed cane. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. As we pick up our story, we find Nick, Patsy, and the captain standing on deck outside the window of Coleman's stateroom. You see, Captain, it's just as I said. A knife thrown through this window at anyone standing at that table would enter the throat at the exact angle that the knife entered Coleman's throat. Nick, this is a curious coincidence. Oh, what's that, Patsy? The name on this deck chair right under Coleman's window is Redding. Yes? You remember that the passenger who busted into the captain's office was complaining about his chair having been replaced by one belonging to a man named Redding? Yes. Well, here it is. So Redding wanted to be in this particular spot no matter whom he annoyed, huh? Mm-hmm. Patsy, take down the names of the passengers in the adjacent chairs and see if any of them saw anything of this. Sure thing you know, Nick. What are you going to do? Going to see what Mr. Redding has to say about this. <laughs> Well? Pardon my intrusion, Mr. Redding. Just curious to know why you changed your deck chair from wherever it was to the position it now occupies. They put my chair in the wrong place to begin with. What's it in your life? I'm acting on behalf of the captain. His chart doesn't show your chair in its present position. I can't help that. That's the spot I was promised. Mr. Redding, do you happen to know a man named Sir Armand Coleman? 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 Yes. Never heard of him. Oh, I see you have a burn on the palm of your right hand, Mr. Redding. Been working recently? What I have on the palm of my hand is no concern of yours. Quite correct. I was just curious to know if you got it by practicing knife throwing. Knife? Get out of here. Get out. I've had enough of this. Very well, Mr. Redding. Oh, uh, by the way, 
Did you hear about the murder on board a while ago? Murder? Mm Mm-hmm. I'd like to know what you're getting at with all these questions. You suspect me of the murder, perhaps? I was going to say when you interrupted me that I'm about to make a very interesting call. I'm going to call on a woman who saw the killer and says she can identify him. So long, Mr. Redding. See you later. Nick! Oh, Nick! Wait a minute. Oh, Patsy, you had time to find out about those other passengers? Nobody saw anything, Nick. They were all downstairs... Uh... Below decks, I guess I should say. <laughs> yes, I guess you should. Is that you, Mr. Carter? <laughs> oh, yes, Captain. Anything new? Maybe, maybe not. I'll leave you to judge. Okay, what is it? Well, as soon as Madame Duquesne, the murder witness, got back to her cabin, she called for a plumber. Said the drain in her wash basin was stopped up. As it happened, the plumber was free, so he went there at once. He cleaned out the drain and left. But when he got back to his quarters, he discovered one of his wrenches were missing. He asked Madame Duquesne about it, but she said she hadn't seen it. And he's sure he left it there. Well, very interesting indeed. I'm on my way to her stateroom now, Captain. You want to come along? Maybe we can find the answer. Madame Duquesne isn't at home. Well, I think we better get in and have a look at her room anyway. I have a key, Mr. Carter. I'll let you in. Thanks. All right, Patsy. See if you can find the wrench. I'm sure it's hidden somewhere here. Right. What makes you so sure Madame Duquesne has it, Mr. Carter? I believe she stole Coleman's diamonds. Then tried to find a safe place to hide them. She got the idea of putting them in the wash basin drain, so she sent for the plumber. Watched what he did, then stole one of his wrenches, and when he was gone, opened up the pipe again and hid the diamonds inside. Well, why didn't she just put them down through the drain in the basin? Too big to go through the strainer, I should say. Oh. I found the wrench. Good. It was under the mattress. Now, suppose we have a look at that drain. Right. Well, hurry up, Nick. I can't wait. Oh, just a minute. Just a minute. There. Oh. And look at these, Captain. What? Well, magnificent stones, aren't they? Why, there's a fortune there. What are you doing in my room? Looking for diamonds, Madame Duquesne. And we found them. Madame Duquesne, you're under arrest for the murder of Sir Armand Coleman. No, I did not kill him. But you did steal the diamonds, didn't you? Yes, I admit I took the diamonds. When I came out of Coleman's dressing room, I saw a man standing there with Coleman's cane in his hand. When I spoke to him, he dropped the cane and disappeared. And you got curious, examined the cane, and found the diamonds. Yes. I could not resist them. I hid them here in my room. Then I reported the murder as if it had just happened. In heaven's name, why did you do that? I had to. Gid knew I was with Coleman. He knew we were to be together for dinner. If I had not reported it, I should have been blamed for the murder myself. Can you prove you didn't kill him? No, she didn't do it, Captain. But she knows who did. Don't you, madam? I... I believe I would recognize him if I saw him. Good. And I think I know who it is. Will you come with me and identify him? I will be glad to do that. If you let me get my... Uh, uh, and came. That just came through the window. She's dead, Nick. Come on, Captain. After it. There he goes. Apart. Stop! Stop! Stop or I'll shoot! If you want me, come and get me! He's going over the rail. Don't jump, man! There he goes! You two can play at that game, Captain. Stand by to pick us up! Don't, Carter! You'll kill yourself! You fool! Man overboard! Man overboard! Man overboard! Well, it takes a brave man to dive into the ocean as Nick did, but Nick is never the man to let a criminal get away from him. In just a moment, we'll hear the conclusion of today's story. for the conclusion of the case of the gold-headed cane. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. Stopping his liner in mid-ocean, the captain rescues Nick from the icy waters together with his unconscious captive, Redding. The latter is put to bed in his cabin under the doctor's care while Nick thaws out in the captain's quarters. An hour later, Nick drops into Redding's cabin. 
You think he pulled through, Doctor? Yes, I think so. He lost some blood from the wound in his leg where you shot him, but it's nothing serious. Can I talk to him? No, not just now. He's sleeping. I just gave him a sedative to quiet him. He's very restless. He's sort of wandering in his mind. He kept calling for someone to get him out of this. I didn't get the name, he said, but it sounded as if he was being paid by someone to uh, do what he did. Well, that's a new angle. I think I'll have a look through his things. If there's anyone else mixed up in this, I'd like to know who it is. Mr. Carter, Miss Bowen, to see you, Mr. Filbert. Well, Nick, glad to see you back. Glad to be back, John. Uh, did you accomplish anything, Nick? Well, yes and no. I found the man who stole the diamonds, but he was dead when we found him. Oh, that's a tough break. But I got the diamonds back for you. Here. Excellent, excellent. Uh, you never seem to fail to get what you go after. In this particular case, John, I got more than I went after. Yes. Is Mr. Hopkins around? Well, well yes, yes. I, I'll ask him to come in. Yes, Mr. Filbert? Ask Mr. Hopkins to step in here. Yes, sir. I want him to hear the rest of this story. I think it'll interest him even more than it will you. Well, right. If you want to see me, Mr. Filbert? Oh, hello, Mr. Carter. Yeah. Have a successful trip? I did. Found the thief and recovered the diamond. And had a very pleasant plane ride in the bargain. Good. <laughs> Mr. Hopkins, I'm puzzled about one thing. Yes, Mr. Carter. You said the diamonds on that display table near the exit gate were checked every night, didn't you? That's right. As I understand, these diamonds were stolen about noon. Correct, sir. And why wasn't the loss reported until late on the following day? Uh, why, uh, well, I thought that... Was to uh, give the it... thief a chance to get safely aboard the boat that sailed for the States that evening, so he'd be out of the country before the loss was reported, wasn't it? See here, Carter. Are you accusing me of something? John? Uh, yes, Nick. When I was here before, Hopkins gave me two new $500 bills as a retainer, remember? Yes, I recall that. And he apologized because he'd spilled red ink in the corner of them. Yes, yes, I recall that, too. What would you gather when I show you these five new $1,000 bills that also have red ink spilled on them in precisely the same places? See here, Carter. Be quiet, Hopkins. Go on, Nick. Where did those five bills come from? I found them in the stateroom of a man named Redding, a man who killed the diamond thief, Coleman, and tried to steal the stones from it. I I don't follow you, Nick. Well, here's what I think happened. Sit down, Hopkins, and be quiet. Well, hey, John... I believe Hopkins allowed Coleman, who was really an international jewel thief, to steal the diamonds from the display table. Probably even suggested the idea to him in some way. They let him pass them through the X-ray machine by getting away with that phony cane trick. See here, Coleman. And he hired Redding, another international crook, to kill Coleman and get the stones away from him. He paid him these bills, which I found in Redding's cabin. You can't prove a word of that, Carter. Uh, That is pretty complicated, Nick. Uh, What would Hopkins get out of it? He and Redding would undoubtedly split the proceeds. The $5,000 was advance expense money. Hopkins could have identified Coleman as the thief. But as Redding would have the jewels, they'd not be recovered. So Hopkins is in the clear. Redding is in the clear if he's not called for the killing. And Hopkins and Redding split the proceeds when they sell the gems. All that deduction based on a blot of red ink. It proves nothing. Your fingerprints on the bills will furnish all the additional proof necessary. (sighs) Fingerprints? Yes. New bills take fingerprints excellently, Mr. Hopkins. All right, Carter. I admit it was all worked out, just as you figured it. Hopkins, you? But, Nick, you haven't accounted for that woman who actually took the diamonds away from Coleman. Where does she come in? She doesn't, Patsy. Just, she just happened to run across the stones and being an opportunist took them. Oh. Well, Nick, I, I don't know how to thank you for what you've done. You've not only caught a thief and returned my jewels to me... You've also exposed another thief who might have gotten away with far more than this if he hadn't been found out. You know, Hopkins, this is just another illustration of the old adage. There's no such thing as a perfect crime. Crime doesn't pay. Ever. I'm curious, Nick. What happened to Reddy? Well, by the time the ship docked, Bob, Redding had recovered sufficiently to stand trial. And later, he was executed for what he did. Well, he certainly deserved it. It was a cold-blooded murder. 
Uh, Nick, uh, it's about time to look into the adventure that Old Dutch Cleanser is going to bring us next week. All right, Bob, here it is. It's the story of one of the most unusual rackets and crime I've ever encountered. Unusual is right. It terrorized a whole city. And Patsy speaks from first-hand experience. Uh Uh-huh. But to go on, Bob. This case included a murder on a dark street, a deserted warehouse... The telltale marks of tires in an alley, a masked man whom they called the boss... And that's enough for now. Uh, What do you call this story, Nick? I call it A Case of the Persistent Beggars. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the Cudahy Packing Company, makers of Old Dutch Cleanser. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick, with Charlotte Manson featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Jock McGregor, plot outlined by Peggy L. Mayer. Original music is played by George Wright. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use Old Dutch Cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Nick, this panhandler syndicate must be headed up by someone far more intelligent than Big Louie Arkin. Obviously, Patsy. But who? I don't know yet. But whoever it is, he's made a mistake. What? What kind of mistake? Murder. Now I can track him down and find out who he is. Oh, but Nick, if he's as clever as you say he is, he won't be easy to find. Oh, I'm not going to find him. I'm going to let him find me. Now, the case of the persistent beggars. Today's exciting Nick Carter adventure brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. Our story begins in a hideout in a deserted riverfront warehouse. A masked man whose Confederates fear and know him only as the boss watches silently as his lieutenant, Big Louis Arkin, opens a large bag of currency and dumps it on the table. Uh, there it is, boss. Today's haul. Did everyone who our collectors pay off, Louis? Yeah, yeah. Every pen handler in the organization kicked in. Five dollars a man, like they've been doing every day. You've told them that my orders are to use no actual violence when they solicit funds from the public? Oh, yeah, yeah, boss. Just like you told me. No rough stuff. Precisely, Louis. No rough stuff. However, I have no objections if our collectors are, shall we say, persistent. Uh, yeah, but some people, boss, well, they're cheapskates. They only come across with a dime or a quarter when our boys put the touch on them. Then tell the boys that's not enough. Then they get a dollar bill out of everybody they approach, even if they have to scare them to death. But, boss, uh, you don't mean they should get too tough. Not too tough, Louis. But tough enough. Understand? Oh, yeah, yeah, I get you. Still, boss, you ain't doing so bad right now, you know. A thousand dollars a Louis, day. do you by any chance envy my success? Me? Oh, no, boss, no. I, I wouldn't want you to be unhappy working for me, Louis. I'm not, boss. Honest, I, I'm satisfied with my cut. After all, it's I who organize these poor, downtrodden beggars. Assign them to their territories, give them... What protection I can. Sure, boss, sure. And it's a sweet racket, I guess. Louie, your choice of words is offensive. Huh? This is not a racket. This is a legitimate business. All in the name of sweet charity. Certainly it's no crime for a poor man down on his luck to beg a dollar for food and shelter. <laughs> Let a hungry man have a little something and get a bite to eat. Oh, well, here's a dime. A dime? Oh, well, yes, I... Give me that dollar bill. I gotta have uh, money. Uh, I'm uh, desperate, see? Oh, well, here. Here, take it. Hey, look, Jack, uh, can you spare a buck? 
My wife's sick, and I got to buy her some medicine. Hey, what goes on here? You're the third panhandler who's approached me tonight. I'm not going to give away any more. Uh, Jack, I'm a desperate guy. I need dough. And you better not be a cheapskate about it. Understand? Uh, all right, here you are. A buck ain't enough, Jack. Not enough? I got a lot of medicine to buy. Better make it two. <laughs> It's all right, lady. I ain't gonna hurt you. Oh, well, it's, it's so dark in the street. Now, well, I didn't see him that do- doorway. I... Look, lady, could you stake a hungry guy to a dollar? I'm down on my luck, see? I'm starving. No way. Oh, well, yes. Uh, so now, just a minute. I, uh, I've got a dollar in my purse. I have that. Uh... you got a lot more than that in your pocketbook, well, lady. I, I... Look, I'm pretty hungry, lady. I could use all that dough. Oh, no. No, no, please. It's all the money I got. I'm about hand to it over. Oh, no. I no. said hand it over. No. Come on. Please. Listen to me. Oh. Hey, call the cops, will you? Oh. I'll teach oh. you what you wish. Oh. You never met up with Foxy oh. Farrow when I get through with you. Oh. Oh. Thanks, Patsy. Hi, Mary. Hi, Nick. Hey, what's on your mind? Plenty, Nick. You know those panhandlers that have been mushrooming all over town lately? Yeah. I'll say we do. Well, you can't walk two blocks these days without one of them approaching you. Yeah. Well, the pressure's on down at headquarters. Newspapers are after us hot and heavy to clean up the city. So is the mayor. And every day of the week we get our ears beaten off by the Citizens Reform League. Oh, yes. That's headed up by John Prentice, the big real estate man. Yeah, Prentice. Sergeant, can't you pick up these beggars on a vagrancy charge? Sure we can. We do pinch a few of them, but we can't arrest them all. Mm. And if you could, Patsy, there isn't much you could do to them on a simple vagrancy charge. Yeah, that's just it, Nick. The judge can fine them or give them a jail sentence, but the jail sentence is only a couple of days. As soon as they're out, they go right back again begging on the street. Oh, but suppose they're fine. <laughs> big Louis Arkin is right there in night court to pay off the fine. What? Big Louie? Yeah. Well, that's very interesting, Maddie. Why should a big operator like Big Louie take such an interest in down and out panhandlers? Oh, I wish I knew. Look, Nick, the commissioner asked me to stop in and see whether you would take a hand in this business, huh? I'll be glad to, Maddie. This panhandler situation isn't just a nuisance, it seems. It's much more than that. What do you mean, Nick? I mean everything points to it being an organized racket. An organized racket? Yes. First of all, there's Big Louie, always on hand to pay the fine for any beggar that gets arrested. Huh. Second, these beggars are sprung up all over the city, on every side street, like the plague. Uh. And third, they seem to use the same methods of terrorizing citizens. Hey, you got something there, Nick. If we could only get some kind of a break, maybe we... I'll get it, Nick. Uh. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Yes, he is. It's for you, Sergeant. Headquarters. Oh, oh thanks, Patsy. Uh, Sergeant Matheson speaking. Yes, O'Rourke. What? Where? What did she say? Okay, O'Rourke, I'll get right on it. What is it, Manning? It looks like the break I was just talking about. Oh, yeah? What? Yep. It's not just vagrancy anymore, Nick. This time it's cold-blooded murder. Murder? Yep. A woman was blackjacked and robbed by one of these panhandlers on a deserted street. She died on her way to the hospital. Oh. But before that, she was conscious for just a minute and she talked. Yes, she identified her murderer as Foxy Farrell. Foxy Farrell? Right. Dick, wasn't he one of Big Louie Arkin's thugs in the old days? Yes. I wonder what he's doing panhandling. Well, I don't know, but I'm going to send out a pickup call for him right away. Oh, and while you're about it, Matty. Yeah? Pick up Big Louie. I'd like to ask him a few questions. <laughs> There's a homicide rap that goes with this. You better come clean. Now, for the last time, where's Farrell hiding out? Now, Sergeant, you're looking for Foxy, not me. Why don't you find him? Lou, you're up to your neck in this, and we know it. Then prove it, Sergeant. Why, you... Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, Matty. No yeah. use getting upset. Uh... If Louie's in this, we'll find out sooner or later. Louie, why have you been paying the fines of these panhandlers when they come into court? 
Well, Carter, I'm a sentimental kind of guy, and a lot of these drifters used to be old friends of mine. <laughs> now, if you two coppers haven't got any more questions, I got a date. Nothing that... doing, you. You're staying right here until we're ready to let you go. On suspicion, Sergeant? What? Don't try to pull that phony charge on me. I got a lawyer who busted apart in five minutes, and you know it. Now, I better let him go, man. No. We can always pick him up later if we need him. All right, come in. I. Oh, it's you, Mr. Prentice. Yes, Sergeant. Uh, Nick, this is Mr. Prentice, head of the Citizens Reform League. Yes, I've met Mr. Prentice. And I think you know Big Louie Arkin. Yes, very well. Don't I, Louie? Yeah. And I'm not forgetting you, Prentice. You sent me up the river for two years, and one of these days... One of these days, we're going to clean such scum as you out of this town. Ah, you reformers give me a pain. I remember this, Prentice. This town ain't big enough to hold you and me both. Huh. What's Big Louie doing here, Sergeant? We've been trying to nail him down on this panhandler killing. I see. Oh, and speaking of that, Sergeant, when are we going to get some action? Uh. It's getting so a decent citizen can't walk the streets anymore. And now, now it's come to murder. I'm sure we'll find the killer, Mr. Prentice. Well, I hope so, Mr. Carter. I'm glad to see that you've taken an interest in this case. And as for the police, Sergeant Matheson, we demand that every resource of the department be thrown into solving this case. Yeah, sure, sure. We're doing everything we can. Well, I'll see that you do. Our league has considerable influence at City Hall. And if necessary, we'll shake up the whole police department. Good day. Oh. Nick, he's out for blood, no mistake. Yeah. Look, Matty. What? There's only one thing to do. Yeah? Get on the inside of this panhandling setup. Try to find out who runs it. I'm convinced that Big Louie runs it. I'm not. It'd take a bigger brain than Louie's to organize and run a racket like this. Mm hmm. No, yeah, well, maybe. Uh, have you got any idea how you're going to uh, get on the inside? What do you think? <laughs> Louie said you wanted to see me. Sit down. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, what's it all about? Foxy, you shouldn't have killed that woman. Oh, now, listen, boss. You I... knew my orders. No violence. Yeah, 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 but, but boss, when I hit her up for the touch, she started to put up a fight. You can hear her yell for the cops a mile away. Her so purse I... was gone, Foxy. And you took it. Oh, boss, I... I run a legitimate business, Foxy. The collection of money for the poor and downtrodden. Not robbery and murder. You know the rules of my syndicate. Yeah, but I... Boss, boss, what are you going to do? To use the underworld expression, Foxy, you're hot. The police are after you, and worse than that. Nick Carter has been brought into the case. Yeah, but, boss... Foxy, I have no use for bundlers in my syndicate. I'm going to have to dispense with your services. No, no, but, boss, let me get out of town. I don't know who you are. You're always wearing that mask. Let me get out of town. It's a pity, Foxy... You let your greed overcome your good judgment. Miss Bowen? What? Miss Bowen? What? How do you know my name? I seen you around with Nick Carter. Look, Miss Bowen, my name's Davis. Snuffy Davis. I ain't had a thing to eat since two days ago. Could you spare a buck or two for a poor hungry guy? No, I'm sorry. You now, look, lady, I'm down on my luck, and I need some dough. Get your hand off my arm. Oh, no, not till you come across. Get your hands off me, please. Hey, Beth. What? Huh? That's a lot. What? Yes, alias Snuffy Davis. Oh, Nick, for heaven's sake, you gave me the scare of my life. What on earth are you doing in those dirty... Ragged old clothes. <laughs> I never suspected. Good, if you didn't, no one else will. Looks as if I passed the acid test with flying colors. Well, 
Nick, what on earth are you up to? Going to do a little panhandling on my own, Patsy. But why? I have an idea that instead of my having to look for the men who are running this panhandler's racket, they're going to look for me. <laughs> back to the case of the persistent beggars. Today's Nick Carter adventure brought to you by All Dutch Cleanser. It is afternoon now, and as we rejoin Nick, now Snuffy Davis, he is panhandling his way up the busy city street. Suddenly, he finds a hand on his shoulder. He turns around to see a tough-looking vagrant with hard blue eyes. Uh, you're mulching out of your territory, ain't you, Jack? What you talking about? It's a free country, ain't it? I can work any place I want to. Eh, not in this town you can't. What's your name, Jack? Hey, look, you you just work your side of the street and I'll work mine. Oh, wise guy, huh? Come on, spill it before I wipe up the sidewalk with you. Hey, uh, What's your name? Okay, okay, don't get sore. My name's Snuffy Davis. Ah, Snuffy Davis, huh? That's right. I just blew into town from Union City. I was just mooching a buck or two when you came along. Punk, and... You can't work this town unless you belong to the syndicate. What syndicate? We got a set up here. Everything's organized. You gotta belong and pay off or else. Then what do you mean, pay off? Who's running this racket? Kinda nosy, ain't you, pal? No, no, but I don't want to work. How do I join this, uh, this syndicate? Ah, that's better. Now you're showing sense. You know what a Boulevard Tavern is? Yeah. Go in there and ask to see Big Louie Arkin. Big Louie Arkin? Yeah. Just tell him Eddie sent you. Hey, you... You Big Louie Arkin? That's right, bum. What do you want? My name's Snuffy Davis. Eddie sent me. I see what do you want? I want to work the street. But Eddie says I've got to belong to the, to the syndicate. That's right. Cost you five bucks a day, every day. Five bucks a day? Hey, that's a lot of dough. Look, Bum, you can take it or leave it. Ain't much choice, is there? All right. I'll take it. Okay. First, you'll have to talk to the boss. The boss? But I thought that you run this record. You asked too many questions, Snuffy. Keep your trap shut and come with me. Your name's Snuffy Davis? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, that's right. I thought you'd like to look him over first, boss. Quite right, Louie. Snuffy, you say you're from Union City. Yeah, yeah, sure, that's right. Where's the Lyceum Theater in Union City? The Lyceum Theater? Yes, where is it? Why, it's, uh, it's on Grand Avenue. And the public library? On State Street. Hmm. Then you have been there. Oh, sure, sure, I told you. Never mind. I... You think he's all right, Louie? Yeah, sure, boss. I give him a good going over. He'll do. He knows the rules, too. Snuffy, the important thing is no violence. I conduct a legitimate business, and I don't want any trouble with the police. Do you understand? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I get you. I get you. Louis here will collect my commission every night. And one more thing, Snuffy. Yeah? If you ever breathe a word about coming to this warehouse or about this syndicate, your life won't be worth a panhandler's dime. You understand? Oh, sure, sure, sure. I get you. I, I get you. All right, Louis, give him a territory and put him to work. <laughs> Mr. Prentice. Yes, Miss Bowen. I just dropped by to see whether Mr. Carter has made any progress in breaking up this vicious gang of panhandlers. Well, he's working on it now, Mr. Prentice. And knowing Mr. Carter as I do... Well, I... I... Excuse me. Uh, Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Patsy, this is Nick. Oh. I'm calling from a drugstore phone booth at River and Ford. River and Ford. Yes, now listen closely, Patsy. Mm Mm-hmm. I met the big shot who runs this whole panhandler syndicate a half hour ago at a deserted warehouse on the riverfront. At a deserted warehouse? Nick, who is he? I don't know yet. He wore a mask. A mask? Yes, covered his whole face. 
I met him through Big Louie Arkin, who turns out to be his right-hand man. Uh-huh. So there is someone higher than Big Louie. There is. Now, listen closely, Patsy. Right. I picked up a clue to the boss's identity, and I need your help. Uh-huh. He parked his car in a dirt driveway next to the warehouse. I didn't see the car, but I went back later and checked the tire tracks. Oh, what was the tire pattern? There was nothing in the tire pattern. Mm. Four new tires of a common make. But the width of the car, the distance between the right and left wheel tracks, gave me a tip-off. The width of the car? Yes. The boss, whoever he is, isn't driving an American car. Because the distance between his wheels isn't standard. In short, Patsy, he's driving some foreign car. Hmm. Now listen closely. Yes, sir. I measure the distance between the wheels. It's five feet, two inches. Check the Automobile Association and find out what foreign make car measures that wheel distance. You got it? Right. Check Automobile Association and find out what foreign car measures two, uh, five feet, two inches in width between wheels. That's right. Five feet, two inches. And when you find the make of the car, call the Bureau of Motor Vehicles and check who owns the car of that make. Uh-huh. Can't be very common. After you find out, call me back right here. All right, Nick. I'll get to the Bureau of Motor Vehicles right away. Oh, what's the number where you are? Virginia 90568. Virginia 90568. Right, now wait for your call. All right, Nick, I'll hurry. Bye. Mr. Prentice, I'm sorry I kept you waiting. That's uh, quite all right. I, I'll be running along now. I have a great deal to do in a short time. Good day. I've got news. Yeah? The car measuring a width of five feet two inches is an English arrow. There are only four in the whole state, and only one in the city. And that's owned by John Prentice. What? Prentice? Of the Citizens Reform League? Right. You don't suppose he could... Oh, uh, hold on a minute, Nick. Someone's coming in. Oh, it's Sergeant Matheson. Hi, Sergeant. Hi, Patsy. Patsy, look. Yeah? Prentice may be in this. We've got to check the other three people who own aero cars before we can make sure. Mm hmm. Hey, wait a minute. What? What is it, Nick? Two mugs came into the drugstore just now. They're watching me. Oh, Nick. I recognize one of them. Panhandler named Eddie. Yeah, they're after me, all right, Patsy. Nick Ben Prentice is the boss. What? He was in the office when you called me and overheard our conversation. Right. And he went out and phoned his men to pick me up. Oh? Nick, what are the thugs doing now? They're moving this way toward the phone booth. And they've got guns. Oh, quick, Patsy. Put Manny on the phone. <laughs> Well, Nick is in a real spot Trapped in a phone booth with two of Prentice's men coming to pick him up We'll be back to see what happens in just a moment And now for the conclusion of The Case of the Persistent Beggars Today's Nick Carter adventure brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser as we pick up our story, two of Prentice's thugs are headed toward the phone booth to get Nick as Matty's voice comes over the wire. Yeah, Nick, what is it? Matty, I've got to talk fast. Two mugs had me trapped in a drugstore phone booth at River and Forth. I'll have every prowl car in the neighborhood down there in five minutes, Nick. Five minutes may be too late. They're here now. Listen, Matty, if you miss me here, try that big deserted warehouse next to the fur exchange. Stop that phone, Carter. Another word and I'll blow your brains out. Yeah, we're going for a little ride, wise guy. The boss wants to see you. Well, Carter, it looks as though you've outsmarted yourself. On the contrary, Prentice, you've outsmarted yourself. Your racket has ended. My dear Carter, my work may be ended, but so is yours. Wait a minute, Carter. You say the boss here is Prentice? That's right, Louie. Prentice, head of the Citizens Reform League, the man who sent you up the river. Why, you double cross? Don't make a move, Louis. The same goes for you, Connor. As you see, I've got a gun. Take off that mask. Why not, Louis? There you are. So you are, Prentice. That Citizens Reform stuff was just a blind. Exactly, Louis. I'm about to retire with my earnings. Naturally, I intend that both of you will retire also. And permanently. You'll have to work fast, Prentice, if you expect to carry out your plan. Mr. Carter, you underrate me. I have plenty of time. First a bullet into each of you. Then through this window. And a... 
What's that? The police, Prentice. Police? Okay, Prentice. But here. I warned you, Louis. Thanks yeah. for the opening, Prentice. Smash the light, will you, Carter? That won't help you. Yeah, miss me. Hard to hit what you can't see, isn't it? Uh, now that your gun's jammed, I'll show you that this is the most effective way. Okay, boy, bring it down. Over here, Matty. Are you all right? Sure, sure, I'm all right. Turn on your flash. Yeah. Hey, what's Prentice doing here? Prentice? Uh, he's the big boss of this whole panhandling racket. What? And the other one with the bullet wound you already know. Big Louis Arkin. I... I'll say I know him. He looks in bad shape, Matty. You better get what you can out of him while he can still talk. <laughs> Nick, I just spoke to Sergeant Matheson over the phone. Oh, yeah? Big Louie gave him the whole story before he died, all about the killing of Foxy Farrell, everything. You know, Patsy, it's funny how Prentice masqueraded as a respectable citizen for so long. <laughs> Why, Big Louie, whom Prentice sent up the river, never knew who his boss in this racket was. <sighs> well, anyway, Nick, the sergeant tells me this panhandling racket is definitely finished. Oh, oh. Hmm? Speaking of panhandling, Patsy, I've got something on my conscience. On your conscience? Yes, seven dollars and twenty-five cents. It's the money I mooched while I was snuffy, Davis. Remember? <laughs> hey, what'll I do with it? Well, uh, why not give it to your boys' club, Nick? Ah, oh, Patsy, you would think of a nice thing like that. That way, the money will really go to help those who need it, and that's what it was given to me for. <laughs> Nick, is all Dutch Cleanser bringing us an exciting adventure next week? I should say they are. Cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction... Nick Carter, Master Detective. But, Nick, that's impossible. No, Patsy. Somewhere high up in the skyscrapers of this city, a deadly killer is running wild. I know. But how on earth are you going to track him down, Nick? It's, well, it's like looking for someone in a jungle of stone and glass. Well, at least I know whom he's picked out for his next victim. Uh, who? A fellow by the name of Nick Carter. Now, the case of the careless employees. Today's exciting Nick Carter adventure brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. Our story begins in the superintendent's office of the Park Window Cleaning Company, a large firm handling skyscraper contracts only. Bill Stevens, one of the company's window washers, is talking to the superintendent, Frank Marston. I just dropped in to give you my notice, Marston. I'm quitting this coming Saturday. What? You heard me. I'm handing in my equipment Saturday. Oh, wait a minute, Bill. Take it easy. It's more money you want. You couldn't pay me enough to keep me washing windows for the park company, Marston. But, Bill, you've been with the company a long time. Yeah, I... and I want to live a long time. I don't like all these accidents that are happening to pals of mine. Look at Ed Kelly. He fell 40 stories to the street two weeks ago. And then last week, Joe Drummond took a nosedive from the Embassy Hotel Towers. And then only yesterday, Tim Ballin hit the bricks. Dropped 20 stories from the exchange building. And each of them so badly smashed, you could hardly identify them. Well, sure, I know, but we're bound to ever run a bad luck now and then, Bill. Those fellas probably a little careless. Nuts! They were old-timers, and you know it. They know where to put their safety belts and how to handle themselves in a high wind. The truth is, this here company is jinxed. And what do you mean by that? You're the superintendent. You tell me. Oh, just because you've had a few accidents. Marston, you... we've had three accidents in two weeks, and that's too many. I'm getting the jitters myself. The next thing you know, bingo, they'll pick me up off the street with a blotter. Well, if I were you, I'd think it over. Think I... it over nothing. My mind is made up, Marston. I'm going to get myself a nice, safe job on the ground. <laughs> Oh, good morning, Patsy. Oh, gosh. 
do I feel embarrassed. Letting the boys beat me into the office. Ah, Patsy. Uh, what's the matter, Nick? Leave that bunch of fruit you call a hat right where it is. We're going places. So early in the morning. So early in the morning. John Farron just called and asked us to go to work for him. Farron? Mm-hmm. Is that Farron of Atlantic Underwriters? That's the man. And I might remind you, his company pays us a handsome annual retainer for services rendered. In other words, you've got yourself a case. I have. Well, what's it all about? Well, Atlantic issues a special high premium policy to window cleaners. And three of these insured window cleaners have fallen from skyscrapers in the last two weeks. Well, what does that have to do with you? In the first place, statistics show that no window cleaner has died by accidental fall in the past two years. Now, for no apparent reason, three of the poor devils plunged to their deaths in two weeks. Hmm. It could be coincidence, Nick. Yes, it could, but I doubt that it is. Hmm? Listen to this. There are only two big contract window cleaning companies in town. The Park Outfit and the Community Window Cleaning Corporation. Uh Uh-huh. Between them, they handle millions of dollars worth of skyscraper business annually. And they're bitter rivals. Well, who had the accidents, park or community? Or both? All the accidents have happened to park, none to community. I see. Of course, that could be coincidence, too. Well, I'm afraid this case has too many coincidences. Well, what are we going to do about it, Nick? In other words, where now? To headquarters. I want to check a few details of Mary before we really get going. <laughs> So you're sure these window cleaners fell by accident, huh, Maddie? I can be absolutely sure of nothing, Nick. As far as we know, these guys just got careless, that's all. Well, from what we understand, they were all old-timers in the window cleaning business. Yeah, yeah, but even the best of them can make mistakes, Patsy. Yeah. And when they slip on a job like this, why, it's curtains. Or I should say shrouds. Oh. Now, what about the safety belts these cleaners are wearing, Maddie? Nick, I checked them myself. They were in perfect condition. Not a thing wrong with them. And the bolts on the sides of the windows to which they hooked their belts went over them personal. Every one of them. And every window where these men were cleaning when they fell. Those bolts were in solid, Nick. Not a loose one on the lock. <sighs> well, Nick, that's that. Why, sure, you're just wasting your time, Nick. The medical examiner looked over each of the bodies and reported death by accident. Fall and violent contact. <sighs> Island is right. Oh, Nick, I've seen men smashed up in my time, but these fellas, uh, we could barely identify them. Well, nevertheless, I still can't get over the fact that these accidents happened so close together and only to the men in the park company. Well, Nick, look, these window cleaners stepped out on a windowsill and slipped. Or they were blown off these skyscrapers by a high wind before they got their belts hooked. No, I don't know. But we're booking them as accidents, and that is that as far as we're concerned. All right, Matty, you may be right. But until I've exhausted every possibility, I'm not going to be satisfied. Come on, Patsy. Uh, where are we going this time? Uptown. I want to talk to the superintendent of the park company. <laughs> Mr. Carter, it's, it's beyond me. I still can't figure out how they happened to fall. Uh, tell me, Mr. Marston. Did you know any of them well? Did I know them? Oh, see, I did. They were old timers with our company. Came in with me when the business first started. Worked right alongside of them before I hurt my leg and took this inside job. Well, they were friends of mine, all right. Knew their families, too. Now. We understand how you must feel. Uh, Mr. Marston, these accidents. How have they affected your business? We're taking a terrific greeting, Mr. Carter. I see. You've already lost a couple of big accounts. The mercantile building and the arcade building canceled with us and went over to the community corporation. They didn't like the unfavorable publicity. I can understand that. And that isn't all. This losing business is only one of our troubles. Suppose your men are quitting, huh? They sure are in droves. You know, window cleaners are pretty superstitious, Mr. Carter. I think our company's hoodoo. Well, can't you get any help to replace them? There hasn't been a man come to our employment office in two weeks. We've advertised in all the papers, and we haven't got a single response. Frankly, Mr. Carter, a little more of this kind of thing, and the park company's washed up. We're, we're through. I see. Uh, Mr. Marston, who's the man to see at your competitors, the community corporation? A man named Whaley, Fred Whaley. It's a corporation with a board of directors, but he supervises operations. Why? What's, what's he got to do with all this? Oh, I just want to get his point of view, that's all. Come on, Patsy. Let's go see Whaley. <laughs> Look me 
Mr. Carter. I'm a very busy man. I don't have much time. Now, what do you want? Miss Bowen and I are investigating those accidents over at Park on behalf of the Atlantic Underwriters. Well, why come to me? Nothing's happened to our window cleaners. Why don't you talk to the Park people instead of coming here to waste my time? Look here, Whaley. You don't have to tell us anything if you don't want to. But at least you can be civil. Okay. Well, what do you want? We don't quite understand why all the accidents seem to be happening to the Park Company alone. Meaning what, Carter? Meaning anything you like. Or nothing. Look here, Carter. Are you implying we're responsible? I'm not making any accusations, Whaley. We just thought you might have an idea. I haven't. Uh, I mind my own business, operating the Community Window Cleaning Corporation. What happens over at Park doesn't interest me. Is that clear? Clear enough. But is it the truth? Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Carter. Do I understand you to insinuate that I... What I'm saying is common knowledge in business circles, Whaley. Park has already lost several big skyscraper contracts to your company. They lose a few more, they'll fold up. Well, that's their affair. It's not mine. Though I'd be happy to see them fold up. Now, is that all? Yes. Yes, Mr. Whaley. That's all. For now. You know, when you're cleaning windows on these big buildings, all you see mostly is a lot of sour pusses. But you, boy, you're the best-looking babe I've seen in any of these offices. Oh, you really think so? Honest, no kidding. Well, you're not so bad yourself. Fine, baby. <laughs> um, what's your name? Mabel. Mabel Lanigan. My name is Bill Meadow. Pleased to meet you. Ah, uh, must be, uh... Pretty dull working in an office like this all day. Punching a typewriter. Oh, I'll say. Sometimes I could scream. But take your job. Gee, that must take an awful lot of nerve. Yeah, you gotta watch yourself. Ain't you scared you'll fall someday? Well, I never was before. But lately I've started to smarten up. In fact, I'm quitting the job of the night and I'm gonna celebrate. Hey, that gives me an idea. What? How about you celebrating with me? Oh, I couldn't do that. I hardly know you. Oh, come on, Mabel. I'm a nice guy when you get to know me. Well, go to the Blue Grotto. You know, dinner, dance. What do you say, Mabel? Huh? Well, I... I... I tell you what, if it'll make you feel any better, we'll make it a foursome. Foursome? Sure, I've got a friend. You get a friend. Well, I... I've got a friend who works on the floor below, on the 32nd floor. Her name's Alice Hayes. I... Might call her up. I tell you what, if it's okay with her, me and my friend will meet the two of you at the entrance of this building tonight at six sharp. Okay? All right. Well, call your friend right now. I'll be washing the next window over, Mabel. And when you get through phoning, you stick your head out of the window and let me know how you make out, huh? So long, beautiful. <laughs> Alice, honest he is. Huh? Oh, gosh, I don't know how tall his friend is. Yeah, sure, it's embarrassing when you're taller than the man you're with, but I, I tell you what, Alice, hold the wire. Bill's washing the window in the next office. I'll ask him how tall his friend is. Hold on. Bill! My friend Alice wants to know how tall... That Mr. Whaley is a nice, chatty man, Nick. Just a sweet, lovable guy, if I ever saw one. Yeah. Certainly didn't get much out of him. <sighs> if you ask me, we're on a wild goose chase. We've been running around in circles. Yeah, what's the matter? Nick, that ambulance just stopped where the crowd is. Must be an accident. Yes. Let's have a look. Right. 
Hey, what happened, bud? What happened? Uh, just another window cleaner. Window cleaner? Yeah, poor guy smashed right through the awning, right on the sidewalk. Oh, oh must have jumped on the 40th floor. Well, Nick, it's another one of those accidents. Oh, I see. Come on, Pepsi. Oh, but Nick, the body's over there. I'm not interested in the body. I want to find out what office that poor devil dropped from. <laughs> You say it was the office next to yours. Is that right, Miss Lanigan? Yes, sir. He just finished our window and he was working on the next one. He was just falling backward from the window sill. Kind of. And that's all you saw? Yes, sir. Uh, Nick, I, I think we better let Miss Lanigan go now. She isn't feeling very well. Yes, of course. Just as soon as she tells us which office it was. It's this one right here. It used to be rented by the Burger Woolen Mill, but it's empty now. I see. Thank you very much for your help, Miss Lanigan. You're welcome, I'm sure. All right, let's go in, Patsy. Right, Nick. Well, not only an empty office, but it's just been repainted. Yeah. Floor is still a little sticky from a fresh coat of varnish. Hey, Patsy, look. Look at what? The floor. Huh? A very faint imprints of someone's feet on the varnish. Nick, you're right. Wait. Hmm? See those little round spots beside the footprints? Yes. Those are undoubtedly made by the rubber tip on the cane. So the man who came into this office was lame, huh? Does that suggest something to you, Nick? Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hey, look. Hmm? A number of prints at the window, too. Must have been left by the window cleaner. Apparently, he was cleaning the inside of the window when the lame man came through the door. Nick, I still don't see what But you... the window washer is pale as on the outside sill of the window. Well, what of it? Well, look at the window, Patsy. Look at it. Hmm? Saw it had been washed on the outside, and the cleaner had started on the inside surface. That means the cleaner was working on the inside when he was interrupted. Nick... If that's the case, why is the pail on the outside of the window? Precisely, Patsy. It shouldn't be. Unless someone deliberately put it there after the window cleaner was dropped to the street. Then this was no accident. I'll say it wasn't. It was murder. back to the case of the careless employees. Today's Nick Carter adventure brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. It is Monday now, and Patsy is just coming into the office after doing a job of research for Nick. Well, Nick, I checked back on those three accidents that preceded Bill Meadows. And? And your hunch was right. Every one of those window cleaners fell from the window of an empty office. Good going, Patsy. This proves that the murderer was someone who knew the schedules of the Park Company crew. And knew them to a dotted I and a cross T. <laughs> he showed perfect timing, picking empty offices where he wouldn't be disturbed. And his motive certainly is obvious enough. To ruin the Park Company, drive it out of business. Hmm. Still, even with what we know, it isn't going to be easy to nail down this killer, Patsy. Oh, I'll say it isn't. Well, there must be a hundred skyscrapers in the city with thousands of windows. And heaven knows how many empty offices. And looking for this murderer is going to be even worse than trying to find a taxi on a rainy night. Patsy? Yes? Did you ever wash what? windows? What? I said, did you ever wash windows? Well, why, yes, of course, but I never enjoyed it. Why? I've decided to get a window cleaning job with the Park Company. Oh. Nick, for the love of Pete, have you gone mad? No, Patsy. I've got a hunch that if I set myself up as sucker bait, the killer may look me up. Well, how do you know where you are or what you're doing? Oh, I'll make sure the word gets around. Oh, Nick, you can't do it. It isn't the killer I'm worried about so much. It's the idea of you hanging on a safety staff 40 stories above the street and then suddenly... <laughs> oh, Nick. Well, now, Patsy, don't worry. High places don't bother me. <sighs> Maybe you don't know it, but if you look in my high school yearbook, you'll see that a kid named Nick Carter was champion high diver of the swimming team. You say my men were murdered, Carter? They didn't fall just by accident? That's right, Marston. Well, what makes you think that? Well, I won't go into the details now, except to tell you I know they were murdered. And the killer is a man who uses a cane. 
Probably walks with a limp. Walks with a limp? Well, that's interesting, Carter. Is there anything I can do to help you track him down? Yes, Marston. You can give me a job cleaning windows. Did I hear you right, Kurt? You want me to give you a what? A job. With one of your regular crews. Well, by all that's holy, why? Because I have a hunch that if I'm on a window-washing crew, this skyscraper killer may pay me a visit. Well, I... Well, now, look here, Carter. You're out of your mind. This is the whole idea. It's... Well, it's crazy. You've never had any experience. This kind of work's pretty tricky and dangerous. I'll take the chance. You're sure you want to do this? I am. Okay. It's against my better judgment, but I'll give you the job. All I can say is you be careful. Oh, don't worry, Marston. I expect to be careful. Very careful. Now, to whom do I report? Well, the crew boss is Al Fredericks. You'll find him in the locker room down the hall and to the left. Well, don't you think you'd better come along and introduce me? Well, I, uh... Well, no, Carter, I think I'd better stay here. I'm up to my ears and work. You go ahead. I'll phone Al from here that I'm sending you in. Oh, uh, one more thing. Yes? Shall I tell him who you really are? Might as well. If you consider him trustworthy, I may need his cooperation later. You, Al Fredericks? Yeah, that's right. Mr. Marston told me to report to you for work. My name is Carter, Nick Carter. Yeah, so Marston told me over the phone just now, but I don't like it. Pretty dangerous work, especially for a green hand. Oh, I know what I'm up against. Okay, I'll put you on the first thing in the morning. I don't know exactly what you're up to, Carter, but let me tip you off to one thing. Yes? Be careful. Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Oh, hello, Patsy. Oh. I'm on my lunch hour. Anything doing at the office? Uh, no, no, there's nothing new. Oh, Nick, for heaven's sake, will you stop this window cleaning business and come back here to the office? I've been going crazy ever since you started work this morning. Now, Patsy, there's no point in getting jittery. Oh, there isn't. Well, Nick, let me tell you something. I screamed about you last night. You were crawling up the side of a big, tall building like a human fly. And then, when you almost got to the top... A huge bird swooped down and started to attack you. You tried to fight back, but you hang, had to hang on and you couldn't. And, and then, then all of a sudden you lost your grip and... Oh, Nick. I thought I lost you. Now, now, Patsy, I'm doing fine so far. Don't worry. Oh, I'm all right, Nick. I'll try not to. Anything new? No. But if the killer wants to look me up this afternoon, he'll find me on the 32nd floor of the Globe Building. Good to get inside for me. Cold out there. did decide to look me up, after all. Don't turn around, Carter. Keep facing that window. And get your hands up. If you don't want a bullet in your back. Well, Nick's hunch that the skyscraper killer would finally look him up turned out to be accurate with a vengeance. We'll be back to see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Careless Employees, today's Nick Carter adventure brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. As we pick up our story, Nick is facing the window with his hands up while the man with the limp points a gun at his back. I see you picked out a nice empty office as usual, Marston. So you know me, eh, Carter? I do. Not that it matters much now. But how did you know? When I first met you, you met... 
first met you, you mentioned the fact that you had a bad leg. Yeah, so I did. That was stupid of me, wasn't it? Very. Then later, when you refused to get up from your desk and walk with me to the locker room, I was pretty sure. Why didn't you do something about it then? Because courts require airtight evidence before they send a man to the chair, Marston. I wanted you to tip your own hand the way you're doing now. I figured you'd get worried and come after me. Yeah, you're a smart detective, Carter. But this time, you've outsmarted yourself. Have I? You sure have. It's 32 stories to the street, Carter. You've got a one-way ticket. Down. I suppose the community corporation's paying you off to ruin your own company. Ah, uh, not the corporation. Just my friend Whaley. You see, Whaley gets a big bonus if community does a big business. And I get a dividend. Twenty-five thousand dollars for turning over to him a million dollars worth of park business. I see. Now, Mr. Carter, I'm going to treat you just as I did the other. No favorites. I'm going to tap you on the back of the head with the butt of this gun, knock you out, then I'm going to drop you out of the window. Of course, they'll never notice a little bump on your head after you hit the street. They'll call it an accident. Just an accident. Hey! Don't like water on your face, do you? Too bad. You missed, Marston. You won't get another chance. Ooh. Well, Mr. Marston, looks as if you're the one who suffered a little accident, not me. An accident that should please my friend Matty very much indeed. Grab Whaley at the airport. He's just trying to get a plane out of town. Nice going, Matty. Well, that makes two customers for the chair instead of one. Yeah. And if these two don't burn, I'll go back to pounding a beat. <laughs> oh, Sergeant. Hmm. Nick, there's still one thing I don't understand. Yes? You were facing the window, and Marston was in back of you with a gun. Yeah, how did you get out of that spot, Nick? Well, I had to take a long chance. I watched Marston's reflection in the window as he came toward me. Yeah. My pail of cleaning water was beside me on the sill. When he raised his gun to crack me over the head, I flipped the pail of water right over my shoulder and into his face. And that blinded him just long enough so you could knock him out. <laughs> well, I'll be doggone. Nice work, Nick. That's my boss, Sergeant. If he can't wash windows with his cleaning solution, he catches murderers with it. <laughs> <laughs> Old Dutch Cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, how do you know it couldn't have been suicide? The evidence shows it, Patsy. But the windows were locked on the inside. No one went through the door. If it was murder, how was it done? The same evidence, Patsy. The bottle tells how and why it was murder. Now for the case of the Crystal Prophecy. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by Old Dutch Glenter. Our story begins in Nick's office about 10 o'clock one bright, sunny spring morning. Well, I'll be darned. What is it, Patsy? Nick, I'm following the latest records on suicides, and they show that during the past six weeks, four women have committed suicide. Oh, what's so curious about that? Well, each of these women was in her middle 30s, each was a widow with quite a bit of money, and in each case, the police couldn't find a single clue to the reason for the suicides. Hmm. When was the last one? Night before last. Uh, Mrs. Doris Manson. Nick, don't you think there might be some connection between these suicides? Maybe. Certainly looks like a lot of coincidence if there isn't. That's what I thought. Are we going to do anything about it? We are. 
We're going to finish the report I'm working on, and then we're going down to talk to Maddie about this this epidemic of suicides. <laughs> Good afternoon, Hassan. I hope I'm not late. Pleased to enter, Mim Saib. You are expected. Oh, I get more excited every time I come here. Is Rashid El Bey ready to receive me? Mim Saib will please to sit there. I go tell Master. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Mrs. Langdon. It is well that you arrived. Oh, I couldn't be late to see you, Master. I do so want to hear more. Then what you have heard has pleased you? Oh, yes. Everything has happened just as you said it would. Just after I left you the other day, I dropped my purse and a man picked it up for me. It was a man named Robert Winter, just as you said it would be. This Robert Winter, he pleased you? Oh, yes. He's a perfect gentleman and so handsome. I think that he's romantically inclined and I thought perhaps... I understand, madam. Please to draw near... And look into the crystal. Do not allow your attention to wander for an instant. O ball of ever-knowing light, bring to your surface the truth about Robert Winter and Martha Langdon. Make the future clear that we may read it. The ball begins to clear. A picture is forming. I see. I see. No. No, it cannot be. Huh? Oh, ball of crystal, are you sure? Oh, what's the matter, Elbe? I am sorry, madam. I cannot tell you what the crystal ball has shown to be the future for you. It is better that you remain in ignorance. No. If there's anything bad, I demand that you tell me. The crystal ball shows, madam, that you will shortly take your own life. Oh, but that's absurd. I have no reason to do away with myself. I am sorry. I am only the instrument through which the pictures are made clear. But now that I know about it, isn't there any way the future can be changed? It is difficult, madame. Very difficult. Oh, I'll do anything, anything. Can't you help me? It is possible, madame. How? It is a long and difficult process. It will mean that I must deny myself to all my other disciples. Much time will be lost. Much money will be lost. Oh, I have money. I'll give you money. It will take a great deal of money, madam. I shall have to devote all my time to watching over you until the danger is past. How much would that be? It would be $100,000. Oh, no. I, I can't pay that much. It is well known that madame wears pearls worth that amount. Give up my pearls? Pearls mean nothing, madame, when the owner is dead. No. I have enough willpower to keep from killing myself. And if necessary, I can hire somebody to watch me day and night for much less than $100,000. As you wish, madame. But it would not be wise I won't to... pay that much to anybody for something I should be able to do myself. No, thank you. As you please, madame. Good day. And may I wish you everything that fortune will bring you. You know as well as I do, Nick, that suicides run in waves. I know, I know, that's true, Matty. But it seems to me that there's too much coincidence in these four. Each of them is too much like the other. Oh, that's crazy, Nick. The first one drove her car off a cliff. The next jumped off a building. The third fixed herself up in a closed garage with a car motor running. And this last one jumps in front of a subway train. But, Matty, did you notice that each of these suicides was a woman in her middle thirties, a widow, and that each had a considerable amount of money? Sure, sure, I know all that, but what's it prove? Now, look, Nick, my squad investigated every one of these deaths, and we didn't find anything but suicide. Okay, Mary, okay. Ah, oh, Nick, you're getting all hot and bothered about something. It's just a coincidence. And that's all. Oh, Robert, how nice. Come in. Hello, Martha, my dear. I hurried over as soon as I got your phone call. What's wrong? It... Rashid El Bey. He, he told me the most awful thing. Really? I've known him for a long time. 
I never heard of him saying anything that didn't come true. Does everything really come true? Indeed it does. I'll never forget poor Doris Manson. He told her that she was going to take her own life. And did she? Yes, poor thing. She was standing on a subway platform one day when the train came along. She jumped in front of it. Oh, horrible. Robert, Elbey told me that I was going to kill myself. Oh, that's terrible. Isn't there anything we can do? Elbey said that he could do something about it, but it would cost me $100,000. I told him I couldn't afford to pay that much. Not when your life is in the balance? No. I I can't believe I'm going to commit suicide. I've never known Elbey to be wrong. I think it would be better for you to pay him, Martha. I'm not going to do it. Very well, my dear. You know you can count on me for any help you need. Oh, thank you, Robert. I know I can. You know, how about a glass of your fine port? It'll do us both good. Oh, I think that's an excellent idea. I'll get it. I must say I admire your courage, my dear. Oh, I'm not brave. I just won't part with all my money for something I don't think will happen. Well, the wine will make you feel better. Wine always helps. And now, Martha, to your health and long life. Hello. Hello, Martha. This is Camelia Huntington. I just called to see if you'd received my invitation. Yes, it's lying here in front of me. I just know you're going to enjoy Rashid Elbey. He's such an interesting person. Yes, he is. But whatever's the matter, my dear? You sound as though you don't like Elbey. Oh, it, it isn't that, Camelia. It's just that he told me something very unpleasant. He did? Whatever was it? I'd rather not discuss it, Camelia. Oh, look, Martha, why don't you try him again? Perhaps he's looked into his crystal again and has seen something for the better. Do you... Do you think there's a chance? I most certainly do. Think about it, dear. Anyway, I'll see you tomorrow at my party. Goodbye. Goodbye, Camelia. And thanks. Try him again. Yes, I'll do it. Why didn't I think of that before? Oh, I'm sure he's seen something else. Yes? Is, is this Hassan? Yes. Who speaks, please? This is Mrs. Langdon. I've got to speak to El Bay right away. One moment, Mentaib. <sighs> Good evening, Mrs. Langdon. Oh, I, I just had to call you, El Bay. I, I wondered if you would look into your crystal ball again. See if it said the same thing. I have looked many times, madam. The pictures have not changed. Oh. The span of your life is growing short. Oh, no. I beg of you to reconsider before it is too late. Well, I... I won't reconsider paying you $100,000, if that's what you mean. Alas, then, what is written will be so. I am sorry, madame. The sands of your life run out rapidly. Oh. oh I never should have called him in the first place. It scares me so. Perhaps I'd feel better if I drank a glass of wine. Now, maybe this will lift me out of this terrible mood. I certainly hope so. Uh, what? Uh, I've got to... Uh, Awfully nice of you to pick me up this morning, Nick. It's all right, Patsy. I just happen to be going by. Or oh, switch on the radio, will you? Police band? Sure. Oh, gosh, it's a beautiful morning. Car 18, go to Hemlock and Toy, reported burglary. Car 43, go to 54 and 9th Avenue. <laughs> Traffic light out of Oh, board. what a charming radio personality. Cars 256 and 257 get to 1485 North End Avenue. Assist Sergeant Madison what? and Homicide Squad in suicide on premises. That is all. Nick, you don't suppose that could be another... I don't know, but I think we'll find out. We can be there in less than five minutes. <laughs> What's the 
the verdict this time. Oh, I don't know, Nick. I just got here myself. Only had time to find out that this is the same kind of case as the ones we were talking about. What? You mean the one who committed suicide was a woman? Yeah. In her 30s and wealthy? That's right, Patsy. Oh. I suppose if you want to take a look. Yeah, sure, Nick. She's right in here, in the library. Right. Well, there she is. The late Martha Langdon. Hmm. Say the cause of death was cyanide, judging by the smell. Yeah, I noticed the bitter almond smell, too. Did she leave a note, Sergeant? Not that I've been able to find. She didn't leave a note, Patsy. But it looks as if she tried to leave us a message. Yeah. Um, what do you mean? I don't see anything. Well, look, Maddie, in her hand. Oh, I've already looked at that. It's nothing but an invitation to some swank tea party. Come off this afternoon. Oh, well, let me see. Mrs. Camille Huntington requests the pleasure of your presence at an afternoon tea in honor of Rashid El Bay, noted analyst of the Alcos. So on and so forth. Yeah, well, what makes you think that means anything, Nick? Well, how does she happen to be holding it in her hand when she died? Well, she could have picked it up before she knocked herself off. No, 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 I don't think so, Matty. It wouldn't be easy to open a bottle, pour out a drink, and hold onto a card like this at the same time. Mm. She must have put it down before she poured herself the fatal drink. Well, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So she must have made a superhuman effort to pick it up again. Remember, cyanide acts almost instantaneously. I don't know. I think Mrs. Langdon picked this up with the hope that it would lead us to her murderer. Yeah. Murder? What's that? That's right. Martha Langdon was murdered. But oh. how, Nick? The windows are locked and the maid says no one's been here all day. The dame drinks poison and you say she was murdered? I do, I do, Maddie. Smell this bottle of wine. Huh? Say, say. Yes, yes. The bottle has cyanide in it, too. And no one is going to commit suicide by drinking cyanide. Poisons the whole bottle. They only put the poison in the glass. No, Maddie. Martha Langdon was murdered. Now back to the case of the Crystal Prophecy. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. As we pick up our story, Nick and Maddie are talking to Robert Winter, who says he hurried over to Martha Langdon's home as soon as he heard of her death. Mr. Winter, do you know anything about this tea Mrs. Camellia Huntington is giving this afternoon? Why, yes, I'm attending the party myself. Well, can you think of any reason why Mrs. Langdon should have picked up this invitation in her dying moments? No, I can't. It'll probably be a very dull affair. Uh-huh. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Winter. Quite all right. I only hope you're able to catch one of those murderers. Goodbye. Oh, Mr. Winter. Yes? Did you happen to know a Mrs. Nora Church? Why... Yes. And Mrs. Doris Manson? I... Yes, I did. Thank you, Mr. Winter. Thank you very much. Nick, do you suspect Mr. Winter? I don't know. Hmm. Of course, those spats he wears are enough to make me suspicious of him. Spats aren't evidence, Betsy. <laughs> but the fact that Mr. Winter knew at least two of the other dead women is interesting, at least. And the fact that he's going to Mrs. Huntington's party this afternoon also interests me. You think all those other women were murdered, too? I'm positive, Betsy. But proving it is going to be something else. Well, come on. Where to, Nick? I want you to go home and get prettied up. You and I are going to that tea this afternoon. <laughs> Nick, you haven't explained how you happen to know Mrs. Huntington so well. Oh, I've known her a long time, Betty. Uh -huh, apparently. When we showed up at the door, she acted as though you were a long lost relative. <laughs> right, all right, I'll confess. It's very simple. I recovered some jewels for her some years ago. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it looks as if I'm not going to make good of my promise to Mary. Huh? Told him I'd keep an eye on Winter, but he seems to have disappeared in the crowd. Well, nobody can get out of this room without passing us. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. Attention, please, Effendi. Oh, something's going to happen, Nick. Yeah, yeah. Effendi, it is the time for the appearance of my master, the master, Rashid Del Bey. Oh, Nick, isn't that a beautiful beard El Bey has? And what a gorgeous costume. Yes, that is quite a costume. Good afternoon, my friends. I am much pleased that you have gathered here to do me honor. I will say no more than tell you it is impossible for me to read my crystal ball before all of you. But I shall be happy to conduct individual readings in a room which our charming hostess has made available. I will retire now to that room. Come on, Bessie. Well, Nick, you and 
not going to have your fortune told, are you? No, we're going back to the office. Oh, good. You can drop me off at the beauty parlor. Sorry, you'll have to cancel your appointment. Oh, but Nick, this beauty parlor is supposed to take years off a girl's face. That's it. We're going back to the office, and I'm going to add years to a girl's face. Huh? And that girl is you. <laughs> Patsy? Oh, I hope I don't look as funny as I feel. You don't. Your makeup's fine. You look at least 35. Uh, uh, that's the worst compliment I ever had. Now, Patsy, remember, whatever happens, I want you to play along. And when you enter the master's presence tonight, don't forget whom you're supposed to be. I won't, Nick. Well, here I go. Good luck. And don't worry. I'll be around somewhere. I'd like to see Rashid Elberry, please. I'm Mrs. Andrew Waller. Please do come in. Thank you. Then Saeed will leave purse and hat here. Then she will wait in Crystal Room. All right. Come, please. Please do be seated here. I go now. Tell Master. Thank you. <laughs> You are Mrs. Andrew Walla, who has come to seek advice from the all-seeing crystal. You are the holder of driver's license number 74592, issued in this city 18 days ago. Your original home was in Brightwood. Why, that's wonderful. It is wonderful only because through this power given to me, I am able to give help to those who come here to seek the answers to those things which they cannot know. Then maybe you can help me. It's very important. Very well, madame. Please to draw near and look into the crystal. <sighs> Do not allow your attention to waver for an instant. Mm. Oh, ball of ever-knowing light. Bring to your surface the future of the one who seeks the answers to questions as yet unknown. The world begins to clear. Picture is forming. I can see you, madame. You are wondering about a man. The man is nearly 35 years of age. He's over six feet tall, good-looking. He's engaged in a very dangerous occupation. His name is... Nick Cut. <gasps> well, it looks as though Nick's plan to have Patsy disguise herself as an older woman and gather evidence in Rashid El Bay's apartment has backfired. In a moment, we'll hear the conclusion of this adventure. Now back to the conclusion of the case of the Crystal Prophecy. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. As we return to the story, Rashid El Bay says, If you move, I shall be forced to use this gun. Oh. You are very foolish to come here, my dear young spy. How did you know who I was? A very regrettable mistake on your part. You were careful to place forged documents in your purse, but you also left the real one in it. Your appointment at the beauty parlor but... in your real name. Oh, no. Oh, yes. And now I find it necessary to dispose of you. But you wouldn't dare. You know that Nick will get you for it if it's the last thing he does. If Nick Carter tries to get me, it will be the last thing he ever does. I am much too skilled in the art of having people commit suicide to be caught by a mere detective. Even a detective of Mr. Carter's reputation. Then you did kill those women. Of course, my dear. Why? What have they done to you? They were stubborn. They refused to pay to keep from committing suicide. So... They did kill themselves as I arranged. Oh. Hassan. Hassan. Yes, master. What kept you? I was in the rear, master. Take this girl out to the car. I will join you. <laughs> this boy is going to commit suicide. You're making a mistake. Nick knows all about you and what you're doing. I doubt that. But even so, it will do no good. You are on your way to your grave. Oh, no. Hassan, take her away. Yes, no, Master. No, you know what to do, Hassan. Yes, Master. Go away. I am going to... Oh. Ah, 
Not that's the first time you ever rang that gong with your head. Oh, Nick, is that you? It is. Oh, oh golly, I, I thought you were her son. That's what you're supposed to think. Now, I'll just rip off the master's false whiskers so that when Sergeant Madison gets here, he can book him for murder under his real name, Robert Winter. <laughs> I tell you, Sergeant, I was never so glad to hear Nick's voice. <laughs> but it was certainly queer to hear it coming from the man I thought was her son. <laughs> How'd you do it, Nick? I told Patsy I'd stick close to her, Matty. It was the only way I could manage it. Yeah. Well, I got into the apartment, knocked out her son, and did a quick change so I could pass for him. Well, you certainly looked like the real thing to me. <laughs> I thought you were going to take me out and boil me in oil. Oh, oh Patsy, <laughs> you know I wouldn't do that to you. Oh, Nick... Uh, tell me, how did you know that Al Bay and Robert Winter were the same man? Well, you were partly responsible for that. Huh? I was? Yes. Don't you remember you said his spats were enough to convict him as far as you were concerned? Yes. Well, they did convict him. Huh? When the fake Al Bay appeared at Mrs. Huntington's party, he made the mistake of wearing his spats under his robe. I caught a glimpse of them. Well, I'll be darned. <laughs> and of course, Mrs. Langdon gave us a lot of help by grabbing up that invitation when she knew she was dying. I was calling attention to the party where I could find Al Bay and his pets. <laughs> so Robert Winter would advise these women to consult Al Bay, and then as Al Bay, he would tell them they were going to commit suicide unless they paid him off. That's right. Huh. If they paid, they were all right. But if they refused... He'd kill them as a lesson to the others, honey. That's right, Matty. <laughs> well, that proves that no one should ever believe the things that are seen in a crystal ball. <laughs> How about a few advance hints about the adventure Old Dutch Cleanser is going to bring us next week? Well, Bob, before I tell you about next week's adventure, I want to remind our listeners that the Red Cross is carrying on in peace just as in war. In any disaster, flood, tornado, hurricane, or epidemic, you'll find the Red Cross on hand with shelter, food, clothing, and medical care. But this is just part of the story of the activities of the Red Cross, so it's no wonder that the Red Cross needs funds. And I want to urge everyone to give, and to give generously to the Red Cross. And I'm sure they will, Nick. So am I. But now, Nick, about next week's adventure. Okay, Bob, I'll give you a few highlights. A man telephoned me, greatly excited about a discovery he just made. And before Nick could get any details, the man had hung up. Which made me curious. And from then on, we got mixed up with red pencil lines in a phone book, a list of perfume shops... A junkyard, a trip to sea in a crowded barge, and a... Whoops, Patsy. Mm -hmm. Save something for next week. <laughs> now, what do you call the story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Smuggled Perfume. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the Cuddy Packing Company, makers of Old Dutch Cleanser. Remember, when you go shopping tomorrow, get the cleanser preferred by more women in America than any other. Old Dutch Cleanser. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick, with Charlotte Manson featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Today's script was written by Charles Stubblefield. Original music is played by George Wright. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count... Use Old Dutch Cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Old Dutch Cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. What's the matter with those eggs Waldo had for breakfast, Nick? They had nitroglycerin in them. What? Someone put nitroglycerin in the eggs? No. What? Then how'd it get in? The chickens that laid these eggs put the explosive in. What? The eggs were laid by chemical chickens. And now 
solve the case of the chemical chickens. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. In Nick's office, he and Patsy are busy with the morning report. Uh, take this letter, Patsy. Right, Nick. From Mr. Jason Griggs. Here, sir, enclosed you will find a photograph taken on infrared film... Proving the will in question. Oh, Nick, boy, Nick, boy, I've been poisoned. If you don't save me, I'm a dead man. Now, Walter, look, we're too busy for practical oh, jokes. Boy, I'm feeling fast. If you don't find me an antidote, I'll be dead in two minutes. What have you got in that bowl? Eggs. Poisoned eggs. And I ate one of them. Are you kidding, Waldo? No, no, Nick. Some criminals have poisoned these eggs I was having for me breakfast. They're after me, Nick. Oh, nonsense. They've been poisoned, Nick. Smell them here. All right. George, sit down, Waldo. Sit down? Oh, is it too late, Nick? No, you're not dying, if that's what you mean. I have to make a chemical analysis to be sure. But you may have stumbled onto something, Waldo. Find anything, Nick? Not sure yet. Oh, Patsy, get your pad. This is the last will and testament of Waldo Aloysius Smidlin, who departs this world foully murdered by his enemies. Quiet, Waldo. <laughs> you haven't been poisoned. Then what's in them eggs? Nitroglycerin. Uh, the explosive? I had dynamite for me breakfast. In minute quantities, yes. Someone put nitroglycerin in the eggs? No, the chickens that laid these eggs put it in. Oh, huh? Nick, are you joking? I'm not. These eggs were laid by chemical chickens. And nitro isn't a thing that chickens can pick up anywhere. I think I'll look into this. What do you think's going on, Nick? Can't tell you, but here's what we'll do. We'll all go to the store where Waldo's landlady bought these eggs. Uh -huh. We'll each buy as many as we can carry and bring them back here and test them. Who knows? Maybe we'll find crooks in our omelet. <laughs> Place, Nick. Bleak is gross. Now, those eggs were large brown eggs. Mm -hmm. we'll go in separately and order five dozen each. I'll go first. Waldo next. Patsy last, right? Okay. Right. All right, I'm going in now. Follow me after a few minutes, Waldo. Sure. Okay, bud. How many dozen eggs are you here for? Uh, about five. Five dozen eggs in a bucket dozen. Here's your dough, five bucks. Hey, what's this for? It's the payoff, but I'm shelling out for the bum eggs I sold this morning. I beg your pardon, sir. I'm Janet Steele, pure food inspector for the health department. If you'd like to register a complaint about the eggs sold by this man... Have a heart, lady. I'm handing this customer a five-buck bill. What more do you want? No, no, you don't understand. I didn't buy any eggs this morning. I want to buy five dozen now. Ha-ha, I'm laughing. This dame already confiscated every egg in a joint. Good morning, folks. I just dropped in to purchase a little hen fruit. No eggs in this store will be sold. Huh? That's right, mister. No eggs. No eggs? You, you, you got boxes of them back there. I've condemned every one of them. Looks as if we'll have to try some other place, my friend. Yeah, but why can't we get some of these here? Say, Nick, what in the... Quiet. Hmm? We couldn't buy any eggs. Let's get away from the store window. I want to go around, take a look in back of the store. What's this all about, Nick? Looks like a phony setup, Bessie. Oh? I'm sure the man in there isn't bleaker. Unless I miss my guess, he's a crook posing as bleaker. Hey, what makes you think so, Nick? First place, the way he talked. Second place, by the money he offered me. I only got a quick look, but that $5 bill he offered me looked phony. But is this a counterfeiting case? It's worse. I'll explain in a few minutes. Right now, I want to see what's happened to the real bleaker. Ah, let's see. Regular suburban back alley. Garage behind the store... And here's the cellar entrance to the store. Think we better duck down to the cellar and look around. Get that door open, Waldo. Right, Nick. That's it. Take a look in the garage. That's the place safe. Right away, Nick. God, this is a heavy door, Nick. Quiet. I'll give you a hand. Nick. Yes? Come here, quick. Look what I found in the garage. Holy smokes. It's a, it's a man all, all tied up and gagged. Try to be bleaker. Help me get these ropes off, Walter. Yeah, sure. Take off the gag, Patsy. Golly, I don't think he's breathing. Hey, maybe he's dead. No, no, he's still warm. Oh, thank you. Heavens, Nick. Here, quick, Waldo. Try artificial respiration. Yeah. One chance in a thousand, we can save him. All right, Nick. Listen, Patsy. We're yeah. in a spot. Yeah. I've got to call Maddie for an ambulance Three. and pull motor at once to give this man a chance. Four. But when an ambulance Five. arrives, the crook inside the store is going to catch on. You've got to help me. How? Take off your hat. Four. Comb your hair into bangs. Make your face up heavily with plenty of lipstick. Disguise myself as a tough, in other words. Four. Right. That thug Five. in there hasn't seen you yet. Four. So you can get away with it. Go into the store and get him out of there. Yeah. Get him out by hook or crook. And yeah. stay with him. Oh, trust me, Nick. I'll do it if I have to sing torch songs. Mm -hmm. 
Now, look, Nick, I'm pretty sore about this. What's the idea letting that mug in the grocery store get away? I didn't let him, Matty. Patsy took him away. Do you realize that we can't bring Bleecker to? It's a murder rap? It's more than just a murder rap, Matty. Well, how are they doing with the pull motor, Waldo? Uh, no luck yet, Nick. Nick, what's all this about poisoned eggs? Very simple. Chickens are funny birds. What they eat goes into the eggs they lay. Yeah. For instance, if a chicken eats mothballs, its eggs smell of camphor. No kidding. Fact. Now, somewhere in the country, there are some chickens that have been drinking water polluted with nitroglycerin. What's that? The eggs Waldo had for breakfast had traces of nitroglycerin in them. So? Might have been an accident, but when I found an obvious thug posing as a grocer in the store where the eggs are bought, I knew it was something else. Somewhere, Matty, up in the farming country, there's a crooked plant manufacturing supplies for criminals. Mm. Boot like nitroglycerin for blasting safes, counterfeit money, probably everything that a crook can't buy legitimately. Holy smoke! And these polluted eggs are the giveaway to the plant, huh? Right. Some of the nitro must have seeped out accidentally and polluted the water in a brook or something that runs through a chicken farm nearby. Well, I'll be darned. That's why I had to hold on to that thug without tipping my hand. He's got to lead us to that place. Well, what's the pull motor stopping for, Matty? Oh, the job is done, Nick. Oh, that man was practically dead when we found him, but he's alive now. You saved him. Oh, boy. good, good, Waldo. Can I question him? Oh, no, no, not, not for two or three days, the doc says. He is going to be tough enough just keeping him alive. Two or three days? Well, by that time, this whole mob may be a thousand miles away. Ah, it's all up to Patsy now. All we can do is go back to the office and wait for her to check in. Hey, Eddie. Yep? Close that door, will you? I can't hear myself sing. You're a funny babe. Okay. When you invite a lady to eat in a private dining room, she likes to be private. <laughs> I never knew old man Bleeker had a good-looking daughter like you. What a break for me. You coming into the store looking for him? Uh-huh. How come you mind in the store for him? He didn't say he was going nowhere. He got a rush call. Had to see somebody about some garage business. Ah. Uh-huh. It's going to be plenty sore when he hears I closed up the place to go eat lunch with his knockout daughter. Oh, Eddie. <laughs> Ain't that waiter ever going to bring us some food? Huh? I'll, I'll go call him. I'll get that punk moving. Okay, babe. <laughs> Important garage business. That's a good one. <laughs> Back already, babe? Hello, Tyler. Janet. Uh, I thought you were... The girl you brought? No, she's outside phoning, Tyler. Phoning? If five will get you ten, she's calling a guy named Nick Carter. Nick Carter? Yes, Tyler, Nick Carter. The man who came into Bleecker's door to buy eggs this morning when I was posing as a health inspector. And that pretty face you're making up to belongs to Patsy Bowen, Carter's secretary. Well, uh, well I knew it all the time, Janet. I... You're a liar. Well, don't worry about it, babe. I'll take care Not of that Not for me, kid. you won't. You're quitting the gang, Tyler. You're too dangerous to keep around. Janet. Oh, oh. So long, Tyler. <laughs> Eddie Tyler sprawls over the table, two bullets in his heart, as Janet Steele slips out of the private dining room. With Tyler dead, Nick's only lead in the case ends. We'll learn what he does next in just a moment. And now, back to the case of the chemical chicken. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. As we pick up our story, Nick Carter and Waldo have pulled up to the cafe in answer to Patsy's urgent telephone call. Is this Patsy? Yes, what is it, Patsy? Oh, Nick. Nick, it's too late. I've lost Tyler. For what? good. He got away when you were phoning me? No. Someone killed him. What? Killed him? Well, where is he now? In the back room. Sprawled over the table. I, I went back and there he was. All right, Patsy. This is a tough break, but we'll manage. You got the car and wait. Right. Waldo, come with me. All right. Must be the room back there, Nick. Right. Come on. Keep your back to the door. No one comes in. All right, boy. What a chance. Might have something. In his pockets. No. No wallet. No papers. Nothing. Then, then we're stuck, Nick? Not quite. There's one chance. His pockets and his pants cuffs. 
What are you ripping his pockets out for, Nick? And you'll find out later. Now, this is what we do. You telephone Mary. Tell him about this murder. Yeah. Then join me at the lab. Okay. That's he goes to Bleecker's store to check the crates the tainted eggs were delivered in. Those crates are usually stenciled with the address of the farm that delivered them. Yeah, but we're... And if Patsy can find that address, it may tell us where Eddie Tyler came from. Oh. She can't. We'll have to depend on his pockets and the cuffs of his pants. <laughs> Pocket steady, Walter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Want to be sure this vacuum cleaner picks up every particle of dirt and grit that's in it. Uh, this one's clean now, Nick. All right, give me the cup of the pants. Okay. Clean them out, too. Look, I don't get it, Nick. Hold it steady. Mm. All right, that's clean. Yeah. And the other one. Okay. Oops, careful. That's it. All right, all finished. Yeah. Now we open the vacuum cleaner. Mm-hmm. And we have one porcelain trap filled with assorted dust. Dust. And this dust is going under the microscope right now. Why? You want to tell us where Eddie Tyler's been during the past few weeks. How the devil can dust do that, Nick? Use your head, Warlow. Yeah, but, but there's dust in the air everywhere. But it's not all the same kind of dust. Find particular kinds of dust in particular localities. And that's what I'm counting on. <laughs> Found anything yet, Nick? Uh-huh, I think so. Huh? That's he? No, it's the law. And darn good and sore, too, if you want to know. Find Eddie Tyler, Mary? Nick, this is a fine mess. You let Tyler get away so you can break the case and he ends up a corpse. Oh, when the commissioner hears about this tomorrow morning... The he... case will be ended by tomorrow morning. Are you kidding? No, hoping. I've been checking the dust from Tyler's pockets. What? Outside of ordinary dust, found almost everywhere, I've found smelter dust, flower dust, and particles of dry hay, all in the deepest layers. That means Tyler's been living in a farming vicinity that also has an iron foundry and flour mill somewhere near. Would you like that? Give me that industrial map, Waldo. Right. Uh, Nick Carter speaking. Nick Patsy, I just finished searching Bleecker's store. Yes? It's no good, Nick. Every egg crate in the place has been destroyed. Yeah. Not one left anywhere. Now, yeah, wait a minute. Yeah. This must be it. Huh? Nick, what on earth are you talking about? I've been checking my industrial map while you were reporting, Patsy. Oh. Matty, there's only one town in the near vicinity that's a farming center, and at the same time has a flour mill and an iron foundry. That's Brickton. Huh? Brickton? That must be the place Tyler came from. I don't understand, Nick. Oh, you will pretty soon. Hurry back to the office, Patsy. You, Waldo, and I are driving up to Brickton right away. <laughs> Mile, Nick. That's what the sign said. Uh-huh. Now remember, we stay under cover in this town. There's a sheriff in here that hates the very sight of me. Hey, did you have a run-in with him before, Nick? Yeah, in the Joplin case last year. But it was a, it was a run-in with her. Uh, hmm? Oh, a lady sheriff? Like in Texas, eh? Hmm? Tougher in Texas. <laughs> sheriff Moss Stickney is convinced I double-crossed her last year. She'll do everything she can to obstruct me now, so we stay under cover. All right. Now look, when we get into Brickton, you and Waldo each rent a car. Yeah. I've divided Brickton into three areas. Each one of us covers one of the areas. Uh-uh, here's the town line, Nick. Uh-huh. Now, each of us visits every farm in our area and asks the farm owners if they deliver eggs to Bleecker in New York. Yeah, but wait, some of them farmers might not answer, Nick. Well, here are two $100 bills. You and Patsy each take one. Huh? If you meet a close-mouthed farmer, tell him this $100 bill was found in a crate of eggs delivered to Bleecker. He can collect if he has records proving deliveries of yesterday. Well, that ought to work. Oh, slow down, Nick. We're passing a rent-a-car or garage. Uh-oh. Run by the terrible Ma Stickney. All right. Go ahead. Each of you rent a car. And we'll meet back here at 6 o'clock tonight. Good luck. is farm number three for Detective Waldo McGlynn to examine with his piercing eyes. Yeah, Wilson's farm. Maybe we'll have better luck with this one here. Ah, ah, it is a farmer. It's a farmerette I'm going to be questioning. <laughs> Very pretty, too, in them pants. Uh, uh, just a minute there, young lady. Yes? Uh, how would you like to earn 100... Uh, it's the health inspector. 
Oh, I've seen you before, haven't I, in Bleecker's Grocery this morning? Well, ma'am, I... You're the famous Waldo McGlynn, aren't you? Nick Carter's great assistant. <laughs> you got the right man, ma'am. <laughs> but it's a secret. Nobody's supposed to know that me and Nick is up here. Mr. McGlynn, I'm certainly glad to see you. It's about those eggs, uh, the bad eggs. Oh, you found them then? Yes, they're, they're here on this farm. I need your help, Mr. McGlynn. I'm only a weak woman, and you. <laughs> Waldo McGlynn's the right man for you, ma'am. Where are them bad eggs? There's a building back of this farm. Up this road a little. I'll show you. Good. Does Mr. Carter know you're here? No, ma'am. Waldo McGlynn works alone. Good. Now, what's the layout here, ma'am? You see that house there, right along the chicken yard? Yep. There's some men live right there. They rented it from Wilson. They pretend to be scientists doing research, but they... I, I know, I know. They're crooks, ma'am. They're making dynamite and burglar tools for more crooks. Well, in some way, the nitroglycerin they're making got into the chicken's drinking water and tainted the eggs. I've already deduced that myself, ma'am. So this morning, when the eggs were delivered to Bleecker's Grocery in New York, Bleecker called Farmer Wilson on the telephone and complained. Uh, huh? And Wilson asked the crooks about it because he thought they were scientists. He couldn't understand it. Uh-huh. And the crooks realized that the tainted eggs might lead the police up here to their factory. Yeah, sure. So when they learned that all the eggs in this particular shipment went to Bleecker's, they rushed down to the city and tried to cover up by closing Bleecker's mouth and paying off all the customers who came back to the grocery to complain. Yeah, sure. They even had a woman pose as a health inspector to make it look legitimate. But, ma'am, you... Come into the house, Mr. McGlynn. The crooks aren't here now. Hey, but, ma'am, you you were the health inspector. Yes, you... Mr. McGlynn, I was. Hi, Janet. Who's the character with the wool of spinach? Nosy little man. Works for Nick Carter. Hey, you can't... Stand still, McGlynn, and don't reach for that rotter or I'll blow you wide open. You're in cahoots with him. Shut You're... up! Bindle. Yeah? Carter's in town. You have to drop everything and take care of him. You'll never harm Nick Carter. Tie You'll down, never... Grandpa. Bindle, tell the boys to get ready. You can tie up this character in the meantime. Okay. Oh, I forgot to tell you. I have to kill Eddie Tyler in town. He turned out to be a nuisance. <laughs> What time is it, Betsy? 6.30, Nick. Oh, where in blazes is Waldo? Should have been here at 6. Maybe he located the farm. Yeah, he's probably there now, blasting away with that old forty-four of yours. Guns are bigger menace to Waldo than the underworld. <laughs> Sheriff Sidney! Sheriff Sidney, is that you? What? Well, that's that health inspector from New York. Sheriff Sidney, the most amazing thing just happened to me... Oh, I'm sorry. I thought Sheriff Stickney was in this car. You want help? I'll be glad to give it to you. I'm Nick Carter. Not the Nick Carter? Well... I'm Janet Steele, a health inspector from New York. I was up here investigating a shipment of bad eggs. What did you say just happened to you, Miss Steele? Oh, it's the strangest thing. I found a car parked out on the road. It's one that Sheriff Stickney rents. And, and guess what was stuck in the windshield? Half of a hundred-dollar bill. In what road? Where? Just outside Wilson's farm. It was near a large white building alongside the chicken yards. Chicken yards? Nick, that's it. Yes, Patsy, come on. Let's get out there fast. <laughs> Heavy roadster surges forward as Nick and Patsy drive into what is apparently a cleverly baited trap. We'll see whether or not the jaws of the trap close on them in just a moment. And now for the conclusion of the case of the chemical chicken in today's Nick Carter adventure, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. It's 7 o'clock. The night is pitch black. Alongside the White House behind Farmer Wilson's chicken yard, five men and a woman wait tensely, watching the turnpike road. He ought to be along any minute, Bindle. Yeah. I took the shortcut. He couldn't be more than five minutes behind me. He'll be along. This is what we do, Bindle. When he comes waltzing in looking for Grandpa, we knock him and the girl cold. Uh -huh. We take the three of them over to the covered bridge and drive them and the car into the river. Big accident. Oh, better do it, Hold it, Bindle. It. Listen. It's a car. It's Carter. I know that car. Get set, everybody. When I give the word, give them the lights and show them they're covered. Looks like Carter and the girl. All right, Bindle, now. Yes. Oh, you're covered, Carter. You and the... Holy! What's the meaning of this ruckus? What are you doing with them guns? Guns is illegal in Brixton County. That same sheriff. Your name's Bindle, ain't it? And yours is Steele. 
Well, you're both under arrest. We've you... got you covered, Ma. I'm sorry, your number's up. Don't get excited, boys. Ma's going to have a fatal accident along with Carter and the girl. The only accident I'm going to have is to pull the trigger of this Tommy gun. Hey, that's Carter. Carter, where? On the roof of your little factory, covering all of you. The first man who turns the light toward me gets a head full of sluts. Your racket's finished, Janet. You want to know why? Ask your lawyer. You'll be seeing a lot of him while you're trying to beat a murder rat. hand it to you. You're all right for a New York detective. Laying the whole case in my lap the way you did was mighty generous. Oh, Nick, boy, I got to apologize. I failed me mission. Just when I had this whole mystery solved, I made one little slip. One little slip. You walked right into a trap with your eyes wide open, you and your 44. Oh, <laughs> Just know. one thing, Carter. How'd you know that story of Janice was phony when she tried to trap you and Miss Bowen? Well, Sheriff, stick me three things. Before I came out here, I checked up and couldn't find any record of an inspector on the health department staff named Janet Steele. That was the first thing. Then I didn't like the idea of a health inspector working up here in Brickton. It sounded phony. She wouldn't have any jurisdiction up here. She sure wouldn't. But the slip that jailed everything for me was when she claimed to recognize Waldo's car as one of the cars that you rented. For a stranger in Brickton, it was obviously impossible for her to know that. So I pretended to fall into the trap. And that's all. Ah, oh, you done it in great style, Nick boy. When you showed up on that roof with a tummy gun in your hands, you was old Sim Carter all over again. Ah, uh, none of that fancy deduction stuff. No, sir, bullets and action. Nick, take Waldo McGlynn's word for it. You'll be a detective yet. <laughs> Nick, what about the adventure Old Dutch Clencher will bring us next week? Before I answer that, Bob, I, I wish to remind our listeners that National Boys Club Week begins tomorrow. And as you know, sponsoring a boys club of my own, I'm particularly interested in this fine work which is combating juvenile delinquency so effectively. More than a quarter of a million boys find wholesome activity and entertainment in these clubs. Under competent leadership, they receive companionship and recreation and learn to develop skills and ambitions. According to law enforcement authorities, boys' clubs lessen delinquency wherever they're established. For these reasons, I personally, as well as the makers of Old Dutch Cleanser, wish to salute the boys' clubs of America for their great contribution in building the citizens of tomorrow. And now, next week's adventure. Oh, it scares me just to remember that case. If it scares you, it must be some story. What's it all about? Well, Bob, it started with a mysterious disappearance of a lot of new cars that were never found again. And just about finished when Nick and I ended up in an old abandoned quarry full of water. But thanks to a new shortwave device, we managed to solve the case. I certainly want to hear this story. Uh, what do you call it, Nick? I call it the case of the lucrative Rex. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the Cudahy Packing Company, makers of Old Batch Cleanser. Remember, when you go shopping tomorrow, get the cleanser preferred by more women in America than any other. Old Dutch Cleanser. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Charlotte Manson featured as Patsy. Waldo is played by Humphrey Davis. Matty by Ed Latimer. Today's script was written by Alfred Bester. Original music is played by George Wright. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count... Use Old Dutch Cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Hi. I guess so, Nick. I feel like a Hollywood stunt woman about to be pushed off a cliff. Just do as I told you. There shouldn't be any danger. The Underwriters Association is going to feel awfully bad about having this nice new car wrecked. Not if it gets results they want. All right, hold tight. Here's the curve. And here we go. Now, 
the case of the lucrative wrecks. Today's exciting Nick Carter adventure brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. Our story begins with a young couple, Bob and Peggy Anderson, trying out their brand new car. Ah, listen to that motor purr, Peggy. Oh, it feels good to be at the wheel of a new car again. Bob, this hill is steep. Maybe there's a curb at the bottom. <laughs> if there were a curb, it would be marked. You don't see any marker, do you? No, but... Bob, there is a curb. What? Huh? Oh. Hold tight, Peggy! The fence! We're going through the fence! Oh. Peggy. Peggy, you all right? I... I guess so. Oh... How about you? Oh, I, uh, I got a bump in my head, I guess. No bones broken. Oh. Can I, let me help you out. Yeah. Oh, Bob, our new car. It's a total wreck. Yeah. Golly, we not only went through the fence, we went halfway through the wall of this barn. Say, you too. Don't try to get away. Well, who's trying to get away? Put down that shotgun, you idiot. Young fella, you mighty near ruined my barn with your reckless driving. Done near a thousand dollars damage to it. A thousand dollars? The whole barn isn't worth that. Don't go getting sassy, young lady. I'm a deputy sheriff, I am. Oh, now, look, Mr. Wheat. That but... name is Dillon. All right, Mr. Dillon. You'll get paid for the damage as soon as I can arrange it. I want cash, young fella. Oh, I, I haven't got enough with me. I get the cash, or I hold your car. Look, we can work this out somehow. Yeah? Well, look, uh, tell you what. I got a nephew in the garage business... Now, this wreck of yours might be worth two or three hundred to him. Now, here's my proposition. I'll take what's left of the car and call it quits. Oh, that's wait not a minute. Fair. Take it or leave it. Well? Oh, all right. I'm licked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bass. Another wreck this afternoon. Mighty nice new royal coupe. Here's a bill of sale. Yeah, good work, Dylan. <laughs> Arranged another wreck by taking down that sign that says warning and curve ahead, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I sure did, Rocky. <laughs> okay, Dylan. Make out that bill of sale to Elmer Eustace. Uh, same as usual, huh? All right. And, uh, Rocky, yeah. look in the files and see if we got a wine-colored Royal Coupe Model 76. Okay. Got a customer for a new job. Just itching to pay a big price. Well, there's no Model 76 Royal Coupe listed in the boss's files. Oh. All right, Rocky, come on. Let's go out and see if we can pick one up. Mr. Carter. In the past three months has been a positive epidemic of thefts of new cars. But Mr. Benson, hasn't a single car been recovered? Not one. That's why the Underwriters Association is asking you to take the case. Very well. But I warn you, I'll have to have a free hand, no matter how strange my methods may seem. Of course. Now, uh, what can we do for you first? I'd like a list of all the cars stolen in the last three months, together with the names of their owners. Certainly. Oh, uh, Miss Collins. Yes, Mr. Benson. Have you the car theft file? Oh, yes, Mr. Benson. I thought you'd want it. Here it is. Oh, thank you. Uh, that's all right now, Miss Collins. Yes, Mr. Benson. Here you are, Mr. Carter. Anytime you want me, day or night, please call me. If I'm not in, call Miss Collins. Oh, uh, here. Here's her home phone number. And uh, here's mine. Thanks. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got some work to do. If you can bear to give up playing with those radio sets for a minute, Mr. Benson from the Underwriters is here. Mm, good. I was just going to call him. All right. Show him in, Patsy. Right, Nick. Mr. Benson, will you step in here? I'll say I will. 
Mr. Carter, do you realize that it's 48 hours since we gave you a free hand on this case? And in that time, you haven't lifted a finger. Oh, yes, I have, Mr. Benson. In my own way, of course. Do you know that another one of our clients had his car stolen last night? Yes, I know, and I'm sorry. But I couldn't do anything last night. Now I can. Well, uh, that's something at least. I'll need three cars from you. What? Three new cars. Three new cars? What for? That I can't tell you. But give me the three cars, and I think I can promise you action in a hurry. Hmm. Well, all right, all right. I guess it can be arranged. I'll have them here this afternoon. But frankly, Mr. Carter, we want results. <laughs> Nick, I just left the last of those three cars at 7th and Washington Streets. Now maybe you'll break down and tell me what this is all about. Why, Patsy, I thought you'd figure the whole thing out by now. Oh, all I know is that you had me park those three beautiful new cars in different parts of the city, and they're supposed to be bait for this car-stealing gang. But why don't you have me put them someplace where you can watch them? Oh, but I am watching them, Patsy. Oh, are you kidding? I am not. Huh? Under the back seat of each of those cars, I've hidden one of those little radios you said I was playing with. What? They're really small, compact sending sets with an individual signal and a two-mile range. Catch on? Oh, I think I do, Nick. If anybody steals one of those cars... The radio starts sending out a signal automatically. <laughs> and with a direction finder in my car, we can follow the stolen car straight to the gang's hideout. Now, well, if that gang will just pick up one of those cars... Nick, they have. How do you like that for service? Wait. That's the signal from the Royal Coop you parked at the corner of Six and Johnson. We've got to get there fast. It must be straight ahead of us, Nick. The signal's been getting louder ever since we turned that last corner. Yeah. Thieves are taking it out this road. Must be headed for some place in the suburbs. There's nothing in sight, except that big truck up ahead. Why don't you pass it? Because that wouldn't do any good. Huh? What do you mean? I mean, the stolen car is on that truck, what? under that big canvas. Why, I never thought of that. Neither did I. Not until I saw that the truck was the only thing in sight. Pretty clever way of transporting a stolen car, isn't it? Oh, I'll say it is. Uh-oh, a freight train coming. Yeah, I better stop back here. I don't want to get too close to the truck. You know, I'd... Nick, the truck's not stopping. Great Scott. They're going to try to get across the tracks in front of the train. Oh, Nick. I don't. Well, this darn thing gets out of our way, that truck will be so far away, we won't be able to pick up the radio signal. Certainly looks as though luck's against us. Well, so Nick lost the first round in his battle to break up the ring of car thieves. But he's lost more than that. He's lost a brand new car lent to him to use as bait. We'll see what that leads to in just a moment. Now back to the case of the lucrative Rex. Today's Nick Carter adventure brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. It is the following afternoon, and Nick and Patsy in Nick's car are cruising around town, hoping to pick up a signal from one of the other cars they planted as bait. Hadn't been for that doggone freight train, I might have the gang rounded up by now. Nick, listen. Huh? That's the signal from the radio in the Royal Coop that they got away with. Yeah. It's getting louder. Now it's getting faint again. And did you notice that it got louder just as that wine-colored Royal Coop ahead passed us? Hey, that's the car that was stolen from us. Well, it's not getting away from us again. I want to force it to the curb. Hey, pull over. What's the big idea? Pull over and stop. Why, you stupid? Watch out! Say, what's going on here? You tried to wreck me. No, I didn't. I just want to stop you. That's a stolen car you're driving. Stolen car? You're crazy. I just bought it an hour ago. Paid spot cash for it. Maybe, but it's still a stolen car. Now, see here. I'm Judge Pearson, and if you think Judge you... Pearson, my name is Carter. Nick Carter. Oh. Oh, sure. I've heard of you, Mr. Carter. But I still say I bought this car legally. Hmm, look, here's the bill of sale. 
Mm-hmm. Sold you by a man named Elmer Eustace. Address 3192 Grand Avenue. And bill sales in order, all right. Well, the engine number it gives is wrong. But it can't be wrong. Look at the number on the engine and see for yourself. Thanks, Judge. I will. This is the car, all right. I recognize that tiny scratch on the door. So do I. The engine number will clinch it. Let me get the hood. Mm-hmm. Now, let's see. D-4-7-7-7-8-9. Well, that's the number on the bill of sale. But that's not the motor number of the coop that was stolen from us. No, it's not. <sighs> and it's obviously the real motor number. Hasn't been tampered with in any way. Well, are you satisfied? Yes, I... Yes, I've made a mistake, Judge. I told you so. Next time, better make sure of your facts. Well, Nick, you let him go. You didn't even look to see whether the radio was under the back seat. Didn't have to, Patsy. That's the car that was stolen, all right, even if the engine number is different. Well... Patsy, listen. Go down to the Motor Vehicle Bureau and find out who originally registered a Royal Coupe with motor number D477789. Right. Where are you going? I'm going to drop in on Mr. Elmer Eustace, the man who sold that car to Judge Pearson. Yes? I'd like to speak to Mr. Eustace. Is he in? Uh, yes, he's in, young man. But I don't know if he'll speak to you. I think he will. May I come in, please? Oh, no, young man. Elmer doesn't live here. He lives next door. Next door? Yes. Right there on the other side of the fence. But that's a cemetery. Yes. Elmer's been dead 20 years. <laughs> So Elmer Eustace has been dead for 20 years. Yes, Patsy, very dead. Huh. And what did you find out at the Motor Vehicle Bureau? Oh, well, the car you asked about was registered several days ago by a man named Robert Anderson. He lives only a few blocks from here, so on the way back, I stopped in to see him. What did he say? Well, his story, Nick, is that he bought a wine-colored royal coupe and wrecked it the same day. Huh. He gave the rest to a man named Frank Dillon to pay for damage the car did to Dillon's bomb when it ran off the road. A... The car, I mean, not the barn. Ah, that backs up my theory completely. Hmm? Patsy, how would you like to join me in a nice cacophonic auto accident? All set, Patsy? Well, I guess my football helmet's on tight enough, Nick. I feel just like a movie stunt girl who's about to be pushed off a cliff. Well, just hold tight. There won't be any danger. You hope. Well, look. There's Dillon's barn, just around the turn, down there at the bottom of the hill. I can see it in the headlights, Nick. My hunch is right. Dillon's part of the gang. My bet is that he's responsible for the accident young Anderson had. And somehow or other got Anderson to turn the wrecked car over to him. But if you think the gang also stole the royal crew we used as bait... It was the same model as Anderson's, Patsy. Only they took the engine out of Anderson's car and put it in the stolen car. But why would they do that? Because they got the bill of sale from Anderson. And when they put the engine from his car into the car they stole, the whole deal looked very legal. So that's how they disguised the cars they stole. That's how. And now we're going to have the same kind of accident Anderson had. Okay, Patsy, here's the curve. Hold tight. <sighs> Are you all right, Patsy? Well, all things considered. Quick, give me your helmet. I'll put it in the suitcase with mine. Here you are, Nick. There. Now they're out of sight. Hey, you! Pretend to be unconscious, Patsy. I'm going to pick you up and carry you. Mmm, I could learn to like this. Hey, you two! Don't try to get away. What do you mean, get away? We've had an accident. Yeah, I'll say you have. Darn near knocked my barn down. Must have done a thousand dollars worth of damage to it. I'll settle for the damage, but this lady's hurt. Got to get her in the house and call a doctor. What about my barn? I'll take care of that later. You can keep the car for security. Huh? Well, all right. Come on this way. All right, I'm following you. And keep on following him, Carter. What? This is a gun against your back, so no funny business. Uh, 
All right, Carter. Put the dame on his sofa and sit down here with her. Anything you say. There you are, Patsy. Oh. Make mm. yourself comfortable, Carter. Thanks. I'm calling the big boss to ask about your funeral. See that there are lots of flowers. Why? You won't be smelling them. Hello, boss. This is Ace Williams. Listen, Rocky and me are at Dillon's. We were giving him his payoff tonight when he walks Nick Carter. Yeah, tried to pull a fake accident, but me and Rocky got the drop on him. Now, look, boss, you got an idea. He's already wrecked his car, see? So why don't we put it on the truck and haul it out to the old Morgan Quarry? That's about 60 feet deep. Nick. What? Sure, we can put him and the girl in the car and push it off. They're going to kill us. Easy, Patsy. We're not dead yet. That's the idea. It's just a nice, clean accident. <laughs> okay, goodbye. Well, Carter, you can pick up the dame again. The four of us are going for a little ride. But only me and Rocky are coming back. Ah, gee, Carter, you sure make a pretty picture standing there on the edge of the quarry holding that dame in your arms. Hey, Rocky, give me a hand back here. Yeah, okay, I shall be right with you. I think they've got the car balanced right on the edge of the quarry. It means they won't have to push the very car once they get us inside. Oh. Patsy, how about a little swim? Uh, why, Nick, Look, are you... The quarry's almost filled with water. You can see it ripple in the moonlight. Yes. It's only about 20 feet from the top. Okay. We're going to put a fast one on these thugs. Okay, Carter, we're all set. Now, if you... That's what you think, Ace. Hold tight, Patsy. Hey! Hey, hey you can't... I'm Rocky. They jumped into the quarry. All right, Patsy. I guess so. Right, take it easy now. Make as little noise as you can. They can't see us, but they might judge where we are by the sound. I think you're a wise guy, don't you, Carter? Let's see how you like this. And here's some more for good measure, Carter. moment at least, Nick and Patsy have beaten the crooks at their own game. But they're not out of danger yet. We'll see what happens next in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the lucrative wreck. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by All Dutch Cleanser. We pick up our story with Nick and Patsy in the water in the old quarry. Ace and Rocky, standing at the edge of the quarry, are shooting at them through the darkness. They've stopped firing. They haven't hit us. That doesn't mean they won't. Stay close to the edge of the quarry, Patsy. They're right over us. Can't see us as they move to the other side. I suppose they do. My guess is that they have no more bullets. I counted the shots. There were 12, six apiece. Maybe they're reloading. You better take that chance. Nick, the edge of rock here. Swell. We can pull ourselves up on it. <sighs> oh, okay, oh, that water's is cold. Yeah. Oh, Nick. Yeah, you'll never get out of there alive. What are you going to do? Shoot us with empty guns? You ain't got no gun either, Carter. That's why you're wrong. I always carry a little spare in a waterproof case. Quit your kidding, Carter. You're done for. Call this kidding? <laughs> hey, Ace. Hey. Yeah, it's gonna come. I'm beating it. Yeah, so am I, Rocky. But don't worry. They'll never get out of there. They'll drown like rats in a trap. Nick, is he right? Maybe we can't get out of here. Maybe not. But we're going to try. <laughs> Well, Patsy, that wasn't so bad, was it? Oh, now that it's all over, it wasn't so bad. But for a few minutes, Nick, I thought we'd never live to get back here to the office. Well, we made it, and that's all that counts. Uh, uh, dry clothes help, too. Mm. I'm got to have these extra things here at the office. <sighs> what now, Nick? I've got an important phone call to make. As soon as I'm through, I'll get going again. Okay. Uh, 
Hello. Hello, Miss Collins. This is Nick Carter. Oh, yes, Mr. Carter. I have an important message for Mr. Benson. He doesn't seem to be home. Could you take it down and try to locate him? Why, of course. What is the message? Just tell him that I've identified three of the gang and have a police dragnet out for them. Hope to have them in custody by morning. Well, Mr. Benson will be delighted to hear that, Mr. Carter. I'll see that he gets the message as soon as possible. Thanks very much, Miss Collins. Good night. Well, that's that. And now I'm going out to find that gang's headquarters. Find their headquarters? But, Nick, they didn't give us a single clue to its location. Oh, yes, they did. Just one clue. Huh? And I'm going to build that clue into a whole court full of convictions. But, Nick... You stay here by the phone. When I call, come running with Sergeant Matheson. And every man he can get his hands on. Look, you two, the boss will be here in a minute, and I'm doing the talking, you understand? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, we understand. Uh, yeah, that's the boss now. Open the door, Rocky. Yeah, sure, yes. Hey, come in, boss. We're all here like you wanted. Close that door. Yeah, sure. Fools. Bunglers. Huh? Well, what do you mean? So you got rid of Nick Carter, did you? Uh, sure we did. And I suppose it was his ghost that just telephoned me. Just, just telephoned you? Nick Carter? He did. And he's identified all three of you. But it ain't possible. You didn't kill him. So now I've got to kill you. All of you. Oh, okay, Mrs. Now, Eustace, now wait, listen. You fail and you put me in a dangerous position. If I let you live, you know what it's happening? All right, drop to... that gun, Mrs. Eustace. Hey, Carter, what's that? Where did he come from? Pretty good act you put on this morning when I came out to question you. But I didn't stay fooled. You cowards, if one of you won't do something... I'll shoot the first man that moves. We we ain't moving, Carter. Good. I'll drop that gun, Mrs. Houston. Kick it over this way. That's better. Hey, look, Carter, how'd you find us? You'll find out, Ace. But first, if Mrs. Eustace doesn't mind, I'd like to remove her wig. You wig! Hey, it is a wig! This is going to be quite a shock to Mr. Benson, isn't it, Miss Collins? Hey, what's this Miss Collins stuff? Yeah, I thought she was Mrs. Eustace. She's both. You see, boys, by wearing this gray wig, Miss Collins became Mrs. Eustace. Well, I'll of course, be... by the time Miss Collins gets out of jail, she won't have to wear a wig. Her own hair will be gray. <laughs> I'll be darned. So Miss Collins was the mastermind of the car stealing ring. That's right, Patsy. As Benson's secretary, working right there in the office of the Underwriters Association, she was in a perfect position to furnish the others with the information that made the racket a success. But why did she play the part of Alma Eustace's poor old widow? Oh, that was a smokescreen. You hired her real identity from the gang. Oh. I imagine her original plan was that when the racket petered out, Mrs. Eustace would just vanish. And since none of the gang knew that she was also Miss Collins, they wouldn't be able to blackmail her later or implicate her in any way. But I still don't see what made you suspect her. That one clue I mentioned, Patsy. Hmm? When Ace phoned from Dylan's place, I counted the clicks as he dialed. 333-444 was the number he called. That was the same number Benson had previously given me in case I ever had to call Miss Collins. That was all I needed to know. Gee, but it sounds simple. When you explain it. <laughs> Now perhaps you'll tell me how you found the hideout. Oh, that was easy. You see, when I phoned Miss Collins and in that way let her know you and I had escaped, I knew she'd head straight for the hideout. Why, of course. Well, I got to the place she lives just before she left. Oh, but how'd you find out where she lived? Had Maddie trace her phone number. He gave me her address this morning. And where did she live, Nick? Right smack across the street from where Mrs. Eustace lives. Well, what do you know? From there on, it was a cinch. I saw her when she came out of the house fixed up at Mrs. Eustace. And then followed her straight to the hideout. Any more questions? Hmm? Oh, yes, teacher. Who owns that spiffy new sedan parked outside of the curb? That? Well, Patsy, it just happens that was an order for Miss Collins. But since she won't be needing a car for ten years or so, the underwriters bought it and insisted on presenting it to me. What? Oh, that's wonderful. Miss Bowen, may I give you a ride home? Why, Mr. Carter, it will be a pleasure. It isn't every day that a poor working girl... Oh, Nick, that truck. It's going to skid right into my car. Oh, Nick, if that isn't the darnest break. Uh, Here I get a brand new car. and don't even get a chance to blow the horn. Every week at this time, two great names are drawn. Crime. 
Every week at this time, two great names are joined as Old Dutch Glenter brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Patsy, get every boy belonging to the club into the gymnasium. Why? What's up, Nick? I've got to make a speech to one of them. To one? Then why make it to 120? Because one of the boys knows the killer in this case. And I don't know which boy it is. Now, the case of the Luminous Spots. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. There's pandemonium in the gymnasium of the downtown boys' club, Nick Carter's favorite charity. For with one minute to go in the big basketball game with Delaware House, Nick's boys are trailing by one point. Put it in, boys! We can't let Delaware beat us! Oh, Nick, only ten seconds more. You're going to try, Patsy. Come on, Smokey! Make Come this on, one go! Make it, Smokey, boys! Oh, oh Nick! Yeah, he missed, Patsy. Smokey missed again. Oh, and that's the end of the game. Well, they took a licking. I'd sort of hoped that Smokey Beats could help us lick Delaware this year. It looked like a flash when he joined the club last month. Oh, well. Well, don't look so sad, Nick. Think how much worse Smokey Bates feels. Hiya, Smokey. I've been expecting you. Come in, come in. Hi, Norton. Hi. Nice little joint you got here, fella. <laughs> Place upstairs used to be a dance hall. This is the basement. Costs us three bucks a month rent. Hey, who's the dame? All right, that's, uh, that's Fran Hollis. Hey, Fran. Yeah? This here is Smokey Bates. Oh, hello, Smokey. Hiya, Fran. Nice game you played tonight. Thanks. Say, which reminds me, uh, here's your dough, Smokey. Twenty-five bucks. Nice pay for just missing a few baskets now and then, huh? Yeah, I'll say so. We cleaned up pretty good on the bets, too. Made some nice dough. Yeah, yeah boy, this 25 feels good in the pocket. Ah, that's pin money, kid. Peanuts. We uh, could cut you in on some real dough if you uh, want to play ball. You mean throw another game? Wake up, kid. Wake up. Life ain't all basketball games. But if you're the kind of guy that's got nerve and brains and likes plenty of excitement, you... Uh, you could make plenty of dough. Yeah, Jerry and Jean from your club joined up with Noonan last month. Yeah? Well, what do they make a week, Noonan? Oh, 40, 50 bucks easy. What do you say, Smokey? I think maybe this is just what I've been looking for. You can count me in, Noonan. Good, it's a deal. Meet me here tomorrow morning at 7.30, Smokey. Bring 20 newspapers and a screwdriver. What's the papers got to do with it? Look, Smokey, here's the pitch. You and me is going to make like we're newsboys in case we get stopped. Oh, I get it. We make like we're on a delivery route. <laughs> That's right. Only we don't work for no pikers, though, like regular newsies do. This apartment house is next, Bates. What do we do here? Same as the last place? Ah, no. We use a different technique in here. It's the first apartment on the right. Ring the bell. You kidding? Ring it, I said. This is another of the joints I've been casing. Like I said, it's a cinch to look into first floor apartments and get the dope. The guy lives here alone. Goes to work every morning at seven. That's why you rang the bell? Yeah, just to make sure. Well, he ain't in. Give me that screwdriver, kid. I'm going to show you a fancy way to open locks. Light a match. I want light. Okay. This guy keeps his dough in the kitchen. In a sugar can. He's... Watch it, Smokey. What are you <laughs> kids doing there? Uh, uh, nothing, mister. We're just delivering papers. Who do you think you're fooling, Mac? I saw you working at the lock of that screwdriver. You're a couple of sneak thieves. Oh, no, you're drunk. Get away, sonny. Get your hands off me. Let go. little tin horn gangsters. You got us wrong, mister. We ain't crooks. Watch out, Smokey. Get out of the way. Don't try nothing funny, son. What do you got in your hand there? It's a gun, mister. Ah, uh, little toy pistol. I don't think I'll fall for that, sonny boy. You're falling for it, but good, Grandpa. Oh, oh. What's the row? 
rush. Where are we driving to? I got a telephone call from Maddie, Patsy. Insisted I drop everything and hurry up to 120 Amsterdam Avenue. Says my downtown boys club is involved. It is? How? I don't know. Maddie wouldn't say. Hmm. Here we are, 120. Come on. Right. Oh, all Maddie would say was that he discovered a murder. Murder? Hey, that you, Nick? Yes, Maddie. It's a nasty case, Nick. Looks like one of your boys is mixed up in it. I'd hate to believe that, Matty. Yeah, well, look here. This corpse is Homer Welland, janitor of the building. Oh. Hey, quiet, you boys, will you? Quiet. <clears throat> he was found dead about a half an hour ago. Twenty-two caliber bullet right through the heart. In some kind of scrap before he was shot, Nick. Yeah, I see the scratches on his hand. And look what we found inside one hand. A piece of wool torn from a sweater, and on it, a small silver pin with the initials D.B.C. Oh, Nick, it's the downtown boys club pin. Yes, I'm sorry to say. Oh. Well, Nick. Matty, I can't answer for every boy in the club. We've got over a hundred members. One or two may be kind to do a thing like this, but... Hey. Huh? Who belongs to this screwdriver? Well, I figured it was the janitors, but I don't figure all these newspapers. What happened is obvious. Some boy came in here this morning carrying these newspapers, probably to disguise himself as a newsboy. Yeah? Tried to jimmy open the apartment door with the screwdriver. Oh, wait, uh. Nick. How can you tell? Screwdriver's brand new, Patsy. And there are flakes of metal on the end of it that match the metal of the door lock. Oh. See the fresh scratches on the brass? Holy oh. smoke, I didn't... The boy used matches for light. You can tell because there's several burnt paper matches on the floor. Also, the match book, which is probably dropped in the scuffle. Well, that's right. And the janitor interrupted him. There was a fight, and then a murder. Typical case of juvenile delinquency. Nick, we got to get down to your club and pick this kid up right away. Matty, there are more than a hundred kids in that club. It'll take a week to question everyone and a month to check their alibis. We've got to work quicker than that. Well, how can we, Nick? Well, the wool from the sweater is your lead, Patsy. Check the stores that sell sweaters. It may be possible to trace the sale to the boy who's wearing it. Uh-huh. Also check the club. Someone may be able to identify the sweater there. Right. Now, what are you going to do? This matchbook is my lead, Matty. It's got the address of a candy store on Sherman Avenue on it, near the old Sherman Dance Hall. You know the place. Yeah. Gang may be operating from around there. They are. I'll find them. I don't like cheap tin horn crooks, especially in my club. <laughs> Close the door, Smokey. Okay, Noonan. Hi, Noonan. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Gene. Fran ain't here, huh? Nope. Hi, Smokey. How'd you make out? Lousy. Are you kidding? I took 33 bucks in cash and some jewelry. You call that lousy? I call murder lousy. Murder? Yeah, it's like I've been telling you, Noonan. It's okay swiping a few bucks, but I don't go for killing. I'm getting out of here right now. Running out to squeal to Papa Nick Carter, huh? Like fun you are. Oh. You need a little slugging around to wise you up, pal. Okay. You talk enough, to Noonan. But I can take you any time. Ah, your wind's bad, Noonan. You're weak. Why don't you play a little basketball, hey, huh? Easy, Smokey, easy. You knock his head off. Watch out, Smokey. He's reaching for his pistol. Uh, uh, Noonan. Yeah, yeah, I dropped him. He'd have squealed on me sure as anything. Listen, Noonan. Now, look, you guys got to help me get rid of the body. Yeah, get rid of it yourself. I'm getting out of here. Me too, and don't wave that gun at us, Noonan. It only holds one shot. We'll be gone before you can reload it. You're in on this killing, so remember that. <laughs> we're in, but we're getting out. Like Smokey said, bucks is one thing, but murder is something else. If you guys start to we talk... We ain't going to squeal, Noonan. Don't worry about us. Just start worrying about Smokey. He'll do more talking dead than it ever done alive. <laughs> Alone in the basement with the body of Smokey Bates, Noonan begins working desperately to find a hiding place for the corpse. We'll see what happens next in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the Luminous Spots. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. An hour after the murder of Smokey Bates, Nick and Matty cautiously descend the steps leading to the basement of the Sherman Dance Hall. This is the place the candy store man told us about, Matty. Gang of kids use it for a club. No, uh, maybe, but it's empty now. Well, there's a smell of fresh cigarette smoke here. Also, 
Hey, wait a minute. Huh? There's water on the floor. It's pitch dark in here. I can't see a thing. Well, look, Matty, where I'm flashing my light. What? The rest of this place is a shambles. But somebody's been trying to scrub this part of the floor. I wonder why. Uh, spring house cleaning, maybe. I doubt it, but we'll find out. I'm going back to my car to get my portable lab kit. While I'm doing that, you get some policemen. What for? To watch the entrance of this cellar. Tell them to let anyone in, but not to let anyone out. When I come back, I may have something interesting to show you. All ready, Matty? Yeah, sure. Hey, what's that thing you got there? A spray gun. Filled with a derivative of tolic acid. Uh, what? Um, come again? Put out your flashlight and I'll show you something. Okay. Boy, it's black as pitch in here now. Watch. While I spray this acid on the wet spots where the floors have been scrubbed. Yeah? Hey, Nick. There's blue spots appearing on the floor. Glow like phosphorus, don't they? Yeah. They burn just like a blue flame. That's what I expected would happen. Look, Nick. There are more spots up ahead there. Yes, come on. We'll follow and see where they lead to. Right. See? I just keep spraying. The spots keep on appearing. Yeah, sure. But what the dickens is the stuff that's burning? Blood, Matty. Yep. Did you say blood? That's what I said. Calic acid is a recent discovery. Makes the hemin in the blood glow in the dark. Even if it's been cleaned up? Yes. Enough always remains to react like this. Hey, Nick, look. The blood spots lead directly to that old ash pile. Yes. Maybe there's a body buried under the ashes. What? There's a shovel, Matty. Take a look. Yeah, sure, as fast as I can. I'll hold the flash for you. Okay. Come on, come on, come on, Matty. Hurry, hurry. I am, I am. Wait a minute. Yep. What's that? Good grief, Nick. It's a body. Yes. Let me uncover his face. So we can... Oh, good heavens. Nick, you know who he is? It's Smokey Bates. One of the kids in my downtown boys' club. Oh, that's too bad. Poor kid shot through the heart. Probably by the same murderer that killed Welland. Nick... He's wearing the sweater that matches the piece of yarn found in Welland's hand. Yeah. Hey, fellas, what are you doing back there? Hey, Nick, it's a girl. Yeah, I'll douse the light so she can't see us. Yeah, sure, but when she comes close, I'll flash the light in her face. Okay. Fellas, do him back in the ash bin. Hello? Oh, oh, you're blinding me. Looking for someone? Who wants to know? This is Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad. I'm Nick Carter. What's your name? Friend, Francis Hollis. Looking for someone in particular, Miss Hollis? No, no. Well, that is a friend of mine wanted me to meet her here, and... and her? I... You usually refer to your girlfriends as fellows? Oh, oh sure. It's, it's kind of a gag. What's the name of the friend you're supposed to meet here? Sally Brown. Uh, you usually meet her here? No, I've never been here before, Mr. Carter. And you know nothing about a gang of boys that hang out here? What's the gang? Oh, no, no, Mr. Carter. How old are you, Miss Hollis? Oh, almost 17. It's 2 o'clock. Why aren't you in school? Well, I had a study period, and I... Kind of slipped out. <laughs> I guess Sally must have been playing a trick on me. Yeah, uh, look, you better go back to school, Miss Hollis. You might get into trouble. Yeah, sure. I hate to get caught playing hooky. Matty. Yeah. Have one of your men follow that girl. Okay, Nick. And tell him to let her see she's being followed. Also, tell him to make sure she goes to school. That yeah. needs to wait and follow her home after school. Right. In the meantime, I'll do a little checking on her and then rush down to the club. If Smokey Bates was mixed up with this gang, there's a chance some of my other boys may be, too. Okay. Between Francis Hollis and the downtown boys' club, we ought to be able to pick up the killer. Everybody here in the gym now, Patsy? Yes, I've rounded up every last boy. Good. Let me have your attention a minute, fellas. A few hours ago... Smokey Bates was murdered in the basement of the Sherman Dance Hall. He was shot down like a dog, dragged to an ash heap and buried in dirt and rubbish. He was murdered by a killer without decency, honor, or shame. Now, it may be that some of you here have been mixed up with this killer. 
And if you have, I can understand why. You saw a chance for some easy money, for excitement and adventure. You figured the law wasn't your friend. It was just another rival to compete with. You thought crime was a bigger, more thrilling game. That's what Smokey thought. And I've told you what happened to him. But crime isn't fun. It's dirty, mean, dangerous. If I were you, whoever you are, I'd be ashamed and scared. Now, whoever it is who's mixed up in this has a choice to make. He can come down to my office and let me help him out of this jam. And believe me, on my word of honor, I'll do everything I can. Or he can try to bluff his way out of it. But if he does, heaven help him. Mr. Carter. Oh, hello, Jerry. Come on in. Come in, Jane. We're the guys. Yeah. Well, fellows, I'm glad you came to me. You're in a bad mess. This is the only way to work it out. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. I I guess it's like you said, Mr. Carter. We just started off doing it for fun. But when he killed Smokey... Who killed Smokey, Jean? I can't tell you, Mr. Carter. Oh, look, Mr. Carter, we'll tell you everything we did. We'll pay back every nickel we swiped. We'll do anything you say. But we can't squeal on this guy. We gave him our word we wouldn't. Okay, Jerry. That's the way you feel. I'm not going to insist. I'll get him. Without your help. But there's one thing I do insist on, fellas. And it's not going to be easy for you. You're going to the police. You're going to confess everything you've done. You're going to take what's coming to you. Understand? Yes, Mr. Carter. Sure, Mr. Carter. Good boys. And if it'll give you any satisfaction, Miss Bone and I are driving to Fran Hollis's home right now. And inside of an hour, the killer of Smokey Bates is going to get what's coming to him. Nick, how come you know where Fran Hollis lives? Did a little check him before I went back to the club, Patsy. Ah. Oh. Mattis should be here to meet me by now. This is it. The White Clabbered House. How much does Fran know about the murders, Nick? I don't think she knows anything. You don't? She wouldn't have come barging into the basement if she did. But she is mixed up with the gang. Hmm. Maybe we can locate the killer through her. Nick! Oh. Hey, Nick! Oh, there's Maddie standing in the doorway. And is he mad? I'm all in the house here, and for the love of Pete, hurry it up. All right, all right. Take it easy, Maddie. That bonehead cop let the Hollis girl get away. Oh, no. What? Well, let's have it, Maddie. What happened? He tailed her back to school, then he tailed her home. Then? Then about five minutes ago, a whole flock of girls trooped in here to see her. A couple of minutes later, they all marched out and she went with them. And my man didn't spot her. Well, at least you've got to hand it to her. She's a smart kid. Okay, okay. So what? What do we do now? I'll show you. I'll show you. Come on over here to the telephone. Hey, wait a minute. How come you know where the phone is? I was here a little while ago as an inspector for the phone company. Oh, what? so that's the checking up you were doing. Yes. See, I figured Fan was smart enough to spot the cop you put on her tail. That's why she came straight home from school. Then she let you in the house? She did. Oh, mm. my man must have missed you, too. Looks that way, doesn't it? But look, how come she didn't spot your voice as belonging to the guy she talked to in the basement of the Sherman dance hall? Because I used a different voice. <laughs> oh, 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 Nick. <laughs> Why are you moving the Davenport? Just so I can pick this up. Hey, what's that thing? Looks like a small radio. Better than that. When I said I was sure Fran would head for home, and she did. She wanted to do some phoning in a hurry. Only I got here before she had a chance to. Yeah, and then what? I set this small wire recorder down here on the floor next to the telephone box. So that's what that is, a wire recorder. Now, look, Nick, wiretapping is out. It won't stand up in court anymore. This isn't wiretaping, Matty. It ain't? No, no. You don't have to attach it to the phone. Instead, you just lay this wire near the telephone wire. And it mm. picks up what's said over the telephone? That's right, Betsy. Huh. Well, I'll be darned. What do they think up next? I don't know yet, Penny. You know. But didn't she say you leave the recorder? I asked her to get me a drink of water, Patsy, and while she was out of the room, I fixed it, and I'm sure she made a phone call the minute after I left the house. Oh. Now, let's see. 
Oh, Noonan. Yeah, that's you, Fran? Noonan, what's happened? There were cops down in your club. We were snooping around, and there's been a cop following me all afternoon. Are they wise to the racket? Cops down in the basement, huh? Uh-huh. Hey, that ain't so good. Well, tell me what's up. Okay, Franny, listen. I'm over at the Sherman filling station. Yeah. I just acquired a car. Beat it over here, and I'll tell you what's doing. But the cops are watching my house. Look, baby, use your brains. You can figure a way to get out. Just hurry up over here. So long. Okay, that's all there is. It's enough. Matter you stay here and cover the house. Patsy, come with me. There's not a minute to lose. Nick and Patsy dash out of Fran Hollis's house, hoping to meet her and Smokey Bates' killer. In just a minute, we'll see whether they left in time. And now for the conclusion of the case of the Luminous Spots, brought to you by Old Dutch Glenter. At the curb in front of the Sherman filling station, Joe Noonan sits impatiently in a new sedan. As he sees Francis Hollis approaching, he calls out softly. Fran, over here, in the car. Get away, Noonan. Nobody followed me. What kept you so long? I'm in a hurry. I told you on the phone I've been followed all afternoon. Then I had to get rid of some kids, and I had to duck in and out of alleys to make sure nobody followed me here. Okay, okay. How do you like the car, baby? Oh, it's a beauty, Noonan, but... Now, listen, kid, the car's taking you and me right out of town for good. Sure, Noonan, but... i got to work fast, baby, so the explanations will have to keep. Now, this is what you're going to do. Tell you, Noonan, you talk, talk so fast, I can't... We barge into the filling station, see? And as soon as we get inside, you pull a faint. Yeah. Just drop right onto the floor, out cold, you understand? Yeah, but... Just do it, kid, that's all, just do it. Now, come on. Hey, you want something, bud? Yeah, I, uh, gotta have a set of new Joe, gaskets. I, I... I feel kind of funny. Hey, Fran, what's the matter? <laughs> Oh. Fran. Hey, Bud, she's fainted. Give me a hand. Get her off the floor, huh? Okay, mister. If you want to help, you can reach. Why, well, you... Get over against the wall. Wait. Get the rod he keeps in the register, Fran. But, Norman... It'll shoot a lot better than this dinky twenty-two I got. Grab the dough out of the register, too. Hey, look, kid. Do like I told you, Fran. We need that dough, and we ain't got all day. All right. Don't think this character's going to spill anything to anybody. No, no, you mean you're going to kill him. Why not? No, then I won't get mixed up in a killing. You're mixed up already, baby. I knocked off Smokey Bates. You killed Smokey? Why do you think the cops were on your tail? But, Noonan, I don't want Make to Make up get... your mind. Are you with me, or do you want to get over there against the wall with him? Oh, Noonan, please, let me out of here, please. Okay, baby, get over there. No. I'll knock the both of you off at the... <laughs> all right, all right, take it easy, friend. Nobody's hurt. I just shot the gun off your boyfriend's hand, that's all. Sorry I couldn't get her any sooner. It was soon enough to end the criminal career of Mr. Noonan. <laughs> That's about all there is to the case, Patsy. They've got Noonan for two murders, and we've got him cold. Yeah, but how did he kill Smokey and Well and Nick? One of the reasons he held up the gas station was to get a revolver. He had a small single-shot pistol that fires a twenty-two caliber shell. Would have preferred something better, no doubt, but that was deadly enough at close range. Oh. Well, if the case is finished, Nick, where are we driving to this morning? Oh, the case isn't finished, Patsy. As far as I'm concerned, it's just started. What do you mean? We're getting out here. Come on. Oh, but this is the courthouse. We're headed for court. Uh, I don't get it. Patsy, you and I are going into that court and put up the fight of our lives for Jerry, Jean, and Fran Hollis. Oh, but Nick, what can you do? Get them suspended sentences, I hope. And then we're really going to work on them at the Downtown Boys Club. You mean Fran, a girl at the Downtown Boys Club? Oh, I forgot to tell you, Patsy. The Boys Club is opening a girl's auxiliary. And you're running it. I'm running it. Mm-hmm. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Now, see here, Nick oh, Carter. Oh, listen, Patsy. If I do any arguing this morning, I'm going to do it in court. Those kids aren't hardened criminals. And I'm not counting this case a success unless I save them. Well, Nick, can you tell us something about the adventure Old Dutch Cleanser is going to bring us next week? Next week, we're going to meet a young war veteran who decided to turn me into a detective college. Only he unfortunately turned himself into a number one murder suspect. Nick got him out of it by making him wear gloves. Gloves and detective colleges. Sounds fascinating. Uh, what do you call the story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Missing Thumb. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the Cudahy Packing Company, makers of Old Dutch Cleanser. (laughs) 
Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick, with Charlotte Manson featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Today's script was written by Alfred Bester. Original music is played by George Wright. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use Old Dutch Cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. At 10 o'clock on a Monday night, a man in the uniform of a sergeant of police walks down a dark side street and enters a small hardware store. Hey, anybody in the store? Coming, mister, coming. Got a late service, pal. We're just close. Holy smoke, the cop. I'm looking for Laurie Evans. He's my old man. Well, what do you want to see him for? It isn't a pinch, kid. Just a friendly visit. Laurie and I used to be pals a long time ago. Oh, oh, I see. They they call me Steve. Pop! Hey, Pop, come on out. Well, is it, Steve? You got a visitor, Pop. Pull down your glasses and take a gander. Hello, Laurie. Yes. Yes, Malone. Hey, Pop. Go to bed, Steve. Shut but, up. But go to bed. Oh, gosh. All right. So long, Sergeant. Good night, Steve. Well, guess you finally located me, huh? Yeah. What's the cop's uniform for? This is a cover-up for a job us two are going to pull tonight. Oh, can't you leave me alone? I've been straight for ten years. I haven't done a job since the St. Louis deal, huh? I lost my thumb in St. Louis, but you lost your nerve. Maybe. Anyway, I'm stay straight and I'm staying. Listen, Laurie, I've been a long time finding you. Don't think I'm going to let you back out now. All i got to do is pass the word that good old Laurie Evans is here running a hardware joint on me. Okay. What's the deal? You're going to help me crack a safe tonight, Laurie. Well, there's nothing much in that safe but a list of names. Names? 20,000 names. And you're going to help me grab every one of them. Is that you, Waldo? I ain't Waldo, honey, but maybe I'll do. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Carter won't be able to see you this morning. He'll see me good-looking. I'm from the government. One side, huh? See here, you can't force your way into Mr. Carter's office. What's going on? Oh, who's this? Make this... Mr. Carter, I'm from the government. I've got important business for you in this dispatch case. Yeah, huh? What's your name? Steve Evans. Mr. Evans, you're lying. Huh? The patch case is new. The letters on scratch with the price tag is still on it. Your clothes are new. Your army discharge button is new. You're obviously a recently discharged soldier. What are you up to? Gosh. <laughs> you sure tag me. That's my business. Mr. Carter, I, I've got something for you in this case. Here. Hey, what's this? Yes. Yeah. It's 800 bucks cash. All I saved in the army. Well, what's it for? I decided I'm going to learn how to be a detective. And you're going to teach me, Mr. Carter. <laughs> For the love of... This is my entrance fee. And if it costs more, I'll get more. Hey, look here, Evan. This is impossible. I'm flattered and honored. You've got a it. duty to us veterans, Mr. Carter. Of course, but... Well, I really can't discuss it with you now, Mr. Evans. I'm late in a case already. I've got to be running along. Wait. My first lesson. I'll go along. Oh, all right. Come along. Come along. We'll discuss this on the way. Well... That's me. I'll be down at Irving Place with Matty. Safe burglary and murder. All right, Casey. Just... Hi, Matty. I'm here. Well, it's about time. I've been waiting a half hour for you. I... Who's this? This is Steve Evans. He wants me to teach him the detective business. Huh? I haven't had time to talk him out of it yet. Steve is the Sergeant Madison of the Homicide Squad. Hiya, Sergeant. Okay, Nick. Stack the kid in the corner and get a load of this case. It's a little... Go ahead. This is the business office of United Veterans Incorporated. It's a veterans organization that publishes a magazine for its boys. And last night, someone was admitted to this office and broke into the safe. How do you know he, he was admitted? Neither the lock nor the door were touched. Oh. See the safe there and the body. Yeah, watchman. Slugged over the head and killed. Maybe he let the cook in and was double-crossed. Huh? Maybe. Now, what's peculiar about the case? One little hitch. There was $5,000 in a drawer in that safe, and it wasn't touched. So? You know the only thing he lifted? The magazine subscription list. He stole 20,000 names and addresses. That's all. 
The guy must have been nuts. Who asked you? Mm. All right. Let's have a look at the safe. Mm, very neat punch job, huh, Matty? Yeah. Dial knocked off of a sledgehammer, spindle punch back, and the small socket's broken. The way of cracking a safe I haven't seen in a long time. Oh. Uh, look at the edges of the broken socket. Huh? This is a rut. Not from the safe itself, but from the burglar tool. Yeah, it must have been an old set of tools. How can you tell? A look at the way the sockets are broken. Huh? Two blows of a chisel to each bolt. Took a strong man to do that. Yeah, I noticed that. Found anything from the body? No, nothing. Next signs of a struggle, two blows on the head, that's all. Uh-huh. Watson was either tricked and then killed. I was an accessory and a double cross. Mm. The killer stole nothing but a list of names from the safe, and that's what he was after. And that makes this a very serious case. Yeah? Why, Mr. Carter? Because, Steve, back in 1932, when Washington announced that a bonus was to be paid war veterans, some crooks broke into the office of a veteran's publication and stole a subscription list. Right after that, all veterans who were on that list were besieged with commons for every known form of confidence game. Holy smoke! Thousands of vets were cheated out of their bonus dollars. And this is the same setup. He stole a name to form a sucker list that will milk a fortune from veterans who are mustering out pay. And the list has got to be located before it starts circulating through the underworld. Well, how for Pete's sake, Nick? Well, the man who cracked this safe. I'll identify him through my files. And we may be able to locate him. Come on. Here you got every card on, Patsy. Right, Nick. Well, Matty, explain to Steve how we keep files on crew. Oh, come I'm on. I'm a veteran, Sergeant. All right, all right. Now, listen, kid. Every crook uses a personal technique on a job, see? He never changed it. It's almost like an autograph. Here are the cards, Nick. Oh, thanks, Patsy. A dude were looking for a burglar who opens safes with a punch technique and who cracks bolts with a chisel rather than a wrench. Yeah. This technique is so unfamiliar to me, I'm sure he hasn't been active lately. All right, let's have him, Patsy. Adams, no records in 28. Specialty blowtorch job. Bookman, no records in 34. Specialty punch job. Take that card, Matty. He's a possibility. Okay. Dennison, no records in 29. Specialty chopping job. That's a technique, Steve, of turning a safe over and chopping the bottom out. Dennison isn't that man. Right. Dugan, 37. Specialty ripping job. That's ripping open a safe with a kind of giant can opener. it. No kidding. Dugan's not a man. And... Oh, what's the matter, Betsy? Mm-hmm. You better read this one yourself, Nick. Maybe it's a coincidence, but then again... Seeing what happened this morning. Hmm? Hmm. I see. Steve, what's your father's name? Laurie. Laurie Evans. I see. Why'd you come to see me this morning? Well, I already told you. I want to be a detective. You sure that's the reason? Not too late to tell the truth. Well, why would I lie to you, Mr. Carter? Where is your father? In the hardware store on Mayor Avenue. Hey, what is all this, Mr. Carter? Explanations will keep. Right now, we're all getting into my car and driving out to the hardware store. I've got to see Laurie Evans. Pat. Is it, Steve? Yeah. Come on. Look, Mick, what's the kid's old man got to do with it? You'll see, Nettie. Open the door, Steve. Right. Door's empty. Where's your father? Oh, he's probably in the back of the store. Call him. Hey, Pop. We got somebody here to see you. Wait a minute, Nick. Yes, what is it, Patsy? On the floor here, behind the counter. Right behind the... Holy smoke, Nick. Pop, what's happened to him? Pop! He's dead, Steve. Been murdered. Behind the sales counter of the Evans Hardware Store in Brooklyn, Nick examines the body of Laurie Evans while Patsy, Matty, and Steve Evans watch. Laurie Evans was in a fight before he was killed. Yeah, look at the scratches on his hands and face. And the fight right behind this counter. See the nail kegs and tools knocked off the shelves? Yeah. And he was thrown down here. I wish I'd been here. Head struck that sack of plaster of Paris, putting it open. The killer grabbed a screwdriver and stabbed Laurie with tremendous force. Killed him almost instantly. But why, Mr. Carter, why? Steve, you'll have to know the truth sooner or later. Here's the card for my files that led me to ask you about your father. <clears throat> Laurie Evans, inactive since 1935. Specialty punch jobs. Further characteristics. Crack safe bolts with chisels. Does not... This isn't true. My father isn't a crook. He never was. Steve, it's the truth. There's no question, kid. Your old man pulled a veteran job last night. That's a lie. He's got an alibi for last night. What, what alibi? He was with a friend of his, a cop, Sergeant Malone. And you gave me... The answer to the burglary, Matty. 
I was wondering how Evans got into that office to watch him with Duke. Evans was with a pal in police uniform. What? Oh, how do you know the guy with him was a crook? Why, was he a real cop? Because you left a signature here. What do you mean? Look, by the plaster of Paris that's spilled on the floor, there's a handprint on it. A right hand with a thumb missing. A policeman can't stay on the active force with a right thumb missing. You're right, Nick. Maybe this Malone high pressed your father into doing this job, Steve. But that isn't the important thing now. The important thing is to find Malone. And the 20,000 names he's stolen before he peddles them to every crook in the country. Now, just a minute. Maybe Steve Evans fooled you, but he hasn't fooled me. Huh? Nick, I want to know why he came to you this morning after his old man cracked his safe at Irving. Oh, well, man. Quiet, quiet. Well, quiet. This is official, Nick. That look here. You can worry about a sucker list of 20,000 names. I'm worrying about two murders, and Steve Evans is my number one lead. He's met him down to headquarters with me for a long talk. Now, how about it, Matty? Will you try it my way? Oh, it's the darndest thing you've ever come up with, Nick. And if he is to be... But, Sergeant, I swear I know... Well, Matty, 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 All right, all right. But if it backfires... It won't. If Nick says it's okay. I'll see if we can check with you. I've been telling you, Sergeant Matty. The only way I can see to locate Malone and those stolen names is for you to escape. So I gathered, but how do we work it? We'll pay you. After you escape, take the northbound subway to Isham Park. Yeah. Get out of Isham and take the ferry across the river. From the ferry landing, strike north along the reservoir road. Got that? Yeah. When you reach a town called Hessian Courthouse, give yourself up to the police. Pick myself up? But I thought you... I thought you were in the army. Do you have to understand orders to follow them? No, Mr. Carter. Very well. You've got to get through to Hessian Courthouse, Chief. You've got to follow the route that schedule, no matter what happens. Oh, yes. One important thing. Wear a pair of gloves. A pair of gloves? Yes. All right, I'll do it, Mr. Carter. Just believe that's what is coming up. When we get out of the car, we've got to put on a good show for the benefit of any harm you You hit me in the jaw and run. I'll make sure to fall against Maddox so it looks good. Duck down on the subway and get going. Yes, sir. All out as far as we go. Matty, you're a fool. I don't know whether Steve is guilty or not, but the important thing is... You're not arresting me! Nick! Hey, come back here! Watch out, Nick! The kid's getting away! Get off! Will you? Hey, what happened? Stop that man! Stop him! He's gone, Nick. Good. The way they Now, let's get to work. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Nick Carter. I'm broadcasting from my car by short wave. Your local station has kindly consented to relay this announcement to help in the search for Steve Evans, suspect in the murder of a watchman at Irving Place, and his father, Laurie Evans, in a hardware store in Brooklyn. Steve Evans has escaped police custody and is at large in the city. He is 20 years old, of medium height, red hair, brown eyes. He is wearing gray suit, gray hat, blue overcoat. He has lost the thumb from his right hand. When last seen, Steve Evans was on the subway headed north toward Isham Park. Please communicate any information to me at once. There is a reward for his capture. Hey, buddy. Did you hear that announcement on the air? Huh? What announcement? I heard it just before I got on to the last station. Nick Carter's offering a big reward for a killer. Old city's buzzing around trying to grab it. Yeah? Well, who's he looking for? A guy named Steve Evans. Killed his old man, he says. I... He killed his old man. Carter said that. Yeah, and a night watchman. Oh, he's a guy about medium height, say, like you, and he's, he's got red hair like... like you, too. Hey, let me see your right hand. What for? Never mind what for. Take off your glove and let me see your right hand. Sorry, Matt. This is my station. So long. Hey, stop him! Stop him! That guy's the killer! He's the one driving the weapon to the war war! Somebody stop him! He's getting away! I gotta hide someplace. Get up out of the station and hide some bark. It's gonna be dark soon. I can just hold out a little longer. Steve. Huh? Steve, over here, quick. Who's that? Patsy Bowen, Nick Carter's secretary. Get over here on the bench with me. Hurry up. But how did you... I was on the train with you. I got out ahead, but I heard the trouble. Steve, this is an emergency. Make I see my boyfriend. Put your arms around me and keep your head down. Quick, here they come. All right. Hey, please. You see your guy go past here. I'll run ahead of time. Ah, but please say, can't people get a little privacy in a park? Yeah, a guy ran past here towards Broadway. Go not say. All right, Steve, we can break it up now. Who's sworn? Get on the ferry and keep going. Follow Nick's orders. But he's double-crossing me. Telling people I killed my father and offering him a woman. He's never double-crossed anyone in his life. Just follow instructions, please. Keep going. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Nick Carter again. 
Steve Evans was last seen headed for the Isham Ferry and is probably attempting to cross the river and escape into open country. All officials and citizens in that vicinity are warned to keep a sharp lookout for a red-haired man with a thumb missing from his right hand. Hey, river's mighty pretty around dusk, hey, buddy? Yeah. It's funny, ain't it? This here river looks so calm and peaceful, but there's a lot happening on it right now. It's on guards on both sides. Yeah? How yeah. oh, come? Ain't you heard? There's a killer trying to get a cross in this little brother. Kill his own man, he did. Uh, the name of Steve Evans. Everybody's looking for him. Yeah? Yeah, Miss Carter herself is directing a search by radio. Uh, have a cigarette? No, thanks. Uh, this is uh, Steve Evans. He's a veteran. He's got red hair and he... Hey, buddy. Yeah? Why are you wearing gloves? Well, because I'm cold, that's why. Well, uh, I'd better be moving forward. The ferry's due to dock now. Just a minute, wise guy. You ain't tripping away so easy. Come here, 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 Ladies and gentlemen, this is Nick Carter again. After eluding capture by swimming ashore from the Isham Ferry, Steve Evans has made for the reservoir road and headed north. I want to warn all motorists against picking up hitchhikers. Please report any information to me immediately. I need to I gotta keep going. I gotta keep on the Isham Courthouse. I promise Mr. Carter. I... Who's that? There's someone behind that tree. Who? Oh. Oh, it's the nerves again. Uh oh. Car ain't like gone up the road. I'm gonna suck him in a bitch again. All right, kid. Come out of the dish. I'm alone. Yeah. Gas Malone. How did you... I've been up and down this road a dozen times looking for you, kid. I've been listening to them Nick Carter reports like I was a cop myself. Listen, Malone. Come on, come on. Get into the car. And no argument. This rod ain't a water pistol. Look, Malone. Get into the car, kid. I'm gonna drive you to my office. It's a quiet place where we can have a nice little talk. Thirty minutes after Gas Malone picked up Steve Adams on the reservoir road, his car draws up before a small building in downtown New York. We're here, kid. Get out. Okay. And don't get funny, Steve. I'd just as soon drop you now as later. I'm not crying anything. Not as long as you've got that gun. Open the door. Go straight upstairs. You kill my father, Malone. Yeah, kid. His conscience started bothering him about the way I knocked off the watchman last night. It was all for phoning the cops. I had to shut him up. No hard feeling, kid. It was business. Yeah. Dirty business. <laughs> Just like I got nothing against you, kid. Maybe you're a nice guy for all I know. Open the door. Go on in. No, no, kid. I got nothing against you. But you might make trouble for me. Listen, Malone, I got a nice setup here, see? Quiet little office. 20,000 names of XGIs. The hottest sucker list an operator ever got his hands on. After I take the cream off the list, I can sell them names for two bits each. Why, there's 50 grand in this deal for me, and I... Sort of got to protect it. Listen, Malone, you don't have to kill me. I know the cops want you for the killings. I don't know how you got mixed up, and I don't care. Just assume leave you to handle the mess yourself, except for one thing. What? How come they said you was missing a thumb? They said I was missing a thumb? Yeah, how come? What'd you tell them? I never told them nothing. Now, look. This is the clutch, kid. We're all alone here. You... Me and this gun. Now, I want some answers. What about the thumb? Honest Malone, I don't... Hey! 
Missed you that time, Steve, but I'll take better aim the next time. Why'd the cops say you was missing a thumb, Steve? They've got the trap going. Don't try to shoot him out. I warned you. Take up his gun, Steve. Okay. Sorry, I was late getting up the stairs, but the door of the luggage compartment of Malone's car jammed on me. It took time for me to get out. Hey, car. Oh, stop your whining, Malone. I just put a bullet through your left hand, that's all. Maybe you'll lose that thumb, too. But it won't make any difference to you when you're in the chair. Mr. Carter, I still don't understand why I had to go through that whole routine. You were bait, Steve. You were bait, just bait. But why? Well, you see, Steve, it would have been impossible to track Malone down in time to stop him from using those stolen names. So instead of looking for him, I made him look for me and lead me to the stolen names. Yeah, but he was looking for me. Naturally, that's what I wanted. So I stirred up a big fuss, made broadcasts every 15 minutes, kept stressing the fact that you had a missing thumb. Well, that's what I don't get. Malone believed the police were after you, but he couldn't understand about that thumb. Finally, his curiosity got the better of him. He had to find you and ask you about it. Oh. I made sure he'd know where to find you. But he might have killed me. Not until he found out what he wanted to know. And I felt sure he wouldn't try anything where he picked you up because there might be police around. And don't forget, Steve, I followed you up the reservoir road hiding in the brush behind you. Then that was you behind that tree. Right. As soon as I heard Malone say he was going to drive you to his office, I slipped into the baggage compartment of his car while he was talking to you. Because his office is what I wanted to locate. I passed you seven times on the road, Steve. I was in Nick's Roadster. <laughs> My, how fast you dove into the ditch. Uh, and didn't you spot me, Steve, boy? Well, old Waldo passed you twice in that truck. Once he hid behind the billboard, and once he got behind the detour sign. <laughs> Holy smoke. Hey, Mr. Carter, is this what detectives have to do all the time? Most of the time. Which brings up the original question of your taking lessons from me. Now, look. You don't have to say anything, Mr. Carter. None of this business of being a detective for me. You know what I'm going to do? Get myself a nice, easy job. I'm going to re-enlist in the Army. Cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, I don't understand it. Why did I have to get dressed up like a bobby sock to meet you in front of this candy store? Hey, are you going to buy me a soda, huh? No, Patsy. You're going to sell magazine subscriptions. Sell magazines? Why? To find a pair of killers. Ladies, in case you missed last week's broadcast, here's the news again. Old Dutch Cleanser's popular silverware offer is back. Now you can get four beautiful William A. Rogers A1 Plus quality teaspoons made and guaranteed by Oneida Limited in the lovely Croydon pattern. These teaspoons are pure silver plate, reinforced at wear points, and have a retail value of $4 a dozen. But you can get four of them for just 60 cents and the windmill pictures from two old Dutch labels. And then along with your William A. Rogers teaspoons, you'll get an illustrated folder telling how to build a complete silver service for your table, all at a marvelous bargain price. So send for your teaspoons now. Order as many units of four as you wish. Just be sure to enclose two windmill pictures and 60 cents in coin for each unit ordered. Mail with your name and address to Old Dutch Cleanser, Box U, Chicago 90, Illinois. That's Old Dutch Cleanser, Box U, Chicago 90, Illinois. Price is subject to change without notice. And now the case of the sunken dollar. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. At 5 o'clock Monday afternoon, a heavy-set man and a pretty red-headed girl walk down the twisted streets near Maiden Lane and enter the musty shop of Jason Grange, one of the biggest coin dealers in the East. Mr. Grange? Mr. Grange, y'all here in the store? Just one minute, please. Just one minute. It's okay. We're the only ones here. You clients give me a pain, that's what you do. A big, stiff pain. Always coming in at closing time. Never give a man a chance to have dinner. Now, what is it, please? What is it? <laughs> Isn't it the most cunning man in the whole world? Yeah? I declare, Daddy told me you were cute, but I never dreamed the famous Mr. Grange would be like this. 
I got half a mind to give you a great old hug and a kiss. <clears throat> no, Miss, Miss, please. I'm Sally Ann Mason. You can call me Sally. Mason? Mason? You are related to Colonel Mason of Memphis? I'm his daughter, Mr. Grange. Great collector, Colonel Mason. One of the best. So you're his daughter. Well, well, well. What are you doing in town? Daddy sent me up to buy a coin from you, Mr. Grange. He did, eh? Huh, think of that. He wants to buy the 18-4 silver dollar. Well, I never thought he'd get around to it. Uh, price is $10,000, you know. Yes. I brought the cash with me. Cash? Yes. This is Mr. Brown from the bank. He was sweet enough to chaperone me around the city. Show Mr. Grange the money, Mr. Brown. You got it right here, Mr. Grange, and 500. Uh, but if you don't mind... I've got the responsibility for this little girl. Could I ask why the coin she's buying is supposed to be worth 10000 Ah, uh, you're interested, eh? Of course. <laughs> oh, wait, I'll take it out of the safe. You can see for yourself. Good. In the year 1804, 19,000 silver dollars were minted, but only three are in existence today. Oh, how's that? Well, the reason is that the coins were shipped north by boat from the mint. The boat was lost at sea. Oh, that's that so. makes the eighteen four dollar one of the rarest American coins. And here it is. <gasps> I declare. Isn't it just too cunning for words? Okay, Louis. Sure, Hazel. Wait, 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 what's this? Well, Maddie, I hope this is really urgent. You've interrupted three reports and a lab analysis with your hurry-up call. Not to mention making me miss my dinner. Nick, this is really a mess. Murder with a sword of trimmings. Oh? Yeah. This is the body of Jason Grange, the de dealer. Murdered about an hour ago. Three bullets, dead center through the heart. I see. Well, what are the trimmings? Well, in the first place, Grange was shot with the craziest looking bullets I ever saw. Huh? A medical examiner just extracted them. Here, take a look. Hmm. Huh. Conical slug with the point squared off. Right? Yeah, you know what it is? Sure. The square-pointed 9mm Luger bullet, Matty. It's unusual in this country. What else? Well, whoever murdered Jason Grange stole only one single coin. What, what coin? An antique silver dollar dated 18-4, worth $10,000. Oh, oh, yes, the famous lost dollar. Most of them are supposed to have been lost by shipwreck. Well, how do you know the dollar was the only thing stolen, Matty? Oh, we checked on that. Checked his stock against his inventory. The only thing we could find missing was that sunken dollar. Sounds logical. Mm -hmm. And here's another trimming. Before Grange died, he scrawled the numbers 1804 in blood on the floor. You see it? Oh, yes. It's curiouser and curiouser. Yeah. Anything else? Yep, and this'll kill you. Under the counter, we found the corner of a $500 bill. Looks like it was torn off accidentally. Here. Ah, oh, this is very interesting. <laughs> Happen to notice that the engraving is rather fuzzy, Matty? Yeah. Uh, you got quick eyes, Nick. Took me ten minutes before I noticed. What are you two talking about? This is a piece of counterfeit money, Patsy. Can well, Nick, let's see you put it together. Why did the killer only steal the eighteen four dollar when he could have taken a fortune in money and rare coins? And how come the counterfeit five hundred? There's just one answer, Matty. This was murder for advertisement. Murder for what? The killer or killers deliberately murdered Grange to advertise the theft of the eighteen four dollar. Well, how do you figure that, Nick? Well, in the first place, Grange didn't write eighteen four in blood. The killer did. What? Grange was killed with three bullets through the heart. He must have died instantly. Oh. He couldn't have written that date. Why, sure. That's right. The killer wants the world to know that the eighteen four dollar was stolen. Why? So he can sell it. No, I don't think so. Don't overlook the counterfeit money, Patsy. Oh. Well, what's that got to do with it? The killer probably got Grange to show him the dollar by flashing phony money and pretending to be interested in buying. But why? If the killer can counterfeit modern money, he certainly can counterfeit an eighteen four dollar. Holy smoke, Nick. You think he's going to counterfeit a whole pack of these sunken dollars? I do. And with a theft well advertised, he can sell dozens at $10,000 each, pretending each one is the original stolen dollar. Then what do we do? we got nothing to go on. Oh, Maddie, you've got plenty. That Luger bullet is a rare bullet. There aren't many dealers in this city who carry it. No, you're right, Nick. Then get your squad out. Check every dealer. Try to get a line on recent purchasers. Right. What about you? I'm going back to the laboratory and do some research into the fine art of counterfeiting. Past 
past midnight. Aren't you ever going to quit? No, I'm almost finished, Betsy. What have you got? Well, I've been through my counterfeiting samples about 20 times. I think I've eliminated all except five of them. Oh, good. Each of those five closely resemble the work on this note. Get our files on counterfeiters, will you? Uh-huh. Ready. First sample, Jerry Hall. Jerry Hall. Jerry Hall, at present serving 20-year term in Atlanta. That lets him out. Hal Moore. Hal Moore. Hal, Hal Moore. Mm, dead. Killed in 45. That gets us down to three. Joe Mitchell. Joe Mitchell. Out on parole, working in Chicago. Hmm, maybe Joe's gone back to the old racket. Larry Denby. Alcatraz. Peter Baker. Baker, Baker, Baker. Ah, Peter Baker at large, this city, last known address, 28 East 2nd. And it's between Pete Baker and Joe Mitchell. Uh-huh. All right, we'll check Joe later. Maybe he's still in Chicago. Right now, we'll run down to 28 East 2nd to see what he's... Oh, phone. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Patsy, this is Matty. Got a report for Nick. Oh, just a minute. Nick is the sergeant. All right. Yes, Matty? Just finished the check on the Luger bullet, Nick. Only person who bought a 9mm slug in the past six months is a woman. A woman? Yeah. She bought it last week. Couldn't get anything much in the way of a description. She's a pretty redhead, that's all. Huh. All right, Matty, thanks. Maybe I'll have something to report to you in an hour or so. Yes, such as what? I'll know as soon as I've spoken to Pete Baker. What time is it, Louie? Louie, put down that magazine. Huh? What'd you say? What time is it? One o'clock. Hey, oh. Pete! Pete Baker! Yeah? How much longer, Grandpa? Just a couple of minutes, Hazel. Well, hurry it up. You know, Hazel, you sound like a pretty cute kid when you put on that southern accent of yours. Yeah? You mean you don't like me this way? Oh, sure, sure. You better. Hey, Grandpa, I'm tired waiting. All right, all right. It's the first time I ever made moles for old-fashioned dough like this color. Yeah, you better do better with that than you did with them phony 500s we flashed on Grange. I thought the old boy was going to get wise they were so bad. You got a nerve. Talking like that to the best engraver and molder in the business. Yeah, maybe okay, was one. okay, okay, okay. Just get those molds finished and Just we'll... Just about finished now. Wait a minute. Aim to cast them silver dollars and sell them? Yeah. They're worth much? Hmm. Ten grand each, Grandpa. And it's safer in passing regular dough. If the guy that buys an 18 for a dollar finds out it's a phony, he can't squawk. He's already bought stolen goods. <laughs> That's pretty smart. Yeah. Uh, there we are. Uh, yeah. Beauties, ain't they? Yeah. Best job ever done. Let's see. Won't be able to tell a coin cast from this mold from the real thing. Yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Okay, wrap them up, Louie. And let's get out of here. Uh, just a minute, folks. Five grand was the price for making them molds. You don't take them unless you get paid. <laughs> he wants to be paid. Hmm. Pay him, Louie. Okay, Hazel. <laughs> This is 28 East 2nd, Patsy. Come on. Uh-huh. Oh, I feel as though I'm walking in my sleep. It's only a little after one. We'll be finished soon. Take a look at the sign on the door. It says this building's been condemned. Yeah, so I see. Then we're out of luck, huh? Not necessarily. Unfortunately, it's not unusual for people to have to live in a condemned building until it's actually torn down. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Certainly be an ideal place for a hideout. Well, let's see what we can find anyway. Mm-hmm. Golly, it's dark as pitch in here. Get my flashlight out. There, it's better. Oh, Nick, this place looks deserted. Maybe. This apartment's certainly empty. So's this one. Oh, this is a wild goose chase, Nick. Uh, wait, there are a couple of empty milk bottles outside that door down the hall. Oh, they've probably been there for months. That's so fast, Betsy. We can't afford to jump to conclusions. Let's take a look in that apartment anyway. Okay. 
There's some furniture in here, Nick. So I see. Nick, you smell that perfume? Somebody's been in here recently. Yes. The smell is too strong to be very old. Uh oh. Oh, Nick. Is that Peter Baker there on the floor? Yes. And he's very dead. <laughs> In the glare of the flashlight, Pete Baker's body is outlined, sprawled on the cluttered floor. Swiftly, Nick inspects the dingy room. Having discovered Pete Baker's body on the floor of his room, Nick examines the dead man closely. Hmm. Two bullet wounds in the chest. Body's still warm. Hmm. Patsy Baker was killed only a few minutes ago. Nick, that perfume we smelled. Maybe the woman who wore that perfume killed him. Possible. I wonder if there's anyone else living in this house who might have seen or heard anything. Well, there's one way to find out, Nick. Yeah, I'll see what I can find in here. While I do that, suppose you go through the building. Cover every apartment. Right. See if you can find anyone who heard shots about five minutes ago and what they did about it if they did. Nick, I've been to every apartment in the building. What did you find? Nothing. They're all empty. You find anything? I did. There was a woman in here with Baker. I found this long red hair. Oh. And I think there was a man with her. Well, why do you think that? Found the cigar butt under that chair. Probably where he sat. See all the cigar ashes mm, on the floor there? Yeah, but couldn't Baker have left it there? No, I doubt that. Baker smoked a pipe. It's still there on the floor where he dropped it when he was shot. Yeah. Nick, what do you think happened? Baker must have been making a mold for them. Uh-huh. His blowtorch and crucibles and other apparatus are still warm. Nick. Could he have been making a mold of the 1804 dollar, do you suppose? Very likely, the way this case ties together. When he finished it, they killed him and then walked out. Yeah. You through here now, Nick? Yeah, I think so. We'll call Mary and go home and get some rest. Okay, Nick. Here's the final report from the lab. Fine, Matty, let's have it. Well, you figured it out just about right. There apparently was a man and a woman in the place with Baker, and she was a redhead. And chances are she's the same redhead who bought the Luger bullets. By Joe, Matty, I've forgotten about that. Yeah, well, we got the man's prints, but the woman wore gloves. Did you identify the man? Yeah, we checked the prints he left on this magazine, Nick. He's Louis Larkin, hijacker, gunman, and all-round crook. Two terms and his fake pen. Uh, here's his file photo. Ah, that helps. Yeah. Hey, what's this slip of paper in the magazine, Matty? Something of yours? Uh -huh. No, no, just an ad the dealer must have stuck in before he sold it. Says if you want your newspapers forwarded to you while you're on vacation, leave your name at the store. Matty, uh -huh. you say you found Larkin's prints on this magazine? Yeah. Look at the date line. What? This magazine was put on the stands only yesterday. Yeah? How does that help? Let me see the name on this ad. Oh, Roger's Candy Store, 100 Park Road. So what? Oh, Maddie, don't you see? That's the store this magazine came from. Well, what was it doing in Baker's place, then? Hey, that's right. Park Road is way across town from where Baker lives. Sure. Maybe Baker didn't buy the magazine. Maybe Louie or the girl bought it. Yeah. Maybe Louie and the girl are hiding out somewhere near this Roger's Candy Store. That's what I was thinking. Well, if they are, Patsy and I will find them. Louie? Yeah, Hazel. Got the bags packed yet? Yeah. Just, just I'll finish, Hazel. I've been going over the list of coin collectors, Louie. <laughs> Got a nice schedule worked out. Yeah? And we hit Chicago first. There are three collectors there. Ten grand each makes thirty grand. Yes, well. <laughs> and St. Louis, Cleveland, New Orleans, El Paso, L.A., Frisco, and Seattle. The way I figure it, we'll split three hundred grand. Easy. Yeah, we sure should. <laughs> Pretty cheap for knocking off a couple of punks, huh? <laughs> you said it, Hazel. You remember to get the train tickets yesterday? Oh, sure, sure. They're on the dresser there in the envelope. Right. Yeah, I gotta hand it to myself, Louie. It's a foolproof racket. Some of these collectors are crazy guys. 
If they're daffy enough, they don't mind buying rare coins, even when they know they're stolen. <laughs> what I like about it is that they got to keep it secret because they're buying stolen goods. <laughs> they got to cover up for us. <laughs> <laughs> That's foolproof, Louie. One hundred percent foolproof. Hey. What's the matter? Come to the window quick. Well? Down on the corner in front of the candy store. Yeah. See that tall guy standing there with magazines under his arm? Yeah, I see him. That's Nick Carter. Nick Carter? Yeah. How's up with that packing, Louie? Let's get out of here. Yeah, I'll say. Maybe Carter's around just by accident, or maybe he's on to us. Either way, we're taking no chances. Not for 300 grand and a murder rap, we ain't. <laughs> Hurry up. I got here as soon as I could, Nick. Do I look enough like a bobby soxer for you? Oh, you look fine. Well, I still don't understand. Why do I have to get dressed up like a bobby soxer and meet you here in front of Roger's candy store? Hey, you gonna buy me a soda, huh? No. They're <laughs> going to sell magazine subscriptions. Uh, I am? Yes. Why? In order to find a pair of killers. Okay, Nick, give with the plan. Well, you remember, one of them left a magazine at Pete Baker's workshop and I traced it to this candy store? Yes. The proprietor says he's sure the man who bought it lives in that house across the street. But he doesn't know who he is or in what apartment he lives. And so I'm going to sell subscriptions from apartment to apartment until I find him. Right. His name is Louis Larkin. Here's his picture. Mm. No beauty, is he? And there may be a red-headed girl with him. The one with perfume. I'll remember the perfume. Now listen, Patsy. Just find out where they're located. Don't try anything else. They're a little too dangerous to play with. <laughs> Good morning, sir. I represent the All-States Magazine. Beat it. Well, that wasn't Louis Larkin. <laughs> no perfume yet. Good morning, madam. I represent the Universal Mag... Uh, and which is helping me work my way through college by the sale of magazines in which I'm sure you won't be interested. Well, why shouldn't I be interested in literature? Mm. Come on in, honey. Come in. Oh, thanks. The All States Magazine Company publishes... I thought you said Universal. Huh? Oh, yes. Yes, I represent both. I, uh... I, uh... I tell you what. I left my subscription blanks down in my car. Yeah. Wait till I go down and get them. Grab and a Louie. Oh, what is it? You're Nick Carter's girl, aren't you? Yeah, we saw you chewing the rag downstairs. Hey, so Carter's up to us. He knows we bumped Baker and Grange, and he knows we're here. You're not telling me anything. Well, what do we do? I'm thinking. Okay, so while you're giving the think tank a workout, I'll take care of this chick. <laughs> take it easy, sister. All I do is pull the trigger, and you won't feel hardly nothing at all. Pleasant dreams. Patsy struggled helplessly as Louis Larkin aims his Luger automatic at her heart. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, please listen carefully, for here's how to send in for the four lovely William A. Rogers A1 Plus quality teaspoons Old Dutch Cleanser is offering. Order as many units of four as you wish. Just be sure to enclose two windmill pictures from Old Dutch labels and 60 cents in coin for each unit ordered, and then mail with your name and address to Old Dutch Cleanser, Box U, Chicago 90, Illinois. That's Box U, Chicago 90, Illinois. And remember, besides the four lovely William A. Rogers teaspoons in the beautiful Croydon pattern, you'll receive an illustrated folder that tells how to build up a complete matching service at a sensationally low cost. So, ladies, don't delay. Send for your four teaspoons now. Remember, enclose two windmill pictures from old Dutch labels and 60 cents in coin... And mail with your name and address to Old Dutch Cleanser, Box U, Chicago 90, Illinois. Price is subject to change without notice. Send now. And now for the conclusion of the case of the sunken dollar. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. As Louis Larkin's finger tightens on the trigger of his automatic and Patsy struggles helplessly, Hazel suddenly knocks the gun aside. Cut it out, Louis. <laughs> Everyone in the house would hear the shot. You wouldn't stand a chance. You mean we'll let this dame go? We'll take her with us to run interference. Well, Carter will be too busy looking for the girl to worry about us. Yeah, maybe he won't. And he'll be too busy worrying about the girl to make a move. 
It's like a hostage, Louie. Get it? Yeah. <laughs> While Carter's watching the front door, we're going out the back way. Take a cab to the station. Well, what about the dame? Stop worrying. But we can't take... Look, Louie, we've got a compartment on the train. And somewhere along the way, we'll push her out the window. With a bullet in her head. Okay, Hazel, but I think you're nuts to do it. Shut up, Louie. Let her go. <clears throat> now, look here, you... And you listen to me, sister. One false move and Louie lets you have it here and now, understand? I... I understand. We might as well burn for three murders as for two. Uh, there's a hat coming, Hazel. Hey, taxi! Taxi! Get in, honey. Okay. The train terminal driver. And will you please close the glass partition? I'm awfully cold back here. Coming on. Okay, lady. I'll close the glass. Okay, we made it. Carter will wait for the girl to come out, maybe ten minutes. Then he'll start looking. Yeah, and <laughs> he won't find nothing. <laughs> what a laugh. Okay. We'll take the first train out. Hey, maybe that don't go to Shy. Yeah, we can always get to Shy later. Maybe we'll start on the West Coast for now, huh? It's okay with me. The further from Carter, the better. Look. Look, I'll make a bet with you. One hundred dollars to one cent that you don't get away from Nick. We've already got away, sister. Is it a bet? It's a bet. <laughs> Only trouble is you won't be around to collect even if you win. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Hey, where are we? What's he stopping for? This isn't anywhere near the terminal. Step right out, lady. Let me help you with your bags, mister. Oh, we all don't want to get out here. I said the train terminal. This isn't the terminal. You're crazy. What is this place? Police headquarters, Louis. What? Don't you say... Don't move. Come on, Patsy, you get out first. Okay, Nick. Nick. Nick Carter? Yes, Hazel. My name is Nick Carter. And I will just pile out of this cab, luggage, gun, moles and all, and walk quietly into headquarters. Sergeant Matheson wants to talk to you about some assorted thefts and murders. All out, please. Oh, uh, before I forget, one cent, please, Hazel. I not only win the bet, I'm here to collect. God, oh, it was a beautiful job, Nick. Beautiful. But there's just one thing I don't figure. What's that, Matty? How in blazes did you know enough to get around to the back street and borrow that cab? I have ears, haven't I? I heard Hazel and Louie making their plans. Well, huh? You heard them? How? I was outside the apartment door. You don't think I'd let you walk into that murderer's den alone, do you? I was right behind you all the way. You were right behind me? Yes, Betsy. Then why didn't you bust in and capture those two crooks right then and there? Didn't want to take any chances on anyone in a crowded apartment house being hit by stray bullets. But they might have killed me before they left. Patsy, you may be sure that I waited until I knew they were going to take you with them before I did what I did. What? Say, that was quite an act. Oh. All state magazines, <laughs> universal magazines. You, you didn't trust me to do it all by myself. You, <laughs> Oh, you treat me just like a baby. No, Patsy. I hate you, you... You mere man. Now, Patsy, easy. <laughs> you know, if it comes to that, how come you were so positive Nick could get Hazel and Louie? Oh, I heard all about the bet. A hundred dollars to one cent. Oh, that. <laughs> yeah, you were betting on a sure thing yourself now, weren't you? You knew Nick was the cab driver. Well, I did not. I never recognized him. Then how come the bet? Because I knew I could trust Nick, hmm. which is more than he can say for me. But Patsy... If I hadn't followed you to protect you, I wouldn't have been able to win that bet for you. Well, oh, oh, all right, you win. Heaven knows you always do. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the Cudahy Packing Company, makers of Old Dutch Cleanser. Remember, when you go shopping tomorrow, get the cleanser preferred by more women in America than any other. Oh, that cleanser.
This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Old Dutch Cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. A gambling ship, Nick. That sounds exciting. If you call losing your money exciting, Patsy, you're right. But I'm not going out there for the fun of it. Oh, I suppose you'd rather go fishing. I certainly would. And I'd rather fish for fish than for a murderer. Now for the case of the missing piano player. Today's thrilling Nick Carter adventure brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. Our story begins in the roulette room of the gambling ship, which is anchored off the Atlantic coast. Several customers are gathered about the large roulette table as the croupier prepares to spin the wheel. Uh, no more bets, ladies and gentlemen, that's all. No more bets. Hey, Bill, stop playing a minute. Yeah, Gus? No more music. The boss wants to see you in his office. Oh, okay, Gus, what's wrong? Come on. What's wrong, Gus? Can't you tell me? The boss will talk about that. Inside, Bill. Okay. Hello, Edwards. You... You wanted to see me, Mr. Simmons? Yes. Why haven't you been following my orders? I was hired to play the piano, not the customers. You know what you were supposed to do when you took the job. I took the job because I needed it, but I've been thinking it over, and I've decided that a crooked roulette wheel is not in my line. You knew the wheel was fixed when we hired you. That's why you was hired. Now you're welching on the deal. And I want to know why. Well, I got a sister to take care of. What's that to us? Just this, Mr. Dutch Zimmerman. I've decided to quit. Don't you know nobody quits this racket once he's in it? I just want to get out of here. My sister's a swell gal, and I just can't afford to stay around here and end up behind the eight ball. You're behind the eight ball right now, Edwards. And it's mighty black, too. But I don't want to... take care of things. Sure, boss. Sure. Well, uh, well what are you going to do? You're going for a little walk, Edwards. A little walk with Gus. Up to the bow of the ship. Patsy. Yes, Nick? You about finished with our case history? Uh, don't worry, Mr. Carter. They'll all be nicely typed and ready for filing before you go away on your vacation. <laughs> I don't see why I had to go... Oh, someone at the door, Nick. I'll go. Thanks, Patsy. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson. Oh, hello, Matty. Oh, hi, Nick. What cooks? Me. I'm off for a vacation. Fishing. Yeah? Just called to say that Patsy will know where I am if anything develops that requires my attention. Uh, it won't. Where are you going? Sandy Point. I uh, wish I was going along with you. So do I, Matty. Well, I'll be seeing you. Okay, Nick. Have fun. Nick, this is Mr. John Redden. How do you do, Mr. Redden? Sit down. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Mr. Redden has a problem, Nick. I told him you were just about to go away, but he's very anxious to talk to you about one of your pet hates, gambling. Oh, is that so? Well, just what's your difficulty, Mr. Redden? A gambling ship. I've lost a great deal of money on it. But why come to me about that? I'm convinced that the roulette wheel on the ship is crooked. If I can prove it, that is, if I can get you to prove it, I may be able to get back some of my losses. Sorry I can't help you, Mr. Ridden, but I'm off on a fishing trip. Mr. Ridden, if you're convinced that this gambling ship is crooked, why don't you go to the police? Well, in the first place, I can't afford the publicity. And in the second place, the police would merely raid the ship and shut it down, and I'd have no chance to get back my losses. Oh. Um, Mr. Carter. Yes? I've heard about your big hobby, your downtown boys' club. Well... If you look into this matter for me, I'm prepared to make a very substantial donation to your boys' club. What? Oh, Nick, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Where is this gambling ship? Anchored off the coast, reached by launch from the town of Thompson's Cove. Thompson's Cove? Why, that's only a few miles from Sandy Point, where I'm going for my week of fishing. Well, then... Tell you what can... I'll do, Mr. Redden. 
I'll take a look at this gambling ship. If I find anything, I'll take a case. I can't ask for any more than that. But, uh, just why do you think this gambling ship isn't on the level? Mr. Carter, I'm convinced the roulette wheel is fixed. Trouble is, I don't know just how it's done. That kind of evidence isn't very satisfactory in a courtroom. Well, if we can just find out how it's done, I can confront the gambling syndicate with the facts and... Get back your money and close up the ship. That's it. Well, Mr. Reardon, I'll take a run out there and have a look. Suggest you meet me at the hotel at Thompson's Cove in a couple of days, and I'll give you my decision. I'll do that, Mr. Carter. <clears throat> and I'm grateful to you. Well, don't be grateful yet. Good day, Mr. Reardon. Good day, Mr. Carter. Miss Bowen? Goodbye, Mr. Reardon. Well, Patsy, you better hurry up and finish those case histories. Oh, Nick, why do I I'll have... I'll need you with me when I go out to that gambling ship tomorrow night. Well, why didn't you say so? That's different. <laughs> You mean we don't have to pay to ride on this launch? No. Nope. The gambling ship provides free transportation to its guests. Oh, oh. Hey, there are some prosperous looking people on board, Nick. They have to be to play roulette. Nick? Hmm? You see that young girl over by the rail? She can't be over 18. Hmm, pretty, too. I wonder why she's going out to the ship. She seems to be alone. You know, Patsy, I think it might be a good idea if you try to find her out. She's not the gambling type at all. Right, Nick. I'll strike up a conversation with her as soon as we get aboard. Nick, I want you to meet Miss Edwards, Mr. Carter. How do you do, Mr. Carter? Delighted to meet you, Miss Edwards. I noticed you coming out on the launch. Well, it's always flattering to be noticed by a pretty girl. Thank you. Miss Bowen and I were both wondering why a girl like you would be visiting a place like this, alone. See that piano over there in the roulette room? Yes. My brother Bill played that piano until last night. Oh, did he lose his job? I don't know. You don't know? No. All I know is he didn't come home last night. You see, we live together in Thompson's Cove. I have a job there. And you've come out here to find out what happened to your brother? If I can, Mr. Carter. I'm terribly worried. Well, possibly I can be of some assistance. Oh, if you only could. I think the first step in that direction is the present piano player. I'll go over and have a chat with him. No more bets. No more bets. You want to join the Why'd you stop playing the piano so abruptly, son? Oh, I don't like that number much. How about playing June's best not all over? Oh, I don't like that one either. You're new here, aren't you? Kind of. What happened to the former piano player? The one who played here last night? I got no idea. Any idea who could tell me about the other piano player? Say, why don't you mind your own business? Why, I'm just curious to find out... Why do you stop right in the middle of a tune? Listen, Nosey, you come out here to gamble or talk to me? I like to see what... Mr. Carter. Yes, who are you? Never mind. But you know my name. Sure, so does the boss. Matter of fact, the boss wants to see you in his office right away. I'll be delighted to meet the boss. As a matter of fact, I was just about to ask someone for a proper introduction. Okay, follow me. I'll introduce you good and proper. Here's Mr. Carter, boss. Hello, Nick Carter. How do you do? Don't believe I've had the pleasure. Simmons, the name. Dutch Simmons. Glad to know you. And your friend here? My name's Gus. Uh, Gus Jones. Well, gentlemen, now that we're acquainted... Quarter. I want to know what you're doing on this ship. Isn't my money as good as any other suckers? I don't like that crack, Carter. This is an honest ship. I never heard of a gambling ship that was honest. How would you know whether or not we're honest? You haven't been gambling. We spotted you the minute you got aboard. And we know you're a private eye giving us the once-over. Who are you working for? Why, you should know that it's unethical for me to divulge the name of a client. That's a laugh. A private dick talking about ethics. Some of us are on the level. And by the way, who are your two girlfriends? One is my assistant, Miss Bowen, and the other is a Miss Ethel Edwards, whose brother played the piano in your roulette room. 
Until last night. Oh, yeah. Bill Edwards. Nice kid. What happened to him? How should I know? He didn't go home last night. Strange, a youngster should just vanish. So you're working for the kid's sister? Could be. Well, you're entirely too inquisitive, Mr. Carter. And if I ever see you on the ship again, maybe you'll vanish, too. Tough, aren't you? Tough enough to handle you, Gus. Yeah, boss? Take Carter and his assistant and his new girlfriend to the next launch. Okay. And see that they get back to shore. Well, that was quite a ship. Yeah. Fantastic, isn't it? The way people flock to a place like that. Just to lose their money? My brother Bill says they do a big business. Expensive layout, all right. Now we've got to figure out how to get back there. Miss Bowen and I have been barred. Barred? Uh-huh. Why? Miss Edwards, I'm a private detective, and Miss Bowen is my assistant. Oh. I'm investigating something on the ship for a client. But when I heard about your missing brother, I decided I'd look into that, too. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Hope you can find out what's happened to him. I will, if it's at all possible. And I think I'll start by having a chat for the pilot of this launch. Oh, we'd better wait for you back here, Nick. All right, Patsy. It'll only be a moment. Okay. Nice night, Skipper. Nice enough. Suppose you sometimes get rough weather. Sometimes. What do you do when it gets really tough? Don't run. But how do the customers get back and forth to the ship, then? They don't. Oh. Then I suppose you decide if the ship will be open for business each evening. Yeah, that's about it, mister. Ah. I should think the owners of the ship would certainly value your services. Not too much. I've been working here for more than a year and got no raise yet. Oh? Well, how about the men who work on the ship? Do the bosses treat them pretty well? Financially, I mean? I wouldn't know, mister. You know somebody back there on the ship? Just a kid who plays the piano. Who's that? Bill Edwards. <laughs> nice kid. Haven't seen him in a couple of days. You mean he didn't come back with you last night? No, he didn't, and he usually right. Say, why are you asking me all these questions? Thanks, Skipper. See you again. Uh, yeah, w- wait a minute. W- w- well, Nick, learn anything? Miss Edwards, the pilot tells me your brother didn't return to shore last night. Unless he swam. But Bill isn't a very good swimmer. And he wouldn't try to swim ashore. It's too far. That's what I'm afraid of, Patsy. He's dead, Mr. Carter. I just know it. I had a feeling... Oh, don't try, Ethel. We don't know what's happened to him yet. (laughs) Mr. Carter, you said you'd help me. And I will. (laughs) I'm going through with this investigation now, no matter what happens. So, a casual look into a possible gambling swindle on Nick's part suddenly turns into a murder investigation. Or is it murder? We'll see in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the missing piano player. Today's Nick Carter adventure brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. It is the following morning. Nick is in John Reardon's hotel room at Thompson's Cove, where Reardon has come to hear Nick's first report. Mr. Reardon, that gambling ship is run by a group of dangerous men. I thought so. They warned me not to return to the ship, or I'd vanish. Why? Because I think I may be on the track of a murder. Murder? That's right. A young piano player named Bill Edwards. I remember him. Why? Why, I liked his music. Ah. Well, this kid was playing the piano in the roulette room until the night before last. Then he vanished. How do you know? Miss Bone and I met his sister on the launch going out to the ship. And? From what she told us, Mr. Reardon, young Bill Edwards is a prisoner on that ship. Or dead. Have you notified the police? No, because I'm not sure of anything yet. Well... In the meantime, how about that roulette wheel? Is it crooked? Is it fixed? Shouldn't be at all surprised after my conversation with Mr. Dutt Zimmerman and his pal Gus. I also think it may have something to do with the piano. Piano, eh? Yes. Right now, my main problem is getting back to the ship. And how do you intend to do that? I've decided to take your case. Good, very good. But I'm afraid it's going to cost you some extra money for a bribe. How much? Possibly 500, possibly 1,000. That's nothing compared to what I've lost out there. Agreed. Thanks for the vote of confidence. Your call, please. 
Thompson's Cove, 7386, extension 8. 7386, extension 8? Right. One moment, please. What are you doing, Carter? Calling the ship. Phone number was on the guest card I got from this hotel. The extension I recall from Dr. Or Mr. Dutch Zimmons phone in his office. Hello? Hello? Is Gus there? This is Gus. Who's this? This is Nick Carter. Nick Carter? What? The... Gus? How'd you like to pick up an extra five hundred? For what? Thought that for five hundred dollars you'd see that I got back on that ship. That's a tough thing to arrange, Carter. The boss don't like you. I can't guarantee what had happened. All right. How about a thousand? But I won't promise what'll happen after you get aboard. I'll worry about that. Just meet me in Curran's Bar and Grill in Thompson's Cove this afternoon at four. Have another drink, Gus? Might as well. What's the matter? You ain't touched yours. I will later. Waiter. Yeah. Another of the same. Yeah, coming up. <sighs> this booze sure tastes funny. Just your imagination. Guess what do you know about Bill Edwards? Nice kid. Good piano player, too. It's too bad. What happened to him? He disappeared. Where? Isn't he somewhere on the ship? Here you are, mister. Oh, yeah. thanks, waiter. Right. Well, Gus, drink hearty. Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> what happened to Bill Edwards, Gus? Bill Edwards? Yes. Where is he? He's dead. Where? Got funny tasting booze in this joint. How did Bill Edwards die, Gus? Where's his body? There was an old anchor on the bow of the ship. Been there for years. Ain't there now. We had to use it. Yeah. We used it. So that's the answer. Huh? Thank you, Gus. You've helped a lot. Sergeant Matheson. Hello, Matty. Nick. Nick, where are you? Thompson's Cove Hotel. Matty, can you come out here right away? What's up? Thought you were on a vacation. Been interrupted by a murder, and I need a little police cooperation, and fast. Can do, Nick. So happens I know the police officers out there very well. Fine. Can you come right out? Sure. Things are quiet here in town. Thanks, Matty. And be sure to wear your old clothes. Why? I've arranged a fishing expedition for you. <laughs> crowd here tonight, Nick. Yes, uh, it's amazing the way people like to get rid of money. Good evening, Tex. Ah, you here again? This is Miss Bourne. Hi. Hi. I enjoy your playing very much. Thanks. Miss Bourne and I were wondering why you don't use the entire keyboard. I don't get you. You never seem to play in the extreme bass or the extreme treble. With such a fine instrument, it's a shame not to use the whole keyboard. <laughs> Why don't you two go away and play games? I told you to stay off this ship, Carter. Oh, hello, Dutch. Oh, this is my assistant, Miss Bone. How do you do? Carter, this thing you feel in the middle of your back is a gun. That's what I thought. Start walking to my office. Um, mind if I come along? You stay here. I'm going to have a little talk with your boyfriend alone. I guess you're not wanted, Patsy. See you later. All right, Nick. I'll be waiting for you. You were a fool to come back, Carter. I warned you. I remember, Dutch. You just said if I ever came back here, I'd vanish. Like Bill Edwards. That's what you're going to do. Yeah? Yeah. Open that door. Ah, come in, Mr. Carter. Mr. Reardon. Yes, Close the door, Dutch. Sure, Redden. And no sudden moves, either of you. I've got you both covered. 
I wouldn't want any trouble. Well, that is certainly an unexpected turn of events. We'll see what happens next in just a moment. And now for the conclusion of the case of the missing piano player. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. We pick up our story where we left off, as Reardon says to Dutch and Nick... No sudden moves, either of you. I've got you both covered. I wouldn't want any trouble. What's the idea, Reardon? Why the gun? Looks like he's gone screwy, Dutch. Shut up, Gus. I'll do the talking. Reardon, what are you doing here? This is my office, Carter. Our office. So you boys are partners in this racket. Nice deduction, Carter. I wondered how long it'd take for you to come out in the open, Reardon. But why the gun? Gus and Dutch are going to do some explaining. So you hired Carter. Correct. I hired him to check up on you two. Why, you... Now, perhaps you'll tell me why you've brought Carter in here at the point of a gun? He's too nosy. He's been asking too many questions. He knows too much. That's right. He knows too much about a crooked roulette for you. You mean to say that this smart aleck has been telling you... Let's listen to what Carter has to say, Dutch. Speak up, Carter. Gladly, Mr. Reardon. At first, inasmuch as you seem to know Dutch so well, will you be good enough to tell him to take that automatic out of my spine? You heard him, Dutch. Drop the gun on the floor. You'll be sorry for this, Reardon. Thanks. Well, Carter, how about that roulette wheel? It's fixed. That's a lie. Prove it. Quiet, both of you. All right, Carter. Prove it. You'll take that piano apart, you'll find the answer. There are wires under the rug, from the piano to the roulette wheel. As the wheel starts spinning, the piano starts playing. At a signal from the croupier, the piano player, who faces the croupier, stops playing abruptly. You're crazy, Carter. Go ahead, Carter. I notice that the pianist never touches the extreme treble or bass keys except when he stops playing. Then he does press a certain key at one end or the other. A key in the bass for black, a key in the treble for red. It's as simple as that, Reardon. So much for the mechanics. What else? This fact should also be of interest to you. Some of the customers are very pally with the croupier. And they're always the same customers. Listen, Carter, you... And these customers walk away from that table with some handsome winnings. Winnings in which you do not share, Reardon, but in which Dutch and Gus do. Reardon, are you going to believe this bum Carter or us? I'm going to believe Carter. Carter doesn't lie. All right, Reardon, what are you going to do about it? Just this, Dutch. I'm going to dissolve our partnership here and now. Hey, Dutch, he's going to... What's the idea of knocking me over, Carter? You don't want to be a killer, too, Reardon. Don't move, any of you. Oh, hi, Maddie. It's good to see you. You all right, Nick? Right as rain. What's the score, Nick? My client here decided to become a killer, so I tackled him and the shots went wild. What's this all about, Carter? Why are the cops? It's about a murder. Maddie? Yeah? Did you and the local police find that anchor? We did, Nick. Under the bow of this ship. With young Bill Edwards' body tied to it. There are your killers, Maddie. Dutch Zimmerman and Gus Jones. Nice going, Nick. Take him away, boys. You can't take me. Hey, this guy's crazy. And if the you bullets are... you guys pumped into young Bill Edwards before you drop him over the side don't finish putting you in the hot seat, I'll turn in my badge. Let's go. Oh, well, Nick, another case history to type. Just as I had everything in the office cleaned up and ready for filing. I'll give you something to do while I catch some fish. Oh, you... Oh, you know, Nick, you haven't told me how you knew where to find Bill Edwards' body. I'll need the facts for the file. Scopolamine, Patsy. Huh? Scopolamine. It's a truth serum. Oh. The kind of stuff the Germans used to get information out of their prisoners during the war. Oh, I don't follow you. You recall I had a date with Gus in a bar? Yeah. Well, scopolamine is a drug that makes a man unable to avoid telling the truth. I put some in the drinks I bought for him. Oh. Then I asked him about young Edwards. The minute he mentioned the anchor, I knew the answer. I called the local police. When they dragged the bottom under the bow of that ship, they found what they were after, unfortunately. And you found more than you bargained for. Yes, very true, Patsy. I realized that Reardon had a little private grudge to settle as soon as he recognized the name of Bill Edwards. Uh Uh-huh. But murder. Well, that's something more than we bargained for. Well, now that that's settled, I suppose you're going back to Sandy Point. Right, Patsy. Back to Sandy Point and some fishing. And this time, I hope to catch nothing but fish. Well, Nick, can you give us a hint or two on the adventure that Old Dutch Cleanser is going to bring us next week? Certainly can, Bob. 
It started out with a dish of macaroni in a one-arm lunchroom. A dish which contained more than macaroni, I might add. And which led us into strange and devious paths. First, we landed in an unused heating furnace. Then a trash can on the corner. Wait a minute. Uh, what were you looking for? A small metal capsule that was worth a fortune. And that turned into a miniature bomb at the end. It certainly sounds unusual. Uh, what do you call the story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Wandering Macaroni. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the Cudahy Packing Company, makers of Old Dutch Cleanser. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick, with Charlotte Manson featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Today's script was written by Bryce Disk, Jr. Original music is played by George Wright. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use Old Dutch Cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Every week at this time, two great names are joined. I've never heard of Nick. Ordering a dish of macaroni just so somebody else won't get it. Yes, Patsy, but it's this particular dish that holds the fortune. But what if you don't get it before Green Hat does? Then I failed in what I promised to do. But what happens after you get the dish of macaroni, Nick? We search it for what it contains. And after that? Anything can happen. Now, the case of the wandering macaroni. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. It's been a busy day for Nick Carter, who's been cleaning up the routine business that has piled up on his desk. Now it is late afternoon, and Nick is still dictating letters to his recording machine, while his secretary, Patsy, sits at her desk and taps her foot impatiently. Dear Mr. Gaylord, I received your letter dated January 17th, semicolon. However, it is not my policy to accept cases of this nature, period. I find yes. that activities of the sort you suggest are incompatible with a general standing yes. that I have attempted to... Mm. Hey, Patsy, you turned off the machine. That's right. It's 5.30. I won't transcribe those letters till tomorrow anyway. And besides, it's my birthday. I only... Oh, Miss you... Carter, you promised me six months ago that we'd go out to dinner to celebrate my birthday, and I'm going to drag you away from the office. I have to use a blackjack. All right, all right, Patsy. I didn't forget. <sighs> Well, close up the office right now and go out and celebrate. Well, that's better. Which do you think would be nicer, Nick? The Penguin Room or the Moonlight Roof? Your choice, Patsy. You're the birthday child. Uh, I think the Penguin Room. They've got that big name band and all the... Hmm, the door. Oh, no. Not another case. Let's keep very quiet and maybe he'll go away. I'd like to, but it might be important. Don't worry about the dinner, Patsy. I'll see to it that you... Mr. Carter? Come in. You're Nick Carter, the detective. That's right. This is my secretary, Miss Bowen. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? What can I do for you? I want you to get me a, a dish of macaroni. <laughs> Beg your pardon. I thought you said macaroni. I did? What? Well, perhaps I'd better explain. Well, I should think so. My name is Griswold. Ben Griswold. Years ago, I used to work as a contact man for your father, Tim Carter, when he needed an inside track and uh, uh, unusual circles. Hey, wait a minute. Ben Griswold, I remember you. Well, I hoped you would. Well, you used to come to the house when I was a boy and help me with arithmetic. That's right, Nick. But I need your help now. I can't go to the police. I, I can't afford publicity of any sort. It would ruin me. I'd be glad to do anything I can, Ben. I pay anything you ask. Now, don't worry about that. For an old friend of my father's, it's on the house. But you said you wanted a dish of macaroni. Yes. Now, here's the whole setup. 
At 7.03 tonight, a man wearing a green hat will go into the cafeteria at 47th Street and Avenue M. Yes. Exactly one minute later, he'll drop a glass on the floor and break it. But why? That's an identification signal. Then at 7.05, you'll go to the steam table. There'll be three dishes on top of the counter. The middle one will be macaroni, Nick. And I want you to get that dish before the man in the green hat does. Well, what's in it? And why is it so important? Well, in that macaroni dish, you'll find a metal container. Now, I, I can't tell you what's in it, but I'll meet you here tomorrow, and before you hand it over to me, I'll give you legal proof that it's really mine. I, I can't go myself, Nick. They, they know me by sight. I see. Well, let's see now. Green Hat comes in at 7.03. Yes. At 4 after, he breaks a glass. Right. And I'm to beat him to the macaroni at 5 after. That's right. And be careful, Nick. It'll be dangerous. All right, then. You've got yourself a detective. I'll get that macaroni for you. May even bring back some salt and pepper for this evening. But, Nick, you promised to take me to the penguin room for dinner. It's my birthday. Oh, that's right. Well, never let it be said that a carter broke a promise. We're off to dinner. At the penguin room? No, Patsy, at the cafeteria. <laughs> Things for a birthday dinner. We'll make it up later, Patsy. We'll take in the penguin room and the moonlight room. Oh, there he is. Green hat here. Behind you. There by the water cooler. I see. He's looking at his wristwatch. He's awfully big, Nick. Yeah, it looks as though he could walk upstairs with a piano under each arm. I don't like that bulge in his coat either. That's a shoulder holster. There goes the broken glass right on schedule. Have you got enough change? A whole pocket full. Come on. Right. You keep away from Green Hat, Patsy. You see me start the door. I'll get going fast. And leave me outside. Right, Nick. Now, wait a minute. Can I help you, bud? Coffee, black. It's plenty hot. Hello, one. What do you want coffee for now, Nick? Might come in handy. There you are. Five cents. Thanks. Now, down to the steam table. We can clean that fast. We'll beat him. Here's the macaroni in the corner. I'll drop a quarter and grab it. Hey, you give me that macaroni. Why should I? I paid for it. Hand it over. Hey, look out with that coffee. Look out. Oh, hey. Come on, have to get it. Wait here. Walk as fast as you can. Mm-hmm. I'm talking, I spilled on green handle. Keep him busy for a while. Did you get the metal container out of the dish? I had a fish. The macaroni for it. But I found it. I seen it. See when Grid will come for tomorrow. Round this corner, quick. Yeah. Uh-oh. Okay, one. Tie you up with a hand. Green hat. Yeah, this must be my lucky day. I come out the side door and then you're like a pair of sitting ducks. Careful, bud, this ain't no water pistol. Yes, he's got us, Patsy. Oh, oh hey, what? What? you made me drop my purse. Sorry, right, Patsy. All right, punk, pick up the lady's bag and come on. We're going visiting. And don't try nothing. Because after that hot coffee stunt, I'm liable to get a little trigger happy. <laughs> Okay, bud, this way. Oh, yes. I couldn't see out of the car as well as down here in. Down by the docks. Looks like an empty warehouse. Sure, you two. All right, all right, in this door. Oh, there you are. You get it. Well, uh, Colonel, you, you see, uh, this, uh, this punk here in a day, they beat me to the macaroni. I, I figured something was phony, so I brought him along. Yeah, he was packing this. Hmm. Well, I'm in did he have the container? Well, I, uh, I couldn't go over him good in the car. What are you waiting for now? Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Okay, punk, off with your coat. That's it. Come on. Take it off, I said. Yeah. Now, let's see. Keys. Notebook. Wallet. Hmm. Nope. All right, all right. Lift them hands. Come on. Yeah. He's clean, Colonel. Unless he swallowed it. After they handed it to the young lady. Did empty your pocketbook out on my desk? Nick. Say what he says, Patsy. All right. There. Gee, uh, it ain't there, Colonel. Well, Mr. Hand me his wallet. Yeah, yeah, here, Colonel. Mr. Carter, I think you owe us an explanation. Seems you've hidden something that belongs to us. I paid a quarter for the macaroni, if that's what you mean. You'll check back at the cafeteria. The container wasn't that dish of macaroni, and you're hiding it, Mr. Carter. 
Well, we'd better cheerfully murder you and the young lady to get what we want. See here. Get over, Mr. Carter. I'll lock them up in the storeroom. Sure, Colonel. <laughs> I'll take care of them. Get lonely, Carter. We won't be gone long. Well, Nick? There must be some way out of here. Oh, but Nick, I just love it here. This is just the place for a birthday party. Pitch flat, dusty dram, drafty. Betsy, that's it. What do you mean? There's a draft in here. It's got to come from someplace. Well, that's right. There must be an outlet. Well, let's see. Maybe if I run my hands over the wall. Is. is it open? No, but it's plenty big. There's a grating about a yard square. See if we can find something we can pry the grating off with, Betsy. Okay. But it's sure like looking for a needle in a haystack. Oh, but it's so dark in here. It's even worse. Nick, how come you didn't have the metal container when they searched you? Please, Betsy. One thing at a time. Oh, all right, but... Hey! Hey, I found something. What is it? I, I don't know. Here. <laughs> Some kind of metal. Well, let's see whether it'll work. I sure hope it does. Maybe it's going to... Are you getting it? Pretty sure I... Wonderful. I got for you, too. Uh-huh. Oh. What's the matter? Oh, I just got a mouth full of dust. <laughs> it's not surprising in a place like this. All right, come on, Betsy. Trick it to follow me down this old stovepipe, or whatever it is. And believe me, it's not going to be a pleasure trip. <laughs> Patsy. What? I said careful. The vent goes straight down from here. What are you going to do? Jump. Oh, but no. Nothing else to do. Okay, here goes. Geronimo. Are you all right? I'm fine. It's about an eight-foot drop. Come on. I see. Oh, darling. You won't get hurt. I'll catch you. But you can't see. No, but you'll land in a pile of ashes. Come on, Patsy. We haven't time to talk things over. Well, okay. Here goes nothing. <coughs> oh, Nick. Oh, dear. Where the dickens are we? My guess is that we're inside a furnace. Well, we're certainly lucky that this is summer. Otherwise, you and I might be fairly well done by now. Ah, that's a streak of light over there. Yeah, that's right. Probably the fire door. If it is. Oh, please. We're lucky this is a big furnace. That's a fire door, all right. All right. Wait. All right. Now we'll help you out. Um... Boy, that's just the way to treat a new pair of nylons. There's the door, Patsy. It's open, too. I think it leads to an alley. Yes. Mmm, fresh air. Careful. Green hat may be around someplace. Uh huh. Oh, dear. What's the matter? I've got ashes in my shoes down the back of my neck. Oh, my. The first thing I'm going to do is go home, take a shower, and get into some clean clothes. Oh, no, you're not. Why, I am, too. Right now, i got a phone call to make. But... And I'm running a race, a very important race. A race? Are you feeling all right? Never felt better. But this race... I'm going to run a race, Patsy, with the Department of Sanitation. <laughs> Covered with dust and ashes, Nick and Patsy hurry through the city on a mysterious race. Their goal, the secret of the container in the wandering macaroni. As their cab careens through the streets, Nick wonders what lies behind the struggle for this puzzling prize. We'll see how he finds the answers in just a minute. Now back to the case of the wandering macaroni. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Friends. Covered with ashes, Nick and Patsy hail a cab and hurry back up town. It is after midnight when they are dropped on a corner, and now they hurry along the dimly lighted deserted street. Patsy is still trying to brush the dust off her hair. Nick, I don't see why I can't go home and clean up. Later, Patsy. We're not hurrying now. Ah, there's a cafeteria down the street. Oh, but just look at my stockings. There isn't enough left for them to make a pair of bobby socks. Here we are. What? Why, this is the same corner where Green Hat held us up. Nick, what are you diving into that trash can for? The container from the macaroni. I fixed it in here when I was picking up your purse. So that's why Green Hat couldn't find it when he searched you. I'm afraid the sanitation department can get your purse and empty it again. Oh, blast it. What's the matter? Who puts banana peels in here? You find it? No, not yet. Wait. 
Yes, here it is. Good. Our little macaroni covered friend. This is a car pulling up a police car. I know. Dr. Matheson. Did he meet us here when I called? Oh. You know, one of these days, Nick Carter, I ain't gonna come running when you call. Hi, Sergeant. Hi, Apache. Hey, what have you been doing? Playing hide and seek in that garbage can? In a way? He's been tasting a dish of macaroni. A ma- at this time of night? Uh-huh. You're both going off your rockers. <laughs> now, just stay nice and quiet, and Uncle Matty will call the wagon. Don't be funny, Matty. I'm on a case. I need your help. And how? Back to the rest of your files and check a few things. Okay, Nick. Hop in back, and I'll take you downtown. Now, what's all this about? I can't tell you much now, Matty, but I have a hunch we're on a trail of something big. <laughs> Sit down, Nick Carter. I'll have those fingerprints for you in a minute. Where'd you get them? From my notebook cover. The ape with the green hat had his paws all over it when he searched me. Well? They kept the wallet, but he gave me back the notebook. What about the other guy? The colonel? Yes. There, Matty, is a smooth operator. Didn't touch anything. and tried to keep his face in the shadow, but he leaned forward when he reached for my wallet. Uh, why don't you check through our file, Nick, and see if you can spot him from the photograph? Good idea. That's it, um, She can help. Hey... Where is that? Down the hall, washing up. <laughs> you could use some soap, too, Nick. No, I haven't time. Got to crack this before tomorrow morning when I see Grizzle. Yeah. Any luck in the filing? Not so far. No one that even looks like it. Uh, come in. There's a record on the print, Sergeant. Mr. Carter was right. This guy's got a record as long as your arm. Uh, okay, Carter, thanks. Now, read it off to me, will you, Matty? I'll keep looking for the colonel. Uh, now, let's see now. Oh, quite a guy, your man in the green hat, Nick. Yeah. Name Shiv Garson. Convictions three, six, nine. Mm. Everything from dope and hot cars to making books. Mm, wanted by the Treasury boys for smuggling. I better have him picked up. What's the latest they got on him? Well, here he's been spotted down in South America, Port of San Luis Oro. Looks like the Treasury's been keeping a close eye on that baby, Nick. Well, that's it. Hey. How be it? Well, what is it, Nick? You find the colonel's picture in the files, though? No, I found my client's picture. Yep. What do you mean? Here on this card. Ben Griswold, convicted 1923, illegal stock manipulation. Served two years in state prison. Ben Griswold. Say, I remember that case. I was a rookie when it broke. Remember anything about him, Eddie? Well, now, let me see. Uh, yeah, he was a research scientist, but he got mixed up with a couple of stock-juggling wizards and took the rap. Oh? He's been going straight ever since, as far as I know, though, Nick. So that's what he meant when he said he was a contact man for my father in unusual circles. Huh? Must have been an underworld agent after he got out of prison. Could be. Matter after I check these files, I want to borrow your laboratory for a while. All right, sure thing, Nick. I've got a little special work to do. All right, I'll have Carter open it up for you. But how about the container from the macaroni? I can't wait till morning for the unveiling. Can you pick Griswold up tonight if we need him? That's no problem. We'll find him somehow. Good. And if you can get him down here and hold him till I call, I think we can break this tonight. Well, back at the office at last, Patsy. You're sure you don't want to go straight home? No. No, I couldn't sleep anyway. It isn't every girl that gets kidnapped on a birthday instead of being taken to dinner. Well, I'm sorry about that, Patsy. Maybe I shouldn't admit it, but I was looking forward to that party, too. Thanks for telling me. Oh, here we are. Uh, I think I'll finish those letters before I... What's the matter, Nick? Didn't you leave the light on when we went out? I don't know. I think I did. I guess I turned them out, though. It's dark now. Nick, do you think something's wrong? I don't know. There's only one way to find out. Wait a minute. I got the right key. Mm-hmm. Okay. Come on, Patrick. I'll get the light. Hey, the green hat. Yes, and he's dead. Good evening, Mr. Carter. <gasps> the Colonel. Yes, my dear. The Colonel. I've been waiting for you. <laughs> Damage your desk, Carter. Don't bother reaching in the drawer. I've removed the revolver from it. I warn you, I shoot quickly and accurately. So don't attempt any heroics. You think of everything, don't you, Colonel? 
I tried to. I find it necessary in my business. Your business? Perhaps I should say profession. I'm a smuggler. I'm a very good one. Don't move, Miss Bowen. I have no scruples against using a gun on a lady. I'm, I'm sure you haven't. What's that? Air conditioning. Oh. Works on an automatic thermostat. I see. Carter, I think I'd better convince you that I'm in business. Oh, we're convinced of that already. The container you managed to get out of our hands. Those microfilm pans. Sand photographs on small film. Oh, we know what microfilm is. What are those plans of, Colonel? A new and secret process for casting aluminum, which doesn't belong to you. Legally, no. You see, old Griswold discovered a process in South America. But he wasn't too careful about guarding his property. You mean you hijacked it off him? Uh, you could call it that. I knew it would be worth millions to the automobile industry, which would pay heavily to the first man to secure an American patent. I plan to have a front man patent it. But you couldn't get it into the country because the treasury men were watching your gang too closely. Precisely. Hmm. That's why we had to adopt that complicated method of delivering the container. And I might add, your shrewd guess decreases your chances of surviving this meeting. You're pretty careless with murder, aren't you? I'm afraid there's been a trail of death following that container. Starting with the original inventor of the process in South America and ending in our unfortunate friend in the green hat. He failed, and I was forced to remove him. And he may not be the last. Mr. Carter, you won't get clear on that rap, Colonel. On the contrary, it's a perfect setup. Griswold couldn't call the police. Any publicity would call attention to the new process before he could patent it. You'll slip, Colonel. It won't work. I told you this, Carter, to convince you that I'm deadly serious. I'm going to get those films, and I don't care particularly how I go about it. I think that corpse cooling on your threshold should prove that. Looks as though you're holding all the aces, doesn't it? Exactly. Now the container, please. I grow impatient, Mr. Carter. You don't hand it over by the time I count three. I shall proceed to shoot your secretary right between her very pretty eyes. <laughs> watching the unwavering gun in the colonel's hand. He must act now, or the soft-spoken murderer will kill again. We'll see what he does in just a minute. And now for the conclusion of the case of a wandering macaroni. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Grenzer. Nick's office is quiet as the colonel covers Nick and Patsy, his fingers tightening on the trigger. The only sound is the colonel's voice. One, two, hold it, Colonel. I don't see why I should stick my neck out for a client. Nick. Must be so intelligent, Mr. Carter. Nick, how can you? The container I gave you. But Nick, you... Don't argue. Give it to me. All right. So what's the use of hiding it in the heel of my shoe if you're going to double-cross your client anyway? Very clever, Carter. I see the heel unscrewed. Here it is. Well, guess there's nothing left to do, Colonel. Here's your container. Don't leave your chair. Put it on the desk. Okay. Now sit back. Don't move, Carter. Glad you finally displayed reason. Now, before we decide what to do with you, we'll see whether this is the real container. It opens on this end. I've got the gun now, Colonel. And now we'll see how you like looking down the barrel. Well, it's all set, Nick. We got the Colonel booked. Murder in the first. How about the rest of the gang, Matty? All locked up. As soon as you called and told me Green Hat was dead and you'd caught the Colonel... Griswold led us to the guy who tipped him off about the macaroni deal, and he squealed on the rest. Good. I turned the plans over to Griswold, and he's got them in the bank vault. And you better get the patent papers filed in a hurry before anybody else gets any ideas. You know what burns me, Nick? That rat, the colonel, will probably hire 
six genius lawyers. Oh, I mean, no, he won't, Maddie. He told plenty before you got here. But he was what? trying to scare me into handing over the container. He even confessed to murder. Oh, that's fine, but can we prove that to a jury? We could let them hear the confession with their own ears. With a... What? Just, just before he started talking, I kicked the switch on my recording machine under the desk. Well, I'll be... Got up. everything he said. He thought the noise was the air conditioning, but he was really dictating his own death sentence. But, Nick, how the devil did you get out from under that gun? The colonel looks like a pretty cool customer to me. Yes, Nick. Just what happened? First, I'm looking at that gun too scared to breathe, thinking you were double-crossing your client, and then the colonel screaming that he can't see. Well, I knew the colonel would come to visit me sometime. He had my wallet with my address. My well, that's true. The only way he could locate the container was to come after me. So I stopped in the police laboratory and fixed a surprise for him. Oh, while I was washing up? Yes. I took the films out of the container and rigged a little booby trap inside it with tear gas. Well, I'll be doggone. <laughs> but that stunt with the heel of my shoe. Well, Patsy, he'd have suspected me if I just had it in my pocket. Oh. I knew he'd open it up immediately to check. And that's exactly what he did. You got it right in the eyes. <laughs> well, there's still one thing I'm not satisfied with, Nick. Oh, what's that? My birthday dinner. Oh. Even if we do go to the Penguin Room, the head waiter will probably get murdered, and you'll take the case. Well, then, how about going back to the cafeteria for a dish of macaroni? Oh, Well, Nick, what about the adventure Old Dutch Cleanser is going to bring us next week? I'll get to that in just a moment, Bob. First, I want to wish, uh, or rather, I wish to call attention to the fact that this is the first day of National Farm... Nick, isn't there any way out of here? I've gone over every inch of it, Patsy. There's not a chance. Oh, it's like being buried alive. I almost wish he had shot us. It would be better than, than dying like this. I'm going to make him wish he'd shot us, too. What? In fact, I'm going to make him come back to do it. Right now. And now, the case of the Bearded Queen. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. Today, Scubby Wilson, reporter on the Globe Gazette, finally got delivery on his new car and is preparing to give Nick's secretary, Patsy Vaughan, his one and only girlfriend, the first ride. Why don't we turn this corner and you get a look at it, Patsy? <laughs> the slickest, smoothest little convertible that ever came out of Detroit. No more riding the elevator, eh, Scubby? No, ma'am. When Scubby Wilson drives by, strong men will turn green with envy and fair ladies will swoon oh. with delight. <laughs> oh. You gonna let me drive? Well, I might let my wife drive if I ever get one. So if you'd care to qualify. Uh-huh. For the umpteen time, Scubby, no thanks. Oh, I mean it, Patsy. With a car like that, think of what a honeymoon we could have. Canada, maybe, or the Rockies. Uh-huh. Thanks, Scubby, but I think I'll stay single and a pedestrian. That's only because you haven't seen the car yet. Oh, and now before we turn the corner, maybe you'd better shade your eyes. It may prove a bit dazzling at first. <laughs> well, let's turn the corner and see. Okay, I'm a good woman, but don't say I didn't warn you. Now, behold the pride of the motor car industry, the glory of... Well? Holy cats! My new car is gone! Somebody's stolen it! <laughs> Sergeant, and if the car should turn up this afternoon, will you call me here at my office? Thanks a lot. Goodbye. What'd he say, Nick? Nothing yet, Scubby. Uh, they put it on the police radio, but it wasn't very encouraging. There's been an epidemic of car thefts lately, and none of the stolen cars has been recovered. Oh, gee, Scubby, that's tough. Oh, fine, fine. Fifteen hundred dollars, and I only drove it twenty blocks. Brother, that's the most expensive taxi ride I ever had. Have the police any ideas, Nick? Yes, yes, they do, Patsy. I think it's the work of a gang of boys about 16 or 17. Why, kids that age wouldn't be able to sell the cars if they did steal them, would they? Oh, well, not unless they were booked up with some crooked used car dealer who had a place where the cars could be repainted and the serial numbers changed. Uh Exactly. If kids are stealing cars on a large scale, they're working for some adult. And there's nothing more rotten than a crook who makes criminals out of youngsters. Mm, some kids seem to be born that way. Oh, no, they're not, Scubby. No, they're not, Scubby. It's a matter of environment and training. Remember, these boys grow up with no place to play except the streets under the elevated. Give them a fair chance, and they're all right. That's true, Scubby. 
Nick proved it with the downtown boys' club. Right. Why, some of those fellows down there had pretty bad records, and we got them. But now I'd trust them anyway. Oh, I know. But at the same time... Oh, let me get it. Hello. Yes, yeah, speaking. Huh? Oh, hey, that's great. They found it. They did? Oh, good. Not even scratched, huh? You sure? Oh, swell. Oh, who took it, do you know? Oh, yes. Yes, I know him. Well, thanks, Sergeant. I'll be right down. Was it stolen by somebody you know, Scubby? Somebody we all know, Patsy. Huh? It's Danny Walker, Nick. Danny Walker? Why, he belongs to the downtown boys club. Are you sure? Sergeant Brady says they've arrested him and he admitted taking it. I can't believe it. Come on. We're going to look into this thing right now. Oh, lay off, will you, Nick? I told you, if I'd known the car belonged to a friend of yours, I wouldn't have took it. It's you I'm interested in, Danny, not the car. I don't like to see you here in jail. You're the first member of the club who's gone into trouble in more than a year. I want to find out why and help you if I can. I don't belong to your club no more. I quit a month ago. When my folks moved over to the west side. Oh, is that so? I knew you hadn't been around lately, but I didn't know you'd quit. Oh, them clubs is kid stuff. I'm 18 years old. Danny, listen. We've been pretty good friends. Oh, now. look, Nick. You're a good Joe, see? Even if you are a private eye, but... Let me alone, will you? No, Danny, I won't. When you came out of reform school, you gave me your word to go straight. And until now, you have. What's changed you, Danny? What's happened to you? Well, I... I lost that job you got me, and I had to get some money quick, see? It was kind of a debt. Of, of honor, like. So I swiped the car to get the dough, and I got caught, and that's that. You stole that car for somebody else, didn't you? No, I didn't. I stole it for me. Danny, look, I came here to go your bail because we're friends, and because I thought you honestly wanted to go straight. Now, you can help me protect other boys from getting into trouble the same way you did. If you'll only tell me who... If I'll turn stool pigeon, huh? Well, I won't do it. No, sir. I tried going straight, and it didn't work. I'll take this rap, but I'll make up for it when I get out. I'll make up for it plenty. Delicatessen. And there's a space where we can park. I hope he's been able to find out something. Hello, beautiful. Hello, Scubby. Hi, Nick. You have any luck, Scubby? No, not much. There's a gang in this neighborhood, all right, but the kids wouldn't talk to me. They have any regular place to meet? There's no settlement house and no boys' club. But some of them hang out at the West Pine Street garage. A garage? Now, don't get excited. I know it sounds like a perfect lead, but I met the boss. And if he's a crook, I'm Jesse James. Well, I'd like to talk to him anyway. What's he like? Nice old fellow. Name of Bainbridge. And everybody calls him Pop. I think you and he will have a lot in common. What? Not you, Nick. What? I said I think you and Pop Bainbridge will have a lot in common. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, never mind. You'll see for yourself. Come on. <laughs> I just don't know what to think, Mr. Carlo. Why, Danny used to mind the gasoline pumps for when I'd go out to eat. Maybe there'd be thirty or forty dollars in the cash register, and he never touched a cent of it. I'll swear to that. I see. Oh, pops, any calls? No, not a thing, Joe. Hey, I want you to meet my friends. Yeah. Miss Bone, Mr. Wilson. Hello. And Mr. Carter. Hello. Nick Carter. Well, how do you do? This is Joe Ferner. He keeps his taxi here, and I take his calls for him. Uh, Nick kind of the private eye, huh? Uh huh. Heard about you. Now I'll be up front, pops, in the office. All right, Joe. Come on, Mister Carter, and you folks too. I want to show you something. I didn't tell Nick about this, Mister Bainbridge. I oh. thought you'd like to do it yourself. All right, in here. We're right down the elevator. Now, will you push the button, Mister Carter? The one marked B. We'll go in the basement. Oh, certainly. But what's this all about? You'll see in a minute, Nick. Oh, a cigarette, Mr. Bainbridge? Hey, the name's Pops. No, thanks. I don't smoke. Scubby, don't you see the no smoking sign on the wall? Oh, sorry. 
Golly, these garage elevators are big things, aren't yeah, they? Well, we park cars on the upper floor and use this elevator to take them up. Oh. There now. <clears throat> now, wait till I find the light. There we are. Why, it's a club room. Oh, look, Nick, a handball court, and there's a dark game. Yeah. Oh. Hmm, and a radio, checker game, and chess. Hey, you've done all right here, Pop. Mm. Well, it isn't much, but I've seen a lot of boys get into trouble hanging around the streets, so I... Hey, here's that... a deck of cards. Like to try a hand at gin rummy, Nick? Oh, no, thanks. Oh, <laughs> look, Nick, somebody's been doing a little art work on these cards. You see the bid on this queen of hearts? Whoever drew that has talent. Even changed the expression on her face. Hey, that's pretty good. <laughs> I hoped I was helping the boys by fixing up this place, but now I don't know. Well, why do you say that, Pop? Well, look what happened to Danny, one of the finest youngsters I ever knew. Now, maybe hanging around the garage here got him wanting a car of his own. I'm afraid it's not that simple, Pops. Well, thanks for your time. You've been very helpful. I'm just sorry I couldn't do more. You've helped me a great deal. A great deal more than you know. the gag, Nick. You didn't come to the jail just to play cards with me. Oh, yes, I did, Danny. Let me deal your hand. Okay. You know how to play poker, don't you? Sure, but I ain't got no money. I'm playing for higher stakes than money. Uh, wait. Huh? Never mind picking up your cards. I have you beaten. How do you know? We ain't looked at the hands yet. I have three aces, and you're holding a pair of sixes. You a mind reader or something? Turn them over and see. Well, I'll... Hey, what is this? You stacking the cards on me? No. I was reading the backs of the cards, Danny. A uh, mark deck, huh? So what? See this card? Yeah. Five of clubs, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, show me those marks, will you? In a minute. This is the ten of diamonds, right? Right. And the seven of spades? The queen of hearts? Wait a minute. That queen of hearts. It's got a beard on it. Has it? Pete Krovick put that beard on there. I've seen him do it. Oh. Well, you played with this deck before. You bet I played with them before. Where'd you get them cards? Don't you know? Who gave me a... Come on, quit holding out on me. You're holding out on me, aren't you, Danny? Yeah, I... I guess I have been. I guess I've been a sucker, ain't I? Taking the rap for somebody who... Who what, Danny? Listen, Nick. Did you mean that about going my bail if I helped you crack this case? Danny, the minute you tell me who's behind these car thefts, you're on your way out of here. Oh, no. Get me out first, then I'll talk. All right. may take me a couple of hours to make the arrangements, and I have to see a client at eight. But if I can't be here, I'll send Scubby to bring you to my office. That's okay, and don't worry about your case, Mr. Carter. I'll crack it for you. Good boy. Brother, I'll crack it wide open. <laughs> That's Nick's house over there, Danny. Okay. You better park on this side, Scubby. Nick's car's in front of the house. Sure. I'll only be here a few minutes anyway. Got to meet a guy for an interview pretty soon. Oh, come on. Nick's waiting for us. Gee, I feel like the mayor or something with two of you bringing me here. Well, Nick didn't want to take any chances. On me running out, huh? No, on anything happening to you. We're your bodyguards. But <laughs> you're guarding me from what? <laughs> Nobody even knows Nick sprung me. Maybe not, but I still think that green sedan was following us. That green sedan must have been your imagination, Patsy. Either that or we lost him in the last block or two. I hope so. We're here, Nick. Oh, hello. Is everything all right? Yeah, hi, Nick. Everything's fine. You bring the reports on the other car thefts, Patsy? What? Oh, Nick, I'm sorry. I left them in the car. Oh, I'll get them for you, Miss Bowen. We won't take it. Oh, no, Danny, let's come into it. Danny, look out! Oh, hey. oh, good grief. Oh. He ran into him on purpose. Come on. It was that green sedan I saw following us before. Patsy, call an ambulance. Right. Scubby, head off any traffic. Sure, Nick. Here, Danny. Here, Danny. Let me put my coat under your head. Danny, can you hear me? It's Nick. Nick. It was... Him, Nick. I know, Danny. Don't try to talk. Got to... Got to tell you about... Those cars. All right, son. What about them? The... I... What I? Who do you mean, Danny? Look for the... I... In the... L... L... Ah... 
Denny. Oh, the poor kid. He's fainted. No, Scubby. He's dead. The I and the L. Can Danny's dying words be the clue that will lead Nick to the head of the car thieves and Danny's killer? We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the Bearded Queen. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. Back at the office, Nick, Patsy, and Scubby are puzzling over the connection between the automobile thefts and Danny Walker's dying words. Look for the I in the L. Nick, the only way I can figure it, it must be some detective on duty around the elevated train. Naturally. Scubby, look, Brady. And ask him confidentially if any L detective has shown sudden prosperity since these car thefts started. Sure, Nick. If only we could have got the license number of that green sedan. Yes. Well, at least we have the fragments of glass from that shattered headlight. That may help us to identify it. Uh-huh. And the police are checking every garage in town for a green sedan with a broken headlight lens. I felt sure that car was following us. But I didn't see it when we got here. Probably parked the car up the street with his lights off and his motor running just in case. Mm-hmm. And when Danny started to cross the street alone, the murderer saw his chance and took it. Right. Well, the next thing is to find out if any older men sat in those card games with Danny. Do you think the leader of this gang played cards with the boys? Not only played cards with them, he cheated. Oh. Danny realized it when he saw the bearded queen of hearts in that marked deck. So-called debt of honor he stole Scubby's car to repay was a gambling debt. Well, then maybe the same trick was played on some of the other boys. That might account for the rest of the stolen cards. The way I figure it. After a boy had stolen one card, it wouldn't be hard to frighten him into stealing more by threatening to expose him. Well, that's the lowest trick I ever heard of. I agree with you, Scubby. Yes. Well, when we find out who won with that Mark Dick, I think we'll have the leader of the gang and Danny's murderer. Perhaps Bainbridge ought to know. Right, Patsy. And that's where we're going. Scubby, as soon as you've talked to Sergeant Brady about the detectives, phone me at the West Pine Street garage. couple of older fellows who sometimes used to play down there, Mr. Carter, but hey, I don't... What? Oh, Joe. What's the matter? No gas tonight? Oh, I didn't hear, hear you drive up. Been here two or three minutes. You're so busy talking to your friends, you didn't see me. Oh, we were talking about Danny Walker. Yeah, nice kid. Too bad he had an accident, wasn't it? How about putting some gas in my can? Yeah, sure, Joe, sure. Right away. Answer that, will you, Mr. Carter? Oh, yes, yes. It may be for me anyway. I'm expecting the call. Well, maybe it's for me, too, Nick. I'd better come with you. Nick, I didn't want to be left alone with Joe. Did you see the look on his face and how scared Pops was? Yes, I noticed it. You better stay right outside the booth here. Yes. Hello? West Pine Street Garage. Is that you, Nick? Oh, yes, Gubby. What did you find out? Not a thing. As far as Sergeant Brady knows, there's nothing against any of the detectives around the elevator. Of course, there's been no time for any investigation, but Sergeant Brady thinks we're on the wrong track. He may be right. But the I and the L is the only thing we have to go on, and I'm going to follow it through. Okay. Oh, uh, say, will you ask Pops if he found my cigarette lighter? I had him. We were going down to the basement there. Remember when Patsy pointed out that no-smoking sign and I... Scubby! That may be it. That may be what? Never mind. You at headquarters? Yes, why? I'll call you back in 15 minutes. Give you the whole story for your paper. Did he find out anything, Nick? Wasn't anything to find out. Where are Pops and Joe? Uh, they went out to the gas pump. Good. I want to take another look at that elevator. Are we going down to the club room? Not this time. Must have been blind not to have seen it before. Seen what? An elevator made of steel plates riveted together. Push-button controls and a no-smoking sign painted on the wall. Well, what's unusual about that? Here's the elevator. Step in. I'll show you. Uh-huh. See, Patsy? One of those rivets is right in the middle of the eye, in no smoking. The I and the L. The letter I and the no smoking sign in the elevator, of course. Danny died before he finished the word. But, well, how does that... This elevator is run by push-button controls, Patsy. A button for each floor. I know, but... There were another floor, a secret oh. floor. The control button for it would have to be concealed, too. And that rivet in the letter I may be it. Push it, Nick. Let's find out if... Nick, we're going down to the boys' club room. I think you'll find we're going past the club room, Betsy. But we can't go past the basement. No? Ever hear of a sub-basement? Huh? Why, of course. 
Jasper Path in the club room. There is a secret floor. Maybe we're going to discover a lot of secrets. Well, this seems to be it. Whatever it is. Gosh, it's dark here. Well, there should be a light switch near the elevator. Yes, here it is. I think it's another garage. A complete paint shop. And mechanical equipment for working over stolen cars. Look, at the other end of the room, a green sedan. With a broken headlight and the fender all dead. That's the car, uh, all right. The one that killed Dan. Oh, Stopper. You too, sister. Joe, I, I thought you I were... I came down while you were telephoning. I've been standing right behind this pillow waiting for you, baby. You and the boy. Now, look, Joe. Carter, take your rod out of your pocket and drop it on the floor. Now, no, don't turn around. Whatever you say. But you're not playing this very smart. Smart than you, Gladfoot. And take that pocket, oh. just, uh, just in case you might be packing some heat. Where's Pop? Have you done something to him? Me? I don't do nothing to nobody, unless it's an accident. Of course, I do have an awful lot of accidents. Hit and run accidents, Joe? Sometimes. But I'll be able to do better than that for you two. Something real neat and artistic. Now, wait. You don't realize the police know we came here. So you come here. Then you left, See? Nobody will find this cellar, and nobody will ever find you. So long, suckers. I'll see you again tomorrow, the next day. And when I do, you're going to have one of the neatest little accidents that ever happened. So long, suckers. I'll see you again tomorrow, the next day. And when I do, you're going to have one of the neatest little accidents that ever happened. Nick, isn't there any way out of here? No. Just this one big bare room. Nothing but the pillars that support the building. These workbenches and garage equipment. And the elevator shaft at the other end. But it's like being buried alive. I almost wish he had shot us. Patsy, I'm going to make Joe wish he had shot us. What? First, I'm going to make him come right back to do it. Right now. Dick, why are you taking off your shoes? I may want to walk quietly before I'm through. Hand me that monkey wrench there. Oh, that won't be any good against a gun, Nick. Better than nothing. Let me have it. Okay. Now, you get inside that green sedan. Lie down on the floor. You'll be as safe from bullets there as any place. All right, Nick. This switch box on the wall contains the main electrical switches for the entire building. One for the lights and one for power. We've got to keep the garage going upstairs as a blind. But it can't operate without lights. So we cut the lights. Oh, Nick, be careful. I will. I'll be behind this pillar next to the switch box. Joe will have to get those lights on again and quick. And he'll have to pass me in the dark to do it. I left the power switch on so the elevator still runs. He's coming. Oh, Nick. I'm afraid. Don't worry. It'll be over in a minute. One way or the other. Nick and Patsy wait tensely in the darkness, unarmed as the elevator descends, bearing a killer with a gun in his hand and murder in his heart. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Bearded Queen. Today's Nick Carter adventure brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. Trapped in the thought in the dark sub-basement of the West Pine Street garage, Nick, armed only with a monkey wrench, waits behind a concrete pillar near the light switches for a killer. Across the room, the elevator comes to a stop. The beam of a flashlight cuts the pitch blackness, and a voice says, That was very clever to turn off those lights, Mr. Carter. Clever, but fatal. You leave us no choice but to dispose of you and Miss Bowen now. Come on along with that flashlight, Pops. We'll turn the switch on again. Yeah, not so fast, Joe. Carter probably intends to ambush us, even if he doesn't have a gun. Yeah. I'll stay here by the elevator and keep the flashlight on you just in case. Good idea. When the lights is on, we can finish him off nice and easy. I'll get the switch. Remember, I have a gun, Mr. Carter, so don't think... Joe! <coughs> <you. coughs> hey, Pops! <laughs> what happened to the flashlight? How'd you come to yeah, drop it? Stay right where you are, Joe. Yeah, okay. Mr. Carter's a very accurate at throwing a wrench. The flashlight's broken. You know where I am, Joe, so if you hear a sound in any other part of the room, shoot. Don't worry, I will. Where's that switch? Did you get him, Joe? I couldn't have missed that range, Pops. 
But I don't know whether it was him or her. It wasn't either. Hey, Bob, you don't hear me. Help me. Help me. Joe. Joe, you all right? Joe, why don't you answer me? This is Joe's gun on your back, Bill. Oh. He doesn't have any more use for it. You better drop the one you're holding. Yeah, yeah. I will. All right, Patsy. Find that light switch. We're taking these two crooks to headquarters. Straight ahead on this street, Scubby. You can't miss the sign out front. The West Side Boys Club grand opening tonight. Okay. Oh, say, Nick, when you jumped on Joe Farner in the dark, how'd you know exactly where he was? By the flash of his gun when he fired at something across the room. Oh. And I still don't know what he was shooting at. <laughs> I do. Huh? When I heard Bambers tell Joe to fire at any sound, I threw my shoe out of the window of the car I was hiding in. And sure enough, he shot at it. Oh, good <laughs> for you, Patsy. Very clever. It distracted Joe's attention just long enough for me to jump in. Great stuff, Patsy. Will you marry me? Oh, Scubby, please. Oh, okay, beautiful. <laughs> and then after I had Joe's gun, it was easy to find Bainbridge in the dark. He kept calling to Joe, so all I had to do was to follow the sound of his voice. Uh-huh. This is it, Nick. The new West Side Boys Club. Just look at the crowd. You have your seat. In my pocket. Good. You know, I'm prouder of being asked to speak at the opening here tonight than I would be if I were asked to address Congress. I guess the other boys who were mixed up with Bainbridge and Ferner will be here, won't they? Well, of course, Cubby. Nick got them all suspended sentences because of the trickery used to make them steal those cars. And thanks to clubs like this, those boys will now have a chance to grow up right. Hey, Patsy, you know what? What, Scubby? I just realized. Now that you've ridden in my new car, maybe you'll change your mind about marrying me. Well, Scubby, I... I must admit I'm in love with... Me? Ah, uh -huh. no, darling. Your car. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the Cuddy Packing Company, makers of new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick, with Charlotte Manson featured as Patsy. Scubby is played by John Kane. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by George Wright. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use new post for Old Dutch Cleanser. Take an A and a C, add T-I-V, then A-T-E, and end with a D. Now, ladies, keep on listening to get the answer you've been missing. New post-war Old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war Old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Patsy, I want you to send Waldo and Scubby to Boontown. Have them kick up a fuss that'll make the headlines. Well, sure, Nick, but what kind of a fuss? Give Waldo $500. Then I want him to hold up a bank and put the money in the bank safe. Hold up a bank and put the money in the bank safe. Yes. Well, that'll make the headlines all right, but how will it help you? It'll help me a great deal. It'll probably save my life. Now, the case of the two-faced firemaster, today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. 
two boys in their teens walk up to a small hardware store on the west side. It's after 10 and the store is dark, but one of them pushes the door open, enter, and walk cautiously to the rear where a small naked light bulb burns dimly. I'm here, Mr. Gerard. Oh, hello, Jenny. And uh, where's Fred? Uh, outside. You got the guns? Uh, right here. Sweetest pair of 45 automatics you ever saw. There isn't an identification number on them. A hundred bucks each, right? Yep, that was the deal. Sure. Uh, Mr. Gerard, I ain't got 200 bucks on me right now. Huh? Me and Fred, we, we figure we'll have the dough for you in about an hour. If you let us have the rods, we, we, we got a little deal. I see. Well? Okay, Johnny. Here you are. Thanks. Uh, you'll be back here by midnight with the dough. Sure thing. I'll see you later, Mr. Gerard. Nobody move. This is a stick-up, you hear me? This is a stick-up. Are you young squirt? You can't... I told no one to move. Get over against the wall or you'll get the same as he got. Hurry up. Fred, check up the back of the store before you hit the register. Maybe there's someone back there. Who turned on that alarm? Who did it? Fred, for the love of fire! Yeah, there was somebody back there, kid. He got your pal. Now drop that gun. You don't get me so easy. Stay back against the wall, you. Stay inside, all of you. Me not tonight, mister, not when I got a car and a ride. Pull over there. Now look out with that car, who are you crowding? Pull over, I said. Get your car over against that curb back. Like fun, I will. Okay, then I'll make you do it. <laughs> Were you born that way or is it a result of practice? I don't know, Brady. Patsy and I were driving down Central Avenue last night, minding our own business. Uh Uh-huh, we just finished the candle case, Sergeant. And that was the moment when Johnny Macklin came tearing out of the place and jumped into his car. And someone from the store yelled, stop him. And I was the closest, so I cut him off. Well, Nick, why should you be interested? One kid's dead. We've got the other one cold for attempted robbery. There isn't any case. It so happens, Brady, that there is a case. Oh, Yeah. The guns the boys use. What about them? Every identification mark and serial number has been removed. And in a professional manner. So what? Somebody's in the business of preparing and selling firearms to crooks. And potential crooks, Ray. That somebody's got to be put out of business. You're right about that. So, with your permission, I'm cutting myself into this deal. Okay, Nick. Where are you going to start? Going down to the hospital for a talk with Johnny Macklin. I want to know where you got that gun. Ah, uh, go fly a kite. Now listen, Johnny. The man who sold you that gun is as much responsible for the jam you're in as you are. And I want to know his name. Go scrap. You know, I can trace the gun. Like fun you can, there ain't no number on it. I said I can trace the gun and I can. And I can get the man who processed it and sold it to you. But you can save me a lot of time if you'll answer my questions. It'll make things easier for you, Johnny. You can't trace that rod and you know it. You bluff it. You think so? Let's have the lab kit, Patsy. Right here, Nick. You see, Johnny, the serial numbers are stamped into the metal of a gun. And they're stamped with a lot of pressure. But even if someone very carefully removes those numbers with a file and acid, they can't change one thing. What, for instance? The fact that the stamp has hit the metal so hard, it's permanently changed the crystalline structure of the metal. What do you mean? I mean that I can drop some of this chemical reagent on the gun where the serial number was originally. Like this. I'm watching. And you'll see the original serial number of a gun, your gun, showing up. Fuzzy. But distinct enough to read. You mean... There. See? Y two eight four three seven. For the love of, so he lied to me. The dirty, lousy, crooky lied to me. Who is it, Johnny? Pop Gerard over on Tenth Avenue, the Gerard Hardware Store. Go get him, Mister Carter. <laughs> Mr. 
Sergeant Brady. Brady? Nick. What you got, Nick? I've located the man who sold Johnny Macklin his gun. Great. He's a man named Gerard, who runs a hardware store on 10th Avenue. Gerard? But I've got a hunch Gerard's only the salesman. So what? I want the manufacturer. Sure, but how are you going to get him? Going over there and place an order for guns. Big enough to stir things up. And when I order them in my best gangster voice, it's going to start things popping. I hope. <laughs> It's me, mister. I got 200 bucks for you. 200? Huh? Right here. Fred and Johnny sent their regards with the dough. Fred and Johnny? Smart, don't you get it? They pulled a nice job last night. But they figured it'd be safer maybe to lamb out of town. So they sent me with the dough. Uh, what's your name, mister? Kane. Nels Kane. From St. Louis. You don't know me. Well, I'm much obliged, Mr. Kane. Listen, Gerard, I like the way you did business with the kids, so I figure maybe you and me can make a deal. Yeah? How much for 40 belly guns? 38s. 40? And maybe a Thompson gun, too. Mr. Kane, that's one big order. Well, I run one big organization in St. Louis. Uh, well, uh, I'll see what I can do, Mr. Kane. Unfortunately, I can't let you know right away. Look, Gerard, ain't that uh, no... Suppose you come back this afternoon at 3... Uh, I'm sure we can do business together fine, Mr. Kane. Real fine. Patsy, I think we're in. Is Gerard your man, Nick? No, my hunch was right. He's just a salesman. So I gave him a big order in my best gangster dialect, and he said he had to find out whether Mr. Manufacturer had enough stock to supply me. And? I'll get to the manufacturer through Gerard this afternoon. Uh-huh. Oh, golly, I forgot. Brady called ten minutes ago. He said you asked him to keep the story quiet. I did. Well, one of the police reporters got hold of the boy's name. Oh, for the love And they'll be in the paper tonight. Oh, Nick, if Mr. Manufacturer sees it, your case is shot. That's no lie. What do you do now? Well, I don't know. I only know I've got to find out who's supplying the underworld with guns. Now for my next question. How old is your firm, Mr. Valance? Rodney Valance Incorporated is 75 years old. I'm the third Rodney Valance to head this old and respected firm as Firemaster. Firemaster? What's that, Mr. Valance? The Firemaster invents and creates the new types of fireworks that are manufactured each year. Oh, that's very interesting yeah. indeed, sir. Excuse me, Mr. Ballas. Uh, yes, Linda? Mr. Gerard to see you. He says it's urgent. Yeah, very well, my dear. If you'll excuse me a moment, Mr. Oh, Gerard. That's all right, Mr. Valens. I'll wait here. Well, Gerard? I think we got a new customer, Mr. Valens. Uh, come to us through uh, Johnny Macklin, who was sent to us by one of our best customers. Who is he? Man named Kane, Nels Kane from St. Louis, wants 40 guns in the Thompson. 40? Mm. Well, quite an order. Yeah. Uh, there's just one thing, Mr. Valens. Yeah? I uh, don't know this Nels Kane. Never seen him before. Never even heard of him. And we must be careful, as always. Now check the files, Linda. Yes, Mr. Valens. Well? Yeah. No one by the name of Nels Kane listed here, Mr. Valens. Well, nevertheless, such an order is rather too large to throw away on mere suspicion, eh? That's the way I feel, Mr. Valens. Well, I'll tell you, Gerard, we'll arrange to test the gentleman's integrity this afternoon. It'll be a protest, but <laughs> very effective. <laughs> Well, now that Johnny and Fred's names will be in the newspapers and Valance is already suspicious of his new customer, it looks as though Nick Carter may be up against a tough problem. We'll see how he meets this challenge in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the Two-Faced Firemaster. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Blender. For the past hour, Nick has been engaged in his favorite pastime while thinking. He's throwing darts at a target set up in his office. Finally, however, Patsy just can't stand not being talked to any longer. Nick, haven't you thought of anything yet? Patsy, I guess I'll just have to go ahead and take a chance. Hmm? 
Maybe Gerard and Mr. Manufacturer won't see the hold-up story in the paper until it's too late. Maybe. In the meantime, I have a plan that may help. Oh? Tell Walter to pick up Scubby and fly out to Boontown at once. Okay, but what for? To carry phony identification with him, identifying them as Johnny Macklin and Fred. And then? Out in Boontown, they to create some wild fuss that'll get them picked up by the local police, something that'll make a big splash in the newspapers. And it's got to be so big that the local papers here will be sure to pick it up. Well, what should they do? I want you to give Waldo $500. Mm-hmm. And tell him he's to hold up a bank and put the money in the bank safe. Hold up a bank and put the money in the bank safe? Yes. Oh, that'll make the headlines all right. Naturally, I want you to make arrangements to have the bank cooperate. Well, I should hope so. On the quiet, of course. Check. In the meantime, I've got a three o'clock date with Gerard. And I hope he doesn't have a newspaper with him. All right, Peterson, we've arrived. What time is it, Linda? Uh, 3.30, Mr. Valance. Very good. You understand your instructions, Peterson? I think so, Mr. Valance. Gerard has told this cane person to meet me alongside the trolley power station at half past three. But you will meet him and, of course, pretend that you are the key man in this deal. Yes, sir. Yes, you will also carry this bag. Okay. There's a Thompson gun in it which you will offer as a sample. I see. And uh, if this cane proves to be a cop or something... Trust me, Peterson. Trust me. Okay, Mr. Valance. I'll be off with you. You mustn't keep Mr. Kane waiting. Been waiting long, Mr. Kane. Huh? Oh, yeah. Here I said. I know, I know. Uh, I'm a little late. Sorry. You're the big boy. That's right, brother. Go ahead. You carry the ball. What do you mean? I'm a stranger in town, mister. I'm not taking no chances. You want to do business with me, go ahead and talk. Okay, okay. Touchy, ain't you? I got a sample here to show you. Now, uh, this here's our Thompson special. It's a rebuilt job, no identification. Are you crazy? (laughs) What do you think I am anyway? A baby? You trying to set up a pinch for me? Lay off, will you? I want to beat your head in. You know no better than to flash a Thompson gun up in the open where a hundred people could see us. Oh, gee, I... Get on your feet, Funk. Take that bag and get out of here. Yeah, but I thought you... I don't do business with you. You're the big boy on this deal and I'm the king of Siam. Hey, Gerard. I want a couple of words with you. What's the idea of sending up mush head to beat me at the power station? Hey, come of... right in, Mr. King. Hey, who are you? The name is Valance, Rodney Valance. This is Linda. How do you do, Mr. Kane? Hi. Permit me to shake your hand, sir. You positively thrashed poor Peterson. <laughs> he had it coming, Mr. Kane. He was clumsy. Hey, I'm beginning to get it. You're the big guy. That's quite so. You sent that mug to try me out, huh? We uh, have to be careful, Mr. Kane. Yeah, sure. Now, to get down to business, you spoke of 40 revolvers and a Thompson gun? That's right. The price will be $5,000 on delivery. All firearms are guaranteed to be in the best working condition and warranted free of all identification marks. Okay, the price is all right. Where's the stuff? Well, at my plant, naturally, you couldn't expect me to carry all that around with me. All right, how do I get to the plant? We'll take you there this evening, Mr. Kane. Suppose we pick you up in front of Gerard's shop at, say, uh, 7 o'clock. You. Any luck this time? You bet. I finally located our manufacturer. Who is he? A man named Rodney Valance. I dropped off to check him on the way home. He runs Rodney Valance Incorporated, a firm that manufactures fireworks. Firecrackers, skyrockets, and stuff like that? That's right. Rodney's what they call the fire master, the man who designs the fireworks. But it so happens he also designs firearms for criminal use. But, Nick, if you met him, why didn't you grab him? I didn't want to. Not until I've located his plant. He's going to take me there tonight at 7. Good. Get hold of Sergeant Brady for me, will you? I want to make a few plans. Right. And let's hope that Rodney Valance doesn't read the wrong newspaper between now and then. If he does, you may have to start looking for a new boss. (laughs) 
Linda. Linda, it's 6.45. Time to be on our way. Mr. Vallis. Now, we've a busy night before us, Linda. There's Mr. Kane to be taken care of and... <laughs> Linda, what's the matter? Mr. Vallis. Gerard said Kane was a friend of Johnny Macklin's, didn't he? Quite right. Johnny gave him the money to pay for his guns before he left town. Well, Johnny didn't leave town. What's that? Johnny didn't pull off that job last night. Fred was killed and Johnny was caught. Let me see that paper. There. Johnny was caught by Nick Carter. Nick Carter? Well. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. You're a treasure. Although I don't think Mr. Nails Kane Carter will think so. After we've finished with him tonight, huh? <laughs> Swiftly, Rodney Valance and Linda leave for their appointment with Nick, who waits in front of Gerard's store. We'll see what happens next in just a moment. And now for the conclusion of the case of the two-faced firemaster. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. It's ten minutes after seven. A long black sedan has just pulled up before Gerard's shop on 10th Avenue. And Nick Carter, the collar of his overcoat up close around his neck, has jumped in. Swiftly, the sedan starts its drive through the city. Uh, sorry to have kept you waiting, Mr. Kane. I hope you'll forgive me. Yeah, sure, that's okay. You know, just before I come here, I read in the paper about Johnny Macklin and Fred. No, did you? Yeah, <laughs> crazy kids. Sure get themselves into the goofiest jams. You read what they did out in Boontown today? Boontown? Yeah, that's right. See on the paper. Uh, read it to me, Linda. Now, turn on the light. Thanks. Me. Two thieves identified as Johnny Macklin and Fred Gummer attempted to rob the Boontown Bank this afternoon, but for some unknown reason made the mistake of depositing $500 instead of taking any money. They... Mr. Vollard... Yes, I heard. Very interesting, isn't it? Well, we'll go into it after we get to the plant. Hey, what's the matter, Valance? Uh, nothing at all, Mr. Kane. Just a little problem of conflicting newspaper stories we'll have to settle. Hey, it shouldn't bother you now, Mr. Kane. Okay, don't bother me. But there's one thing that does. Yeah? You've been driving this car around the streets like you're an eel. I don't like it. We going to your plan, or is this a come on? Uh, merely a precaution to shake off anyone who might be tailing us, Mr. Kane. Thought you already tested me once. Wasn't that enough? I'm a careful man, Mr. Kane. So am I. Especially with five grand on me. Now, look, we're at fifth and grand. Correct. If we was being tailed, we ain't no more. So now either we head straight for your place or I get out while I still got my dough. We're going there directly, Mr. Kane. All right, so where is it? It can't do any harm to tell you now, Mr. Kane. It's alongside the river at First Street. It's the Valance Powder House where most people imagine our uh, fireworks are manufactured. The Valance Powder House at First Street, right? Yes, that's right. We're on the level with you, Mr. Kane. But in five minutes, we're going to ask you a more serious question. Are you on the level with us? Well, here we are. Will uh, you get out, Linda? Yes, Mr. Vallon. Now you, Mr. Kane. Sure, pal. Should have let me help the lady out first, though. Don't move, Mr. Kane. Don't raise your voice, please. I won't, sister. Not with a gun on my back. Mr. Kane, I'll be honest with you. Up until the time you got into our car, I was positive you were Nick Carter. Nick Carter? <laughs> that joker. A certain item in the paper made us think so. But you showed us another story that seems to confuse the issue. To put it plainly, if Johnny and Fred are really in Boomtown, you're Nils Kane. But if they were captured last night in this city, you're Nick Carter. Look, if you think Walk you're gonna... into the warehouse, Mr. Kane, or Carter. Go ahead. And you'll wait here until we can check the conflicting newspaper stories. Yeah? Yes. If you're Nils Kane, you'll leave with 40 revolvers and a Thompson gun. And our apology. If you're Nick Carter, you'll leave with the bullet in your heart. Okay. Be careful, Linda. I'll open the door. Come in, Mr. Kane. Oh, Mr. Carter. Okay. All right, Valance. What's rage? What is it? Mr. Valance, we've been... You too, sister. Linda, you've got a gun. I'm going to use it, too. Ready, keep Alice covered. I'll grab the girl. That's what you think, Mr. Nick Carter. Give me that gun. I'll kill you with a... Linda, try to... Keep your hands up, Valance. Okay, Linda, if you want to play rough. Nick, Nick, you all right? I'm all right, ready. In a half a second, I'll... Drop that gun. Well, that's better. You beast, I could... Keep them both covered, Brady. Right. 
I'll get the gun. Okay, that's that. Did you get Gerard and Peterson back at the store? Oh, you sure did. Then let's wrap up this case and go home. Well, Mr. Valance... Now, look, Carter, if you think... I you're... don't think, Mr. Valance, I know. This is the beginning of a long and profitable relationship between you and a prison cell. <laughs> I don't get it. What, Patsy? When you got into Valance's car, did you know where his plant was? No, I didn't have the slightest idea. Then how come Brady was waiting for you inside the plant? You said Valance shook off anybody who could possibly be tailing you. Mm -hmm. Patsy, a great many new devices were developed during the war. One of them is a very compact radio transmitter small enough to go into a large pocket. Oh, then that's why you wore your overcoat. That's why. And that's also why I turned up the collar so that Valance and Linda wouldn't see the throat microphone I was wearing underneath. <laughs> oh, well, I'll be darned. All Brady had to do was listen to what you said to Valance. That's right. I said it was simple, didn't I? That's how he happened to be waiting for us. And thus ends that case. Oh, no, 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 not quite. What? what do you mean? And say, where are we going? Now, Patsy, don't tell me you've forgotten all about Waldo and Scubby. Why, Nick, they're still in Boontown, in jail. And that's where we're headed. Of course. After all, when they pulled off that crazy stunt of theirs and confused Valence and Linda, gave me that extra five minutes I needed in order to save my life. Yes. <laughs> I guess the least you can do is to get them out of jail. Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time and over these same stations by the Cudahy Packing Company, makers of new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. <music> Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Sergeant Brady is played by Ted Jewett. Script by Alfred Bester. Original music is played by George Wright. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. of a hermit thrush. Today's exciting adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter brought to you by a new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. Our story begins outside an imposing edifice which 70 years ago was considered beautiful and luxurious. Today, with its boarded windows and air of decay, it is ugly and ominous. A tall, distinguished-looking man stands on the dark porch of the mansion banging away with the heavy bronze knocker. Mr. Kavanaugh! Mr. Jewel, open the door! Mr. Kavanaugh, do you hear me? Hey, you! What? What? What's going on up there? Oh, policeman, good. Don't you know it's the middle of the night? People are trying to sleep, and here you are. Officer, oh, you've you. got to help me get into this house. Are you crazy? That's Mr. Otis Kavanaugh's house. Nobody goes in there. But, officer, Mr. I... Mr. Kavanaugh locked himself up in there 15 years ago, and he's never come out. I know that, And what's but... more, he don't let nobody in. Nobody except his housekeeper and his lawyer. But I'm Otis Kavanaugh's lawyer, Leonard Kelsey. What? You say you're his lawyer? Yes, and I've got to get inside this house, even if I have to break in. Well, you're not breaking in, mister, not as long as I've got anything to say about it. But I'm afraid Mr. Kavanaugh has met with foul play of some kind. Well, what makes you think that? I phoned here half an hour ago, officer. Eleanor Drew, that's Mr. Kavanaugh's housekeeper, answered the phone. So what? She was very excited. 
She said that she and Mr. Kavanaugh had been quarreling, and she refused to let me speak to him. Huh? Then when I called back a few minutes later, no one answered the phone. Well, that is funny, seeing as how Mr. Kavanaugh never goes out of the house. Officer, please. Miss Drew is a woman of violent temper. She hates Mr. Kavanaugh, even though she continues to work for him. We, we've got to get in there, I tell you. She, she may have killed him. Did you try the door? Oh, of course not. It's always kept locked. Officer, I am... Wait. The door ain't locked now. What? Hey, maybe something funny is going on in here. Come on, let's have a look. Here, let me, let me find the light. Here it is. Now we can... Yeah. Good Lord. Holy smoke. It's, it's Miss Drew. And it looks like you've been worrying about the wrong party. It's the housekeeper that's met with foul play, Mr. Kelsey. She's been murdered. <laughs> Tell me, the identity of the murderer is quite clear. His identity, yes, but not his whereabouts. In other words, all you want Nick to do is to find Otis Kavanaugh. Is that it, Mr. Kelsey? Precisely, Miss Booth. Well, the police are quite capable when it comes to locating missing persons, Kelsey. Especially in a case like this. There can't be many places where Otis Kavanaugh can hide. Why do you say that, Miss Booth? Well, after all, he's been cut off from everybody for the last 15 years. I remember hearing about him when I was a kid. Yeah, he locked himself up in that old place because of a broken heart, didn't he? Yes, uh, Mr. Kavanaugh was jilted by the young woman he intended to marry. He's been a recluse ever since. Oh, wasn't he also just beginning a career as a singer? I know the tabloids always refer to him as the hermit thrush. That's right, it was on the concert stage. Billed as a high society tenor. Yes, that's right. And now he's wanted for murder. He what a wasted career. Yes, yes, but uh, Mr. Carter, I, I think it's tremendously important that Otis be found quickly. You do? Why? Frankly, to prevent more murders. I don't believe Otis Kavanaugh is sane. No? No. No man who locks himself in a gloomy mansion and refuses to come out can be in full possession of his faculties. But... And I'm very much afraid that Otis' derangement has become permanent and violent. Well, then there's real danger if he isn't caught. That's exactly my point, Mr. Oh. What do you say, Mr. Carter? Very well, Mr. Kelsey. I'll do my level best to find him. And I hope it won't be too late. So that's the Kavanaugh Mansion. Hmm. How long has this house been voted up this way, Kelsey? Why, ever since Otis went into security. And you and Miss Drew were the only ones that saw him in all those 15 years, huh? The only ones, yes. Oh, there's Sergeant Matheson, Nick. Oh, hi, Matty. Well, I'll be... What are you doing here? Why, Mr. Kelsey here hired me to lend a hand on the Drew killing. Any objections? A lot of good it'll do me to object. Okay, come on in. <laughs> Thanks, Matty, for the cordial invitation. Oh, this is really a dirty old place, isn't it? Yeah, this Drew Dane may have called herself a housekeeper, but brother, she never kept house. She was out as private secretary, his cook, and his nurse as well. <laughs> How she hated him. Huh? She hated him? Yet to continue to work for him? It's rather odd. Well, although Otis was a victim, she wasn't a miser, Mr. Cotton. He paid her very well. I see. Well, where's the body, Matty? In the next room, Nick. Uh, come on, I'll show you. You sent out an alarm for Kavanaugh? Yeah, we got every man on the force on the lookout for him. Any chance that he's hiding somewhere in the house? We searched every inch of the joint from top to bottom. He's not in here. Well, here she is. Hmm. Got it right through the heart, didn't you? Yeah. How horrible. Matty. Yeah, Nick? You have any reason to believe it wasn't Kavanaugh who killed her? Nick, there's only one way it adds up. Now, look. Kavanaugh don't budge out of the house for 15 years, and then when he does blow, he leaves a body behind. To me, it's open and shut. Well, that sounds reasonable, Nick. Especially since Mr. Kelsey spoke to Miss Drew just a few moments before she died, and she and Kavanaugh were having a quarrel. You know what they were quarreling about, Kelsey? No, she didn't say. Uh -huh. Hey, why'd you call Kavanaugh? Well, it was about his monthly annuity check. His annuity check? Yes, yes. Mr. Kavanaugh's father left his money tied up in trust, and Otis received an annuity. Well, why call so late at night? <laughs> Time meant nothing to Miss Kavanaugh, and uh, I'd been working late at my office, so I phoned to see whether he'd mind if I stopped by with his check. Mm. Save me a trip tomorrow morning. Well, couldn't you have mailed it? Oh, no. No, no. Miss Kavanaugh always insisted that I deliver it to him in person. Uh-huh. Matty, did you find the murder weapon? No, not a sign of it, Nick. What about fingerprints? Boys are working on it. We'll have a report by morning. Good. Well... Looks as if the only question is where Kavanaugh could be hiding. Uh, well, I might make one guess. We found this in Miss Drew's pocketbook. Why, it's a telegram. Well, let's see. It's addressed to Otis Kavanaugh. Yes. It says, 
Arriving, steamship Montevideo, Monday. Monday? Well, that's today. We'll go straight to Granger's tourist camp on Highway 47. Must see you. Signed, Oliver. Oliver? Who's Oliver, Kelsey? Why, uh, I, I, I don't know, Mr. Carter. I never heard Mr. Cavanaugh mention anyone by that name. Uh, well, whoever he is, what made him think Cavanaugh would leave the house even to meet him somewhere? I don't know, Maddie. But there's one place where we might get the answer. Sure. Granger's tourist camp. Right. Come on, let's go. Come on, come on, Matty. Step on it. Look, Nick, I got her up to 60 now. I want to get there in one piece. Okay. But if you hadn't been so bullheaded about phoning headquarters before we left the cabin off place, we... Nick, how many times do I have to tell you? I ain't one of you private eyes. When I start going places, I gotta let people know. Well, I suppose you're right, Matty. Nick... What do you expect to find when you do get to this camp? Oh, it's Kavanaugh, I hope. Maybe we should have brought Kelsey along to identify him, huh? If you don't mind, I'd rather work without Kelsey around. Why? You think he's mixed up in this? I didn't say that. Ah, Nick, the whole deal's as plain as the nose on my face. Kavanaugh and the dame had a fight. Kavanaugh plugged her and then beat it. And that's that. Maybe, Maddie. Maybe. But then again... Maddie, doctor... look out! Huh? Those headlights coming out from that side road. Oh, hold on, Maddie. It's cutting right out in front of us. Oh, no, that's just darn... Oh, Nicky, he's shooting at us. Watch it, you two. With the tire shot out from under him, Natty tries to control the careening automobile. But it's too late, and with Nick and Patsy huddled together in the back seat, the speeding car plunges into the ditch at the side of the road. We'll see what happens next in just a minute. Now back to the case of the hermit thrush. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. As we pick up our story, Nick, Patsy, and Sergeant Matheson are just recovering from the shock of having their car skid off the road at high speed. Patsy, um, oh, Patsy, are you all right? I, I think so, Nick. Well, I ain't all right. <laughs> Look at this bump on my head. Oh, golly. Huh. Well, thank heaven whoever was shooting at us wasn't a better shot. I don't think those shots were meant to kill us. Huh? We're supposed to delay our arrival at Granger's camp. Well, they certainly succeeded. We'll have to wait until morning to get out of this ditch. We can't wait until morning. I don't want to take a chance at having a homicidal maniac like Kavanaugh running around loose. Well, maybe we can hitch a ride at the Granger's. That's just what we're going to do, Matty. Necessary, we'll commandeer a ride. Come on. <laughs> Are you the proprietor of this tourist camp? Yes, that's right. I'm Robert Granger. Well, my name's Nick Carter. This is Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad. Yeah, we're looking for a man who may have checked in here sometime yesterday. Uh, what was your fellow's name? Oliver. Was that his last name? I don't know. You have a register? Yep, sure. Here's the book. Here's book. You folks that came in yesterday. See anything, Nick? Yes, Niles. Oliver Niles. And that's the only Oliver here. Where is he, Nick? In, um, like a cabin 26. 26 is straight on back. Last one to your left. Thanks, Granger. Okay, we shall see what we shall see. <laughs> Mr. Niles! Mr. Niles! Huh? No soap, Nick. Nobody in there. There ought to be. The lights are on. Well, how about looking in the window? I guess we're better. Nick, you don't think we're too late, do you? I hope not. We can see in through this window, Nick. Uh-huh. Have you seen him? <gasps> oh, Nick. Holy smoke. There's a guy laying on the floor. And would you look at his face? Well, that answers your question, Patsy. We are too late. That man's dead. <laughs> Say, you're not sure whether this man is Oliver Niles, Ranger. No, no, I ain't, Mr. Carter. You sure can't tell much from his face. Uh, not after somebody shot him point blank with a shotgun. Oh, it's awful. Uh, hasn't been dead more than an hour, Nick. Only there was some sort of identification on him. 
Take a look around, will you, Patsy? Go through everything. See what you can find. Okay, Nick, I'll look. I don't get it, Nick. We already know who he is. Do we? Why, he was Oliver Niles, of course. It's perfectly clear what happened. Yeah, what? Sure. Cavanaugh found out where we were heading and beat us to the punch. Took a couple of pot shots at us on the road and came out here and knocked off Niles. But why, Matty? Why? What's well, he up to? I don't know. He probably don't know that himself. Didn't you yourself call him a homicidal maniac? Yes. Yes, what is it, Pepe? Nick, look. Huh? He was in his bed. Under his pillow. Uh-oh. A watch. Let me see. Well, well, well. Something engraved on it, Nick? Yes. From M.V. to O.C. Christmas, 1932. O.C.? Why, that stands for Otis Cavanaugh. Well, Maddie, what's this do to your neat little theory? Oh, brother, it knocks it into a cocked hat. Nick, this guy ain't Oliver Niles at all. It's Otis Cavanaugh. Oh, boy, we finally caught up with him. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. Miss Bowen, this is Leonard Kelsey. I've just come from the morgue. Oh, yes, Mr. Kelsey. Will you tell Mr. Carter that there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever about the man's identity? It is Otis Cavanaugh. I see. Well, thanks, Mr. Kelsey. I'll tell him. Thank you. <sighs> well, Nick, it looks as though you're out of a job. Kelsey identified him, huh? Uh-huh. Huh. And since we were hired just to find Cavanaugh, it looks as though we were about to be fired. Patsy, I don't like it. I don't like it one little bit. What do you mean? It doesn't add up. There's something wrong someplace. Well, I don't see what's wrong. No? Tell me again what happened, Patsy. Start from scratch and I think you will see. Well, uh, Cavanaugh had a quarrel with Eleanor Drew and killed her. Yeah, go on. And he lit out for the tourist camp, planning to lie low there. When he found out we were heading for the same place, he tried to stop us. But, but... how did he find out where we were going? What? Hmm. I don't know. And why didn't he kill us when he had the chance? Well... And why did Niles shoot Cavanaugh in the face with a shotgun? Do killers usually do that? No, of course not, no, but... No, 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 Now, Patsy, there are too many holes. Too many murders and attempted murders for no apparent reason. Mm. There's something missing. I want to find out that Wait something... Wait a minute. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. It's me, Patsy. Let me talk to Nick. Oh, just a second. Here, Nick, it's Sergeant Matheson. Oh, thanks. Hiya, Matty. I suppose you know Leonard Kelsey identified the body, Nick. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, I just thought I'd check with you before I gave the story to the papers. Hey, Matty, what yeah. about the fingerprints? Uh, fingerprints? Yes. You have a report on the ones your boys found in the Cavanaugh house? Oh, those? Yeah. Any of them drive with the dead man? No, they don't, Nick. None of them? No. Nope. I don't see why you're getting so hot and bothered about that. After all, the body's been identified by the man who knew Cavanaugh best. Look, Matty. What's wrong? Huh? How could Cavanaugh live in that place for 15 years and not leave a single fingerprint? Hey, you got something there. I think I have. And I don't think we found Otis Cavanaugh. See, Nick, this Cavanaugh mansion is even spookier in the daytime than it is at night. Well, don't worry. We're only going to be here long enough to take a look through Cavanaugh's private papers. To see if we can find out who is Oliver Niles, maybe? Maybe. This looks as though it might have been a study. In here. Oh, what's the matter? That window there, that crack in the shutter. Oh, oh. oh Nick, I could have sworn there was a man's eyes looking in at us. Well, there's no one there now. Yeah. Well, maybe this creepy old house is making me see things. Forget it. Okay. All right, let's have a look in this file cabinet. Oh, my goodness, Nick. Millions of papers. Oh. It'll take us forever to go through all those. And they're all old, too. Turning yellow and black. Yeah. Oh, here's a scrapbook, Nick. Oh? Well, let me look at it. Those are reviews. The critics' comments on Cavanaugh's debut as a concert singer. Uh-huh. And back here are some society columns. Huh? Oh, here's a picture of the whole family on a yacht. I wonder which one's Otis. Oh, wait a minute. Let's see. Reading from left to right... Mrs. Roger Hobart, Mr. Roger Hobart, Mr. and Mrs. James Niles. Niles? Yes, and the two sons, Mr. Oliver Niles and Mr. Otis Cap... Otis Cavanaugh. Hey, they're two sons? What, what does that mean? That's what it says. Mr. and Mrs. James Niles and the two sons. Mr. Oliver Niles and Mr. Otis Cavanaugh. Then Oliver Niles and Otis Cavanaugh were half-brothers. Right. Otis Cavanaugh's mother must have been married twice, the second time to a man named James Niles. Of course, Nick. It, 
Look at that picture. Otis and his half-brother look very much alike. I certainly do. Good heavens, Nick. This means that the man we found at the tourist camp could have been Oliver Niles. Yes, could have been that. It also explains how Chelsea could have been mistaken. Patsy, it may explain a lot of things. Oh, Nick, we've got to find other cabin, or if we don't... Oh, 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 who could be calling up here? I don't know. Well, I'm going to find out. I wonder where that phone is. It's over there, in the alcove under the stairs. Oh, yes, I see it. I'll get it. Hello? I warn you to give up your investigation, Carter. Who is this? If you don't, you'll meet the same fate my housekeeper met. Your housekeeper? Yes, mine. This is Otis Cavanaugh. Hello. Hello. I sound up. Oh, Nick. And you heard what he said? Yes. Cavanaugh must have seen us come in. That must have been his face I saw at the window. Then he went somewhere in no, your box. Wait, wait, wait. What? Let me think. Yes. Of course. What is it? Come on. You've got to hurry. Where are we going? To try to find Otis Cavanaugh. I think I know where he is. Cavanaugh couldn't be down here in the cellar. You just talked to him on the phone. That wasn't Cavanaugh. That was... But how do you know it wasn't? That's, don't you remember how Otis Cavanaugh was billed as a concert singer? Yes, as a high society tenor. Well, is it likely that a man who had sung tenor could speak in a deep bass voice like the one we heard on the phone? Of course not. But that still doesn't prove that Cavanaugh is down here. Well, maybe it doesn't prove it, Patsy, but we're going to keep on looking. I have a feeling that we're going... What's that? The door, the head of the cellar stairs. Someone's coming down. Yeah. The gun stairs. Take it easy. Have you got your gun? I'm all set. Nick. I'm not positive, Patsy. If my hunch is right, it's the murderer we've been looking for. Nick and Patsy wait tensely in the basement of the old Cavanaugh mansion while someone descends the cellar stairs. Whether or not it's the killer and who he is, we'll find out in just a minute. Now for the conclusion of the case of the hermit thrush. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. Huddled closely together in the basement of the old Cavanaugh mansion, Nick and Patsy wait as someone slowly descends the stairs. Here he comes, Nick. Aren't you going to know we're here? I think he already knows it. Hello there. What? Why, it's not Otis Cavanaugh at all, Nick. It's Mr. Kelsey. Yes. Come on in, Kelsey. Oh, Mr. Carter. And Miss Bowen, too. What in the world are you doing down here? We've been looking for Otis Cavanaugh. In the cellar? I'm afraid you'll never find him here. You're mistaken, Kelsey. You mean you found his grave? So he is buried down here. Yes. Nick, look out. He's got a gun. My hunch was right, eh, Kelsey? You and Eleanor Drew buried Cavanaugh down here 15 years ago. Knowing that won't do you any good now, Carter. Nick, please. He's got us covered. And I'm going to kill you both. I can't afford to have my secret known. Is that why you killed Miss Drew and Oliver Niles? You figure everything out, don't you? All right, I did kill them. Doesn't matter that you two know now, because neither one of you will live to testify against me. I'm not so sure of that, Kelsey. Okay, Sergeant Matheson, you can come out now. Here's your killer. Sergeant Matheson, okay, Kelsey, go away. Go. That's to get his gun. Okay, Nick. Rocky's out cold. Oh, that's the same. Pick it up. Oh, gee. He sure fell for an old gag looking around when you call Sergeant Matheson, who isn't within five miles of this place. No, oh, they do it nearly every <laughs> time. Now. Our next job is to get our murderous little friend here down to headquarters and have him booked for murder. Well, Nick, you were right. I got a complete confession from Leonard Kelsey. Good. Just as you figured, Nick, the whole story was a phony. Otis Cavanaugh never locked himself up in that house 15 years ago. He died 15 years ago. He did? Yes. How? Apparently, it was a natural death, Patsy. But Kelsey, who was the executor of the Cavanaugh estate, saw a chance to keep on collecting Cavanaugh's large monthly annuity. That's right. But uh, where did Eleanor Drew come in? 
Well, Kelsey apparently needed her help. First, to bury Cavanaugh in the cellar after he died, and second, to maintain the fiction that Otis was alive all those years. Well, I still don't see why he killed Eleanor Drew. All right, I'll get back to that in just a minute. You see, Oliver Niles had been living in South America for 20 years. Yeah. So he, like everybody else, thought Cavanaugh was alive. But then when he returned to this country, Kelsey's game was threatened. He had to kill Niles. Yeah, but the Drew dame wouldn't go for that. That's right. She probably figured that fraud was one thing, murder another. So they quarreled, and Kelsey killed her. And he saw a perfect act for himself by claiming Kavanaugh killed her. All he had to do was murder Niles and identify Niles' body as Kavanaugh. Oh. Well, that way the case would be closed, he thought. The reason he came to me was to be sure Niles' body would be found. Yeah, but uh, that telegram in the Drew woman's purse, didn't he know that would be found? Yeah, that's where he slipped up. Yeah, he probably thought she destroyed it. Yeah. And Kelsey was the only one who could have known we were headed for the tourist camp, wasn't he? That's right. And then there was that watch. It was the only identification in the cabin. Sure, Kelsey planted it there. And that's what made me ask myself why somebody wanted me to think that Otis Cavanaugh was dead. But what about that phone call, Nick? Why did Kelsey call you? Because if he succeeded in killing me, he wanted you to testify that I'd been threatened by Cavanaugh. Oh. <laughs> uh, Nick. I'll never forgive you for one thing. Why, what's that, Bessie? For not telling me that Otis was dead, and for not pointing out his grave in the cellar. I didn't find his grave. But, and that was all a bluff? Sure. Well, I thought I was right, but I didn't know. I had to get Kelsey uh, to tip his hand. Uh, of course, I'm sure Cavanaugh's grave is down there now. Yeah, but... it is, Nick. We found it. Ah, good for you, Maddie. But, Patsy... Oh, what, Nick? Don't ever accuse me of holding out on you again. After all, you wouldn't be able to stand me if I were the kind of guy who knows everything all the time. <laughs> Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor, is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Ken Pettis and Lou Schofield. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Bob Martin saying, when minutes count, use new post for Old Dutch Cleanser. is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Time two great names are joined as new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. a $10,000 scene from a client and then accused him of murder. That's right, Patsy. But I don't understand. How could he have committed the murder? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. But he was with us when it happened. Yes, I know. You and I, Patsy, are his alibi. And yet I'm positive he killed William Lasher. And now, the case of the perfect alibi. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter... Brought to you by a new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. It is almost 8 o'clock in the evening, and Nick Carter and his assistant Patsy Bourne are bound for the theater. It's one of those rare evenings when Nick is not working, and Patsy is happy enough to sing. Oh, Nick. First the theater, then supper and dancing. Oh, we won't get home until morning. Well, well, we won't get home until morning. We're taking an evening off to see you so happy. Oh, I am happy, Nick. They'll just be us tonight. No policemen, no crooks, no anybody. Hey, look at that fool. But he's driving right at us. The taxi brings himself. Oh, Why does? Oh, that driver must be drunk. Crazy. He's not injured. I'll tell him a thing or two. Are you in there? You hurt? No. No, I'm okay. Well, get out and let's have a look at you. It, it was my fault entirely. I'll be glad to pay all the damage. What's wrong with you? Plenty of light on this street. You must have seen us coming. I know. I, I said it was my fault. Here. Here's my license and my registration. I I'll call my attorney in the morning and he'll get in touch with you. Here, Paul Sanders. Yes, yes. 
Now, you must have just found it out. The radiator of your car isn't even warm. Well, I was traveling slowly. I was just driving. With your eyes shut. Well, my name is Nick Carter. You'll need that in your accident report. You're Nick Carter? Really? He certainly is, really. Mr. Carter, I need your help, desperately. For what? Mr. Carter, a man is going to be murdered tonight, and I'm the man with the strongest motive in the world for killing him. You have the strongest motive? Yes, I have. Mr. Carter, you may be the means of saving my life and the life of William Lasher as well. William Lasher? Yes. Not the man who used to be district attorney. That's right. He represents certain clients who are after my scalp. Naturally, that makes him my enemy, too. So what? I phoned him just a little while ago. I argued and pleaded with him, but it was no use. He can ruin me, and he's going to do it, if he lives. You don't make sense yet, do well, I? while I was talking to him on the phone, he received a letter by messenger. He, he read it to me and accused me of sending it. It said that Lasher was going to be killed tonight. Me? Isn't Lasher that D.A. who was so tough they refused to let his name go up for re-election? Yes, Patsy. Stepped on too many toes. Oh. I must have a reliable person who will swear that I couldn't have killed Lasher. Will you take the job, Mr. Carter? You know, Mr. Sanders, I think maybe I will. I'll pay you any fee you ask, anything. The fee will be $10,000, Mr. Sanders. $10,000? Well, that's pretty steep, but okay, I'll pay it. All right. First thing to do is to establish the fact that Lash is alive right this minute. Suppose I use my car, Mr. Sanders. Mine will run. Yours doesn't look as if it would. Very well. I don't like this, Nick. Neither do I. Why do you think I accepted this case? Well, come on, Mr. Sanders. Let's look into this murder you say is going to happen. For your sake, Mr. Sanders, I hope Mr. Lasher is alive. I hope so, too, even though I detest the man. I, I think someone's coming, Nick. Yes? I'd like to see Mr. Lasher. I'm Nick Carter. You're Nick Carter, the detective? Yes, may I see him, please? Well, oh, gee, I'm sorry, but he left strict orders that he wasn't to be disturbed under any circumstances. In spite of his orders, I want to see him whether he's all right. Well, I have reason to believe he might be murdered tonight. Murdered? Why, oh, all right, I'll knock on the study door. He gets awful sore when I disobey him, but, well, I'll try it. Who's he, Mr. Sanders? His name is Joey Wilson. Nice boy. Nice as his guardian. Oh. Mr. Lasher. Mr. Lasher, go away. I told you I don't want to be disturbed. You see? Yeah, let me try. Mr. Lasher, this is Nick Carter. I want to talk to you. I said go away. I'll see no one tonight. Well, I'm afraid you're going to see me because I want to see you. How did you get out of here? Well, what happened, Nick? Well, you threw a book at me. Fortunately, oh. his aim was bad. Uh, then he's still alive. Yes, Sanders. Luckily for you, he's very much alive. Oh, Joey, do you know Mr. Sanders here? Why, yes, sir. He comes to see Mr. Lasher sometimes. When was the last time he came to this house? Oh, let me see. He hasn't been here in a long time. At least for two months. Yes, yes, at least that. I see. Well, now 8.32. Remember that, all of you. Lasher is alive now. What's more, Sanders? Yes, Mr. Gordon? We're going to take further precautions to see that he stays alive, at least as far as you're concerned. Come on. <laughs> What's the idea of bringing me here to police headquarters? Because I want to look in on my friend, Sergeant Matheson, before we go back to Lasher's place. Well, at least the last two hours have passed quickly. Seeing your offices and laboratory was quite an experience, Carter. Well, at least it was one way of killing time while we were establishing your alibi. And here's the sergeant's office. Hi, Matty. Oh, hi, Nick. Happy? Hello. This is Mr. Sanders. Sergeant Madison. How are you, sir? Listen to you. Any further word from Lasher, Nick? No, Matty. I called Joey half hour ago. He reported Lasher was still very much alive. Good. I sent four men up there, as you suggested, just to cover the house and sort of keep a watch over Lasher. Thanks, Matty. I also did some checking down here. You know, Nick, Lasher was about the toughest DA we've ever had. Yeah, so I recall. One of the boys he put away, and one who hated Lasher like poison... Got out of prison yesterday. Well, that's interesting. Who is he? Pete Arnold. Lasher got him sent up for 15 years for armed robbery. And the day he was sentenced, Arnold swore he'd get Lasher for sending him up. I think I remember him. 
Wasn't he a big, powerful fellow? Yeah, mean and dangerous, too. You know, Nick, I think we ought to go see Lasher again, whether he likes it or not. I think you got something there, Matty. Let's go. Come on, Sanders. All right. Where you go, I go. For tonight, at least. You've got your men well hidden, Matty. Didn't see one anywhere. They're uh, here all right, Nick. Don't worry about that. Hello. Oh, it's you again, Mr. Carter. Yes, Joey, and this time we're going to talk to Mr. Lasher, orders or no orders. Well, it's at your own risk, Mr. Carter. I know, Joey. Mr. Lasher, I'm coming in. I want to... Hey. Dick, uh, he's dead. Oh, no, he can't be. He's dead, all right. Dead, is he? Well, everyone stay right where you are. Don't touch a thing. Now, let me see. There's no blood yet. No. And no sign of a struggle either. Just that terrible expression on his face. For me, that means just one thing, Betsy. Lasher was poisoned. Nick, someone was here with him. Look at that bottle of liquor and those two glasses here on the desk. And the glass beside Lasher's hand is empty. But the other one's full. I'll call the medical examiner and the homicide boys. Now, you four go back in the living room. I don't want anything disturbed in here, intentionally or otherwise. <laughs> Two of the men I got outside saw someone peering through the window of the study where we found Lasher's body. Did they catch him? No, they lost him in the darkness. Uh-huh. They said he resembled Pete Arnold in size. So the window's being dusted for prints, and so are the bottle and glasses. Oh, those glasses are hobnailed, Matty. They're huh? too rough to take an impression. Yeah. Yeah, I'm afraid you're right. Well, I'm going back in the study, Nick. You carry on, huh? Okay, Matty. Uh, Joey, why did Mr. Lasher insist upon being alone tonight? I don't know. All I know is that every once in a while he'd clear everybody out of the house except me. And my job was to see that nobody disturbed him. Mm-hmm. When was the last time that happened? Oh, I'm not sure. About a year ago, I guess. Hey, Nick. Oh, yes, honey. Yes, there were prints on the window. They matched Pete Arnold. That's so. And the medical examiner says he thinks it's poison. Just in the glass that Lasher drank from? No, in both glasses. The murderer must have slipped the poison into the bottle before it was poured. Well, one thing is sure. Sanders didn't kill him. He was with us all the time. Thank you, Miss Bowen, for those kind words. Well, I'll get back to headquarters in case something breaks down there. Okay, Matty. You'll phone me just as soon as the poison's identified? You better will, Miss. Good. The minute I find out. Well, two lucky things happened to me tonight. That's so. Last year's dead and I'm saved from bankruptcy. Also, I ran into Nick Carter, who furnished me with a perfect alibi. I'm not even suspected of the murder. Well, you're a lucky man, Mr. Sanders. Uh, now, there was something said about a fee. The fee? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yes, I've got the cash right with me. Here, and $500 bills. Oh, lucky. Yes, there you are, Mr. Carter. $10,000 for three hours' work. Sanders, how does it happen you're carrying all that money around? Well, I always carry a lot of cash. Wouldn't be that you purposely had that much on you so you could wave it under my nose if I didn't want to take the case. What? Why, I didn't even know I'd need you. No? When you collided with me, the radiator of your car was almost cold, yet you said you'd been driving around. Well, I had been. I doubt that. I believe you were parked at the curb until you saw Patsy and me start away from my house. I believe you were waiting for us. Are you trying to say that I framed that smash-up? I am. You deliberately planned to have me furnish you with an alibi. <laughs> I suppose next you'll say that I actually murdered Lasher. Yeah, I think you did. Uh, oh, Nick, how could I? Oh, that's crazy. How could I have been with you and be at this house at the same time? I don't know the answers yet, but I'm going to find them. I'm sure you killed him. I don't have to stand here and listen to slander. You're not free to leave yet, Sanders, to stick around. Don't worry. I'll be around if you need me. Nick, what's going on here? You just took a $10,000 fee from a client and then accused him of murder. That's right, Betsy. Well, I don't understand. He was with us when it happened. You and I are his alibi. Yes, I know. But in spite of that, I'm positive Sanders killed William Lasher. As the case moves swiftly to a climax, Nick and Patsy serve as the alibi for the man Nick accuses of murder. 
In just a moment, we'll learn whether Nick can make this accusation stand. Now back to the case of the perfect alibi. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. It is a short time later. The police are gone. Nick and Patsy are upstairs investigating Lash's bedroom. Well, nothing here that gives us any clue. Uh-uh. Do you really think he murdered Lashes? I do. Well, what about Pete Arnold? He swore he'd kill Lashes someday. Pete Arnold didn't do this job. Well, how can you be so sure about that? Look, Patsy, Lasher knew Arnold was dangerous. Would he have invited him in for a drink? No. No, I don't suppose so. Besides, men like Arnold don't use poison when they kill. Yes? It's me, Joey. Oh, come on in. Yes, Joey? I thought I'd see if there was anything I could do. Oh, yes, yes. Perhaps there is, Joey. Uh, Lasher was obviously a hot-tempered man. Was he always that way? Oh, no, sir. That was just on the surface. Underneath, he was a swell guy. Oh, that's so. Why, he built a new wing on the hospital and it cost him a quarter of a million dollars. That's the Blystone wing. Why do you use that name? Because he didn't want his own name on it. He didn't even want anybody to know he paid for it. Oh, well, uh, who was Blystone? Anyone special? Oh, yes. Mr. Blystone saved Mr. Lash's life in the First World War, and he was nearly killed doing it. Oh. He used to come here every year to talk about the war and old times and stuff. And it was sort of an anniversary. You know where Blystone is now? Oh, he died five years ago. Oh, he... Oh, uh, must be Maddie calling him up poison, Patsy. Oh, I'll get it. Okay, thanks. Uh, about this life. I'm coming. Coming. Oh, that dark here ways like that. Are you all right, Patsy? Oh, oh yes. Nick. Nick, I, I tripped. Wait a minute. Are you all right? Are you hurt, boy? No. No, I, I don't think so. There was something stretched across the stairway. I, I thought it hit my ankle, and then I lost my balance. See, that's too bad. Sanders did that. Huh? I'm scared. He knew I expected a phone call and wanted me to break my neck, but he tripped you instead. But what was it that tripped me? This is an open stairway with a railing on both sides. You could have passed a wire or a cord across the step, pulled it up as you came down, then pulled the hard free and got away. Oh, gosh, what a dirty trick. I'll say. Help me up, Nick. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm all right. All right, let me help you to the studio, Fred. Mm-hmm. Sit down there and rest for a bit. Thanks, Nick. Okay. Much better. All right, there you are. Take it easy now until you feel okay. I will. Oh, you know that Sergeant Madison probably wondering what on earth's wrong. Do I answer it? No, no, I'll get it. Nick Carter speaking. Look, why don't you answer the phone? I was getting all set to come out there and see if you were still alive. I'm sorry, Maddie. Perhaps you tried to answer your first call, but you fell down the stairs. She fell? She didn't hurt herself. No, no, I don't think so. Nothing serious. Oh, good. Well, your hunch was right, Nick. The autopsy shows the liquor was poison. That was potassium cyanide in the bottle and both glasses. So that's why it works so fast. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you, you better watch out for Pete Arnold. My boys never did see him leave the place. Thanks, Mary. I'll do that. What did the sergeant say, Nick? Says it was poison, cyanide. Oh. Hey, Joey... Were there any more glasses to this set Mr. Lasher used? Not that I know of. I never saw more than two of them. I see. Hey, this brandy. It's imported from France. More than 40 years old. Golly, it must be priceless. It is if you go in for that sort of thing. <sighs> now, to whom would Lasher serve 40 year old brandy? Have to be somebody very special. Mr. Carter, I remember now. Yeah, what? Mr. Blystone, every time he came here, that bottle of brandy would turn up. Well, now. And about a year, uh, once about a, a year since Mr. Blystone died, I, I'd i found the bottle here on the desk again with the two glasses. Did Lasher drink much? Well, he never drank, Mr. Carter, except, well, maybe the times I found the bottle left on the desk. Nick, get to me quickly, by the window. Yes, what is it, Betsy? The second floor of the garage. Watch that window right in the middle. Yeah. Someone's looking out. Someone with a cigarette in his mouth. Could... Could that be Pete Arnold? I don't know. But it won't take me long to find out. Watch it now, Patsy. Get out, get out, get out. 
Look. You stay right here. Don't move. But what are you going to do? I'm going around the other side. He's out of the garage now and around the west corner. I saw the gun flash. Oh, Nick, please be careful. I'll be careful. Now, if I can just make it to the... Uh-huh. Still shooting over the other way. Now, if I jump in fast... Wait, not that... No, why, you... Oh, my God. I'll hold you. Hey, did you get him? I did. He'll be with us as soon as he wakes up. Oh. Having trouble, Mr. Carter? Yeah. Mr. Sanders. Yeah, Sanders, where have you been while all the fireworks were going on? I was just uh, walking around, uh, thinking. Okay, suppose you take all of Pete's legs. We'll carry him into the house. Then we'll all do some thinking. Together. Okay, one handcuff around this wrist. The chain behind the steam pipe and the second cuff on his other wrist. Which takes care of Pete Arnold for the time being. Carter, why did you bring Arnold upstairs? Why not just turn him over to the police? Because there are no police here at the moment, Sanders. Matty took his men away. Figured that whoever had been prowling around had gone by now. He's waking up, Nick. All right, all right. All right, cut it, Pete. You're not fooling anyone. I'm Nick Carter. I try to kill Patsy and me. What a step I've been. What a step. Pete, did you kill Lesser? No. I was going to, but when I looked in the window, he was sitting there, dead. Then what happened? I heard the cops moving around, so I hid in the garage. Why? Because I had to. The cops seen me here, they'd have framed me for the job. Nobody's framing you, Pete. But the police are going to ask you a lot of questions. Well, I guess I'll be here when they come. Is this all you're going to do, Carter? Sit here in the study and wait? Aren't you going to send for the police? I'll be glad to, Sanders. You decided to confess? You're crazy, Carter. Here you have a man who swore he'd murder Lasher, but who even tried to shoot you. Don't you know when you've caught a killer? <laughs> Sanders, there's an old photograph hanging on the wall here behind Lasher's desk. Hmm? Looks like some of the men from Lasher's old infantry company. Yes, that's what it is, Mr. Carter. Oh, I know that picture. You get a copy of this. Uh-huh. There's a third one from the left, aren't you? Yes. Who are the others? Can you name them? Yes, most of them. Brown, Myerson, Kelly, Blystone. And you knew Blystone? Of course I did. Oh. My sergeant. But if you're trying to tie him into this, you're wrong. He's been dead for five years. Yeah, so old Joey told me. Oh, Patsy. Huh? Come to the living room, Mary, will you? Of course, Nick. You too, Joey. Sure, Mr. Carter. Now, listen, both of you. Mm-hmm. I'm going to accuse Sanders of murder again, point blank. And I'm going to show him how I can prove it. Gee, can you do that? I'm going to try. I get it. You want to make him so desperate he'll do something that will give himself away. That's it. Oh, but what about Pete Arnold? I told you, Patsy, nothing as far as Lasher's murder is concerned. But if Pete didn't do it, and Sanders was with us, who was with Lasher when he was killed? Somebody had to be. Patsy, when Lasher died, there was no one with him except possibly a ghost. But a ghost? Nick, are you trying to tell me this is a supernatural case? No, simply the work of a murderer who planned every move well in advance. Oh, now, let's get back to the study while I tell Sanders how he murdered Lasher without even being present. Well, be careful, Nick. Sanders may have a gun. I shouldn't be surprised. That's where Joey comes in. Me? Oh, gosh, I'll do anything I can. Okay, Joey, take one of those heavy bookends off that table. Go out of the house and around to the back. You have three minutes to reach the windows looking into the study. But then, then what do I do? Joey, when the time comes for you to act, you'll know it without me telling you. Oh, <laughs> some facts. Oh? You knew Lasher and his dead friend Blystone from World War I. Suppose I did. 
You knew that Blystone saved Lasher's life, and that Lasher and Blystone made a pledge after the war was over to meet once a year and celebrate the rescue. Does that make me a murderer? Now, Lasher never used liquor except once a year, when he and Blystone each drank a small glass of his fine old brandy. And that celebration always took place on the same day, the date of Lasher's rescue, a date you knew because you were there when it happened. So, two men celebrate an anniversary, and that makes me a murderer. It does because you knew about it. Joey tells me the bottle and the two glasses were kept in plain sight in the cabinet over the desk. You must have seen them many times. It's been very easy for you to come here to see Lazar, and then, while you were waiting here in the study for him... Oh, well, that's it. Get it, Patsy? Of course. Sanders poisoned the bottle of brandy when he was here over two months ago. He knew it wouldn't be used until tonight, and he planned to set up an alibi for the exact time when Lazar would be killed. All right, both of you put your hands up fast. Oh, I told you I had a gun. Get him up. Thank you. So you found out about me. I did. You were too anxious to have Patsy and me be your alibi. And you were too eager to pay too much money for such a small job. I'm admitting nothing, Carter. But don't move, either of you. I have plans for you. Sanders backs away, his finger tightening against the trigger. We'll see what Nick does about this in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of a perfect alibi. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. Sanders slowly levels his gun at Nick and Patsy as he says, Here's where you and Miss Bowen get it. I hope you're ready. Get down, Patsy. <laughs> That was some haymaker you landed on his door. Well, he won't do any more shooting for a while. Was it okay, Mr. Carter? Ah, oh, you are marvelous. You are wonderful, Joey. Oh, gee, thanks, Miss Boyd. Mrs. Bowen. Boy, is he out cold? <laughs> well, Nick, the plan seems to have worked. Yeah. When Joey smashed the window, Sanders reacted just as I hoped he would. And that gave you a chance to go for him. Yeah. Well, now you'll have two prisoners now. Pete Arnold and Sanders. God. It's hard to believe. Sanders killed Lasher and wasn't even here when it happened. That's right. Then Blystone was the ghost who was with Lasher when he was killed. Right. Oh, gosh, that was a clever scheme. Yes, and safe, too. The brandy was never used for anything else. <laughs> he simply set a murder trap and waited for the reunion to set it off. Right. Which is murder in the first degree, as you'll find out very shortly. <laughs> the order of the community test. Test, Nick, this is the first time in a long time a murderer's money has helped a worthy cause. A murderer? Carter, something terrible has happened. So I found out too late to stop you, huh? Too? What do you mean? You're going to tell me that you've had another period of temporary insanity, aren't you? Yes, yes that's right. I don't remember what happened, but when I came out of it, I, I found this knife in my pocket. Yes. I expected that. Those stains on it. Carter, they're blood. Now for the case of a barefoot banker. Today's adventure starring Ron Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by a new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. It's four o'clock on a Monday afternoon, and Arthur Colby, portly, dignified, and respected, walks through the huge bronze doors of the Colby Trust Company and crosses to the curb where a uniformed chauffeur opens the door of his limousine. I won't need the car just yet, Marvin. I think I'll walk a few blocks before going home. Yes, Mr. Colby. Uh, don't close the car door yet, sir. I want to get in for a moment to take off my shoes. I beg pardon, sir? To take off my shoes. It's such a fine day. I think I'll walk barefoot. Mr. Colby, barefoot on Park Avenue? Yes. Good idea, isn't it? I can't imagine why I never thought of it before. Thing. You of all people. I tell you, I don't know, Ron. I can't even remember it. It was like 
waking from a sound sleep to find myself in the street crowds laughing at Can me. you blame them? Richard, keep quiet. Yes, sister dear. And that newspaper photographer, I tried to smash his camera. And you only succeeded in giving him a better picture than he'd hoped for. It's on the front page of every tabloid in town. Don't remind me of it. <laughs> you with your Homburg hat. Tight trousers and bare pussy swinging that gold-headed cane at the camera. Please, you <laughs> shut up. Arthur, dear, please don't get excited. We'll all forget that it ever happened. Yes, why don't you relax, old boy? Here, have a cigarette. One of those Turkish atrocities of yours? No, thanks. I'll stick to my pipe. Sis? Not now, Richard. Aren't we swanky these days? Monogram cigarettes, no less. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, they're not paid for either, by the way. Uh, uh, could you let me have a couple of hundred, Lorna? I'm stone broke. When are you going to quit sponging on your sister? Well, if you'd make me a decent allowance, it wouldn't be necessary. Richard, you should be ashamed. Arthur's done a great deal for you. I know. And he never lets me forget it. Well, if you don't like living in my house... Oh, but I do, I do. It's very convenient to have a sister with a rich husband. Even though he is a bit eccentric. Well, I am not eccentric. Well, I was trying to be polite. Most people would have said balmy. Richard, that's enough. Well, it's not as if this was the first crazy thing he'd done. How about the way he hides things all over the house? And the time he put the goldfish in the wall safe? If that isn't a sign of something not Get quite... Get out of here! Get out of here! Very well. I'll go. You'd uh, better watch out, sis, or you may wake up some morning with your throat cut. Wait, I... Arthur, dear. Now, now, don't pay any attention to him. Maybe he's right. Perhaps I am losing my mind. Oh, that's nonsense. You're only tired and nervous. But what if during one of these mental blackouts I should harm you? Don't even think about it. Tomorrow we'll see Dr. Henderson. Your Honor. Arthur, what's the matter? There's something in this humidor. Something buried in the tobacco. Buried in the tobacco? Look. It's my watch. The one I lost two days ago. Well, maybe you didn't put it there, darling. It might have been Richard playing a joke on me. No, no, no. I hit it there myself. I remember now. But Arthur, why? I don't know. Heaven help me, Lorna. I don't know. I should like to buy a knife. Yes, sir. A uh, kitchen knife? I believe so. Yes, a kitchen knife should do nice. Uh, what kind, sir? What kind? Oh, yes, sir. Paring knife, butcher knife, carving knife? Uh, butcher knife. Yes, a large butcher knife. Sir. Of course. Now we have them at various prices. The price doesn't matter. Just so it has a sharp edge. A very sharp edge. See, it's for my wife. <laughs> And that was the knife they found under your pillow, Mr. Corby. Yes. I don't remember putting it there. I don't even remember buying it. And you want me to protect your wife against what she might do in the future, Mr. Corby? No. No, I told you all this, Carter, so that you'd understand the circumstances. What I want you to do is find the sum of money I mislaid during another of these spells. Oh? How much money? $20,000. Oh, Quite a bundle. When did you lose it? Yesterday. Teller at my bank said I drew a personal check for 20000 at about 2.30. And did you? I examined the check this morning. It's my signature, all right. But you don't remember signing it? I don't remember anything from about 2 o'clock until I arrived home at 5. Go on. The bank guard saw me leave the building at 3, but when I went or what I did, I don't know. Then you don't know whether you were robbed or lost the money? I gave it away. I'm more inclined to think that I hid it somewhere. I... I do hide things lately. Hmm. Well, I'll see what I can do. But frankly, I think there's only one thing that will get your money back. What's that? Luck, Mr. Colby. Just plain sheer luck. <laughs> There's something wrong with Colby's story somewhere. Huh? What do you mean wrong? It doesn't ring true. I'm no psychiatrist, of course, but I've always understood these mental cases followed a definite pattern. Well? The pattern isn't right. 
Up until now, he's been hiding little things about the house. Oh, $20,000 isn't a little thing. Not in my dictionary. No, mine. But he didn't hide it in the house this time, either. Yeah. That's one thing. And this business of buying a knife and hiding it completely outside the pattern. Do, do you think he's lying? Well, it certainly doesn't make any sense that he should try to railroad himself into an asylum. Unless... Unless what, Nick? Unless he's planning something big. And all this is just a build-up so that he can plead temporary insanity. You mean something like murder? Well, could be. You have the name of Colby Skytrick? Yes, it's Dr. Miles Henderson. He has an office in his home out in Eastfield. Try to get me an appointment with Dr. Henderson. Let's find out whether he thinks Colby might be faking. Okay. Oh, and ask him to have Mrs. Colby there, too, will you? Perhaps she can tell us how her husband acts during these so-called periods of forgetfulness. Why did you ask me, uh, Mr. Carter? Has Arthur done anything violent? Oh, no, no. No, Mrs. Colby, nothing like that. Yes, and just what is this all about? I'm coming to that, Dr. Henderson. You see, Mr. Colby has retained me to recover some money he thinks he's hidden and forgotten about. Is that so? How much money? Twenty thousand dollars. Twenty thousand? Yes. He said he drew it out of the bank during a period of amnesia yesterday afternoon. And he didn't have it when he got home. Why? You are going to say something, Mrs. Colby? I... No, no, I was surprised, that's all. You shouldn't be. I warned you that his condition was getting worse. Will you have a cigar, Mr. Carter? Oh, no, thank you. I believe I will. You're a large knife to use as a cigar cutter. Oh, I don't think so. I picked it up in the Orient several years ago. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Henderson, you've been treating Mr. Corby for some time, haven't you? Only about two months. At first, he complained of headaches and absent-mindedness. Then he began to find his personal belongings in odd places with no recollection of putting them there. Well, how about these periods of amnesia? They started three weeks ago, and they're getting progressively worse. At first, he did silly things, but now his actions are becoming more ominous. Such as buying that butcher knife and hiding it under the pillow, you mean? Exactly. For her own safety, I've been trying to persuade Mrs. Corby that her husband should be placed in an institution. And I can't believe that's necessary. I won't believe it. Not until... Until it's too late, perhaps. Richard keeps at me about it, too, until sometimes I think I'll go mad. And who's Richard? My younger brother. He lives with us. Well, I'm afraid Richard's right. He isn't right. You know what he's thinking of, Doctor. Money. Uh, Just a minute, just a minute. I'm afraid I don't follow this. I love my brother, Mr. Carter, but I know his fault. He thinks if Arthur were in an asylum, I'd control Arthur's money. I see. Tell me, Dr. Henderson, have you ever observed a case quite like Mr. Colby's before? In my own experience, no. But the pattern of behavior is not really unusual. That's what I was really wondering about. Up to this point, Mr. Colby's condition corresponds exactly to that of a French editor described by a Dr. Wilhelm Schweiger in his book, uh, Psychopathic Phenomena and Aberrations. On this other case, did it start and develop in the same way? Step by step, they are exactly similar. That's why I'm so positive Mr. Colby should be confined. Why? What happened to the French editor? He murdered his best friend. from your conversation with Dr. Henderson yesterday, Nick? That's enough to make me even more curious. That's it. I want you to get me a book. It's called Psychopathic Phenomena and Aberrations by Dr. Wilhelm Schweiger. Nick, I'm sorry, but I can't find that book you asked for. I've called every publisher and bookseller in town. Nobody ever heard of it. I don't think there is such a book. Oh. In that case, Patsy, get me the County Medical Association. I see. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilson. What do you say, Nick? You're right, Patsy. There is no such book. And there never was a Dr. Wilhelm Schweiger. Well. Not only that, the Medical Association has no record of any such person as Dr. Miles Henderson. Doctor. 
Carter, you've got to help me. Something terrible has happened. Well, I found out too late to stop you, huh? What, what are you talking about? You're going to tell me that you've had another period of temporary insanity, aren't you? Yes, last night. I started for my club about eight, and I don't remember any more until I awakened in my own room this morning. And during this so-called period of forgetfulness, what did you do? Murder your wife? No. No, thank heaven, Ron is all right. But look what I found in my pockets this morning. Why? Well, that's Dr. Henderson's paper knife. I saw it on his desk yesterday afternoon. Yes, yes they must have been there last night. And these stains on the knife. They're blood. That's what I mean, Carter. I'm afraid I killed the doctor. <laughs> Instead of being part of Colby's plan to cover up a murder, the false Dr. Miles Henderson, it appears, has himself become Colby's victim. We'll see what happens next in just a moment. Now, back to the case of a barefoot banker. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by a new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. When Arthur Colby recovered from his latest period of amnesia, he found in his pocket a blood-stained paper knife belonging to the man who called himself Dr. Miles Henderson's psychiatrist. Nick and Patsy have gone to Henderson's office in his suburban home to see what really happened. Well, Patsy, he's been stabbed all right. Well, I'll see. You know, with this sort of a wound, it's strange that Colby didn't have any blood stains on his clothing. Maybe he was wearing something else like that. Oh, possibly. Huh. Must have talked for quite a while before the killing took place. Huh? What makes you think so? He's after it. One on the doctor's side of the desk, and another by the chair at this end. Judging by the amount of that. What's the matter, Nick? Patsy. These are cigarette ashes. So what? Colby smokes a pipe, and the doctor smokes cigars. Oh, but Nick, where are the cigarette stubs? There aren't any. No. At first, I thought Colby was framing an alibi. Now, I'm beginning to wonder whether someone isn't framing Colby. What? You mean Henderson might have been stabbed by someone else? Someone who smoked cigarettes? Exactly. Oh. There must have been something unusual about those cigarettes. Otherwise, why would the stubs have been taken away? Well, maybe you can tell from the ashes. Here we oh. Here's a few shreds of tobacco. Good. We'll take them down to the police laboratory for analysis. Okay. Is, uh, is there anything else to be done here? Now, I want to take a look in this filing cabinet, labeled Case History. If I can get the names of some of Dr. Henderson's other patients. I'll get a pencil and write them down for you. That won't be necessary, Patsy. Huh? Looks as if Colby was the only patient our fake doctor had. You mean the file is empty? Not quite. Look what I found here. What? It's money. A lot of money. It certainly is. I think we found out what happened to Colby's $20,000. You mean I gave the $20,000 to Dr. Henderson during my spell of amnesia? I don't think it was amnesia, Mr. Colby, nor insanity either. Carter, what are you driving at? Tell me, how did you happen to start going to Henderson? Well, I met him at the house one night. Who brought him there? I don't know. It was a big party. Many of the guests were strangers to me. Uh, friends of Lorna's, friends of Richard's. I say, go on, go on. Well, Henderson mentioned being a doctor and a psychiatrist, so I told him about the headaches I'd been having. He suggested I come to see him the next day, and I did. And that's when your real trouble started, wasn't it? Yes, so headaches were the first symptoms, he said. What kind of treatment did he give you? Well, the usual routine, I suppose. I'd... I'd talk about my problems, and he'd explain the hidden meanings in what I said. Wasn't there ever anything else? Well, sometimes he'd give me a sedative first, and he'd talk to me until I fell asleep. He, he said it relaxed me for the actual treatment. Ah, yes. And after one of those treatments, you'd pull some ridiculous stunt, wouldn't you? Are you trying to tell me the doctor was responsible for the spells I've been having? Colby, he wasn't a doctor. He was a fake. He... What? And unless I'm mistaken, the reason for your peculiar actions was not insanity. You were hypnotized. This is the 
Look around, sir. My room's directly above. And if anybody had taken one of these cars out last night, you'd have heard it, wouldn't you, Martin? Yes, sir. I did. You did? Then one of the cars was gone last night? Yes, miss. Mr. Colby took the convertible about 11.30 and brought it back a couple hours later. Yes. According to the medical examiner, that's just about the time Henderson was killed. How do you know it was Mr. Colby, Marvin? Well, I know the sound of the motor, sir. It's quite different from the other. I didn't ask about the car. How did you know Colby was driving it? Because it's Mr. Colby's personal car. But you didn't actually see him. Why, no, sir. That's what I wanted to know. Thanks, Marvin. Well, Nick, what now? We're going up to the house, Betsy, for a little friendly conversation with a killer. <laughs> Isn't this rather useless, Mr. Carter? We all know what happened. My brother-in-law killed Henderson in a fit of temporary insanity. I still want to know whether anyone left the house last night at 11.30. Can you tell me, Mrs. Colby? No, I'm afraid not. My room is in the east wing. Too far away to hear the front door. How about you, Mr. Ames? At 11.30, I was sound asleep. I'm sorry we can't be of more help. Will anyone have a cigarette? No, thank you, Mr. Carter? Miss Bowen? These are rather special if you like all sorts of tobacco. Yes, thank you. Oh, no, thanks. I uh, don't smoke. I wonder whether I may make a phone call, Mrs. Colby. Well, of course. Richard will show you where the phone is. Yeah. Well, while you're making that call, Nick, I'm going to work on a little idea of my own. What sort of an idea, Patrick? Oh, uh-huh, never mind. But I may have a surprise for you. <laughs> Marvin doesn't come in the garage and catch me snooping around Mr. Colby's car. He might think I'm stealing it. But there must be an article in the car. And if there are any stubs from those special cigarettes in it, the kind Richard smoked, it'll prove who took this car out last night. Yeah. Here's the ashtray. Oh, darn it, it's empty. Going for a ride, my dear? Mrs. Colby, I... I thought I'd like to watch the detective at work. So I followed you. Oh, oh well, I... That is, Nick's the detective, not me. I... Well, I just wanted to see what it felt like to sit behind the wheel of such a beautiful car. Do you like it? Oh, it's wonderful. I... Why, how funny. What's funny? The rearview mirror. I can see through the back window perfectly. That's what rearview mirrors are for, isn't it? Yes, but... But Mr. Colby is tall. If he'd driven this car last night, the mirror wouldn't be adjusted to fit me. Get out of that car. So I was right. It was, Richard. How clever of you, Miss Bowen. But I can't let you tell anyone what you've learned. Mrs. Colby, put down that ring, please. Uh, Nicely done. Hmm. The skin isn't broken. Her hair will cover the bruise. I'm afraid your meddling has caused an unfortunate accident, my dear. So foolish to start a motor in a closed garage. People die that way. And as Mrs. Colby closes the garage door, Patsy lies unconscious behind the wheel of Arthur Colby's car with the motor running. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of a barefoot banker. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. Leaving the motor of the husband's car running with Patsy slumped unconscious behind the wheel, Lorna Colby closes the garage door and starts toward the house. Oh, just a moment, Mrs. Colby. Oh, Mr. Carter. I've been looking for you. You have? Thought you might like to know that your brother did not kill Henderson. Well, of course he didn't. My husband... No, Mrs. Colby, and not your husband either. You killed him. I killed... Oh, 
Well, that's not a nod. I don't think so. And you're not leaving me just yet, Mrs. Gold. Let go of my arm. You took your husband's car and went to see Henderson late last night, didn't you? No, I didn't. You called with him about the $20,000 he stole from your husband. I don't know what you're talking then about. And you picked up the paper knife from his desk and stamped it. That's not true. It was Arthur who did it. Remember the blood, Mrs. Colby? The blood that stained your dress? No. I found that dress with a blood stain still on it. You're lying. I burned it this morning. Thanks for the confession, Mrs. Colby. Perhaps we'd better drive down to headquarters now and make it official. It was a trick. You didn't know anything. Oh, yes, I did. But I had no proof until you gave yourself away. Come on, let's go. No. Not to the garage. I'm going to let you drive me to headquarters. I won't go in there. I won't. Oh, yes, you will. Wait till I open this garage door. Let me go. Let me go. Wait, the motor of that car running. Uh, I don't know. There's someone in it. No. Good heavens, it's Patsy. Well, Miss, they say I can leave the hospital tomorrow. Isn't that wonderful? Wonderful that you're alive, Patsy. Another couple of minutes in that garage and you'd have been my late lamented secretary. Oh. Well, I'm sure glad you came along when you did. But tell me, Miss, how did you know Mrs. Colby killed the doctor? I knew because Richard smoked turkey cigarettes. But the laboratory analysis of those shreds of tobacco in Henderson's ashtray proved that they came from some ordinary popular brand. Oh, and that eliminated Richard. Yes. Colby smoked a pipe. So he was in the clear. So it had to be his wife. I don't follow that, Miss. Couldn't it have been some completely unknown person? <laughs> but you're forgetting that the knife was found in Colby's pocket. And outside of Richard or Colby himself, the only person who could have put it there was Mrs. Colby. Well, yes. Yes, but... What was behind all this business? There's a plot to get control of Colby's money by having him put in an asylum as a homicidal maniac. Mm -hmm. That's why Mrs. Colby hired Henderson, an ex vaudeville hypnotist, mind you, to pose as a psychiatrist. Uh Uh-huh. And by putting Colby under hypnotic influence, Henderson could make him do peculiar things the next day and then forget all about them. He could and did. And after a few incidents like that, all before witnesses, mind you, Mrs. Colby would have no trouble at all getting her husband put away as a dangerous lunatic. Then Richard was completely innocent. She didn't know a thing about it. Huh. You know, the whole scheme might have worked out if Henderson hadn't got greedy and used hypnotism to make Colby draw that 20000 out of the bank and bring it to him. Yes, that was a fatal error. I should say it was. Made Mrs. Colby furious. So that's why she killed him. That was one reason. She also saw a perfect chance to get rid of the only person who knew her plans and at the same time put her husband in the asylum as a homicidal maniac by putting the blame on him. Mm, What a dirty frame up. Oh, by the way, Patsy, you get 50% of the fee on this case, you know. I do? Mm Mm-hmm. Why? Because you caught the killer before I did, even if you didn't know it. (laughs) Well, I hope I never catch another one. (laughs) Catching criminals is all flay hard on the head. The new... Oh, thanks. You've just solved the mystery. All we've got to do now is catch the killer. Oh, but how do we do that, Miss? By turning you into a ghost. By turning me into a what? Patsy, I'm going to make you up into the scariest ghost that was ever seen. And tonight you're going to haunt a chess club. <laughs> now for the case of the jeweled queen. Today's adventure starring Ron Clark as Nick Carter... Brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. In his small basement apartment, cluttered with chess books and chess sets, old Jeremy Hawthorne sits over a chess board and listens absently while two hard-eyed men talk to him. Will you listen to me, Hawthorne? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh... He called you his name twice already, pal. This is my boss, Mr. Monk. Uh, oh, yes, yes, Mr. Monk. I swear if you don't pay attention... I'll, I'll... do, Cruz. Okay. Yes? Yes. Bishop to queen, bishop to oh, the only possible move. Unless, uh, knight to rook five. Also, and I got a thousand dollars for you, eh? What's that? Well, uh, a, a thousand dollars? Uh, that woke him up. Do you remember the old National Chess Club, the old marble mansion on East 20th? Uh, oh. Oh, yes, do I not. <laughs> I'm the last surviving member. Ah, what great old days we had at the club. And it's been closed now for, let me see... For 40 see. years, and it's been falling to pieces all that time. Yes, yes, that's right. 
If it hadn't been for that terrible scandal, the club would still Look, be... Look, I'm not interested in the club or its scandals. I'm interested in you. Oh? Oh, you're a chess player, Mr... No, no, uh... I'm the guy with a thousand bucks. I'll pay it to you. But, uh, for what? For your right title and interest in the club. Oh. My dear sir, <laughs> you're cheating yourself. There isn't anything in the club but old books and old furniture. Hardly worth fifty dollars, let alone. I'll pay you a thousand dollars for everything in the building. Everything that's your property as the last surviving member. All you have to do is kind of release. Oh, Mr. Munch, this is ridiculous. The place is a liability. It may be so, Hawthorne. You just sign the paper and take this thousand dollars. I'll take the liability. <laughs> I haven't asked you to marry me for over two weeks. How about Oh, please, Gabby. Don't you ever get tired of hearing me say no? Why, Patsy, I... Hey, Nick! Nick, stop the car, quick! Stop it! What's the matter? I just remembered something. A murder? Oh, you yelled as though there were ten murders. Well, arson thrown in. Oh, <laughs> oh, no, it's nothing like that. I just remembered old man Hawthorne. Hawthorne? Yeah, he lives right here. That basement apartment, Stubby. Who, what, and why is old man Hawthorne? He's the guy I play chess with by mail. Oh, oh, now I've heard everything. No, no kidding, Patsy. I'm up to my neck in a red-hot correspondence game with Hawthorne. <laughs> and I just remembered I forgot to mail him my latest move. <laughs> yeah, get back in the car, chess champion. We're late for dinner already. I'll lend you a postcard. Well, take a second, Nick. I'll be right back. Oh. <laughs> it's probably fling open the door and howl. Check. <laughs> And scare old man Hawthorne to death. <laughs> oh, um, Patsy, did I ever tell you the story about the man who won a chess game because he couldn't talk cannibal? Uh-uh. Another Nick Carter special on the way. It seems this man was captured by cannibals down in New Guinea. Uh-huh. And while they were boiling the pot... Hey, Nick, hey! Hey, oh, there's Scubby. What's the matter with him? Ah, it doesn't sound as though he's making a chess move either. Hey, Nick! Nick, you got to come into Hawthorne's place right away. This is awful. What's the matter, Scubby? You need advice on your next move? I'll say I do. Hawthorne's dead. Oh! He's committed suicide. <laughs> He climbed up on a chair and hanged himself from one of the water pipes. But why, Nick? Scabby says he didn't have a problem in the world. Well, not outside of chess. Well, he just lived for his chess problems. The old guy was happy. He yes. was. That's what's bothering me. What? Look at this note Hawthorne apparently left here on the chess table. Neatly printed in ink. I'm 80 years old and I'm tired. Chess is a bore. There's nothing left. And Nick... Why did you say Hawthorne apparently left the note? Because the note is printed in ink. So what? Hawthorne's got an ink stain on his forefinger. True enough, Scubby. But tell me this. Where's the ink bottle? The what? The bottle of ink. And the pen Hawthorne used. Or the fountain pen. Oh. Or anything that'll write in ink. Holy smoke, you're right. I've been through this room thoroughly, and there isn't any ink. So how could Hawthorne write that note? Well, maybe there's a pen in his pocket. No, no, I've searched him. There's nothing on it but some small change in a handkerchief. Mm-hmm. Then he didn't write that note. No, Scubby, he positively did not. Some kind friend obligingly wrote that note for Hawthorne with his own pen and then kindly helped Hawthorne commit suicide. What? You mean that someone murdered him? Go to the head of the class, Betsy. Oh, but he was harmless. Why would anyone want to kill a nice old man like that? That, Scubby, is what I'd like to find out. So would I. Where do we start? Well, here's the picture as I see it. Well, oh. Someone was here with Hawthorne just before he was murdered. Uh-huh. Someone who had the pen that Hawthorne used to write with. Accounting for the ink stain on the finger. Right. But what did Hawthorne write? Well, certainly not the suicide note. That was written for him after he was killed. Now, when this... Oh, this is interesting. Who? What? Here on the floor, under Hawthorne's feet. The rhinestone medallion, see? With a letter M in the center. A medallion with a letter M? Recognize it, Scotty? Sure I do. That's from the club monk. The nightclub on the west side? Yeah. 
There's a dancer there named Jenny Valentine. She does a solo tap dance and throws these souvenirs to the customer. Oh, but what would an old chess player be doing in a nightclub catching souvenirs? You mean, what would a nightclub dancer be doing in Hawthorne's rooms playing chess? Nick, maybe that medallion's the key to this murder. Could be, Skelly. And look, you kids stand by and wait for Maddie in the homicide squad. Uh Uh-huh. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going down to the monk club and try to catch a souvenir. Five grand. Oh, uh, no. But I, I told you how to get the queen. Didn't you believe me? Yeah. Well, did you see Hawthorne? Did you buy it from him? Yeah. You owe the club 6000 now. Well, what do you mean? Now, listen, Sonny. You come here to the club and you drop five grand. You can't pay, so you hand me a story about this. This bequest your uncle left to the chess club. Well, it's true, I swear. The club was closed before they had a chance to find out what he gave them. They never knew what they had. Mr. Monk, that queen is worth $20,000, maybe thirty. Okay, okay. Well, that was the deal. If, if I steered you into it, you'd cancel the money I owe you. Listen, Punk, the word was if. It's what you said. Neither I haven't got the queen yet. It cost me another grand already. If I get it, you're clear. Get that through your head, Hopkins. I don't sucker so easy for fancy stories. Well, sure, but after all, I want to... Ma! Ma! Yelling, will you? Everybody in the club can hear you. You're making so much noise. Oh, hiya, Jenny. Hello, Hopkins. Hello. Oh, Hopkins. Don't you love me anymore? No. Now, that's a man for you. Jason after me for three months, solid. And all of a sudden, bump, the freeze. Don't be mad at me, Hoppy. You played me for a sucker, Jenny. Five thousand dollars worth of sucker. Why, Hoppy? Go ahead and go in. I'm going to the bar, and I hope I never see you again. Go ahead. <laughs> Monk, baby. Yeah. Got the dope, Hoppy? Yeah, everything's okay, and we get the queen. Tonight, baby. I'm going over with Cruz. Are you gonna... Are you gonna take care of me? Mm-hmm. You just leave that to me, honey. From tomorrow on, it's just gonna be you and me and 40 grand. Oh, God, Mark. Look, uh, better grab your dressing room now. Cruz may get ideas that we see with me. Say it again. Say it again about you and me, Monk. You and me and 40 grand. Oh, honey, you say the sweetest thing. Good looking. You um like my dance? 
I haven't seen it, so I wouldn't know. And what are you hanging around my dressing room for? Miss Valentine, I'm Nick Carter. The detective? That's right. Now get out of here. I'm not quite ready to leave yet, Miss Valentine. I'd like to ask you about this medallion. Huh? What about it? Why'd you give it to Jeremy Hawthorne? Jeremy Hawthorne? Uh, hey, hey, look, I... I throw hundreds of those things around every night, but... I should I know who catches them. Of course, Miss Valentine, but you do know Hawthorne. But I throw... Don't deny it. You showed it on your face when I mentioned his name. Get out of here. I came up here to ask you what you know about a chess player who had the misfortune... Janet to... Carter, I'll ask the questions around here. Oh, hello, Monk. Do I also say hello to the 45 you're playing with? Make one fancy play, Carter, and you can get intimate with a slug. Don't you knock when you sneak into dressing rooms? Uh, no. Besides, you and I are going to sneak right out. Monk, I think... Now, look, this is my play, Jenny. Let me tell you. Okay, okay, but this is... Get on your feet, Carter. We're going up to my office. All right. It's nice and soundproof up there. We can play just as rough as you want to. And if you want to play some parlor games, that's all right, too. I've just one game I'm not in the mood for, Monk. Oh, what's that? Two men played with a gun or a rope. It's called murder. <laughs> so Nick was right in his guess that Hawthorne was known to both Jenny and Monk. We'll see where that leads him in just a moment when we hear what Monk has to tell him in his private soundproof office. Now, back to the case of the Jewel Queen. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. At the point of a gun, Nick is ushered into Monk's soundproof office on the second floor of the Monk Club. Monk closes the door sharply and... Sit down, Carter. Thanks. Now listen. I had trouble with you before. I know you're a smart cookie and I know you're dangerous. That's why I use a rod when you're around. Put your cards on the table, Monk. Carter, this is one deal that's on the level. What deal? The deal with Hawthorne. Oh? Well, this is very interesting. Go ahead, Monk. Sing your song. Well... A rich kid named Hopkins got in the red for me for five grand. So? So he couldn't pay. And so his old man wouldn't hand over the dough. So Hopkins steers me into a deal to square. What deal? You going for history, any? I've read a book or two. Well, get a load of this. Back in the 1500s, there was this English queen, Elizabeth. I've heard of her. Well, now, there was a tournament held in her honor once, a kind of uh, joust. Now, Elizabeth was impressed with a way a guy by the name of uh, Sir Charles Blontfoot. She was so impressed that she sent him a present the next day. A chess piece. It was a jewel queen. And I think I've read the story. Well, now, according to the book, Essex was so jealous of the gift. He had some fight to do with Blount. And afterwards, the chess queen disappeared. So I've heard. Now, Carter, that queen's worth a fortune. And I own it. All legal, all fair, all square. How so? Well, Hopkins' uncle uncovered it 50 years ago. He sent it to the National Chess Club as a bequest, along with some books and stuff. Well? But he died right after that. Then the club went bust before they knew what they owned. That jewel queen is stored away somewhere in the club cellar. And you own it? I do. Mm. I bought it fair and square from the last living club member... Old Jeremiah Hawthorne. I got the bill of sale of the club property signed by him this afternoon for a thousand bucks. So that's how he got the ink stain on his finger. What? Uh, nothing. Now, tonight I'm going down to the clubhouse and get what I own. All legal and above board, right? Except for one little detail, Monk. Maybe. Somebody murdered Hawthorne. Well, I... Get out of here. It's a dirty double-crossing. Hawthorne's been murdered, and he didn't have a thousand dollars on him. I told you to get out, and if you know what's good for you, Carter, don't try to hang this rap on me. I won't have to, Monk. I'll just help you hang it on yourself. (laughs) 
your hat, Mr. Carter? Thanks. Don't you like the Monk Club, Mr. Carter? Sure, sure, I like it fine. But I don't like the people in it. Good night. Good night, Mr. Carter. Come again soon. Just a minute. What? Well, Mr. Alfred Cruz, isn't it? How are you, Alfred? Last time we met... Carter, what do you want with Jenny? Take your hand off me, Alfred. What was you doing in Jenny's dressing room? Don't see why that's any of your business. It sure is. She's going to be my wife. Is that so? When? In a couple of months. She's a beautiful kid. Everybody's chasing her. Like that kid Hopkins. Even Monk. I don't want you around her, too. I have no intentions of chasing her, Alfred. Now, will you please get out of my way? You don't bluff me with fancy talk, Carter. I swear I'll break your neck if you go near her. You want a sample? You don't step aside, Alfred. Yeah, I... see how you like this. I really hate to do this, Alfred. When you get up again, I hope you'll have more sense. your car, quick. What's the matter, Scully? I was coming down to meet you, and I saw your car just now, and we'll take a look inside. Don't tell me you've discovered them. Good heavens. Johnny Valentine. Get it. office whirl around in circles. Nick, I'm serious. Why'd you bring Jenny back in the car? Why haven't you reported her murder to Maddie? I'm going to just as soon as I figure this out. Oh, but Nick... Maybe I was meant to find her and report it. But she's still out in your car. If anybody finds her... I know, I know, I know. Found it. She was in the back seat with her neck twisted, strangled. It's as though she'd come to the car and was waiting to speak to me after I left the club. Only the killer came along and spoke to her first. Nick, you've got to do something. I know, I know I do. I'm trying to think. Well, my money's on Monk. He's our meat, maybe. Oh, uh, did Jenny tell you anything that could help? No. Although she was friendly enough till she found out who I was. <laughs> this I already know. How? Oh, I know a clue when I see it. See that big smudge of powder and makeup she left on Nick's sleeve? Out of a makeup on my... Patsy, you're magnificent. You've solved the case. I've solved... You just told me who murdered Hawthorne and Jenny Valentine. Now all we've got to do is catch him. But, but, but how? By turning you into a ghost. By turning me into a what? Patsy, I'm going to make you up into the scariest ghost that I've ever seen. And tonight, you're going to haunt a chess club. <laughs> Hawking gets right, Cruz. And all through this old chess club. Stuff must be stored down in the cellar. Okay, come on. Look, uh, Hawking said it's in a big packing case. Stencil Hopkins. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's a rat thing. They can print it off. Well, rats can eat books, but they can't eat gold and diamonds. You keep telling yourself. No, no, no. Take it easy. This is the bottom. Hey, flash around your light. Yeah. Hey, Mark. Yeah? Over there against the wall. See? On a case. It says Hopkins. Okay, come on. Monk and 
crews stand in the depths of the cellar, staring up at the head of the stairs in horror. We'll hear what happens next in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the Jeweled Queen. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Granger. As Monk and crews stand transfixed in the cellar of the National Chess Club, Nick whispers to Patsy, who stands at the head of the stairs in a glowing green drape. And Patsy... Boom! Look! At the top of the stairs! Look! It's the same. She's coming down the stairs. This is coming down the water. Hey, wait a minute, Monk. She looks like... Holy smokes, it's Jenny. Hey, for the love of mud, Dave, what are you trying to do? Play the phantom of the opera? That ain't Jenny. Who does I can see her face? It can't be a fool. No! Let go of my arm. I'm not telling my Jenny you're crazy. It can't be Jenny. Jenny's dead. She's dead? How do you know that, Cruz? Carter. How do you know Jenny's dead? Only the man who killed her could know that. But if Jenny's dead, who's this? My assistant, Patsy Bowen, made up to look like Jenny. This bad light, she was able to fool you, just as I planned. Cruz. You killed Jenny! Yeah, wise guy. You thought she was going to cross me up with her, huh? Make a sucker out of me like she made out of Hopkins. Well, I showed you, and I'll show you more. Oh, yeah. Quiet, Cruz. It's too late. Oh. Don't howl, Alfred. A shot just went through your arm. It'll heal by the time you're due to take 40,000 volts sitting down. <laughs> That's right, Patsy. The old story of thieves falling out. Huh? So what do you mean, Nick? Well, Cruz knew he was being double-crossed by Jenny and Monk, so he decided to return the favor and double-cross them. Oh. Well, is that why he went back and killed Hawthorne after Monk made the deal? Tried to frame Monk by dropping that medallion. Mm Mm-hmm. Then to fix Jenny, he strangled her and left her in my car. And that way, he figured Monk would take the rap for Hawthorne's murder and Jenny would be dead and both would be out of his way. Exactly. Oh. He selected Jewel Queen and lived happily ever after. Golly. Nick, I still don't understand how I solved the case. Well, Patsy, you did it when you saw that smudge of makeup on my arm. Will you please explain? I most certainly will explain. Patsy, the only person who could have touched me while I was in the monk club, who had makeup on his hand, was Cruz. Remember I told you how he knocked my arm? Yeah, just before you hit him and knocked him down. That's right. He must have smudged my arm with makeup, which means he must have got it on his hands from Jenny's neck. (sighs) Well, I'll be darned. So he had to be the man who strangled her. Yeah, but what about the jewel queen? The jewel queen goes to monk. He bought it legally, so he's entitled to it. Oh, shucks. Oh, don't feel bad, Patsy. If you want one, I'll buy you a dozen tomorrow. A dozen? Punk is out six dollars. dear. The velvet box contained one very elaborate chest key made of wood. Value, about one dollar and fifty cents. It wasn't the real your queen? No, Patsy, it wasn't. Queen Elizabeth Chesties is still at large, somewhere in the white, white world. Well, maybe Cruz will be able to ask Her Majesty where it is after he sits down in the hot seat. Yes. Patsy, that's not a nice thing to imply. No. It isn't? Why not? Well, I certainly hope good Queen Beth isn't in the same place Cruz is going to. Oh. Oh. Besides, by then it'll be too late to do him any good. <laughs> Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.